personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Why the frown, pal? Worried about that lawnmower you lent the guy next door two years ago? Not just because he lost his memory when he went ten rounds with Lewis is no reason to get yourself in a snit. My advice to you is let George do it. You know George Valentine. Take your problems to him. Everybody else does. You'll find him in the phone book. That's where Abner found him, only Brooksy got him first. Brooksy fronts for George. And even over the phone, you'd know she's perfect for the job. But not our Abner. All he could do was confuse the issue. Hello? I would, but I can't, you see. It's a great ad. I've seen it lots of times. Oh, a great ad, I said to myself. There's a kind of a guy that when a guy's... Oh, well, pitch, uh, can... just a minute. Mr. Valentine... on the extension, Angel. Hello? Hello? I haven't got much time. Yeah, see? I'm right here. I got it. No time to write, but uh, who are you? What's your problem? Now, this is a real pleasure, sir. If you'll permit me, my name is Abner, and I'm in jail. You what? Only don't get me wrong. The reason I can't write is because I can't write. You understand? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said you were... That's right, I'm in jail. And let me tell you a more unjust thing has never happened to me. There ain't no justice... Uh, Mr. Abner, uh, slow down a little. I'm trying to write It's important, that's all. There wouldn't be time to write either, I guess, for that matter. But the main thing is it's important. That's what I've got to make you understand, see? You get me? Oh, sure, you make it so easy. Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of excited. Because, you see, the jail burned down. What? Oh, oh, yeah, and you burned down with now, it. Now, hold on. I mean the jail over in Melody. That's where I'm calling from. Melody? Uh, over in the valley? Yes, sir, that's the one. And a beautiful little town it is for tarantulas. But that old jail, let me tell you, was the biggest eyesore in... Hold it, hold it, will you? Now, say something sensible or hang up. But I am. I mean, just because I can't write. Listen, the fire was last night. They moved us out, that's all. Now we're locked up in the sheriff's office. That's how I could get to the phone. <laughs> Clear as a bell. Listen to me. I got out of the fire, understand? Only one of the guys in the big cell, he didn't. He's dead. And if I tell what I know about it, I'll be dead, too. What? I mean it. It's a rough deal. Get over here, will you? If you don't help me, if they make me tell what I know, they'll burn me. I wonder if this Abner's telling the truth. Could be he's taking George on a wild goose chase. Oh, all I know is my friend here won't lead you astray because what he has to say is straight and to the point. Lead on, Macduff. You made every word live, son. Now let's see if George and Brooksy can do as much for Abner. Oh, that's them pulling up in front of the sheriff's office. Well, that's the sheriff's office, George. Yeah, sure needs a coat of paint, all right. But I guess this is the place that dopey guy on the telephone... Hey! That's you, Valentine? Yeah. Only where in the name... The alley, George. Oh. Here. Right here. Hurry up. Don't let anybody see you. Okay. You're Abner, huh? But I thought you said you were locked up. Right, you are, lady. Transferred all of us here when the jail burned down. Only now I'm... I'm not, see? Well, how did you get out? They turned us loose. I just dropped into town for a little game. A slight flutter of the pasteboards and wham, they picked me up. But the way they treat you in this town, you'd think you'd murdered a whole city block. We got in the way and they turned us loose. I don't blame them. Kicked me out and told me to get out of town without even giving me a free meal. Can you imagine? There ain't no justice. Oh, now listen, Buster. I drove four hours just so I could try to make sense out of what you said on the phone. Sure, now... sure, sure. So let me tell you just what... Oh, no, you don't. I'll tell you. We stopped at the scene of the fire on our way in. You weren't lying. There was a fire. Well, that's Furthermore, what Furthermore, I... a man, a prisoner who was hauled in last night, another big... A gentleman like yourself didn't get out. He died in that fire. It's plain to see you got the facts. But I don't know his name. Nobody knows his name. Sure, sure. But it was a plain, simple death, so far as anybody knows. So, Abner, whatever you know had better be He good. was dead before the fire. What? You heard me. In a big, jammed-up cell. Conditions are terrible here, I tell you. In that big, snoring mass of men, that guy was already dead as a mackerel. How do you know? 
Because when the fire started, I tried to rescue him, that's why. Because I put my hands on him and shook him and practically got frozen for my trouble. Body cold as ice, I told you. All right. All right, we get the idea. Well, why didn't you tell the police? Because they're mixed up in it, that's why. In some way. I tell you, in this town, they got a chief of police. Oh, now, wait a minute. His name's McNabb, and he's cruel and crooked as a cactus. For instance, you know what? He beats me, hauls me into his office and beats me. You don't believe me. Ask Hank. Hank, come over here. Hank? He was there. He knows. Hello, everybody. (laughs) Hank, huh? I beg your pardon? Whiskers do not measure a man, no the patches in his pants. How do you do? Pleasure, young lady. Pleasure indeed. Now listen, Mr. Valentine. Hank here was visiting my humble abode. Humble abode? A small place, not too elegant. As for that big guy, the guy who died, we did entertain him. Hank and I invited him to share our diggings a couple of days Don't ago. Don't exaggerate, Abner. Your room is a dump. And you didn't even know the guy's name. I remember you said hello, and I said hello, and he says, oh... Fascinating fellow. What do you know about his death, Hank? Well, it's just what Abner's told you, I suppose. I, it's no skin off my neck. I don't like people who won't talk. I doubt if even he said three words to the cop who threw him in. You mean when he was arrested? Rounded up a whole bunch of us. Guess they do it every Saturday night in this town. That's the cross we have to bear. And I may say a draft to your jail cell. Now I've listen, never... that guy didn't die of no cold. He didn't look any too well. I wouldn't be surprised if the fright and the excitement of the fire... It was a treatment he got, I'm telling you, the rough way that they had... What rough treatment? What kind of stuff are you guys trying to... Beat you, that's what they do. Round you up. Say, change your clothes and into the tank you go. No chance to argue or nothing. I tell you that McNabb's a regular guest stop on the way to... Oh, get off the soapbox, Abner. Live and let live. Take it easy. There's no excitement. Okay, Abner, okay. Where do I find this chief of police? Oh, no. Oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to come within five miles I of wouldn't that. ask you to. Hey, you, Hank, come on, lead the way. How did I get dragged into this? <laughs> Quit kicking, friend. I could ask the same question myself. So they say he died somehow before the fire, is that right? Yes, Chief, they said that... Now, wait just a minute how you use that word, they. It's Abner who says... Oh, get out of here. Go on, beat it. Look out, Chief, don't hit me. What? What did you say? Well, I haven't done anything, and when you talk like that, Abner will say... Go on, Hank, go on, we we don't need you. Well, well, sure, if you say so. I didn't mean any harm. Pleasant morning to you, Chief. Hmm. There's a wreck of a man. Big words, little work. Well, what are you looking at me like that for? I suppose you expect me to hit people, too. All right, now just take it easy, Chief, will you? I know what kind of a guy Abner is. But uh, I also saw that jail that burned. And it wasn't exactly a model one for as big a town as this. Uh, Sure, sure, my fault. Blame it on the Chief. Wouldn't have anything to do with how much money the town gives me to run this force, would it? Skip it, would you? There was no connection between the fire and that other bum's death. Uh Uh-huh. Unless somebody set the fire in order to get rid of some evidence, like a a blow or a bullet, just in case that death wasn't natural, I mean. Oh, but George, that doesn't make any sense. All that trouble just to get rid of some unknown, a man nobody cared about. Now, look, both of you, I want to... Excuse me, Chief. Oh, get out of here, Sergeant. I thought you ought to see that dead guy's clothes. What? Well, here. For the wing of the jail that wasn't burned. Where they changed. Hey, you mean what he was wearing when he was thrown in here? Let me see that. I'll do that, mister. Uh, Eleven cents change, eh? <laughs> Big man. Typical vagrant, I tell you. He was just... Oh, a... here, Chief. Piece of paper. So many on a Saturday night, we don't really have time to go over them, you Let know. Let me see that. Hmm. Mr. Walter F. Smith. Who? Yeah. Mystery solved, Chief. That's his name, apparently. Uh... Suggest you stick pretty closely to plenty of milk. Leave out too much starch. Be careful of pepper or any seasoning. What? What's that? That's all. Some doctor's name, Kansas City. Yeah, diet list, Chief. So he was just a nobody, huh? Oh, no. Well, what's the matter? 
I should think that would help. Chief just advice. realizes he might be in a worse spot than ever, right, McNabb? Very smart, Valentine. You catch on real quick. Negligence, Angel. If there was anything wrong with this guy, then the police should have found out about it. Maybe he needed help instead of a cell. Go on, get out of here. I got work to do. Oh, wait a minute, sir. There's something else. Now, look, Sergeant, you've caused enough trouble yourself for one day. I... I'm sorry, Chief, but over at the morgue, there's a woman. She says she's Mrs. Walter F. Smith. His wife? Well, I, I guess, or, or used to be. Anyway, she's been looking for him several months. Read about this in the newspaper. Just flew into town on a hunch to look at the body. Flew in? The wife of a typical nobody? Uh, I mean, you better see her, Chief. I mean, she wears a mink coat. Of course, there's nothing I can tell you. What could I tell you? Don't be ridiculous. I'm going back to my hotel. Look, I know how you feel, Mrs. Smith. I don't know whether he was ill or not. I don't know anything about him lately. But the chief of police asked. I'm sorry. I've been through enough seeing Walter there like that. Mrs. Smith, if you don't. My taxi's waiting. I'm sorry. Which hotel? Let her go. Leave her alone. Uh Sure. Where's a mink coat? Wife of a bum. Well, we asked her to stay and. I wanted to see what the teletype check said on his name, that's all. Well. Walter F. Smith is wanted by the law. What? Embezzlement. Well, all right, what are you so sour about? If his death was the police's fault in any way, it's better for you than if he was a respectable citizen. Hold still, I'll give you the facts. Have fun with them. In addition to Smith, his loot of $200,000 is also wanted. Do you suppose someone found out what he did with it and then murdered him last night? There you go, having fun already. Take it easy, Chief. At least you're off the hook. So now everybody else is up to something, that's all. As Abner puts it, there ain't no justice. Our boy Valentine sounded a little burned up when he said there ain't no justice. And he's right. Where's the body he always stumbles on long about now? This could ruin his reputation. You know, I'd ask my friend here to drop dead, except I know he has something pretty good to tell you. get back and see if George's temper has improved. Not that I blame him. Abner would make anybody see red. If you remember, Abner is the old coot that accused Chief of Police McNabb of barbecuing a fellow prisoner by burning down the pokey. As an added touch, Abner swears the victim was dead before he got the hot foot. Then to make matters more complicated, the Chief discovers the body belonged to a Walter Smith, who was wanted for taking 200 grand that didn't belong to him. Complicated? You bet. But George has it figured. He says it's murder. Even so, I think I better lend our boy a hand as he starts asking questions around town. I have a landlady, George. Walter Smith came to town a couple of days ago. You must have noticed something about him, or he must have had some baggage that you... I'm a working woman, Mac. I don't have time to sit around and gab with the guests. I just thought he was a drifter like the rest of them, that's all. And he had no baggage. I can tell you that in one word. No baggage. Two words. But you notice baggage, huh? Keep your eye out for that sort of thing? I gotta protect it, you know. Don't want nothing stolen from the gas. Uh Uh-huh. Nothing in his bureau? Oh, spare shirt, maybe. How should I know? I'm telling you like I told McNabb. Smith was here, but I didn't notice him until he wasn't here. Last night. And somebody said he was in jail. Who said? Guy named Abner. Seemed all upset. Oh, yeah. They're rounding up Abner again. Ain't that interesting. Look, if you're through nosing Here's your about... newspaper. Huh? Yeah, it's today's newspaper. Rome hasn't been occupied since yesterday. And uh, I don't know who else would read the fashion page around here. Thanks. Now, you've been going through this room. What did you find? Nothing. Gee, 200,000 bucks they say he's got someplace. But I'm telling you, not a thing. Not any baggage, not nothing. You expect me to believe that? George. Yeah, in here, Brooksy. George, I can't find you. Oh, if you're looking for me, dearie... Mrs. I'm... Smith, his wife. I tried every hotel in town. That taxi driver who drove her away from the morgue? No, the police had already located the driver. He says he dropped her off downtown here in the business section. Oh. What are you two talking about? You know something I don't? I doubt it. Come on, Angel. I've learned all I need to. Mm-hmm. 
So it wasn't the fault of the big, bad police, Valentine. I just talked long distance to that doctor in Kansas City, the one whose name was on the diet chart. What'd you find out, Chief? There was nothing really wrong with Smith's health. He was one of them hypochondriacs, you know, warriors, pill takers. Doc finally booted him out. All right, all right. So the police are pure. Did you locate that Abner for me? I haven't done anything for you. But I'll take you down to a garage if you want. A garage? Huh? Smith's wife. She went down to this garage and rented a car. Only now the car's back and she's disappeared. I don't know where she went when she took the car. But didn't you see Mrs. Smith when she came back to your garage? Oh, she was gone about an hour, I guess. Anyways, I didn't notice a car till just a few minutes ago parked here in the alley. Yeah, it's been someplace with a lot of dust. And I got the sergeant around combing the town for her. She's back. She's got to be around someplace. You're sure about that? Why not? Well, I didn't have much luck. And I must have been looking after she came back. Twenty-two miles. What? Well, you set the speedometer back to zero when you hire a car out, don't you? Well, that's right. So, wherever she went, it was 11 miles out and 11 miles back. Yeah, with all that dust, too. Now, look, a piece of sagebrush. What's ticking in your head? Most of the roads around here are paved. There's only a couple this of... This is grape country, irrigated most of it, so how did that sagebrush get there? Come on, hop in my car. I'll show you. The third and last road. Ten and a half miles. Yeah, plenty of sagebrush on this one. Yeah, old double A place. Sold out and cut the water off. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What's that building over there? Abandoned winery. Only the mileage. Wait a minute, hold it. Stop tracks. Right there. See him turning off? Yeah. Only there's two cars. Yeah, there's one right there. What? An old pickup truck, see? Beyond the building. Hey, hey, you! It's Abner and Hank, George. Hey! Look out, Skipper! Abner! Wait for me, Abner. I can do anything. Stop, both of you! Get away from that truck! Wait, Abner! We haven't done anything, my boy! Stop or I'll shoot! Hey, Hey, slow down, Hank. I'm not doing anything. Okay, Hank, your friend left you, that's all. Oh, cut it out, McNabb. He got away. Let him go. But if I don't get after him right now... Abner was just looking for you, Mr. Valentine. We just got here. A garage man told him you were out trying some roads or something, so he borrowed the truck and grabbed me along. Skip it. Radio the highway patrol, McNabb. They'll get him. And take Miss Brooks into town for me. What? Who do you think is chief of police in this I've town? I've told her what I want. Uh, uh, help me, I... It hurt my foot a little. Okay, okay, I'll take care of Hank here. Only get your car away from here, McNabb, quick. Okay. All right, cool off, Hank. We'll just wait. In the shade. If we can find it. How long are we going to wait, Mr. Valentine? Oh, relax. Relax, Hank. Sun will set in a couple of hours. A couple of hours. Then it'll be just as bad. Gets real cold out here in the evening. Goes through your bones. I don't know how I got into this crazy... Yeah, sure I know. Abner brought you out here with him, huh? Abner got me into this because he already had a little idea who Smith really was. Is that check? I guess so, Mr. Valentine. I don't know. Sure, sure. You were all in jail together. Abner thought maybe I could help point him toward the money. Is that right? I guess he thought that because Mrs. Smith came out here, that, well, then the money was out here, too. Yeah, yeah. It might be. Uh, you really think so? Well, in that case, while everybody's gone, maybe you and I... No, 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 it's too hot. No, we'd never find it, Hank. Let the police worry. Abner doesn't trust McNabb. That's why he took off. I know it. But he'll be back, looking for the money. Uh, look, Mr. Valentine, was this guy Smith murdered? I don't know. Holy smoke. Maybe he killed himself. Well, it could have happened. Only it doesn't tie with anything very well. Uh, come on, we're losing our shade. Let's move. Maybe Smith was just not in too good health and kicked off. A man has to take care of himself. Yeah, you're right. Ah, here's a good place. The winery? Yeah. Ought to be cool inside here, don't you think? Okay. Boy, 
pitch dark. What's in the name of... Hey, what happened? Did you fall? I'm all right. Look. I tripped. Look. Mrs. Smith. The body of Mrs. Smith. Goodness, at last a body. Too bad it had to be Mrs. Smith. But you know the old saying, here today and ghoul tomorrow. Anyway, while George is getting to the bottom of this, I want my friend here to dish a little off the top. You know, there's an ironic twist to this story. It all takes place in a town called Melody. As far as I can see, it's been one discord after another. And this fellow Hank isn't helping matters with his off-key baritone. Look, I don't like it around here, and it's cold even in here. I told you it'd be cold tonight. Quiet, will you? Don't make so much noise. But she's been dead a long time. She's Get been... over the head. Yeah, I can see for myself. So somebody else drove the car back. She drove out, and somebody else drove it back. That's more like it. Well, I'm getting nervous. Somebody will be back. Yeah, tonight. you're right. All we know about her is that her husband left her. He was hiding out, posing as a bum. So she came after him to get the money. Do you mean to say the money was here? I mean, I've caught on to this case, that's all. Mrs. Smith didn't know where her husband was. How could she know where the money was if he was dead before she got to town? Oh, for the love of... Okay, okay, I'll stop talking, Reynolds. You hear that? Yeah. We got company. Get back in here. He can't see us. Hold it. McNabb. Valentine? Oh, yeah, right here, Chief. Oh, holy smoke, Chief. We thought you might be somebody else. Where's Miss Brooks? Out in the car. We haven't located Abner yet. Did you two find what I told Brooksy about? Yeah. Pills, medicines, a small drugstore. Okay, where was it? First place you suggested. But I doubt if it'll do much good as evidence. I know it, but I got a better idea. Go on back to the car. Okay, sure. See. What's the idea? <laughs> What's so funny? Well, you might not see the joke, Hank. Uh, sit down. We're going to wait some more. For days, if we have to. Wait? What for? A confession. What? Yeah, a man named Smith was a fugitive from the law, and from his wife, too. Had money and plenty of trouble, and worst of all, he was sure he was sick. So the money couldn't give him much fun, could it? And result? He was hiding on Skid Row when he got an idea. Why not die? Look, I'm... I'm cold. And I'm so dying he of... he did. He did. He did just that. He died. Of murder. And afterwards set fire to the jail he was in, so his body couldn't be examined too what? closely. He what? And it all worked beautifully until his wife showed up. She kept her mouth shut when she saw the body. But afterwards must have spotted Smith herself, and so he brought her out here and he killed her. Probably told her the money was here, when really I suppose it's stashed away in Kansas City or any place else. I'll say you don't know anything. You, you're oh, so I should mixed have up. Oh, when I found Smith's room had no baggage. That's where the pill taker's private drugstore should have been. But of course it wasn't. They were with your stuff, Walter F. Smith. That's where McNabb found it. Oh, is that so? Yeah, the man you killed was just a poor penny any gambler. A man you knew hardly ever opened his mouth. No one knew anything about him. He'd never be missed. So you knocked him over the head, I suppose, when all the rest of the men were asleep. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Valentine. And then you put that diet chart in his clothes. Oh, not a bad stunt. Make the police think they might have done a pretty terrible thing. Make them want to cover it up and keep it quiet. I won't admit any of it. There's nothing you can do to Oh, me. Buster, what an ironic spot you sit on. Oh, you're cold? Oh, well, come on, let's have a brandy. You know, I remember the items on that diet list. Milk, no pepper, just bland stuff. So the guy it was written for must have been worried about his stomach. Come on, Hank, have a brandy. A little sharp, maybe, kind of strong for some stomachs, maybe, but for you it'll... I don't want it. Too bad you didn't have the sense to stay away from here. Just curious, I guess. Shut huh? up, shut up. Uh, look, Mr. Smith, if all I've said isn't true, well, go ahead, have a drink. There's nothing wrong with you. The diet chart wasn't shut yours. Up. And after you're really hungry, we'll go in for a nice spicy Mexican dinner, maybe. There'll be no excuse for you not to eat it, will there be? Cut this out! After all, you're okay. You can eat anything. Go on, have no, a drink. No, no, no. 
All right, come on, Mr. Smith. Miss Brooks will take it down in shorthand. And then we're going back to town and find Abner. And see how he can take some gentle persuasion. Abner, I want you to get out of Melody and keep going. And right now... Uh, look out. Don't you hit me again, Chief. Oh, I've never hit you. Nobody on my force has Abner, ever... Abner, listen, will you? The Chief here is all right. With a little publicity on this case, maybe the town will wake up and give him the money his department needs. But, uh, Abner, I am not a cop. I'd be glad to hit you. No, no, you wouldn't. That's what you think. I don't like being played for a sucker, so start moving. Now, look, I mean, I know I did a lot of lying to get you into the case. I figured we could make some dough together. I mean, Here I... goes. No, no, no. <laughs> thanks, friend, thanks. That guy sure was a headache. Oh, don't mention it. Okay, Brooksy, let's go. All right, George. So long, McNabb. So long. Well, where you been, Angel? Seems to me you kind of dropped out of things. Miss me? Hmm? Oh, well, I, I was busy with the kids. Never mind. I... As Abner used to say, there ain't no justice. Say, did you ever see a dream walking? Maybe not, but you just saw a bell burning. Brooksy. And if she'll be good enough to hold that torch she's carrying a little closer, I'll be able to read that Robert Bailey plays George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Don Clark directed the script by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, and Eddie Dunstetter's music kept things blazing. I'd like you to make a mental note right now to save a half hour for us next time when you will hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. You know something, friend? You look lousy with that gun in your back. Of course, if you're trying to cure your lumbago the hard way, forget I told you. However, if that gat's starting to make a bad impression, why not remove it the easy way? Let George do it. He'll get rid of it or your money back. George doesn't mind taking chances. He figures the odds this way. If he does a job, he's money ahead. If he doesn't, you won't be around to collect anyway, so why worry? On the other hand, everybody doesn't have your problem. Take old Mr. Stengel, for instance. To look at him as he drives down a backcountry road, you'd never think he had a care in the world. Oh, carry me back to old Virginia. That's where they... Hey, what? Hey! Hey, hey, you! Get away from there, lady! Look out! And get away from that railing! Don't you know there's a river down there? What do you think? Oh, let go of me! Hey! Oh, holy smoke. You're Mrs. Blair, ain't you? Who'd you think I'd be? A water sprite? <laughs> well, 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 I'm sorry, but, gee, I, I seen you there by the railing. I, I mean, it's a good 35-foot drop, you know. And this bridge ain't been repaired for years. I know, I know. And you're out delivering milk. No, 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 no. Don't look over, you'll get dizzy. Well, I, I sure didn't mean to offend you in a way. It's my view, as it is yours, isn't it? Here, here, I'll give you a ride over to your place if you like. Oh, let go of me. Oh, I'm sorry. You frightened me, that's all. I was just standing here, and you frightened me. No, no, thank you. I'll walk. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Holy smoke. Well, I know 
know one thing. I'm sure glad Mrs. Blair didn't jump. Think of the repercussions if you'd been fishing that day. Would have been awful to explain to Mr. Blair that you just caught his wife. On the other hand, it's easy as pie for my friend here to explain almost anything. If you don't believe me, just lend an ear. That's using your head, pal. Now let's see if old Mr. Stengel used his. Well, what do you know? He just walked into George Valentine's office. I know it's none of my business, You but... thought the woman was trying to jump, is that it, Mr. Stengel? Well, I'll tell you, Miss Brooks, I don't want to commit myself. I don't know. Then why did you call me? Oh, now, don't chase me around the barn so much, Mr. Valentine. I don't want to start any excitement, but they're nice people. Husband's a wonderful fella. Nicest guy you'd ever care to meet. Okay, okay. Tell me some more about Mrs. Blair. Well, Mr. Valentine, she really ain't been around here so much. More of a city type, you know what I mean. At least they're not joiners or bridge players. And the places are pretty far apart out here. I thought she was away someplace. Where's uh, Mrs. Blair been, do you know? Uh, search me. It's none of my business. You apparently liked her husband. Uh, why didn't you call him after this happened? Well, I did. But there weren't no answer. Then after I called you, I noticed his tractor out to just working the field over, that's all. But by then, I figured I might as well keep my mouth shut. Mr. Blair's a farmer like you are? Oh, no, 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 no. Artist. You know, when them fellas paints pictures? Pretty good ones, too. Only he's not so good on cows. Draws them all with straight line. Emmett Blair? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's his name. I wouldn't be surprised he's got a reputation. <laughs> yes, he has. Owns a nice farm. Really works it, too. Oh, he's a wonderful fellow, he is. He don't associate much, and he's kind of sad looking at times. I don't speak his language, maybe, but, uh, well, he speaks mine. Well, Mr. Stengel, the point is you don't want to offend this guy, Blair, but you're curious. You don't know him very well, and you know his wife less. But today you saw her very unhappy and maybe thinking about suicide. Now, 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 then... hold on, hold on. I don't believe in jumping at conclusions, but there's been things that, well, I, I don't want nothing bad to happen, that's all. There's been things like what? Well, I'm not a gossip. But in the past, well, it was something the local doctor told me once. Always stuck in my mind. Oh, but uh, I'm not going to tell you. That's up to him. Doc Durfee. I uh, don't want Doc thinking that uh, I shot my mouth off with ethical secrets. All right, Mr. Stengel. You just want us to look into it. We will. We'll call Dr. Durfee. But in the meantime, I'm going to play it straight. What do you mean? Well, see something you don't understand? Why not go find out? Come on, Angel. We're going to call on the Blairs. No, no, no. It, it couldn't have been my wife. Stengel must be mistaken. You say your telephone's upstairs, Mr. Blair? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes, Miss Brooks. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, turn to the left. Oh, thank you. Mistaken, Mr. Blair? Stengel's met her before. Uh, but my wife's not here now. In fact, she won't be here until later this evening. I'm going to meet her train. Where's Mrs. Blair been? Well, I scarcely think that's important to you. Uh, see here... Uh, why didn't the old fool go after her if, if she was so upset? He said he did afterwards, but couldn't find her. She'd run off toward the highway anyhow. Oh, well, the buses run. Yeah. Now, of course, she could be... Oh, no, no, this is ridiculous. Well, why is it ridiculous, Mr. Blair? What? Well, my wife just isn't the type to, to commit suicide, Mr. Valentine. Well, it might not have been that. Oh, incidentally, Stengel did try to find you, but you were out in the field. Yes, yes, I, uh, I've been out cultivating all day. Uh, excuse me, will you please? I, I want to get into that desk. Mm. Oh, sure, Mr. Blair. Of course, I uh, appreciate you coming over about this, you know. I don't understand it, but I... Well, I stopped to talk to a kid coming up the lane. He was under the impression your wife was here uh, yesterday. I don't blame you for your curiosity. I... No, no, Mary wasn't here. In fact, she's seldom been here in the past ten years. Which is not very important either. No, no, he, he must have noticed Cecile, that's all. Cecile? Yes, I, I'm an artist. Artists have models. Well, go on, say something nasty. Why should I? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm awfully sorry. Forgive me, I am just upset. Cecile's a very lovely person, a very close friend, nothing more. Very few people understand. I, I've been working on a portrait for the past week. But Cecile's gone now. Oh, yes, here, here we are. It's a phone number. 
you suppose Miss Brooks is through yet with that phone? Yes, I oh. am. Huh? Oh, well, uh, will you excuse me then? I, I want to phone the number where my wife's been visiting for the, the past... The Clearview Rest Home. Yes. What else did you find out, Angel? She went there six weeks ago because of a nervous breakdown. Now, see here, what is this? What right have you I've to... I've been talking to Dr. Durfee. You've what? George, that thing that Mr. Stengel was hinting at was that Dr. Durfee found some poison here once in this house. What? Uh, now, I've only... Uh, he wouldn't tell me much more, but he used the word homicidal about the situation stop here. It, stop it. Now, listen to me, both of you. Durfee's a, a country quack. He doesn't... Situation have... here? Oh, to my wife, naturally. All right, since you've pried this far, we, we haven't been close for years, but I, I tried to do everything I could to help her, naturally, but... They said at the rest home that Mary was perfectly all right, only only a breakdown. I, I mean, she... Well, this absurd situation goes back years and years, and I... I oh, get out, will you? What's the use? I, I want to call that place and find out if Let she's... Let me the... call for you, Mr. Blair. What? I'm sorry I blurted out things like that, but I want you to show George your portrait. What? I bumped into the wrong room, I guess. This must be a lot worse than you think it is, because there's a painting upstairs of a woman... Oh, yes, yes, of course, Cecile. It's the one I just finished of her. And the canvas has been slashed to pieces. Oh, no. Oh, look at that. One of the best jobs I've ever done. You didn't slash it yourself. Why would I do that? Okay, okay. And you say the picture was all right when the model left? Yes. My wife, of course. Who else would do a thing like that? She never loved me. I doubt if I've loved her, but... Well, that's it. Jealous for the sake of jealousy. Is that why you sent the model away? No one else will ever have you, she said. I've been as patient as I could with her ridiculous emotional imaginings, her... Come on, I'll run out back and get the car. Huh? Well, Mary's obviously been here in the house, walked in and saw this portrait and slashed it. Well, let's get back up the highway. She must have gone someplace. Okay, go on ahead. I'll get Miss Brooks. All right, thanks. She left that Clearview place this morning, George. Oh. They thought she was coming here then directly. But she's perfectly all right, they say. She was, huh? I don't see how just a picture would be enough to upset her that bad. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I wonder if there's anything else around here to show what she did. With... Shall I call Mr. Blair? No, no, let me go. Hello? Hello, Emmett? Uh, no, this is George Valentine. I'm a friend of his. Is there a message oh. you'd like to... Oh, well, this is Anne, Mrs. Blair's sister. Anne? Yes. I mean, I'm at the railroad station, and she's not here. But I haven't eaten, and I want to go to a hotel. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. A railroad station? Mr. Valentine, is my brother-in-law there, Emmett? You want to talk to him? No, no. Mary sent me this wire from Clearview several days ago asking me to come and meet her here at the train. But she wasn't on... Yes, her. yes, I know. She apparently came earlier. Uh, what hotel were you talking about? Well, is anything wrong? Well, oh, the Plains Hotel, I guess. I have to eat first. I'm here with some friends. Okay, okay. I'll leave a message for you there. See you later. But what is it? Mary's all right, isn't she? In this telegram, she said she wanted me to be with her when she went out there to her home. She didn't want to go there alone. What should I do? I don't know, Anne. But don't worry. Now, my name's George Valentine, like I said. Remember it. it. Seems a little ridiculous to have called the sheriff's office. We want to find her, don't we? Well, yes, yes, of course. But if you hadn't stayed so long in the house, I... What kept you, anyway? Um, uh, nothing. Just getting a search started, that's all. Poor Mary. She's always been so... Listen. Yeah, somebody's horn stuck. Hey, that's the bridge up there, isn't Stengel. it? Stengel. That's Stengel's truck. It's just parked there. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Hey, what's the matter with you, Stengel? I saw your headlights. Afraid you'd turn off the other way. I wanted help. George, there's blood in his face and his clothes yeah, are... I'm all right. Scratched, that's all, but I twisted my ankle... Took me a half hour to get down there. Well, what happened? I tried to stop her. She was standing in the same place. I always drive out this time of night. Who? And... 
Oh, and I'm sorry, but by the time I crawled down there through the woods, over those rocks, current's too strong. Not hiding her hair over. Mary? She jumped. I tried to stop her. She screamed and she jumped. Come on. No, no, now there's no use, Mr. Valentine. Current's too strong. By this time, there's, well, there's a waterfall half a mile down. Oh, no. Oh, the poor thing. I don't understand it, but now it's happened, hasn't it? There was nothing anyone could do. Stengel saw her commit suicide. That's all there is to it. Suicide. Or a perfect murder. I guess this goes to show you can't argue with a woman. Mrs. Blair made up her mind she was going to drown her sorrows even if it killed her. And it did. Of course, someone might have helped to prove her point. But I have a fellow right here who never needs help to prove his. Prove a point, pal. You know, there are a couple of angles to this case that don't add. First of all, how come old man Stengel was around every time Mrs. Blair took a notion to dunk herself in the drink? And what was he doing with all those scratches on his puss? Did Mrs. Blair do it, or had he been playing patty cake with a wildcat? And where does Mr. Blair fit in? If he could mix plowing with painting, he also might be able to blend money and mayhem. But who did he hire to push wifey off the trestle? All I know is that even if Blair couldn't paint a cow... He's a past master at throwing the bull. Speaking of bull, here's a prime specimen. Only this bull doesn't have horns. Oh, the fact is the case is now officially closed and I'm going home. But why is it closed, Lieutenant Johnson? Sheriff's office found the body down the river below the falls. Oh. Drowned further up, I suppose. Wasn't easy to even find her after she'd been over that falls. All those sharp rocks. Yeah, okay, skip it. I get the idea. I don't know. Women like that, maybe she's happier. Had a lot of funny notions all her life, apparently. Have you seen her husband? Stop by to tell him he's all right. Okay, so it doesn't upset him much. So what? They'd have been separated long ago if it hadn't been for her, for him trying to take care of her. Yeah, yeah, sure. Nice guy. Well, what's the matter with you? Oh, I don't know. Come on, Angel. Hey, where are you going? See that sister of hers that I talked to last night on the phone. I already met her. She's on her way downtown to the morgue with one of the boys. What can she do? What can she tell you? There just isn't any case to look into. Oh, sure, sure, Lieutenant. No case at all. But I'll bet five bucks you follow me out that door. I, I don't know anything about them, really. I don't. It's been years since Mary and I... Yeah, now look, I, I know this hasn't been pleasant, Anne. I'm sorry, I can't help it. The doctor or somebody took me in there. Oh, it's a horrible way to see a sister you haven't seen. She sent you a wire. She didn't want you to go back to her home alone. She didn't want to go back alone, is that right? But that's all she said. I don't know. I just assumed she still didn't feel very well and wanted some help. Well, why didn't you assume she was having trouble with her husband? Because I didn't know she was. Hadn't you even heard of a woman named Cecile? Who? Oh, Mr. Valentine, you talked strangely last night and I didn't understand it. I know my brother-in-law has gone out with various women, but Mary knew that too. Okay, Anne, okay. But I, I want to take the bus out and see him. At least I've taken care of everything here at the coroner's office and he ought to know that. I mean, is there any reason I shouldn't? No, there isn't. Huh? Go on, miss, and thanks oh, a lot. Oh, now, wait a minute, Johnson. I'm just go getting... Go on, go on. There's nothing more to be done. You'll just get all worked up sitting around here. Whatever you say, Lieutenant. Okay, okay, so I'm getting nowhere. That isn't any reason to His barge... His car in... is parked across the street. Come here. What? Look out the window. That green sedan over there. Blair? Coroner's office didn't realize there was another relative around, so they called him in. He's sitting there. But he's already been inside, don't you understand? While you were talking to the sister. He's waiting for her, I guess. Yeah? There she goes, but he doesn't stop her. Huh? 
Yeah. Doesn't call her. Doesn't do anything. Got his coat collar up. But he's watching her. Well, now, look, I don't understand. Coroner's man said it was all Blair could do to stand up when he came out of the morgue. So what? Valentine, I've been thinking over everything you told me. Once that there was poison at the Blair house and nobody ever knew who had it there, did they? Oh. Oh, so now you're getting the idea, huh? Hey, look, there she goes down the street. And still he sits. Sure, I know Mrs. Blair killed herself, but I wonder which one it was that was really weird in that family. If his wife was driven into a nervous break... Skip it, come on. Hey, yo, yo, wait a minute. Blair, just noticed you out here. What? I, I... Oh, Valentine. When did you come back inside? Well, Lieutenant... Oh, yes, yes, I... Just sitting here for a moment. No, no, I, I'm sorry. I have appointments to Your, keep. Your uh, <laughs> sister-in-law's in town. She was just up what? talking to us. Yeah. Oh, is that so? I, I mean, yes, yes, of course. I, I know. I make up your mind what you're going to say. <laughs> well, what's the matter? Is he here? I'm not overparked in this place, am I, or something? What's the matter with you, Mister Blair? I, I, I'm afraid I don't feel very well. It's nothing at what's all. What's the matter with you? Nothing. I... All right. I've been crying. Isn't that all right with you? Crying? Well, I suppose you're so used to experiences like this, you wouldn't expect a man to behave normally. Get out of my way. Hey, Mr. Blair, wait. Leave me alone. Look out. You, how do you like that? What in the... I'm going to get that guy. He's nuts. Did you hear the way he... Yeah, sometimes murder can be so simple, can't it? What? You heard me. Murder. Well, go on. Catch him. Step on it. Me, I'll take a different direction. Valentine. I just waked up to the fact there's liable to be another murder unless I can stop it in time. There's the turn off, George. Yeah, let's park it here a second. The bridge is only a couple of hundred yards. You think we got here in time? Sure, sure. But I want to look at something first. Well, if you take a bus, I suppose it stops at the intersection back there. That's right. And then it's only half a mile walk across the bridge to Stengels and Blair's. George, you could walk on the road. You don't have Wait to walk. Now. Just wanted to see the river, that's all. You can't hear the falls from here. No. Half a mile down. A couple of bends, I guess. Water looks deep under the bridge, doesn't it? Yeah. George, look. Mm. No, no, by the road. Walking from the highway. There she is. Oh, yeah. Come on, let's get back up there. Are you sure, George, that you figured out... I'm not sure of anything, Angel. I just don't want to take chances, that's all. But you didn't get any answer at that telephone number that I asked you to call before, and then... What's the matter? What are you stopping for? It's Ann George. Aren't you going to stop her before she gets out on the bridge? Green sedan. Hmm? Sure. Sure, she came straight out. Only where is... Hey. Oh, George, there he is. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. Wait a minute. Uh, I, I was coming to see you, Emmett. Yes, I know. This is the place, isn't it? Emmett, what's the matter with you? You don't have to ask that. Get away from me. I was coming to see you. Get away from no, me. No, wait a minute. Running won't do you any good. Come on, step on it. Stop. I tell you, stop. I'll get you. No, out of the... George. Emmett, don't. Emmett. And nothing will help you. No. You're going to die. No. Stop it. Like she did. No. Let go of her, Buster. No. Stop it. Take it easy, would you please? You're all right. Uh, I don't know what he was going to do. I was going to see him, but I don't know what he was going to do. I know, do. I know. That was your mistake, lady. What? Yeah, the poor guy's out of his mind, practically. I suppose he might have thrown you over the edge. Get away from there. No, not too far down. The water's deep. You could swim, all right. Oh, don't get so near the edge. That's where Mary Take jumped. Take it easy now. Take it easy. Everything's all right. You know, Emmett's mistake here was to cry. What? That's right. Pretty hard thing for a man to fake, too. George. Come on, let's get off this bridge. Well, don't worry. I'll come back for him. He's pretty well out, but he'll be in shape to wind this up in a hurry. What do you mean? You know what I mean. Miss Brooks calls Cecile's house in Los Angeles. Nobody answers. Cecile? Take it easy now. You're all right. Don't talk to me as though I'm... I know, I know. It was only a nervous breakdown. George, what in heaven's name are you talking about? Murder can be so simple, can't it? Big flash of temper. Big flash of jealousy. But Mr. Stengel saw Mary commit suicide. No, no, no. He saw Mary jump, Angel. But it was dark. He couldn't see her in the water. He couldn't see whether she swam or sank. No, no. But it's Emmett there who tipped it. Big, suspicious husband. Shook like a leaf when he went to the morgue. Cried. Really cried afterwards. Called Denver. 
I guess there really is a sister, Anne, isn't there? Of course there is. Who is still in Denver, right? Oh, no. All right, I'll make it real simple. Emmett Blair was in love, pretty hopelessly, I guess, with a girl named Cecile. He practically told me so. I should have believed him all along. Her picture was slashed by Emmett's wife, Mary, who came home unexpectedly too soon. It's Cecile's body that's at the morgue. What did you say, George? That's not true. That's what shocked Blair so, what tipped him off, what upset him so much he might have committed murder himself. Stop it! Yeah, Stop it! Yeah, that's right. It's Cecile's body. And you're Emmett's wife. You're Mary Blair. <laughs> What's more, you kill Cecile. Oh, no! Those are mighty powerful words, George, and you better be ready to back them up. Right now, however, I would suggest you go get Mr. Blair back on his feet, while my friend here gets some things off his chest. George said earlier that this was almost a perfect crime. What could be more perfect than to be able to bump yourself off and live to tell the tale? I wonder where Mrs. Blair slipped up. Or if you'll take that ice bag off your head, Emmett, maybe you could tell us. I didn't guess before I came to the morgue. How could I? Stengel had seen the whole thing. Mr. Blair, Stengel saw it twice. That's where your wife got the idea. Because what he saw the first time was Mary on the bridge, just after she'd managed to shove Cecile over the rail. Yeah, she got her out there to do it, I guess, and then hit her with something. Because she knew what had happened to a body that went over the waterfalls down below. You mean identification would be almost impossible? Yeah, she had a very neat plan, all right. Once the big temper wore off, the crazy jealousy, she decided that she would identify the body, which she did, posing as Sister Anne. An identification which nobody would question. She thought you'd protect her, as always. Mary was a fine swimmer. Yeah, that's right. That's what happened the second time Stengel saw it. She realized before that he thought she was trying to kill herself. So why not capitalize on it? Wait until his return trip in the evening and dive over. In the dark, she could swim ashore and go back up to the highway before he'd get down to the river. Yes, perfect murder. She tried it before, you know. Trying to use poison on you, you mean? Yes, but I, I couldn't really believe it. <laughs> it was my trouble, I suppose, never believing Mary was dangerous. It ended up with me almost committing murder. Oh, no, you wouldn't have killed her. I know you didn't tell Johnson and me what you just discovered at the morgue. And I had to knock you down to stop you, but you wouldn't have killed her. Thank you. Come on, George. Yeah, sure. Goodbye, Mr. Blair. Goodbye. George, I bet he would have killed her. Yeah. After all she'd done to him? No. After killing Cecile? No. <laughs> after trying to come back to the house as her no, own sister? No, no, no. You see, a man can go just so far, and then his own sensor goes to work on it. Don't you understand? A man can go just so far, and then his sensor makes him stop? Yeah, sure. Well, as far as your romantic inclinations go, I can understand that, all right. Georgie, I got a big TL for you. Now, either you tell that censor of yours to loosen up and give a little, or... You better start thinking of a few choice last words, because any day now you're going to need them. And if you can't think of any right off, well, you might say that uh, George Valentine is played by Robert Bailey, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Don Clark directed the script by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, and that uh, pounding in E-flat minor was Eddie Dunstetter at work. I hope you'll save us some time for another visit with Valentine. When you will again hear what happens when you let George do it.
Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Remember Charlie, who used to live around the corner? Poor fella. Always had a problem. He was forever trying to make square pegs fit into round holes. Nobody thought he'd do it. Then one day he did. He shoved his mother-in-law down the garbage disposal. But that's doing it the hard way. It would have been much easier to let George do it. At least George Valentine could have gotten Mama out of the house in one piece. Yeah, you never know when George will come in handy. Now, take Jerry Mace, for instance. He's the guy standing over there on the crowded railroad platform. He's waiting to catch a train home to Wifey. But I don't think he's going to make it. Come on, come on, give me my change. I'm trying to get the 515. Thanks. Oh, oh excuse me. Pardon me, lady. Uh, excuse me, that's my... All right, so it's not the 515. Well, look who wants to read the newspaper. <laughs> Who's following who, friend? You or me? Come on, loosen up. What are you? Hey, look out! Let go of my... Ah! And so instead of making the 515... Jerry Mace caught the Heavenly Express. Hope he had the right ticket, because it's a long ride with no return. Speaking of tickets, my friend here always has the right one for you. All aboard, Conductor. That was a streamlined spiel if I ever heard one. Now let's see if we can find out what caused Mr. Mace to do a jackknife onto the railroad tracks. It's Jerry Mace. Yeah, that's who it is, all right. Or was. One of my boys who went out to get the body said he thought he recognized him. Thought he was a friend of yours, Valentine. That's why I got you down here to my office so fast. Wait a minute, Lieutenant Johnson. Didn't he have any identification? Pockets were practically empty, Miss Brooks. Wallet, stuff in his side pocket gone. So he must have been slugged first, robbed, and then shoved in front of the train, huh? That's right, Miss Brooks. Otherwise, it might have looked like he'd just fallen or maybe even jumped off that station platform to kill himself. Sure, he was a nice guy. But you don't have to beat around the barn to prove it was murder. What do you mean? He just got a new job a couple of months ago. Private investigator for the independent insurance company. For what? Yeah, you heard me. Was anything at all left in his pockets? Handkerchief, a couple of theater stubs. Things are over there. He used to carry a blue notebook, George. Remember? That he'd write up his cases and... Jefferson theft case. Huh? I remember now. Insurance bulletin. Independent insurance company. Yeah. Yeah, that's the insurance company in the case, all right. What are you talking about? Swedish match killing. 50000 taken. And before that, the Prairie Bank job. All one man. Prairie dog, the boys call him. Clear it up, Lieutenant. Uh, the one man I've wanted to get more than anyone else in the world. Six unsolved crimes in the past two years. One of them a murder. Each time by the same guy. Dumb crimes. Clues all over the place. But we've never been able to catch him. What's that got to do with the independent... He's sloppy. Leaves cigarettes on the floor when he cracks a safe. Uses a funny black kind of Swedish safety match. Wears a pair of greasy gloves. Oh, we know lots of things, but we can't catch up. Lieutenant, I ask you what... His it last to... crime was another robbery murder. That insurance company a friend here worked for got hooked. Oh, so that might have been the case Jerry was working on. Prairie Pawn Shop. What, George? Hock your shirt, we'll loan you another. Yeah, it's a pawn ticket. Slipped down through a hole in his pocket, I guess, into the lining of his coat. No date on it. Yeah, well, me, I'm going to find out for sure what Jerry Mace was working on. From the independent insurance company. It's after six o'clock, Lieutenant. I know their office will be closed, but in a little while I ought to be able to find somebody. What's the prairie? What is it? Didn't you ever hear it called that? Commercial Street, lower end, from front to third. You mean it's a district right here in town? Sure. In the daytime, it's industrial. Night's another matter. Shadows don't even trust the street lamps. Every man for himself and the devil has to pay admission. Yeah, nice place. That's where this prairie dog killer of yours comes from? Maybe, I don't know. That's why I want to check what Mace was doing. Okay. Come on, Angel, we're leaving too. Where are you going, Valentine? To hock my shirt and see what I get in exchange.
closed. George, the shop's closed. Yeah. Anyway, I don't understand why you're so interested. Angel, why would Jerry hawk anything? He's always had all the dough he needs. Oh, well... Unless he was interested in the place. Or unless it was somebody else's ticket he picked up for some reason. Or unless this place had some connection with the merchant. Sixty bucks a month. What in the... You want it or don't you? Utilities paid until the fifth. Sixty in advance and I won't take a check. If you don't want it, loiter somewhere else. I'm nervous about the plate glass. Want what, for heaven's sake? I own the building. What do you think? I'm out walking for my constitution? Hold it, hold it, brother. The hawk shop here is for rent? Yeah, tenant just closed up today. Name was Felix. Very substantial citizen. Always paid in advance. Can't you read the sign? Here. Yeah. yeah, George. Out of business. Store to let. Yeah, we didn't notice. All right, now you do. Think you want it? Let me know. Choice location. Yeah, sure. Well, George, at least this is one lead you can cross off your... What's the matter? I read you the sign. I'm reading between the cracks. Huh? Yeah, there's a light between the cracks. Premises aren't quite empty yet. Let's try one of the side street doors. He said the man's name was Felix, didn't he, George? Yeah. Hello, is anybody... Now, what are you doing here? So here, I guess. We're just... Shh, shh, shh. Come on, stop blowing your nose. He's talking to somebody else. Yeah. Uh, take it easy, take it easy. Just wanted to see you, that's all, Felix. Can't you read signs? Now, go away, stranger, I'm busy. Try more the next block. I don't want to hawk anything. Oh, here, like a smoke? Smoke is cheaper than eating, you know. Keeps the stomach quiet. Beat it, I said... You want a handout? Stick the soup kitchens. I've got an inventory. Ah, oh, please, Felix. Listen. Uh, they tell me, uh, well, uh, somebody says you uh, loan money on uh, things. What do you think a hawk shop does? Bake donuts? Yeah, but I mean... Uh... Stranger, for the love... Now, oh. what have you got? Uh, wristwatch. Yeah, let me see it. Yeah, my grandfather gave it to me. Wonderful man. Uh, pretty valuable, don't you think? George. Yeah, Brooksy, watch this. Your grandfather, huh? Only, of course, it's a lady's wristwatch. I know. I guess he must have bought it for my grandmother. Don't you think? Piece of junk. But all right. Come out back here a second. Oh. Piece of junk or worth something sometimes, though. Don't you think? You see, uh... Uh, your name Felix? Yes, that's right. What is this? Open house? Well, we uh, want to see you, that's all. I know. Everybody does. I'm out of business at the side door, too. If you a gentleman wish to discuss something, I'm... Uh... No, no, no. Give me that thing. And you stick around, tall boy. Sit down, sister. I'll only be a minute. Oh, uh, really? I could come back on... Give it to me, I said. Yeah. Get it here in the lights. Uh-huh. Ah. <laughs> Look at that. Rhinestones aren't even real. Your grandfather got taken. Ah, shut up. Hello, Prairie Pond Shop. Oh, hello, Sergeant. Well, oh, the same to you. But look, Sergeant, I'm locking up my place and I... Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, okay, let me have the description. Brown hair, skinny, short. <laughs> Look, I've got other things to do than watch for a stolen wristwatch, huh? Wait a minute, you say the guy sniffles? Hey! Hey, you! Stop it! Stop it! Stop that guy! Officer, grab it! Uh, let somebody else wear himself down. Well, you were a great help, tall boy. Let him go. All right, so who cares? Great neighborhood, huh? Classy type of people. Sister, what do you think of having a shop where guys like that come in? What's the matter? Want to use this phone, that's all. Well, if it's all the same to you, I... Just let me, that's all. What's the idea? Well, the phone's dead, isn't it? Kind of a convenient call from his friend, the sergeant, would you say, Brooksy? I wondered why you brought that guy back in here. Look, Where's oh, the boy. button? Oh, yeah, here we are. Sure, step on the button, it rings. Not bad, not bad. Bum walks in, obviously trying to peddle a stolen watch. So you step on the bell and pretend to get a call from a police officer. And then the bum runs away, leaving you the watch. <laughs> nice, clear profit. Hot as steel from a thief. Great neighborhood. Classy type people. <laughs> all right, all right. It's no skin off of your neck, is it? No. Uh, the prairie. Got to watch yourself in the clinchers in these parts, tourist. George, what did Lieutenant Johnson mean about Swedish matches? What? 
Look. And it's black, too. It was a safety match. Let me see that. Yeah. Now sit down, Buster. You and I are going to have a little no, talk. No, no, George. It was the other man, the sniffy one who dropped it. It was when he lit his cigarette coming in here. I remember. You sure? I'm positive. Come on. Headed up the alley, Valentine, but I cut him off. Chased him three blocks since Felix gave his yell, but I lost him. Hey, listen, there's another cop's whistle. They must have got him on the next street. Oh, no, they haven't. He got down this side, then ducked in someplace just a second ago before... Oh! Through here, back of the barber shop. Yeah. You like to shave, huh? Well, I'll give you a shave. Close to the skin from down here. Yeah? I'll show you coming into my shop. There he is. Like... He's got him. All right, Tony, you can get off his chest now. A lady I have under the machine. He come running into my shop. She could pull her hair out by the root. He was just trying to find a way through the alley, I guess. Oh, I catch him. The Tony catch him. I, I chase him. First, he tried to fight Stop me. Stop waving that razor around. I could slice his ears. All right, all right, we said. Come on. On your feet, Sniffy. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Much obliged. Uh, obliged, he says. Oh, hey, look, mister. I'm still on watch. I, I didn't do nothing. Oh, assault, battery, trespassing, scaring to death a woman under the machine. Keep your shirt on, Tony. There's probably a reward for catching prairie dogs. What? What are you talking about? I'm getting out of here. Oh, again. no, you don't. Yeah, that's better. Yes, yeah, Sniffy, we'll forget the watch. You're under arrest for what's called suspicion of murder. That boy Valentine's just full of good news, ain't he? He can toss more accusations around than a politician at a Fourth of July picnic. Now, do you really think little old Drizzle Puss is the nefarious prairie dog? I can't go for it. Get it? Go for it? Prairie dog? Swell. Well, while you kick it around, let's see what old groundhog here can unearth. Dig me, pal? Say, do you remember when you were a kid how you liked to put pennies on the railroad track just to see what would happen when the choo-choo train ran over it? Well, there's a character around town called the Prairie Dog who has, uh, shall we say, modernized this little prank. Instead of using pennies, he started using people. And you know what happened? It worked. However, this does not set well with George Valentine, as he figures it will give the railroads a bad name if they have to start putting body catchers instead of cow catchers on the front of locomotives. So, he sets out to do something about it. So far, all he's been able to find is a little sniffle-nosed character who's long on alibis and short on handkerchiefs. Meanwhile, the cops are busy, too. Bless their little hearts. There, you see that? file we've drawn up on all the prairie dog cases. Let's see. That same kind of match has been found in every single one of them. Why, I wonder? Because the guy's dumb, Miss Brooks. Also, because he smokes. <laughs> Big logic. No, no, look there. Each one was a robbery that took some time. Makes sense? Yeah. And one, a safe was blown, and another, a combination was worked out. Well, is Sniffy a clever enough man to... Guy gets nervous. He smokes while he works. Grinds his cigarettes out into the floor. Here. Like that. Always the same way. Oh, the janitor will love you. You can't buy those matches in stores. Try it sometime. Sniffy's cigarette was the same brand, too. Cheap, but not too popular. I didn't see any greasy gloves on him. That friend of yours, Jerry Mace, who got killed, was definitely working on finding the prairie dog. His office said he was working on a hot lead today, but they didn't know what it was. You'll have to say more than that, Lieutenant. Before you'll buy that it was probably the guy he was after who killed him? Right? Mm-hmm. Well, Sniffy can't offer a single explanation as to where he was at the time of any one of the prairie dog crimes. Also, we've already turned up a witness who says he saw Sniffy on that station platform this evening where Mace was killed. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? How good a witness. Uh, that's why I didn't. For skeptics like Valentine, I'm waiting to get some more witnesses. So I... Come on, let's get down and see Sniffy, huh? All right, all right. If you don't believe me, watch him hammer the nails in his own coffin. 
Now, uh, you understand, I want to cooperate all I can, gentlemen. Just a simple misunderstanding. Oh, I, I don't blame you. I know how these things can happen. Why'd you steal that wristwatch you tried to sell to Felix Snuffy? Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked me, because I've been trying to explain to this other gentleman. Can it? Valentine, we can't find any record of it being stolen. Well, of course you can. See, my uh, my grandfather... Can it, I said. Yeah, well, I just want you to understand. Uh, I, I have stolen things before. <laughs> I've even been to jail for it. That's... Certainly wouldn't do a thing like that again. Ah, oh, so you've got a record too, huh? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They'll they'll find it out sooner or later. I might as well be honest, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, just like that business of the station platform, uh, it's uh, uh, suddenly occurred to me that I was there this evening. Oh, is that so? Yeah, it was just hard for me to remember. It's, oh, not that I was there when any murder took place, but. Well, I find the inner urbans a very cheap place to sleep, and there are always plenty of newspapers to read, and. So, you see, I, I generally am at almost every station in town every day. Uh, speaking of coffin nails, Johnson... Oh, would you like a cigarette? Excuse me. Of course. Hmm. Oh, thanks. No brand, huh? No matches, too. I only want to be helpful, that's all. Hold it. Where'd you get these? Didn't they take his stuff away from him, Johnson, when they dressed him in the faded suit? Oh, I suppose one of the guards... Yeah, see. Hey, get away from me. Don't... Hey, those are mine. You can't... Uh... Sort of full pockets you wear, Buster. Cut it out, Snippy. Candy bar, package of gum. Well, none of that stuff is worth more than a few cents. Not, not any of it. A man's got to be comfortable, doesn't he? Where'd you get it? Yeah, even a cigar. A what? Hey, that's mine. That's one of my cigars. Uh, a very good cigar, Lieutenant. I, I meant to thank you. But how in the love of... Our friend here is a pickpocket, Johnson. Simple as that. The big suspect. Oh, for peace. Of course, none of it's worth more than a few cents. You see, I've mended my ways. I wouldn't touch anything valuable. Telephone for you, Lieutenant. Yeah. Kill this guy for me, Valentine. Is it wrong for a man to like his little comfort? You uh, took this stuff from the guards, huh? From anybody who's been near you, right? Well, perhaps. Just like the uh, Swedish matches and special cigarettes you might have taken from anybody. Well, it's an embarrassing thing. But who? Come on, remember. Where'd you get those matches? I wish I knew. He might have been anybody, I guess. Anybody I bumped against. Oh, brother. Oh, Felix himself, I suppose. Come to think of it, a man like Felix is much more the criminal type. Shut up. You do what? Go on, go on. We're letting you out of here. You've given me enough bad ideas for one night. Felix isn't the prairie dog. I can tell you that right now. Well, I was only... Because Felix happens to be dead. Murdered. That's Felix, all right. How about it, Sergeant? Now, the prairie dog, sir, fits all the patterns. Been hit over the head. One instrument, grease stains on the paperweight there, same as on the briefcases. Motive robbery, huh? Sure, sure. A pirate like this guy, Felix, must have made a pretty penny oh, in his time. Oh, uh, look Don't stand there, sir. Huh? A couple of marks on the floor, that's all. Hey, where's this landlord? Did you find him? Yeah. Come in here, will you? Sure. Say, ain't this a tragedy, though? It shows you never can tell. His name's Calgary, George. I've been talking to him in the other room. But I didn't say much. How could I? Left Felix here before you people came. You people saw never me. Never mind the alibi, friend. He says he was here helping Felix pack before, George. Pack? Yeah, going to Florida. Fly to Nassau. He made his pile. What do you mean? Going to retire. That's why he closed out his shop. Casting all the stuff he owned. Had a briefcase full of securities and stuff, and a roll of green goods, and his suitcase other would have choked a horse. Who knew that Felix would be ripe for robbery right now? Jerry Mace, for one, George. Maybe that's why he was interested in Felix's place today. Yeah, I thought of that, but who else? Well, could... I guess most everybody in the neighborhood, friend, must have had some idea what was going on. Felix was a pirate. Wouldn't take much to figure he was worth knocking over. But knowing his exact schedule, the fact he'd be late in the shop tonight... Be leaving from here and so on, well, maybe not so many. Uh-huh. But more than just you, I suppose. Don't think I'd fall into that one, do you? I wasn't born yesterday, tourist. Now, Lieutenant, come here. T take a look. Tennis shoes. All right. Or uh, marks from them, I mean. The killer was wearing them. Uh, on the floor, you see. Same as in the last prairie dog case. Same type shoe. What are you trying to do, rub it in? 
Every time we learn more and more about less and less. Clues, clues. I just thought you'd want to know the pattern is so... Cigarettes, matches, greasy gloves. But do we get any fingerprints? No, no. I tell you, this prairie dog is one guy who wanted... Take it easy, Lieutenant. Valentine, he could be practically anybody in this entire city. He's killed two people today. And we haven't moved one inch closer toward catching him. Yeah, yeah, I got the general idea. Only then I changed it. Huh? I decided I've heard enough. And if I'm right about what I've heard, then it's all over but the shouting. Now, look, Master. Suppose you and Caligari here just sit tight, and I'll be back later. Come on, Angel. Let's go to work on a prairie dog while he's still out in the open. I wonder what George will use to dig up a prairie dog. Could be a shovel, maybe. I know what I'd use. A spade. Sam's spade. Not that I haven't confidence in Valentine, mind you. I do. Just like I have confidence in what my friend here has to say to you. Let's see what George and Brooksy have dug up on the prairie dog situation. Oh, that's them getting out of that car over there. I don't see him, George. I hope we made it in time. Yeah, well, he had to change his clothes again. If he's not here, I don't know where we'd ever find him. Yeah, coming down the other steps. Hello, Sniffy. Oh, even, miss. Well, welcome to the fresh air. No, wait, I, I need your help. Oh, sure. Yeah, some things I'm pretty handy at. Well, it's just helping my memory, that's all. <laughs> Wish I had one. <laughs> you know, I walked into this case because a friend of mine was killed by the prairie dog. He was getting too close, I guess. In fact, from the location of that railroad platform, he was probably on his way to see Felix. He'd nosed around there before, so I... I guess Jerry had practically figured what the next crime was going to be. That's so? Or maybe he'd figured how simple all of these prairie dog cases really are. Figured the clues... Figured why the clues were always the same. I uh, don't get any of this, Misty. What I didn't figure until now was what it was I walked into myself this evening. When I walked into Felix's place. That's where the memory comes in. Yes, we walked in by the side door, and then we heard Felix moving around, and he spoke, and we thought he was speaking to us. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I was there. You, you see, I had this watch of my grandfather. Yeah, yeah, that's and, right. Uh, but I'm trying to remember what it sounded like when you and Felix walked into the back room. Remember, two of you coming into the back room, but only one pair of footsteps. His. I don't get it. And I remember the same thing when he pretended to get that phone call and you ran. He didn't make any noise. I don't get it. I suppose you dragged that watch in just so he'd invite you to the back room, where people would be less likely to see when you robbed and killed him. I don't get it. Why don't you say something different? What we walked in on was murder. That's the real reason you ran. Look, you're worse than that lieutenant. I didn't kill Felix, remember? I was in jail. You weren't in jail when Jerry Mace was killed. Huh? You don't understand why the same clues were always left by the prairie dog? Of course not. You're dumb like everybody else, so it never occurs to you those clues, the cigarettes ground out, the special matches, the greasy glove marks, the tennis shoes, were only to make people think in terms of one man. But suppose the prairie dog is two men working together. How to fool people. Not bad. Each would have an alibi one time or another. All sorts of neat ramifications. Huh. That's a pretty word. And you're trying to make something against me just because you think I was wearing tennis shoes. Well, you don't make sense. Look. That's leather. That's pair in a city dump. And don't the rest of your memory work? Felix gave a yell. The cops started after me. I've been in jail ever since. This is the same pair I got dragged in with. No spares in my pocket, see? That's why I'm so sure it's you. You've changed shoes. When? When could I change my shoes? What? You had to change them. Your murder of Felix was interrupted by us, and there you were with all the evidence ready for planting. Well, you could save yourself on the matches and cigarettes by that little pickpocket exhibition in jail. But if you'd been caught with the shoes on, they would have hung you. So, I wish the pair of hard ones out of the air, mister, mister. When? When could I have? So simple it hurts, Buster. Because there's only one person who could be your partner. Only one person you could have given the evidence to so he could go ahead and kill Felix and get you off the hook as well as collect the loot. 
Only one person you could have run to when you knew the cops had you surrounded and it would nab you any second. The guy who caught you. That barber. Tony. Yeah? Is that so? <laughs> it's the only way it could work, Busty. Just like the only way Jerry Mace could have had his pockets emptied before he was shoved in front of that train. He couldn't have been slugged in public and then rolled and then pushed, could he? George, that's right. Yeah, Angel, we missed that before. His outside pockets were empty. In the crowd, the only way that could have happened was if a pickpocket did it before Jerry even knew he was there. So you hung yourself on that one, Buster, showing off your ability. Now, come on. We're going to go see the barber about a two-headed hair. Look out, Georgie! Thanks for giving me an excuse, Buster! Sniffles after all. Say, I know a good way to save the state some money. Instead of sending him to the chair, thereby using up a lot of electricity, just put Junior in a cell with a box of paper handkerchiefs and let him blow himself to death. Oh, well, it's a dog's life at best. So, before they put me back in the pound, let me say that Robert Bailey played George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. The story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis... And that uh, bang in the background was that old hound dog, Eddie Dunstetter. I hope you'll save some time for another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. if you remember the old-time comic who always began with, tonight the show's going to be different. And so it is with Let George Do It. Only we switched it to, tonight the mayhem's going to be different. And I want you to listen closely, as this would be a swell way to discourage your brother-in-law of taking your upper plate for the ladies' aid taffy pull. It has its beginning in a cozy little cave on Crescent Lane. You know the type. One of those modest country places with six rooms and a polo field. As our story opens, a nervous young filly is writing a letter to George Valentine. For this, she is using a very special pen. It not only writes under water, it also writes under blood. Dear Claire, I meant to write you so much sooner than this. It's been so long, hasn't it? But has it only seemed that way to me because we're so isolated out here at Crescent Lane? Anyway, I've known, of course, that you'd be here for the weekend tomorrow, you and George, and I've... Oh, hello, Avery, dear. It's all right with you, isn't it, to have them here? I meant to tell you that I'd ask them, but I guess I forgot all about it and... With me, I think it's a terrific idea. But, but Joe... Who else would wander in to haunt you? You want to know how it is with Avery? You'd better ask him. Well, I... I... I thought you were Avery. Why, does he creep up on you, too? Well, I was just writing a letter, and I... Well, you see, I thought this George, this boyfriend of Claire Brooks, could go fishing this weekend. I mean, Avery loves a chance to show off his own trout lake, and... Well, it would take them a couple of days. Hey, this gets better and better. Go on, write your letter. I think it's a wonderful idea. With the squire out of the house for a couple of days... Cecile? Uh, yes, Avery? Well, there's old Thunderhead. See you later, baby. I want my lunch now, Cecile. Oh, all right, Avery. I was just writing a letter to... Yes, yes, of course, but I'm in a hurry, dear. But I wanted to tell you this weekend I've invited... I said I'm in a hurry, Cecile. Yes, Avery. What's the matter with you anyway? Oh, nothing. Was Joe Ames here? Well, yes, but I... I don't like that man or his money either. He doesn't belong in Crescent Lane. He's not the sort of well, man... Well, just because he wasn't born oh, here... Oh, for heaven's sakes, I want my lunch, I told you. 
Do I have to call one of the servants? Or... All right, all right. I'll, I'll be right with you, dear. <laughs> That's the girl. That's my sister. I have to mail this in a hurry, Claire. But remember, I'm expecting you this weekend without fail. Sincerely, Cecile Lewis. This gal, Cecile, may have the whips, but she ain't so dumb. She figures by inviting Brooksy, Valentine's girl Friday, for the weekend, she will still have Joe Ames, her boyfriend, Monday. Wonder how the plan will set with Brother Avery, though. I bet not half so well as the plan my friend here has for you. My friend, I think you'll go far with that kind of talk. Now let's see how far Brooksy and George go when they get that letter from Cecile. Cecile Lewis? I just don't know her. You don't know her? But then why would she write as though you were an old friend? I don't know. I tell you, I've never even heard of her. Uh -huh. Well, I've heard of an Avery Lewiston up there in Crescent Lane. Big shot among big shots. Sportsman stuff. You, too, can wear trees. I know. Wait a minute. Someplace in the paper I read it. What? Yeah. Here it is. Yeah, society section. Where else? Oh, I see. Prominent Crescent Lane bachelor who will preside at the Hunt Club. That's Network. him, all right. The early George Apley, mustache and all, distinguished looking. Look, George. There she is. Huh? There. Holding the bridle of the horse in the background. Oh, yeah. Miss Cecile Lewiston. She's not very attractive, is she? But she writes as though you were a friend. All right, come on, Angel. Let's find out why. I'm so glad you could come. It's certainly a beautiful place, all your gardens and the woods. But I'd still like to know Oh, yes, my brother's very proud of it. Well, aren't you too, Cecile? Well, it's really his. I mean, I've always lived here. Ever since my mother and father died, I, I was just a child. But my brother is... Well, it's sort of his. I always think of it that way. Here, we'll go in through here. Well, wait a minute. Uh, what about that letter of yours? Mr. Valentine, please don't ask any questions. <laughs> you might as well ask him to stop breathing. Uh, I'll explain everything later. No, 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 no. It's all right with me. What? No questions. <sighs> Thank you. Come on. All right. But you've told your brother we were all friends of yours. Mr. Valentine, you promised Oh, well, that's you... not a question. Just an observation. And you wrote the letter to Brooksy that way because he was watching you write it, maybe. So that makes your brother a curious kind of duck who looks over his shoulders. No, and... no, I, I mean... The... All right, all right, never mind. I'm close enough. But why a full-grown woman would pull a childish stunt like that on her brother is but beyond me. But you're wrong. I mean, Avery doesn't even know about you yet. I haven't had a chance to tell him. He was out all yesterday afternoon with a man named Joe Ames who's new here, and, well, this morning Hold I... Him. Well, hello. Hi, hi. We were just admiring your place. Oh, but... no. No, this is not Avery. I mean, this is Paul Merrill. Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, oh, how do you do? Oh, I'm sorry. Paul lives down the road. What do you want, Paul? If you're looking for Joe, he hasn't been by here this morning. Well, why do I want him? Oh, I'm all through with Joe Ames. Why, what do you mean? Well, he got what he came here for, didn't he? The big tycoon with social ambitions. He's made the grade now. What's this? Huh? Oh, hi, Avery. Well, where are you? Right here in the study window. Oh. But what did you just say about... No, no, operator. Hang on a minute, will you? Well, it was nothing important. Uh, uh, go on, go on, finish your phone call. We'll walk around the porch and come inside. Avery, these are some friends Be of... Be quiet, the... will you? Shut up. What? Avery! Nice guy. You know why Ames has been here to see you. You stay out of this. Yes, Avery. Well, all I meant and was... And you don't know. Go on. What do you think it is, Paul? Oh, Avery, for gosh sakes, Joe Ames just bought my place, that's all. He what? Well, sure. I, I dropped by. I thought you might be interested. Yeah, now Joe's made the grade, house in Crescent Lane. He bought up my second mortgage without telling anybody. <laughs> sort of had me over a barrel. What else could I do? Oh, I, I haven't signed any papers yet, but... Oh, what's the difference? Who cares? I can't pay the taxes by just growing peaches and... <laughs> well, Avery, Avery, hey! Well... Well, what the heck's the matter with him? Paul, please leave us alone. Hmm? Get out of here, will you? 
Please, Paul, please. Well, sure, sure, take it easy. What a place. Everybody always upset all the time. Well, I'll, I'll see you later. Ames, Paul Merrill, hot tempers, social climbers, what kind of a thing Mr. is... Mr. Valentine, something's wrong with my brother. I don't know what it is, but he's been like this for weeks. Just any little thing will set him off. I mean, he doesn't care about Paul Merrill selling his property any more than I do. That, that's what I wanted you to do this weekend. Take him fishing, make him get away from here. Well, Avery hasn't left this place for years, not even for horse shows out of town. Hey, hey, what? slow down, will you? Tell Brooksy, not me. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Don't mind if I climb in the window, do you? I want to make a phone call. George, what are you talking about? The guy has to be pretty upset to just drop a phone without hanging it up. Oh. Hello, hello. Hello, operator. Do I still want to talk to police headquarters? No, no, never mind, thank you. Hmm. Police headquarters? Cecile, why would your brother be talking to... Cecile. George, she's gone. Yeah. Listen. Hey, five shots. Sounds like it's over in one of those sheds. Stay here, Brooksy. You. Hello, Avery. My name's George Valentine. What have you got here? Miniature rifle range? Get out of here. <laughs> a man gets upset, he can come out and plug away at a sandbag, huh? It's a repair shed. I haven't been here for months, but the door is always open. Yes. There's no lock. What's that? Mr. Valentine. I know who you are, I know why you're here. There's something wrong with me, isn't there? My poor little sister that I've given half my life to. She's so normal, so honest. Hey, hey, take it. Slow. But she's going to run away from me. Did she tell you that? Did she? There's a man named Ames, you see, and I... What's this? What's this? Oh, I know. It's all very confusing. But it's really not. Cecile is stupid. She's not pretty. She's never had a man like that make a play for her. Ames, Joe, Ames. Rough and ready, man of ambition. Would have to be accepted around here if he married a Lewiston. Only, of course, I'd never allow it. Would I? Oh, clear it up, please, Buster. What are you talking about? A moment about? ago, I got the idea. It hit me like a sledgehammer. Elope. That's what I've been afraid Ames would try. Elope with her so I couldn't stop it. And that's why you're here. To get me out of the way. Well, it might make a little sense. Your sister certainly hasn't so far. And neither have I. Because now I know I'm wrong, you see. Hey, move, will you? Stand over there. Huh? Because somebody else has been in this shed. And so has my rifle. Look, slug in the waste box. See? Oh, now, look, how about one thing at a time? That's what I'm doing. Someone's packed a rifle bullet into a shotgun shell. He could dig the rifle slug out of the sandbag I there. still don't get it. Let me see. Look it. out, I'll spill sand all over you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here's a slug from your rifle. Another couple. Three of them in the sandbag, but... They match with the one in the waste box, see? Look at it. And here... The one in the shotgun shell. Now, wait a minute, Buster. Let me get this straight. You're talking about being upset over your sister, but now you've got a shotgun shell loaded with what's left of a rifle bullet. Listen to me. I don't understand it. I just found it. Ames. I've been worried about Ames making a play for my sister. Wanting to take her away, yes. Of course, I've been behaving strangely. But now I find a thing like this. Uh-huh. Somebody's been experimenting with your ammunition. I don't know what it means. Well, here. It might mess up the barrel of this shotgun a little, but we'll try. What are you going to do? Well, I've heard of taking the buckshot out of a shotgun shell and stuffing something heavier in front of the powder. Look out! Well, that one wasn't packed very tight. But see? There's the slug over there, buried in the wall. The slug that was originally fired from your rifle. George! George, where are you? Oh, yeah, and here, Brooksy. Don't tell anyone. It, it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't understand it. It, it doesn't make... I think you better come inside. Why? We've got a big enough mystery cooking right in here. Oh, George, listen. The caretaker's on the phone from the next estate. He says he was out in the woods and found the body of a man with a bullet in him. What? What's that? It was the body of Joe Ames. You know, this piece of news is going to come as a big shock to Cecile. Here she was, all ready to marry Ames, and he often elopes with an angel. Poor girl. 
In her present mental state, she's liable to toss convention to the winds and get on her broom and join him. However, here's a fellow who doesn't need a broom to take a flyer. He does it with words. Sweep a syllable this way, pal. You remember the old saying, never go for a tramp in the woods unless you're wearing a bulletproof vest. Well, Joe Ames didn't. He went looking for a partridge and turned out to be the pigeon. Now, this made Brother Avery a happy little monster, as his cup ran over even at the mention of Ames. All of this came to pass just because George and Brooksy got a weekend bid from Cecile, a hysterical female who's just itching for a jacket that buttons down the back. Two minutes in these surroundings would have told anybody to get your bustle back to town. But not our George. He took a shot in the dark and stayed. Meanwhile, someone took a shot in the woods and didn't. Was it murder? Was it suicide? I don't know. Mr. Worth, the local constable, thinks it was an accident. Uh, how about you, Brooksy? Avery Lewiston made some sort of a phone call to the police or was going to earlier, remember, George? I already asked Mr. Worth about that, Angel. Yeah, Avery's been pestering us trying to find out all the facts about this Joe Ames, that's about all. Yeah, that's what he told me, too. What do you mean, facts about Joe Ames? Well, Ames has made a lot of money back east, you see. I guess Avery hoped somebody would tell him Ames was crooked. But Ames wasn't, huh? Oh, no, 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 of course not. You know, just a bit rough, ambitious. I don't know why Avery should have worried so much about it. He's got plenty. Nothing Ames could have done to him except to bring a little noise and progress into his precious Crescent Lane. Oh, no. No, there was something else. His sister. What? Uh, skip it. It's all over. Uh, by the way, Valentine, I want you to show me this hocus pocus out in the shed. This shotgun rifle slug stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll get Avery. Yeah, that's what I mean. Let's clear it up. <laughs> That's what I found. Understand, Mr. Worth? That somebody's been experimenting with how to fire a rifle slug out of a shotgun? Well, of course I do. Only tell me, Avery, where do you keep your rifle? Well, generally in my study inside the house. So your rifle itself couldn't very well be borrowed and then put back without your noticing it? I suppose not. But the slugs fired from it could? I don't understand. I think I do. Go on, Worth. What was it your crew reported to you from town? Uh, where's your rifle now, Avery? Well, I had it out here earlier with Mr. Valentine, but... No, it... it's gone. Yeah, that's right. My boys have it. They ran a ballistics check, Valentine. The bullet that killed Joe Ames was fired from Avery's rifle. Well, I'll see you later. What? Uh, but, but wait a minute. Somebody trying to build you a new Avery? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm finally beginning to understand. I thought I was a well-liked person. In fact, for years, I've been sort of an ex-official mayor of Crescent Lane. Take it easy. But now it seems someone would like me to hang. Why? Just because I'm known to express my opinion on Ames? Because I would make an obvious suspect? Easy now. Worth is going to comb the woods for a shotgun. Try and check everyone in the neighborhood that might have been fired. He figures whoever practiced stuffing shells in here is the one who did it. But the slug was from my gun. It had the telltale markings from the barrel of my rifle. So when he finds that everyone dislikes Ames, it'll be much easier to put the handcuffs on me. Oh, cut it out, will you please? Why? Don't you understand? How will we ever be able to prove that the bullet that killed Ames had already been fired once by me in here? Sometimes the crime is simpler than it looks. You said everybody hated Ames. But everybody didn't have access to the shed, did they? No. No, that's right. Oh. Uh, hello. Paul. Hello, Paul. I just wondered if there was anything I could do. No. No, I guess not. Uh, Mr. Merrill, you live down the road, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Yes, all is I. I suppose the police have asked you where you were this morning. Yes. <laughs> I don't have any alibis, if that's what you mean. Yeah, but on the other hand, I don't kill people. Hey, you fixed this place up pretty nice, Avery. Moving the lathe, I'll give you more room in here, didn't it? Haven't you been in here since then? Me? Well, no. Why would I? Now, what's going on, anyway? I'm not interested in guns, if that's what you mean. But you're a neighbor. You're around here all the time. 
Well, now, let's get it clear. What do you mean? No, no, Valentine. It's ridiculous. Paul and I have nothing in common. As for my sister, she actually goes out of her way to avoid him. There must be others. I was thinking that Mr. Merrill and Joe Ames had something in common, that's all. What's that? Yeah, that uh, business of the property. Oh. Paul, now, 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 look here. He forced me to sell. What of it? I don't mind getting out of here. I've been full of Crescent Lane all my life, and I'm sick of it. Well, just because he didn't give me as much money as... No, oh, I'm getting out of here. I, I'm sorry I can't help you, Valentine. Paul. No, I'll let him go, Avery. It's about all over anyway. Uh, what? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes a crime can be so simple. And the simple way is the only way I can figure it. Well, well where are you going? Oh, what do you mean that it... To see an old friend that I didn't meet until today. Your sister, Avery. No, Mr. Valentine. Please leave me alone. Please. Now, look, you lied to begin with when you wrote us your letter. And if you don't help me now... But Joe Ames was an awful man. Don't you see? Anyone could have done it. An awful man? Ames has been around here for months, hasn't he? He wanted to buy some property. But even more than that, he wanted to marry you. George? Here, Brooksy, what'd you find? What, what have you been doing back there? I was in your room, Cecile. I had to go through the bathroom. The other door was locked. You have no right to... Well, if you won't tell us, we'll find out ourselves. Go ahead, Brooksy. She had three suitcases all packed. Oh. There isn't anything left in the closet but a few things to wear over the weekend. No. No, Okay, I... so you were planning to get out of here. That is why you brought us out here, isn't it? To get your brother out of the way so you could leave. You must be scared to death of Avery. No, no, I'm not. It's just that... I, I know, I know. He didn't want you to get married. But I wasn't going to be married. You don't understand... This is your engagement ring, isn't it? I found it in your dressing table. <laughs> okay, Cecile, okay. <laughs> Avery had already guessed it. He told me about it. Now you tell us about it. No. No, I won't. I can't. You're protecting someone, aren't you? No, no, I'm not. Someone like yourself. What? Ames was murdered by a bullet from your brother's rifle. Avery? Avery, come in here. Oh, no, never mind him. He couldn't have been the one to try and frame himself, don't you understand? So it's someone else you're protecting? No. Oh, leave me alone. Well, come I... on, Cecile, let's go into town. What? George, she's so upset she's sick. The person she's protecting is Cecile. How many times do I have to say it? George. Well, who else would have access not only to that shed out there, but also to the study where Avery kept his rifle? Mr. M Mr. Valentine. Oh, come on, sister. You can tell it to Mr. Worth at police headquarters. George, look out. She... Oh, yeah, I've got it. Well, she just fainted, that's all. What is it? What happened? Oh, nothing. Brooksy, get on the phone. Call Worth. Tell him I'm on my way. All right, George. Then wait here for me. What are you doing with her, Cecile? She fainted, that's all. Never mind, I can get the door. Put her down. Valentine. She'll be taken care of, don't worry. Put her down, I said. I have. There's a doctor in jail. He can take... Get away from her! George get away from her? Will Avery give it to him in the end? Boy, doesn't a situation like this kind of get you deep down inside? Hmm. Well, in case it didn't, maybe what my friend here has to say will. Get back and see how George is making out. Say, this is terrible. He's still standing there. Get away from her! Well, where did you get the shotgun? Well, found it out in the woods. Just bringing it to show you. Well, don't wave it at me like that. Uh, hey, what's that shotgun loaded with? Buckshot? You better get your hand off the trigger. You'll hit us both. What? Or is it loaded with another one of those five slugs from the shed? You went over to Merrill's and you stole his rifle and now you're getting ready to plant it in the woods. Get away from her. Oh, yeah, sure. The big squire of Crescent Lane that everybody calls Thunderhead. And the only person that really takes you seriously, I guess, is Cecile. After all, why not? She's not very good looking. There weren't any boys. She's waited on you hand and foot ever since your parents Stop died. Stop it. Be quiet. 
What makes you think I'd want to plant Mel's gun? Now, you listen to me, Buster. You move one inch and she gets hurt, see? The gun's simple. The whole crime's simple, I told you. I always wondered what it'd be like to walk in on a case just a few minutes after a man had been murdered. Now I know. A man will try anything when he's desperate, won't he? I don't know what you're talking about. All right, forget all the fancy stuff. Forget that shotgun stuff. When I walked in here today, you were phoning the police. You were all upset. Well, suppose you were going to phone in and tell him that you just shot a man by accident in the woods. No, that's not true. He was the guy who was going to take your sister away from you. With your standing around here, how could anybody ever prove it wasn't an accident? But the shotgun... You shot Ames with your rifle. Only then you changed your mind. How desperate can you get? Sure. Why not make it a murder now? For the last time, Valentine, I'm warning Why you... Why not get rid of Merrill, too? Why not go out to the shed and show me a perfectly obvious switch with the ammunition that'd make you look innocent forever? But I found those shells there. You knew ballistics had proved it was your rifle that killed Ames, so you showed me how someone else could have used one of those five slugs. Get away from her. For the last time, get away from her. Five slugs, Buster. Five slugs. You ripped open the sandbag, remember? There were three in there. One in the wastebasket. One in the shotgun shell you just stuffed. I don't even know what you're talking but about. But I heard you fire your rifle five times. So why weren't there more slugs? If somebody else was getting them from an earlier shooting out there, he'd have to get them out of the sandbag, wouldn't he? But the bag wasn't ripped open. And when it was, we only found three. V Valentine. Five slugs and you fired five shots. Now drop that gun. Uh I, I knew he must have done it. But I couldn't tell you what I knew. I couldn't. All right, all right. Take it easy, Cecile. Your brother's a strange guy. I guess you know that better than anyone else. But you don't need to explain anything. Not even why he suddenly decided to make his simple crime look like a murder. He made quite a mistake, didn't he? Mistake? George, what do you mean? Haven't you figured that out, Angel? Well, come on. I'll tell you on the way out. All right, think, Brooksy. Why didn't he just leave Ames' death as an accident? Why didn't he finish his call to the police? You remember what happened? Well, Paul Merrill was there talking about selling his property. Angel Cecile was planning to elope. Now, would the man she'd elope with buy property right near the murderous brother they were running away from? Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's what hit Avery like a sledgehammer. But on the other hand, why would Merrill be perfectly willing to sell at a bad price and get out? Now you have it. But she and Merrill were so cool toward each other. Well, if it was necessary to elope, it'd also be necessary to put on an act, wouldn't it? Avery never even guessed until that moment. It wasn't Ames at all. It was Merrill. And Avery started working to pin the murder on Merrill. Sure, sure. Get rid of the real suitor who was going to steal his sister. But at least it ends happily. You see, now they can get together. <laughs> Love always wins out. Ha. Huh. You know, it's amazing to me how Valentine can romp his way through a million clues, then top it off by saying the wrong thing to Brooksy. That poor gal's got enough frustrations for a sorority house. Oh, well, time will tell. And I've got just enough time to tell you that Robert Bailey plays George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and Eddie Dunstetter gave you a shot or two at the organ. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, dangerous my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I want 
if you know who first said, let George do it. Now, if your name happens to be George, don't say my wife, because you'll be wrong. No, it was all started back in the 15th century by a fellow named Louis XII, who must have been a pretty stale character, because unlike his grandson, Louis XIV, he didn't have any furniture named after him. You see, back in those days, it wasn't considered fashionable for a king to go around stabbing people in the back. So as a result, when some peasant got out of line, he called in George, a fellow with a sharp knife and no scruples. Now, I don't mean to say that George Valentine employs the same tactics, but if you hire him to do a job, he expects you to look the other way if someone starts to bleed. All of which brings us up to the moment whereby George is about to get himself hired by a group of evil politicians. If you'll shut the door, we can put the plot on to boil. Boys are a little noisy. Guess the luncheon's broke up. <laughs> Civic League. Just a lot of talk. None of them will ever do anything but the three of us. Always away, you're not. I don't know. You've only written one sentence. Shut up, Vic. And summer, spring. Um, perhaps you visited the hotel here yourself, Mr. Valentine. But at least it's a sure thing you've seen the outrageous charges the federal grand jury and city newspapers have been making about us. Uh, now, now, wait a minute, Nielsen. I'm still not so sure this is the right way to go at this. Here, here. The mayor speaks. Well, now, Vic, you're a lawyer. Would you hire a man you've never seen to investigate your own backyard? Now, there's a man I know, a fine detective, who'd be only too glad to come down fine here. Fine detective to... like that police force of yours, I suppose. Can't see what's under their own noses. Well, I'm the responsible one, and it seems to me that Emmett I should Wall, be... Emmett Wall, his back's to the wall, and his head is all full of surmises. Now, see You've here, got Vic, to you... stop being cautious sometime, Emmett. In my bank, I make decisions, and I make them fast. Yes, but I'd I... I agree that. with Nielsen, Emmett. If we don't get an outside investigator quick, the grand jury will do it. I say let's us find out first. Clean up our own town. <laughs> Objections overruled. Now we're getting someplace. Mr. Valentine, I'm enclosing railroad tickets. A public-spirited group of which I am the head. Three of us. Don't we sound fancy, though? Expects your immediate presence. It has been alleged that Summer Springs is being used as the center of payoffs for the big city collection racket. That our fair town has a jackal in its midst. And it's your job to find it. There. Now do it. That's all right. Now we'll get some action. I'll mail this right now. Only see here, both of you. Nobody knows about this but the three of us. Remember, nobody else knows about Valentine. That's what I call a happy little trio. I wouldn't trust that mayor any farther than I could toss the city hall, which ain't far. On the other hand, here's something you can put your faith in and never be wrong. Well, I guess George got the tickets all right, because there he is at the railroad station. The gorgeous one with him, uh, that's Brooksy. She works for Valentine, when he hasn't got anything else to do. They made a reservation for me at the Summer Springs Hotel, Brooks, so you can phone me up there. George, why can't I go with you? Just because they don't expect hey, me to come... Look, it's a five-alarm to... fire all set to go off, and you know it. Summer Springs is going to be hotter than but the But nobody of... knows about you, just the men who rode. Angel, I'm looking for a guy who poses as respectable, a big-timer who hasn't been identified. And if you were there, I wouldn't be able to duck as fast. But there's nothing to... dangerous if nobody Valentine. knows. Hey, wait, Mr. Valentine. Huh? Yeah? The baggage man pointed you out. Yeah. I need your help. I need your luck. I got a case for you. Sorry, I'm tied up on one. My, uh, grandmother's dead. Oh, that's too bad. My grandfather killed her. Used an axe. What? I'm not interested. George. You see, my aunt's insane, and what happened I doubt if that... you ever had a grandmother, gorilla boy, or even a mother. Now say it in English and fast, because I'm not going to miss that train. I got a thousand bucks here for you to take my case. I could think of one. Uh-huh. You mean if I don't take the train? I don't mind. I can tell it to you on the way to Summer Springs. That's where you think I'm going? Huh? No, just where you think you're going. So somebody else does know. Hey, Buster, get out of my way before I'll I miss stay that. away, I'm telling you. Oh, no, you George, don't. George, look, look out. out. Yeah, yeah, easy. We're attracting attention. A corpse would attract more. Who hired you? A thousand bucks. The trip ain't necessary. Stay home. Okay. Okay, maybe you're right, mister. 
Too late now, anyway. There she goes. That's a sooty kind of a trip. You wouldn't have enjoyed it. Uh huh. Shall we go count the money? Sure. My name's Lemuel. You're a smart guy. I thought you'd see the light. Yeah. I hope you do. <laughs> So you get to go after all, Angel. Yeah, you get to drop me off in Summer Springs yourself from the car. Not much of a hotel, is it? For a fancy town like this, no more potted palms than usual. Do I get to come in with you? Sure, sure. Lemuel kept me off the train, didn't he? Okay, then the more casual, the better. You mean whoever hired him won't be expecting you to show up now? I mean, Lemuel isn't in condition to report for a while. I do not care what the union says about chambermaids. I have an opinion, too, you know. Have you been a clerk for 12 years? Well, have you? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Be just a moment. Oh, no, no, no. Finish the phone call. Now, listen. I don't care how many chambermaids you've known. Do you run a laundry service or a... Or a, oh, hold on, will you? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now, what was it? George Valentine. I've got a reservation. No, I won't call the manager. He doesn't live here. Uh, what was the name, sir? George Valentine. Oh, let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, he's in his room. He, what? At 350 towels, I told you. Not 340. Oh, for heaven's sake, hang on, will you? He, What's the matter? Well, I asked... Oh, yes, 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 it was George Valentine you asked for, wasn't it? Well, he just checked in a few moments ago. Yeah, he's in his room. (laughs) I'm so sorry. It's room 419. It's elevated to the right. Um, but... Oh, thanks a lot, Buster. Come on, Angel. You see, my dear fellow, if the chambermaids don't count the towels... Who is it, George? If somebody took your oh, room... I don't know, Brooksy. Looks like they're still one step ahead of us, whoever they are. It's essential Emil couldn't have revived in time. Well, whoever the impersonator is in there, he doesn't seem to answer very fast. Come on. <gasps> yeah, sure. Of course he's dead. They shut that door. There's no gun. I don't shut see the gun. Shut the door, will you? Shot, all right. George, he's about your same build. Huh? Around the same age. Yeah. It is a briefcase over here under the bed. It's a sample case, isn't it? The kind salesmen carry? Neckties. Nothing but neckties. Look, George, there's a key on the floor next to it. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, to another room, 631. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Card in his wallet. Sure, of course. Harold Stark, Sure Silk Tie Company from Salt Lake City. Necktie salesman. Only suppose he came in on the train tonight, Uh George. Yeah, sure. Single guy looking generally my type. You mean suppose he got picked up by somebody watching the hotel here, somebody expecting me. So they kill him and put him in your room? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let it ring. We ought to talk to the clerk, to the bellboys. Now listen, again. whoever shot this guy did it and ran. Okay, then so will we. George, that's crazy. Is it? I was hired to find out who a big-time collection man is in this town, right? Only whoever it is got one jump ahead of us. I can't even start working until I get out from behind the eight ball, can I? Oh, George, that phone, it keeps ringing. Somebody's going to hear it. And... What are you doing? I'm putting my wallet, my own wallet, on the body. What do you think? No. You take this guy's. Go back to that driving on the edge of town. Run a fast telephone check on him. Harold Stark, Salt Lake City. The clerk knows we're here. He'll keep ringing. Wait like grab the neckties. We'll dump him in the alley. Well, I'll be out from behind the eight ball if I'm dead, won't I? George. I'll be free to find out those guys who hired me. So come on, give the police a chance to find the body of George Valentine. Uh, well, uh, yes, come in, Mr. Uh, uh. Valentine, I told you. Your name is Nielsen, isn't it? You sent for me, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. Well, don't look like a ghost, like you're scared. What do you want with me? What's that? Why do you keep your hand in your pocket? Because I want a cigarette. Look. See? Oh. Now all I want is a little talk, Mr. Nielsen, with you and Mr. Vickery and Emmett Wall, the mayor. You know all of our names. Well, sure, of course. Here's the letter you wrote me... 
Oh, <laughs> hey, I'm beginning to get this. Have you just had a phone call or something? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact, from Vickery. He happened to be at police court. For once, they work fast in this town. A patrolman has reported the murder of George Valentine. <laughs> okay, sit down. I'll explain if you will. I have nothing to... Buster, I'll use your phone. Prove it to you. The police here in the city. I know you've never seen my face, but they can identify my voice for you. Here, let me have it. Oh, no. Hello? George? Oh, yeah. What'd you find out, Brooksy? I found out that you're crazy. Absolutely crazy. What? Darling, I tried to contact those people in Salt Lake, but I can't. I mean, I got the company all right, but nothing about Harold Starr. Why not? They've never even heard of him. Nobody by that name has ever sold neckties. Don't you see what you've done? Throw away that wallet, George. The man who was killed was a phony. You can't be somebody that doesn't exist. All right. I believe you. I agree you're Valentine. Then you realize how fast i got to work, Nielsen. I told you what Miss Brooks said. The body was a plant of some kind. This thing gets deeper every minute. And you haven't even started your investigation. Whoever the man is I'm after is calling the shots in advance. And you claimed only three of you knew about me. Yes, yes, I understand. You think it's one of us. But I'm afraid it doesn't make much difference if I do help you now. What do you mean by that? Well, Mr. Valentine, I'm not a cowardly man. But I'll admit, when you knocked on the door... Yeah, sure, you were scared to death. But what's that got to Valentine, do with... Valentine... I don't think you realize yet just how far behind that eight ball you are. That same patrolman who found the body also saw a man and woman throw away a briefcase in an alley. Huh? You and Miss Brooks, there was identification with the neckties. At the door just now, I thought you were the man every policeman in town is looking for. Harold Stark. He doesn't exist, you say? <laughs> His description is yours. And you know who you are? Never mind, never mind. I get it. I dug my own grave, didn't I? Yeah. I killed George Valentine. Well, this should prove something, but nothing's impossible. Who else do you know can bump themselves off and live to tell you how it felt? I think George is wasting his talents in Summer Springs. This boy should be in Washington. They could use him, just like you should hear this. If you've been able to follow this little story up to now so in case you haven't don't let what I have to say confuse you because it will it seems that a group calling themselves the syndicate figures the politicians in the town of Summer Springs as fall guys for their nefarious deeds now the mayor of said hamlet does not look kindly on this plot as he figures that he's committed enough crimes already to go around so what does he do he writes George Valentine and what does he do he bumps himself off, which is getting out of it the easy way, which the mayor does not like and tells himself. Well, Valentine, for once it seems the police wasted no time discovering a mistake, that George Valentine was not killed. Well, that's nice to know. You mean they re-identified that body I found? Clarence Prell, up-and-coming accountant. His name's been mixed up in this thing already. He's been making a tremendous amount of money the past few years. It's just possible our big shot is already dead. Well, why would this man, this accountant, have the identification of Harold Stark on him? Who killed him? Who put it there? Who put him there in my hotel room? Now, listen to me, Valentine. You can get to work now. You're off the hook. They know it's not your body. Now, look, I've been in trouble because it wasn't kept secret that you three were hiring me. Is that right? Oh, there you go again. We're on it. Stupid. Yes, but honest. None of us are mixed up in any okay, racket. Okay, okay, skip it. But even if the big shot isn't one of you, you're now in the way, aren't you? What? Well, maybe I'm wanted by the police, but if the killer with strong boys knows about me, he also then knows about you. Yeah. Lock your doors tonight. Shh. Turn out those lights. Huh? The car just stopped out there. I could see the lights blinking. <laughs> Take it easy, Nielsen. It's only Miss Brooks. I'll see you later. Oh, 
George. Sometimes I think you're the eight ball. Angel, the heat's on the big shot, whoever he is. A lot more than it's on me. Come on, we're going in here. Where, the drugstore? Yeah. Got a nickel in your purse? Yeah. Why don't you go straight to the mayor himself? Oh, see, I need a little more time to work alone. You're going to give it to me. What? The mayor's got his own ideas. I've got mine. But if, if I don't work fast, a lot of people are liable to get hurt. This... Hello, operator. I want a policeman. This Mr. Rex will do anything to cover his tracks before a full investigation... George, what on earth are you doing? Hey, police, look. I just heard that thing on the radio. I, I mean that description of that guy and that girl, that, that Harold Stark with the girl who was dressed... Well, slow down. How can I? I just seen her, the girl, having a soda. And... Hey, what's the name here? Oh, yeah. Kleshima's Drugstore. She's wearing you a... Rat. a you brown coat. Hey, you better down. come and get her quick. George Valentine, of At all the dirty tricks... At least you won't trips. get hurt, Angel. Tell him to look for me any place but the Summer Springs Hotel, room 631. Now, you play eight ball for a while. Six thirty one. Gee, fits all right. Ouch. Where are the lights in this plank? Oh, no. How long have you been dead, Baldy? Just about as long as the other guy, I guess, huh? Only what's your name? You the real Harold Stark? Are you the... Hey! Shut up. People in the next room. Hey. Lemuel. Yeah. It's a lousy hotel they let anybody in. I thought I knocked you out of the picture before once. We're even. I didn't hit you hard enough either. Yeah, you're out of condition, Buster. That's bad. You kill that guy? I was with you and another Tom. Don't talk so loud. All right, all right. Hey, wait a minute. What are you trying to... Hey, get out of my pocket. What's the idea? It's a gun in your stomach. Don't argue. Well, why put a gun in my pocket, too? Empty. I'll get your hopes up. Be quiet. Another wallet, too. If you think you can frame me for killing this guy, whoever he is, you're crazy. I'm not. Cops don't kill cops. What? Can't you tell Flat Feet when you see him his name's Harold Stark? An eye that got shot. Like you're gonna be. Oh, so that's it. Yeah, sure, there is a Stark, a detective. Came to town acting like a necktie salesman, huh? Ouch. Just let me get in that chair, will you? Sure. You're fixed. You got everything. Wait a minute. Two guns. Two guns I got in my pocket. That's a lot. There's two men dead, aren't there? You're a bright boy, a real up-and-coming eye. Dead eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. The real Stark dead in this room? That accountant named Prell dead in my room. So come on, bright boy. Get on your feet. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Look out. Get away from that Hello, phone. anybody. Oh. oh, shut up, like I said. Hey, what's going on there? Can people have no privacy? You're listening. That's what you're doing. Oh, for the love of... Walk, will you? Go on the door. All right, all right. Plenty of standing room. Don't shut up. Well, what are you listening to? You think you hear something or something? Of all the nerves. Now out the door. Okay, okay. Just thought you might not want the guy who's coming down the hall to see you. What? Oh, it's only the desk clerk. Get back in there. What's going on here? What in heaven's time? Arthur! What do you think you're doing? Come on, get out of the way, fast. Let go of me, really. Down here, will you? Okay, he's not going to shoot. Shoot? What kind of a disturbance is this? This is not the sort of hotel you get... Wait a minute. I've seen you before. Yeah, you're the guy who gave out my description. What? No, no, I didn't give any description. Oh, you're the laundry man. Oh, no, no, that's what I was talking about. I remember you're the... Oh. oh. Well, see here, there was a mix-up Come on, on skip it. Just show me the fastest way out. Don't, but get that gun away from that me. That big man in there. Was there anybody with him when he came into the hotel? What? What? Well, no. Oh, yes, I, I mean, yes. Uh, uh, there are several men down the lobby. I, 
I don't know who they are. You're wanted by the police. That, that's all I know. The back stairs, then. Where are they? Come on. I won't help a criminal. Come on, don't argue, friend. Well, all right. Here, here, here duck in here. Uh, there, there are several policemen in the hotel, too. There, there are cars at the alley entrance. You're going to find me a way out, so stop shaking. I didn't kill anybody. The police don't think I did. Oh, why not? Now, look, you. I'm just the guy behind the eight ball, see? There's a big crook in your town, Clarence Prell. You know him? No. An accountant. Man in a nice spot to take payoffs coming in from the city. But Prell is dead, so he's not the crook. What? Oh, for heaven's Find sake. Find me a way out of here or people will be wrong. They'll think he was the crook. They'll say he killed a detective named Harold Stark who was on his trail. Let them say what they want. I... They'll say I killed Prell, maybe in self-defense. But I was real smart and collected all the evidence, including the guns. Then poor Valentine. He was on his way to get himself out of trouble with the police when something happened to him. You're mad. You're worse than the laundry people. Now, look, Buster, I'm telling you all this so you'll help. It's a frame-up, see? To get rid of two private detectives and take the heat off by making Prell look like the big shot. A triple play. Here we are. Here. Uh, give me a hand with the window. Uh, okay. Only six stories up. I forgot my umbrella. I can't jump, Buster. No, 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 no. Look. Out there, you see? Uh. To the side. It's an old fire escape. It hasn't been used since we built the new wing. But it comes down in the service yard. This is the side street. Yeah. You... Well, go on. How much help do you need? No. Oh, <laughs> there's no one down there. Here, you see? Yeah. Yeah, sure, I see. Uh-huh. Little rusty, though, isn't it? Well, what do you expect? A red carpet? I expect you to go first. Lead the way. What? It just occurred to me it's not so bad being behind an eight ball. If you've got the cue in your hand. Mr. Valentine, for the love... Remember the gun, Buster. Lead the way. Now, tell me. Why do you call me Valentine? Why not Prell or Stark? Or any of the other names thrown around tonight? Well, well, back there, Lemuel called you Valentine. How do you know his name? Well, I'm a hotel clerk. I, I see lots of people. And that switchover of rooms today. I don't see how anybody could have done it but the hotel clerk himself. Well, but what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Human nature. How you and your boy Lemuel found out about my coming here. How I? An accountant sees lots of people, sure. But a hotel clerk sees a lot more. Now, who's in a better spot to receive payoff deliveries on the QT than the man behind the desk? I'm going back. You're going nowhere. Now, listen, Buster. It had to either be one of my three clients or you. What? Yeah, so take human nature again. It couldn't be one of them, or why get me in it? But they did write the letter right after a Civic League luncheon. Uh, what do you mean, human nature? I mean how people mail letters in hotels. In a hotel, you just hand the letter to the clerk to mail, don't you? Get out of my oh, way. Oh, no, you don't. I'm going back. What's the matter? Don't these rusty stairs go on down there? Do they just fall off in the dark someplace? That you is going to fall off in the dark. Not even afraid of the gun, are you? You already know it's not loaded. Just evidence to be found on the patsy. Look out. Don't. This is where you get racked up, eight ball. Oh. I don't think that was very nice of George. He gave Buster time to open everything but his parachute. While we're waiting for the desk clerk to make a three-point landing, here are a couple of good points for you. George, how did you get off that fire escape? It was rusty. You would have fallen through. That's why he led you out there. What he expected hey, you to do... Hey, 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 hey. Slow down, will you? How'd you get out of jail, Angel? Oh, George, please. I want to understand. Oh, he was a guy, all right. The hotel clerk. Yeah, he kept a job so nobody would ever guess, as well as because it was such a perfect spot for payoffs. He knew the heat was on when he heard I was coming, and Lemuel couldn't stop me. He had me all set for a double fancy frame. But that other detective... Well, the mayor said he wanted to handle things himself, didn't he? That he knew a man he wanted to hire. Harold Stark. Posing as a necktie salesman. Yeah, and that accountant had been working with a clerk on the rackets, so he figured he'd make him fall guy. Strictly from desperation, Angel. But it all might have worked. But you would have died accidentally, fallen and been killed, and that would have been the end of it. Mm-hmm. 
Only how on earth, after you knocked him out, how did you get him off the fire escape? <laughs> how did you get out of jail? Well, you saw him. That big, good-looking policeman. So what? You said you didn't tell him anything. No. Well? <laughs> he was very sweet. Well, he... I mean, after a while, there was no reason to hold me. In jail, I mean. Oh, why, Brooksy. And, well, why should I tell you if you won't tell me? <laughs> Good night, Georgie. I'm telling you, George, you better watch your step with Brooksy. Didn't you ever hear the saying how when the cat's away, your secretary will play? Play what exactly, I don't know. But I do know that Robert Bailey plays George Valentine, but Virginia Gregg is Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and Eddie Dunstetter kept things organized at the organ. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Dangerous my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Remember way back in the 30s how the blowhards went around with the spiel? A car in every garage, a chicken in every pot. Do you know why they didn't have more success? They left something out. A valentine in every closet. Think of all the trouble he'd have saved you. Like the time Junior ran Rover through the lawnmower as he figured he'd look better in a crew cut. Now don't take it out on the little rascal just because he has aspirations to be a barber. Let George do it. He'll give it to him once over light, like he never got. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun to George Valentine. He gets all kinds of mail. Take the letter he's about to get from this old tumbleweed character. Mr. Valentine, sir. Uh, I'm a cowboy movie star. I'm sure you must have seen me sometime, even if it's only on television. Well, anyway, I, I know how silly it sounds, but uh, I need help. There's a most desperate situation that requires the action of a hero. And while I'd like to qualify, this same situation requires certain proficiencies that I haven't got. Notably, there's a mystery. Mysteries aren't my longest suit. Uh, you see, I met her. Uh, her, I mean, but just barely. And Mr. Valentine... This lovely young lady I refer to, she's in distress. She is. But, Mr. Disbro, in your letter you didn't tell Daphne. us... Daphne. That's who she is. Ah. Uh, Daphne. Daphne. Yeah. I met her just the other day, you realize. I was talking to a man I know, a song plugger. That's like a fuller brush man, only with music, you uh -huh. see. Uh, he pointed her out. The little school teacher type that's always having westerns, you know, big bashful blue eyes and hair like honey and a heart just as big as all out of doors, you with know. With a head to match. <laughs> I know. Oh, uh, who cares if she's smart? I don't. Uh, Anyway, I find this little girl lives all alone, way up in the Imperial Crest Apartments. Uh-oh, I take it back. <laughs> Daphne does all right, doesn't she? Oh, uh, she has money, but she's nervous, if you know what I mean. So nervous, she'll hardly talk. And afraid? Oh, yeah, I, I think somebody's watching her up there. Well, I'm not surprised. A big bad wolf, maybe. Uh, me? No, no, this is different. No, 
It is. She didn't even want to meet me, and most women do. Oh, now, look, cowboy. Yeah, and today when I tried to talk to her on the street, even after I'd been properly introduced, she just up, walked away. Well, so am I. Now, wait, no, wait a minute, Mr. Valentine. Now, she wanted to talk, and she would have, if the man she walked away with hadn't been carrying a gun. Oh. So maybe it is a case, huh? What man? Big. Bigger than both of us. Black hair and sour face. Her husband, maybe. No, oh, no, she told me she wasn't married. I don't know who he is, but she's afraid of him, all right. Uh-huh. And what do you want me to do, scare him away? No, figure it out, Mr. Valentine. Go meet her and protect her before something worse happens. And then let me know before it does. Oh, I see. That's it. I do the dirty work, hand you the answers, and then you step in to scare away the rustlers. And win the girl, of course. Well, that's right, honey. And having to keep my public name intact, uh, my fans and all, you know, I, I'm a beautiful patsy. Okay, partner. But don't think you've got a corner on the market. <laughs> You better get out your earplugs, kiddies, because me thinks there's going to be plenty of shooting in this here Opry. Oh, but don't put them in for just a minute, because first I want you to hear this. You know something? That did this old heart good. Now let's see if George is doing any good for Daphne. Uh-oh. Hey, George. Someone is trying real hard to bump you off. Hey, George. Duck! <laughs> Hey, what the... <laughs> I put your cigarette out, didn't I? Well... One shot at 30 feet, that's pretty good. Oh, but I missed the sandbag again. Look at them holes in my wall. Hey, lady, you got holes in your head. Oh, now, what? don't be angry. I'm practicing here on my roof garden. Uh, see that clay pipe down there? I never oh. miss. Oh, fine. You must make a big hit with lots of people. Well, my landlord and neighbors do complain once in a while. See the other pipe? Hey, you. But I talk them out of it. Well, now, look, I don't talk so easy. Don't you? No, he doesn't. <laughs> Not when you're around, you mean. Oh, no, all you right, bet. Annie Oakley, so you're nice to look at. Daphne. Daphne Crockett, girl type Davy. Crockett? Oh, of course. The club Paris. Mm -hmm. I've been there five years, longest run of any act in nightclubs. Everybody likes my shooting. <laughs> oh, so that's it. Little Red Riding Hood turns out to be two-gun Nelly. Professional bullseye artist. Mr. Valentine, where are you going? To see the bull about some black eyes. He... No, no, wait a minute. I'm here now. I might as well speak my piece, even if it's only for laughs. Speak your piece? Like Miles Standish? In a way. Only John Alden's name this time is Rafe Disbro. Oh, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's funny, all right. He thinks you're in danger. The cowboy says you're being watched up here. He says what? Well, there's the building next door. I guess from that one apartment over there, you could oh, probably... Oh, no. No, of course not. All right, lady. But the rest of my recitation says you're afraid of a big man, black hair, sour face. How about that one? Mr. Disbro has quite an imagination, hasn't he? Maybe. And maybe not. I suppose he sent you over here to protect me. That was a general idea. And think twice before you say no. I'll show you what I think of Mr. Disbro in spite of that lovely Texas accent. You see those three little dolls in a row? Lady, I said think twice. And there are three bullets left in this gun. Oh, now look, if you are in trouble, Daphne... Three Daphne. answers you can take okay, back. Okay, lady, never mind. We get the idea. This is where we came at, Angel. Hey, that was four. <gasps> Miss Crockett, Daphne! No, I, I'm all right. It, oh, God. It missed me. What missed you? Where'd that extra shot come from? No. No, there wasn't one. I, I, get out of here, won't you? Please leave me alone. Please, leave me alone. Don't waste your breath, lady. We've already gone. George, shall I telephone Lieutenant Riley? No, he's on vacation. Oh. Ask for Clary and tell him to get up there fast. Yeah, but George... I got a date next door, Angel. See you in the second reel. There's a card outside this apartment. It says R. Seaver. You him? I don't know. Are you? Now, look, Bright Eyes, I What's want you to look... A guy comes busting in, upsets my equilibrium. I'm teaching myself to master. Now go away. All right, don't mind me. I won't tell if you cheat. Your manners get worse. The door's back that way. Remember? Yeah, just call me a building inspector. Come to take a look at your window, that's all. Don't fall out. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, all right. 
The only apartment from which you can see the roof garden. You don't say. The only apartment from which you could take a pot shot at a woman across the way there. Sit down. Maybe we could both learn canasta. You always wear a hat when you play cards? Sure. What woman? What's it cover up? Black hair to match your sour face? I said what? We don't like each other much, do we? Daphne Crockett. I was there when it happened. Now we like each other less, huh? I don't know. Friendship begins slow sometimes. Sit down, will you? I'll deal out a few. What do you use for chips? The bag there? Huh? The black bag there by your foot. The one you're trying to keep me from seeing. A real observant boy, aren't you? Wait a minute. I can see a hand when it starts to move, so stop moving it. I'm dealing this, Inspector. Oh, no, you're not. You're... <laughs> Too bad nobody can argue with a blackjack, Inspector. We might have had a nice little game. Shall I tell you what hit you, Valentine? No. But don't tell me that's Lieutenant Clary's voice, not at last. At last. Valentine, if you'd wait for the police once in a while, or better yet, if you wouldn't get mixed up in cases like all this. All right, all right. You sound just like Riley. My headache's bad enough. Uh, his name was Curly. Curly Blackson, the strong boy, wanted for ducking out of prison back east. Yeah, what was he in for? He was serving time for shakedowns. He was a blackmail artist. Blackmail? Hey, is there a little black bag still around here anyway? Oh, mine, of course not. No, there isn't, George. And this Curly may have been the man Rafe saw once with Daphne, but I don't think he took the shot at her across the way. He didn't talk like he did. Not to mention the small fact he had a gun, but it was still loaded and hadn't been fired for some time. A... So you know an awful lot, don't you, Lieutenant? Come on, wake up. Open your baby blue eyes wide. Huh? Oh, I get it. Curly's dead, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, I know I didn't do it. No, no, no. You just slept through it, that's all. First you get mixed up in it, but then when you might be useful, you take a rain check while Curly takes a bullet. Bullet? One shot clears the whistle right through the heart from a short distance. Yeah. And he was armed. Somebody outdrew him and surprised him. And a marksman, too, huh? Or a markswoman. Yeah, where is she? Where is she? Where do you think she is? Gone, of course. And while we look for her... There was all the time in the world for this to happen. All the hey, time for this. Listen, take it easy. Hey, somebody's coming. Yeah. And remember, Lieutenant, the girl didn't shoot at herself out there on the roof. And if Curly hit it... Shh, wait a minute. Keys. Sure. Sure, it's the guy who lives here. R.C., do you want to bet? All right, friend, that's enough music. You can notice this now. Grab him. Hey, now. Sit. Okay, put down that stick, Buster. Huh? That's better. Well, a little surprise, that's all. You can let me go. I'm all right. You're all right. Sure. Da -da 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 -bum. You're breaking my heart. Never leave it too unfinished. <laughs> Had to finish it, that's all. Say, hey, didn't expect a room full of roses. Sit down. Roses are in seventh place this week, you know that? My name's Clary. Homicide. All right. Sit down. Sit. Listen, my friend. Hold on, Lieutenant. Just a minute. Roses are number seven, huh? How's Jealous Heart? A little raise on records. Down in cheat sales, though. <laughs> oh, but you ought to hear the blues number I've song got. Song plugger, huh? Maybe even the same song plugger who once introduced a cowboy to a girl. Maybe. I don't know. Play piano down at the Club Paris, too. The Club pa Oh. All begins to tie together, doesn't it? My friend, we're going to pull up our chairs for a nice long talk. <laughs> Be careful, don't stub your toe. What? Chairs are all nailed down. Keeps the maids from moving them around. Keeps the, <laughs> keeps the maids... Look, Looney, Daphne Crockett was being watched from here, and I doubt if Curly did it. She was shot at from here, but he didn't do it. Did it, do it, did it. My name's Seaver, Lieutenant, not Looney. Seaver. Dick Seaver. Dead Eye Dick, they call me. Dead Eye? And Curly was murdered by a dead... Well, brother, if you're crazy enough to wait admit minute, it... Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Wait a minute. Chairs nailed down, that stick you carry. You haven't even noticed the body yet. You haven't been watching Daphne, have you, Dead Eye? Of course not. 
I couldn't. I'm blind. George, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times. Don't jump at conclusions. You tell me how a poor old blind guy goes around filling people full of lead. It just can't happen. Unless maybe he uses seeing eye bullets. Hey, you know, that's all right. And for that matter, so is this. Say, before the shooting starts again, I think we should pause briefly for story identification, don't you? It seems that a self-styled cowboy named Rafe Disborough, who got himself fired from monogram because he could only ride side saddle, hired Valentine to keep his beady brown eye on a doll named Daphne. He figures that only one eye will be necessary, as he will have to keep the other one peeled for a guy named Curly, a black-haired character who was very repulsive. On further investigation, Daphne turns out to be an up-to-date Annie Oakley, who's been knocking him dead at the Club Paris with her fur-lined six-shooter. However, some patron who doesn't like the cover charge takes it out on Daphne and starts shooting back. Only he misses and plugs Curly. Meantime, George has been sleeping it off in Dead Eye Dick's apartment, a song plugger around town, as he has become very drowsy from a hit on the head. George immediately points the finger at Dead Eye. Only Dead Eye is blind and can't point back. Still, George figures that if he can plug songs, he can also plug people. However, this sets well with nobody, so he goes back to see Rafe Disborough, who is no help either, because all he can say is, Gosh, Mr. Valentine, that's all I can say is, gosh. But you should try harder, Mr. Disborough. Usually there's just the good men, the bad men. And the little school teacher in between, I know. Well, this isn't the plot of a western. But why you really wanted us to meet Daphne, you didn't say. So suppose you start saying, Buster, right now. What? I, uh, I told you she was in distress. Are you being blackmailed, cowboy? Uh-huh. That was Curly's business, you know. And I saw a little black bag once. Blackmailed, I said. No. No, no, not me. Not you? Well, I'm always cautious about those things, but... Well, Daphne, she has another suitor besides me is Mr. Michael J. Martin. Martin? Yeah, one of those millionaire fellows. That this is strictly confidential, you understand. And you figure Martin's a better sucker than you are, huh? Oh, well, he, he is a married man. Yeah, I, I have never taken that step. Uh-huh. And you really hired us to look into Daphne because you were afraid she was going to knock you over, too. Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. You totally misrepresent me. No, I mean nothing of the kind... The little lady is always innocent. Okay, Disborough. When you decide to tell me the truth, let me know, will you? I am. I'm just a bystander who... Or better yet, let the police know. This is still a murder case, Rafe. And they tell me cowboys are pretty good shots. You what? Oh, I'm just a singing cowboy. That's the last straw. No, I'm not proficient except with a guitar. I don't shoot guns. Well, my fans wouldn't like it. Well, listen, I'll show you. Come on, Angel. Let's get out of here. Here we are, George. Dressing room number four, three, two. Sure, sure. She's number one with a star on the door. Mm. In just a moment, please. I'm very sorry, but no one's allowed inside. Well, I'm sorry too, Shorty, but we want to Miss Crockett see... isn't receiving any callers this evening. She hopes you understand. Well, now, that's real thoughtful of her. Just step to one side. You please. needn't raise your voice, but if I haven't made myself clear... Oh, George, just pick him up and throw And him. I really don't feel like arguing Shorty, about it. Shorty, get out of the... <laughs> Oh, hello, Mr. Valentine. Goodbye. Oh, no, you don't. Stand still, sister. Well, I've really got nothing to say. Come along, Mike. Hey, get out of my way, Shorty. Wait a minute, you. Please don't be difficult, Mr. Valentine. Mac, Fred, Joe. Slow down, I said. Would you... Hey, let go. Let go. Bye-bye, Mr. Valentine. Would you... All right, Mac, Fred, Joe, she's gone. You can let go. Sure, don't get sore. Let me brush your coat. The boys, huh? Stage hands, that's all. Don't want to see you getting in trouble. Buster, I'm not the one who's going to be in trouble. Oh, yes, you are. Little guy's important, tough, too. The what? Little guy with it went with her, the Michael J. Martin. Martin? You mean that little shrimp was Martin? Lucky we saved you, huh? Lion hunter, you know. Toughest little guy in the world. Best marksman, too. No, Miss Crockett isn't here. Of course she's not here. Don't expect her to show up. 
I even had one of our own men, Taylor, and Martin shook him off, too. All right, all right, so she's not here. You said that, Lieutenant. Little school teacher type, caught in the middle. <laughs> Martin's not much to look at, only five feet tall. Two million bucks you could look at. Mm, maybe blackmail does make sense. I told you that a long time ago. But nothing else means sense. Why did Curly come out here? Why did he get killed? Oh, stop asking questions. All right, you want an answer? Curly was Daphne's husband. What? It's in the record. They used to be married. Sure. And now she was afraid of him. Sure. Does it tie together a cowboy, land hunter, Annie Oakley? Does it tell which one of those marksmen put a bullet through a man's heart with one shot? Let's not leave out Seaver. All right, so he's tied in. He's a friend of Curly's, too. But Angel, let me tell you something. When we were at the Club Paris, who was playing the piano? Huh? Well, it was... Oh, George, it wasn't Dixie. Uh-huh. See what I mean? He's missing, too. And you know, Lieutenant... A blind guy who's a heel could get into trouble easily. Now his heart's beating. Now he's just unconscious, I think. Come on, Seaver. Come on, snap out of it now. His door's still open. Somebody must have slugged him when he was running out before he could get away. Oh, Daddy beat me. My head. Oh, he's okay. Take a look inside. That's what I'm doing. Quite a mess. It's been ransacked. All the drawers, only thing still in place of the first... <gasps> Michael J. Martin. Dead. Would you look at that? Another one-shot victim. Sharpshooting. Even about the same distance. Yeah. Got Martin a little higher up, though. Hmm? Yeah, look here. Hit him right in the neck. So what? He's as dead as Curly, isn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just... What is it, George? The window. Lights just went on there, opposite. What? Yeah. Yeah, so they did. The roof garden. Our little Nell has finally come back home, huh? And, Lieutenant, if you work a process of elimination... Come on, let's get over there. I'll stay here. But, George... Go on, go on. I'll take care of Seaver yes, here. But... Now, I'll take you five minutes to make it from building to building anyway. All right, we'll keep our eyes open. But you watch from here. Don't worry, I've been wrong before. I'm not going to be wrong this time. Get going. Oh, Daddy, what a head. What's happening? What's happening, Mr. Valentine? Here. Come in, I'll give you a hand. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's my chair. Uh, the poker table. Okay, careful now. Uh, there she is. Whew. Sit down yourself, Valentine. It's good for the rocks in your head. From the chair opposite me, the wing chair there, you can see out the window. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Already there, aren't you? I can tell by your voice. What you doing now? Nothing. Taking off a coat. Take off your coat. Take off your hat. <laughs> Cigarette? Got some right here on the table. No, thanks. Go on into the kitchen now. I bet you can't cook. You've never seen her, huh? Nope. Blind since I was 21. Lost him in a stick-up I got messed up in. Stick-up? Nice guy. Oh, I've been around. But I'm straight now. She's back on the roof now. Why do you say it's straight, Seaver, when you were all mixed up with Curly? <laughs> I didn't know he'd taken a hop from prison. <clears throat> he was up here all the time watching his wife, wasn't he? Sure. It's a cinch I wasn't. You were in on the blackmail with Curly, too, weren't you? Somebody must have tipped him off that there was a good touch going, that Martin here was a pushover. <laughs> all right, so what? What have I got to lose? Conspiracy to blackmail, but everybody's dead. You're right, we can't prove it. I've been around. You're not. What's that? Oh, she's just practicing, that's all. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Everybody's a marksman. You know, poor Martin there has a gun in his pocket, too, but he was outdrawn, just like Curly. That cowboy can shoot, too, Mr. Valentine. I don't believe that stuff he says to you. No, no, I'm not talking about murder anyway. I was thinking about when Daphne over there was practicing early and somebody took a pot shot and missed. Well, what about it? Well, that couldn't have been a marksman, could it? So it must have been somebody who just stuck a gun out the window and shot to attract attention. <laughs> You've been around, too, haven't you? You knew somebody come running over like I did and find Curly and lock him up. He was a fugitive. Good way to get rid of a partner, a huh, Seaver. Well, she's going to work on the clay pigeons now. Good shot. Never mind her. Then what happened? Well, it didn't work, obviously. Curly knocked me out instead. So when you ducked back into the room to pick up the dough in the black bag, you found Curly alive and plenty suspicious. So you had to kill him, I guess. Oh, is that it? Now, how could a blind man do that? 
Then maybe later Michael J. Martin figured out who'd been in on the blackmail and came up for a little talk. So you had to kill him. <laughs> well, I guess you can't be blamed. Lots of people think I'm not really blind, but I am, see? Look. Look at the match in front of my eye. Never mind. Skip it. <laughs> it's because you are blind that I know you killed both of them. Who else but a blind man would shoot two men at the same height? A big man in the heart and a five-footer like Martin in the neck. You're crazy, Mr. Valentine. I'm blind. I don't even know where people are, little... You can tell by the sound of a voice, can't you? What? But not close enough to... Tell what chair they're sitting in? The chair that's always in the same place because it's nailed down? Well, come on now. Tell me the rest, Buster. What happens? Yeah. <laughs> You'd like to know how it works, wouldn't you? You'd like to know which chair. Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'll show you. It's the chair you're sitting in. Ain't I an old meanie, though? You know, a situation like this could set Cliff hanging back ten years. Which might be a good idea. For that matter, so is this. Now let's see how the little game of Blind Man's Bluff is turning out. It can't be good for George, because old Deadeye is getting his jollies over something. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? The blind man can fool them all. A little heavy on the downbeat, maybe. <laughs> they won't look like a marksman this time. Ah, but the coroner won't care. I'll just move him out of the chair and... Valentine. Valentine, where are you? Where are you? Just where uh, I was, Seaver. Huh? Standing by the side of this chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Valentine. I can't tell you how grateful I am for apprehending that barman. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. He was a little twisted, I guess. George, we've got to be going. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute. I asked you out here to explain about her. Oh, boy. He's really nice. She was afraid of her husband. She was afraid of what he might be up to. And uh, she wasn't really mixed up uh, much with that rich man, Mr. Martin. Oh, we know, Rafe. You told us. She's a schoolteacher type. I hope you'll be very happy. Oh, I'm sure we will, Mr. Valentine. <sighs> well, this is the last reel, Angel. So look out for the cactus while we <laughs> mount up and ride off into the sunset, leaving the little ranch house behind. Huh? Well, George, uh, at this point, doesn't the hero usually kiss the girl? Oh, no, ma'am. Huh? He always kisses the horse. Oh. Uh. You know, after a crack like that, I'm not going to even try and defend that boy anymore. I'm just going to say that Robert Bailey played George Valentine with the story by David Victor and Jackson Gillis. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, so, you all set for another visit with Valentine? You know George. He's the boy whose motto in life is let George do it. Nothing too small, nothing too big. 
better still, nothing too dangerous. He runs an ad in the personal column, but some of his clients are sent by friends. That is, if you can call Lieutenant Riley a friend. Dear Mr. Valentine, I am without doubt the ugliest man in the world. Hey, wait a minute. Who is this? However, I need your help or the man standing beside me will go crazy. Because, Mr. Valentine, I... Riley, it's you, isn't it? Lieutenant Riley. Yes, yes, it's me, and I'm the one going crazy. All right, have it your own way. Honey, what are you talking about? Valentine, I've got a client for you. A little ugly stumble bum wants your help. A slot machine repair man, no less. He needs help, or at least he won't help me unless somebody helps him. Only he won't trust the police. I don't blame him. You make so much sense. Uh, Okay, then let's say I need your help. Sure, this little guy isn't much, but the idea Riley, is... hold it, will you? You said this guy's dying? Yeah. Police hospital. The doctor gives him a day or two at the best. Can't operate, can't stop the infection. From what, Lieutenant? Oh, gunshot wounds, Miss Brooks. One gun, but all six shells. Happened in a dark alley. Whoever it was didn't want to miss him, I guess. That little man must be tough. Maybe. Or lucky or unlucky. He's one of those guys who's born to end up at the bottom of the pile, Valentine. Then why are you so interested in him? It's just possible that he can steer us all the way to the top of the pile. His name's Trailer. I told you he was the littlest shrimp in the slot machine racket. The repair man. Well, we've never found out who the big shrimp is. Uh, the... I see. I worm my way into the man's confidence, and then maybe he spills. Is that it? Blows the whole racket apart. No, no, no. You just help the little guy find his girl. Betty. Betty, that's her name. I was going to see her tonight. Betty who, Trailer? What's the rest of her name? She's beautiful. I'm not, but she is. I'm just her bill, she said. But you don't believe it either, do you? Trailer, can you understand me? There's nobody in the world to believe. You gotta be careful. You can't trust people. You gotta test them and test them and test them. And then, then you can't trust them because... They're all the same. What are you talking about, friend? The racket? I won't tell you anything. I won't. I should. All right, all right. Take it easy. I, Who shot you? Ants. You can test people to see if they're ants, you know. Put honey in front of them. See if they took themselves. Why did you ask me? Betty. Hey, Trailer. Fine, Betty. Hey, look, Trailer. Uh, uh, uh. Nurse? Betty. Guess you can have him back for a while. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Riley, I'm willing to bet he doesn't know anything that'll ever help you pry open the big time. Is that so? Well, just let me show you. Look in here. Oh, you mean the tall, skinny man over there? Yeah, yeah, Wilson, the highest-priced legal beagle in the state. Waiting to see if anybody off stage needs defending, huh? Yeah, that's it, the watchdog. Ever let just in case the police have a squealer who might stop worrying about the girlfriend and climb out of his delirium long enough to sing. Sing? What's this? What's all this, Lieutenant? Somebody's singing? That's right, Mr. Wilton. Trailer in there tells me you own all the slot machines in this state. <laughs> yes, of course. 
It's just a sideline, though, rather a bother, particularly when I don't live in this town. Here on business, Mr. Wilton? I beg your pardon? Uh, Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Oh. How do you do? Charmed. No, I've, uh, I've been retained by a client, Mr. Valentine. Oh, who's that? The Black Company. Hmm. Riley here knows about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Out-of-town corporation. Manufactures will-o'-the-wisps. Well, I'm only a lawyer. I'm not familiar. Oh, the black company's quite an outfit, Valentine. Perfectly legal. Only nobody knows who runs it. But do they own the slot machines? Oh, of course not. No Do more they than I know do. who they make bank deposits for? Does this bird trailer even know who he works for? Does anybody? The basis of all good organization, Lieutenant, is the pyramid. Like a spy system, huh? No one man knows enough to incriminate any of the others. Then why are you here, Mr. Welton? Why are you worried about this trailer person? <laughs> I haven't really said I even know the man, have I? <laughs> or that the company I represent is interested in anything more than employees' indemnity, his uh, accident and so on? <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. Riley, maybe it is possible that the best of pyramids get a little wobbly once in a while. Huh? Maybe it is possible that the reason trailer in there got shot was that he found out too much about the higher-ups. Yeah, hold it, hold, hold it, Mr. Wilton. Yeah, hello, Lieutenant Riley. Oh, I, I... I... I wanted to speak to the nurse about Bill Trailer. Well, all right. Who's calling? Well, I... Just the nurse, please. The nurse on duty there. Well, just a second. Valentine. Valentine, it's a girl. Now, take it, will you? You're the intern on duty, or anybody, anybody. What's this? Misrepresentation, Lieutenant? Here, let me have it. Hello? Nurse? Well, she'll be here in a second, honey. I'm the receptionist. Well, I just wanted to find out about a patient. His name is Trailer. Uh, trailer? Well, uh, wait till I get my cards here. Trailer. Hurry up, please. Somebody said he was there, but I, I want to know what happened to him. Well, we had an appendix case come in this morning. Oh, just tell me what happened to him. Just... What? You don't handle cases like that in the police ward. Well, I meant in the other ward. I... Hmm. She hung up. It's all right. We got the number. Call came from a phone in a bar at 1612 Commercial Lane. The old Durfee Hill section, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's quite a district. A 50-cent flop house or a $5,000 penthouse. It's what the harness boys call the Ant Hill, Valentine. The Ant Hill? Huh? Mm hmm. Let's go, Brooksy. A million people a day use that phone, my friend. Every third one tries a slug. But, bartender, all we wanted to Besides, know was. Besides, if you the... whistle at a dame, where's it get you? Maybe your boyfriend's a prize fighter. Me, I'll take television any day. The girl used the phone only a few minutes ago. Who was she? Should I know? Should I watch the cash register and be a bulldog for the phone company at the same all time? All right, all right. You don't know. Or maybe you don't want to know. I suppose you never heard of a guy named Trailer around here, either. Trailer? No, not until the fight last night. What fight? Uh, him and Louie. Who'd you think? Nice guy, that trailer, I guess. But he'll never amount to much, mixing it up with a guy hey, like slow Louie. slow down, will you? Slow down. Who's Louie? And what was this fight about? About a dame natural, classy blonde, lives up the street, named Betty. Fight ended quick. We threw them both out. Betty! Sure. See what I mean about whistling a dame? You mean this guy, Louie's tough? Go on, go on. More about Louie. Not a price letter, no, but a real sharp boy, just the same. Working his way up for a good outfit. Makes collections for the black company. That slot machines to you. Oh, fellow employee, huh? Only Louie's higher up in the pile. He makes collections from guys like you. From me? You, you're crazy. Sure. Sure. What's the rest of his name? Louie what? Ask me no questions. I'll tell you no lies. Good day, friend. Brooksy, this is where your job begins. I said I'm sorry, sister. Wrong place. No Betty here. Now beat it, will you? Hi, lady. Find your party? Well, no. This gentleman. Look, what is this? The Census Bureau? Box of flowers, Max. Sign here. What? Oh, look. All of you go someplace. I huh? haven't got all day. Sign here and don't keep the pants. All right, all right. Yeah, knock clear off. A giant. Ah. Huh? People send you flowers? Come on in. I don't know where Betty is. What do you want? Well, just to see her. Betty sings down at the nightclub, I found out. She mentioned to me once about a job, and I thought maybe dancing or selling oh, cigarettes might... Oh, great unemployed, huh? Look, you gotta be a jerk not to get along in this world, sister. What's the matter? No angles? Oh, I'm just new in town. Gee, that's a pretty box, isn't it? You gonna open them? How do you like that? 
Dated yesterday. Now there's a florist who's gonna fall right out of business. Betty gets him like that all the time, sister. She knows her way around. Nothing better than the best. Gee. I met Betty's boyfriend too once. Trailer or something. <laughs> That's what he told you? Boyfriend. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> There's a laugh. <laughs> well, sure he wasn't dressed so good. Oh, he... hopeful, Harry. She can do better than him any day. Oh, I didn't know. You mean you're the one she... Say, roses. Look, I'm Betty's brother. My name is Louie. Oh. Now, where did you say you met Betty? <laughs> Gee, has a girl got to relieve all of her privacy? We was only in the beauty shop. I was seeing about a tent. Well, don't look at me that way. She spoke to me because I complimented her on a corsage she said her boyfriend gave her. Boyfriend? <laughs> Look at that, sister. Those aren't just roses. It's a wristwatch wrapped around them, you see? Holy smoke. I'm an admirer, see? Guy she hasn't even met. Told you she was good looking. You ought to hear what they say about her singing. We're going places, her and me. Well, you don't have to hate my wrist about it. Uh, <laughs> so go be unemployed. Peter, will you? Dear Betty... I look forward to meeting you. Uh, what's that? I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes when I say I'm not a masher, and won't you please, please telephone me at Durfee Hill. Hey, yeah, give me that. Hey, let go. It's just a card with the roses, that's all. Come on, get out of here. Gosh, I'm not going to try to beat Betty's time or anything. I'll say you're not. I never heard that name anyway, Mr. Black or... Black! Valentine, of course, of course she's all right. You talked to her yourself, did you? Sure, Brooksy read me the note she'd seen on the flowers, but why... We had a man watching him. After Miss Brooks left that place, a slewy fella took off in the opposite direction like a flying duck. But my man lost him. Now, now, will you please clear up what you've been doing? That Durfee Hill number in the flower note. It's a new number, Riley. Private listing and installed only a couple of days ago from somebody from out of town who just rented this place. What place? The fanciest penthouse in the whole section. Hey, Riley, people really look like ants from up here. You mean... Sure, sure, I'm in the place. There was a loose hinge on the service door and nobody inside. You've got the loose hinge, my friend. Don't you realize it was a Mr. Black who sent those flowers? Oh, Riley, add two and two, would you? Nobody knows who owns the slot machines, who runs the Black Company. And yet a mysterious Mr. Black shows up in town, a man nobody's seen, not even the janitor downstairs. Trailer's girl, Betty, she must have seen him. Oh, no, remember, he just wanted to meet her. Probably had seen her at the nightclub or something. But that was Black's mistake if he wanted to stay incognito, giving a girl his telephone number. Because now here I am with $10,000 in my pocket. But what? What'd you say? Sure. Must be collection time in the three lemon business. About two seconds ago, a delivery boy hands me an envelope at the door. Inside was an accounting sheet for all the slot machines on the south side and proceeds for the past month. Well, I... Riley, be... I figured out who's the man at the top of the anthill. Don't ask me how long it'll last or why it works this way. But right now, Riley, that man seems to be me. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. You go to help Lieutenant Riley. Because there's a man dying in the police hospital who might tell what he knows about the slot machine racket, provided somebody helps him find his girl, Betty. Well, so far you haven't found Betty, though you have discovered that there's someone else in her life. Someone a little more successful than Trailer, a man who calls himself Mr. Black, who owns the slot machines, whose identity is a secret even from his own employees. Only if your name is George Valentine, now it's you who occupy Mr. Black's apartment. It's a dangerous game, and no one realizes that better than Claire Brooks. Down at the police hospital now, she seems unable to help. I, I don't know anything. I tell you, Trailer, I don't know. If you could just remember why you and Louie had that fight last night in the bar, was it over Betty? Betty? Or is something wrong in the business? In the black company? 
find Betty. Just find Betty. No, of course not, Brooksy. We've gone way past trailer now. We're in the middle of the ants, the scramblers. The police have the apartment surrounded now, well, George. Well, tell them to keep out and lay low unless I whistle for help. But, George... Angel will never find out who fired those shots in the trailer or who runs this rack unless we ride right along with the gang. You'll ride yourself right into a funeral notice. Sooner or later, the person who rented that apartment will come back I and said then... don't worry, will you, Brooksy, as long as I can... What? Go on, George. Well, what do you people wash those shirts in anyway? A huh? cement mix either. The, the collars come back with ground glass on the edge. George, what's the matter? Well, just don't use so much starch, that's all. Hello. I didn't mean to interrupt. The door was open. All right, then shut it and come in. Now, what is it? What do you want? Uh, don't get so boss. Now, take it easy. Your name's Louie, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Sure it is. How'd you know? You fit the description. Look, look, look I, I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I should have just sent the stuff up by messenger the way we always do, wherever the point is each oh, month. Oh, so but... that's it, huh? You're a collector. Uh, Durfee Hill and East Side, sir. You brought some money. All right, let's have it. Here, here. The counting sheet's right on top. I had all those figures in my head. It's a trick. I taught myself. Right, boy. I, I know it's not healthy to come up here and find out who you are like this, Relax, but I... relax, will you? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew you wouldn't mind when you saw that. It's almost double last month. 23,500 bucks. What did you do? Fix the machine so they pay in bubble gum instead of jackpots? Oh, oh, oh no, sir. No, I, I didn't touch them. But uh, I've been in there giving them the old boost, you know, talking it up with the bartender. A real climber in the business, aren't you, Louie? Uh, now, what's this really about, Buster? How did you make so much money this month? Oh, well, the truth of the What happened is... to Trailer, the repairman? I don't know what you mean, happened. Who shot him? Boss, listen, he was cheating you. Did you know that, did you? I can prove he was. He was what? Hold now. Jack up the setting on the machines and then split the rake off with bartenders. That's how he did it. You must have heard the same thing Mother districts. He floated around all of them, didn't he? You know, it's getting too complicated for me. Uh, now, wait a minute. Wait, listen, that's how I built up my total for the month, by catching him at it and stopping it. Yeah, you earned the Silver Star, all right. Uh, look, who are you, you going to call? Listen to the rest of what I got. Buster, I'm going to see a man about pinning a medal on you. But I didn't do it. I didn't empty any gun into him. Wow. Everything happens at once. Uh, you want me to get it for you, boss? No, no, I'll get it. Go mix yourself a drink or something. Uh, don't mind if I do. I, I know who it is anyway. Huh? Well, this is great. Oh. Hello. I guess you're the man, huh? <laughs> Are you the girl? Don't be funny. I mean, well, after all the notes you've been sending me with the flowers. Oh, sure. Come in, come in, Betty. Thanks. Say, you live all right, don't you? <laughs> I hope to. Uh, you know, you're not so easy to find, Betty. I've been wanting to meet you for some time now. Yeah, I got the idea. Do you always use that whirlwind stuff, flowers and presents on a girl, Mr. Whatever your name is, Black? Uh... Hey, slow down. Take your coat off. Uh, sure. Well, you wanted to meet me. You saw me in the nightclub and you heard my singing and you wanted to meet me. Well, now, who wouldn't? You're very beautiful. Do a girl good to be known she associates with you? <laughs> no comment. Any girl would break her neck to get up here. She'd give her eye teeth to walk up close to you like this. Hmm? Hey, what's the matter? You dirty... Hey, sis, sis, cut it out. Cut it out, sis. You said you'd be nice. Now stop it. Will you cut it out? I, I don't know what's the matter with the boss. Honest, I suppose you both be quiet. She said she was coming up here to see you. She promised She promised you would, you know. I, I, I told her what a great guy you I said, I... shut up, killer. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 look, boss, this is my sister. Say, one of the greatest kids in the I world. I know, I... I know. A guy could go places if his sister associated with a big shot like what me. What was it you said? You called Louie... Freddie, you came up here to find out about Trailer, didn't you? To slap my face and ask the big shot which one of his hired hands was responsible for your boyfriend being down there in the hospital. Wasn't that it? He's not a boyfriend. She's ten times as good as him. He's only been hanging around a couple of months. Sure, he's not an eager beaver like you, Buster. He wouldn't try to use his own sister to get him ahead in the world. Oh, no, no, they just thought about it. In that bar the other night? Oh, yeah, but that was all. I told him to stay fun. away and he got me and it took me no. one at a time, will you? Honestly. You live with the no, ants. Don't you know what they're like yet? Or was that what you saw in trailer? That he was a little different from the scramblers? It was a dope. He was stealing, holding out. You want to bet it was you who was holding out from collections, Louie, and he caught you at it? Boss, no. No him a chance to get rid of two birds with one stone. Get in the boss's good graces and cover your Louis, own tracks by being the guy... You said you didn't see trailer after that fight. Well, All I, I know, buddy, is that your brother said something to me a minute ago about a gun being emptied into trailer. Huh? 
Well, it so happens he was shot six times. Only how could you know about that little specific thing, Louie, unless you were the guy? look, everything I've done is for you. It's for the good of the company. I'm looking ahead all the time. See, I, I want to... Fl- it, if you like. Huh? Hey, who's that for? Got a gun? Shut up. Hello, Mr. Wilton. <laughs> party's over, huh? Yes. Yes, the party's over, I'm afraid. And besides, it's making too much noise. Next door? No, I've been in the back of a wardrobe you overlooked. Oh, sure. Well, I didn't think it could last. It never did make sense that such a careful setup as this apartment wouldn't have... Wouldn't have me. Yes, me. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. So's Louis. So's Betty. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, who is this guy? Now, if the three of you will I'll just... I'll take care of him. Down that gun, Buster. Don't worry. He can't get away with anything. Stop it. Stop it. You're making a mistake. <laughs> Ambitious to the end. Couldn't resist trying to make one last impression on you, could he, Mr. Valentine? Mr. What? <laughs> yes, Betty. I'm afraid I'm the Mr. Black who's been so anxious to meet you. Yeah, it's too bad. Things couldn't have worked out better for us. But if you're Mr. Black... I... The great organizer. The best of pyramids totter once in a while. I was here to make my own collections this time. I thought it was about time for a visit to South America. <laughs> so if you'll just hand over my money... Why don't you come and get it? You've caused enough trouble already, Valentine. Sure, come on, come on. Shoot some more people. I'm warning you. No. It's the only way you're going to get out of here. Valentine, I... Like that gun. Well, thanks, Riley. Mr. Slot Machine King, see what the sound of those shots brought you? Three lemons. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And that was it, Trailer. A gun test proved that Louis shot you. Yeah. Why? Well, ambition, I guess. Cover his own mistakes, get in good with a big boss. Can you understand me, Trailer? Can you understand what I'm saying? Yes, and all scrambling around. That's all Louis was. Sure. That's all Wilton is, too. But the girl's different. I think she'd like to see you, Trailer. Yeah. Yeah, we found Betty. She's a nice girl. Uh, yes, I know. Since when? What? I said, since when did you know? I mean, that she was the kind of a girl who's a little different. Who might have really meant it when she said she liked an ugly little guy like you. Mr. Valent, I'm very tired. I'm very... Wilton isn't kidding anybody. I just want you to know that I know that, Trailer. I... Begun to guess it, I... His biggest mistake was trying to take over the slot machine empire tonight. Like the rest, he couldn't resist the opportunity. George! Think back, Angel. Wilton's tall and skinny. Would he have ever written a note to Betty, just an ordinary-sized girl, saying, I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes? No, of course he did He's only a lawyer. A rat trying to grab what he can off a sinking ship. And Valentine. I had no idea. I'll say it for you, Trevor. Uh, Wilton didn't ever own the slot machines like he claimed he did at the last minute. And he wasn't the Mr. Black in the notes. No, they'd have to be a short man, probably. A little guy. Yeah. A little guy. Like maybe a man who'd made such a success out of not trusting anybody that he couldn't believe a girl liked him. He had to test her by making her think a big shot was after her. To see if she'd drop him and run for the honey. He was in town for the collections anyway... And the nose around the way he always did, inspecting the anthill he built while looking like a repairman. You mean, Trailer here is really Mr. Black? Yeah, Brooksy. What would you have done, Trailer, if Betty had dropped you and chased after you, Mr. Black, the way her brother wanted her to? I... I would have killed her. No. No, I... I wouldn't have. 
I know. I don't know. I know, Buster. It's pretty ironic. You kept your identity so secret. You did so well. That what happened? You got shot by a guy whose only ambition was to get in good with the boss. Make a big, fine impression on you. Now you still want to talk to Betty while you can, Mr. Black? No. No. She... Leave her out of our anthill. You have just heard The Ant Hill, another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey stars as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, uh... Did you ever hear of anyone who was afraid of an angel? Now, I'd always heard there were pretty nice people with wings and harps and stuff. But not so with Lefty's gal Friday. She had this angel as figured packing 45s, all aimed at her. Now, instead of getting panicky and chewing her nails until she resembled Venus to Milo, she should have looked up George Valentine. His motto is, let George do it. And he isn't afraid of 45s or even 46s. I must say, however, she had a reason to be scared. You see, she played a big part in building this angel. And just in case you've never seen an angel being manufactured, listen, and you'll get it firsthand. Rockstar, get your paper. Let the lump it kill an auto crash. Law couldn't get him, but wet pavement dead. There you are, left the lump part. Big shot. You say your name's Emerson. Huh? You heard me, Mr. Valentine, Frank J. Emerson. Oh, but you're the president of... That's right, young lady, Emerson and Citibank. And I'm a very busy man. I only want to know if you've read about Lefty Lumpert's death in that auto accident. Sure, who hasn't? Naturally, naturally. When the biggest crook in town dies, it's news. Young lady, but I know what sort of reputation Mr. Lumpert was supposed to have. Well, just because they could never nail anything on him, not even the income tax board. Of course, yes, yes, I know. But I must remind you that Mr. Lumpert owned a perfectly respectable small investment office. <laughs> Invest in a dog track or a five-foot shelf of bookies. Perfectly respectable, I said. Regardless of whatever criminal connections or power Mr. Lumpert may or may not have had, that front, that uh, business of his, was proven many times to be perfectly... Yeah, perfectly respectable. I heard you the first time. Okay, okay. Lumpert was real smart. He worked alone. He never told anybody anything. His ostensible occupation was strictly legal. There. That reassure you? Well, yes. I just wanted to make sure... Only, uh, what's it to you? Why so insistent? And why should a banker like yourself be concerned with Mr. a guy... Mr. Valentine, my bank has done business with Lefty Lumpert many times. Oh. And never mind that tone of voice, either. A dollar is a dollar. Our money was only used in legitimate purposes. It's not up to us to refuse business to a man merely because he's supposed to be engaged in other outside activities, is it? No, really, let's not be naive. Oh, no, no, let's not be naive. All right, Mr. Valentine. It's embarrassing. Of course it is. Business is business, and I have nothing to be ashamed of. But, uh, well, I've never liked it very much. Then why are you here? Why does Lumpert's death mean... Oh, no, no, no. Don't get the wrong idea, please. There's nothing I'm really worried about. But, you see, he had a secretary, Myrtle Dane. 
And through the years, I've got to know her pretty well. Myrtle Dane, the one who was in the accident with him? That's right. Probably as close to him as anyone could ever be. At least anyone from the legitimate end. She's quite a person, Myrtle. <laughs> She's uh, rationalized working for him much better than I have. A very realistic person, a very good secretary. If she knows anything about Lefty's more private life, she certainly never let on. Wait just a minute. The newspaper said that Miss Dane was hurt. She was driving, they were going to an appointment and in a hurry, but the steering wheel saved her. Banged up and shaken a good deal, yes, but not badly enough to make her behave irrationally. What do you mean? I've just been to see her at the hospital. Normal, friendly act, that's all. But she refused to see me. I forced my way in, but it didn't do any good. For some reason, Mr. Valentine, the girl is terrified. She's even afraid of me. Uh -huh. well, what do you want me to do about it? If there is any scandal or kickbacks or new discoveries about Lumpert's activities now that he's dead, I'll admit I want to protect my own name and the name of the bank. But also, Mr. Valentine, I think it's my duty as a citizen to wonder, why is she afraid? <laughs> You know, I think that's a pretty silly question. Now, if you'd taken part in bumping off the town's leading gangster, how would you feel? Now, don't start looking for the nearest cave, because I want you to hear this. Now, let's see how George is doing with Myrtle. Nope. She's still standing her ground. No, I don't want to see anyone. I told you. They brought you some candy, dear, in the doctor. Please, nurse, how many times oh, do Myrtle, I have to... Myrtle, how are you feeling? What? Uh, will you excuse us a minute, nurse? Yes, Mr. No, come back here. I told you. That I... <laughs> Sorry, but she's a friend of Miss Brooks here. Hello. Who are you? What do you want? Nothing. Brought you some candy. Take it away. Get it out hey, of here. Hey, take it easy. Myrtle, look. It is just candy. That's Won't all. Don't blow up or anything. Uh, a little nervous, aren't you? I'm, I'm sorry. The nurse called you Mr. Valentine, didn't she? You're George Valentine. I know you're all right. I... There's a hall full of flowers and fruit and candy out there. Lots of people have been pestering you, huh? <laughs> Suddenly I'm popular. At my age and with my face, can you imagine? Who sent you? Emerson. Oh, the banker. Well, you can tell Mr. Emerson that I am not just another working girl out of a job. I have been very well paid. I don't want another job. That I am taking a year off to take a trip around the world and will probably never come back to this town or ever talk about the time I've spent here. Hold on, hold on, will you? I don't believe you. What? Mr. Valentine, the doctor says I can leave this hospital in about ten minutes. And I tell you, I'm going straight to the airport. I know, I, I know, sure. You're running away fast. But to work for a guy like Lefty Lumpert, you must be a very sharp and cold-blooded girl. Certainly smart enough to know that people will raise their eyebrows and say, Oh, she only worked in his legitimate enterprises, huh? Running away, huh? Keeping her mouth shut. You wouldn't believe me one way or another. Any more than anyone else would when I tell him I know nothing about Lefty's criminal connections. No, you're wrong again. I do believe you. Thank you. A dollar's a dollar, you know. But it takes some rationalizing to work at a job like mine for so many years. And ignore the other kind of remark. Whose remarks? What makes you so bitter, Myrtle? Oh, no, you don't. My personal life is still private. Big Shot dies unexpectedly. Faithful, tough private secretary is suddenly scared to death. Why? Well, that's the only reason I'll believe you didn't really know anything about Lefty. Because now you don't even seem to know whom you should be afraid of. Mr. Valentine... There's an assistant district attorney by the name of Bill McCoy. Do you know him? No, but I can certainly find, find him. him and meet me at Lefty's office. Give me an hour to get dressed and checked out of here. Why? <laughs> because the two of you are like cold water in the face. Oh, no, I'm not afraid of Bill. Maybe you've just reminded me of my debt to society, that's all. Is he the one? Bill? What one? I'm not very good at double talk. Yes, you are. <laughs> because I'm doing it right now, of course I am. He's the only person who hasn't come to see me. Bill McCoy. All right, so I'll go see him. And we'll all try to solve the riddle of Lefty together, shall we, Mr. Valentine? Well, that's the general idea. I'm scared, Mr. Valentine, but you're wrong. It's not because I don't know whom to be afraid of. No. And it's not any mysterious partner of Lefty's, either. It's an angel. I'm scared to death of Lefty's angel.
An angel, George? Protect her, Brooksy. That's what she was talking about. She means a guy like Lefty couldn't get along without someone to protect him from higher up. Oh, someone respectable. Maybe that's why the police could never get anything far enough. Hey, hold it. Huh? Hey, you. That's not the way you get into a hospital, is it? Through the fire entrance? You make up the rules or something? Oh, but I got friends on this floor. That brightens my whole day. Now get out of the way. Hey, look, that's an operating room. You want to visit that? Eh? Yeah. Only a couple of private rooms up here. And maybe you're mixed up. At least my friend doesn't want to see anybody. Come on, come on now. I'll show you the reception desk. Yeah, I got business to attend to, and I get oh, out no, of the... Oh, no, you don't. I'm going to see and you can't stop That's me. That's what you think. All right, all right. Cut it out. Mistakes, see? Yeah. That's all. On the wrong floor, I guess. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Come back here, you... See you again sometime. George, what on earth was yeah, that? Stop being tough when I bumped his chest when I noticed he carried a gun. Oh... She afraid of an angel or a devil, George? Hey, look, get to the police and give them a description of that guy, will you? And check the reception desk on everybody else who's tried to see Myrtle. I got a hunch this case is going to go off like a string of firecrackers. Did we keep you waiting, Myrtle? Found your friend here in the barber shop. Hello, Myrtle. Hello, Bill. <laughs> well, that's a friendly greeting. Why did you want to see me here at Lefty's office, Myrtle? I thought the big investigator might enjoy a chance to search through Lefty's private papers. Well, McCoy, it seems like the place to start if we're going to try to find out who his angel was. No, no, I just thought it would be a good idea. Hmm? We're too late. Somebody beat us to it. Look. Holy smoke. Yeah. Looks like a typhoon went through here. It was like that when I got here a few minutes ago. Filing cabinets open, papers all over the floor. Yeah, and any incriminating papers just plain aren't here anymore, Check. I've never told this to Bill, Mr. Valentine, but Lefty always said the law would never get him. He had an angel watching over his shoulder. Yeah, an angel who just tore this place apart. Yes, that's the point. Lefty was no fool. If there was such a person, then somewhere he must have kept a file on him to protect himself. Only where is it? Oh, cut it out, both of you. He didn't keep it here. Huh? How do you know? If his own secretary is... I was more delicate, but I ransacked the place myself two nights ago. You what? And there wasn't anything here then, Valentine. Two nights ago? The same night you took me to the movies? Oh, now take it easy, Myrtle. And you said you had to go home early to get some sleep? Mr. Valentine, do you know how many years this waste basket from the district attorney's office has been trying to get something on my boss? Do you know how many laws he's broken himself? Cut it out, will you? A job is a job. Yes, isn't it, though? Like, like taking me out Okay, and... never mind. You're on opposite sides of the fence. You don't like each other. Myrtle, he's dead now. Please, oh, won't you... Oh, it, will you? Hey, Myrtle, did Lefty have a safe deposit box? Yes. I know where the key is. Please. You know what's in that box? No. I suppose you won't believe that either, Bill. Oh, for the love of... Look, Myrtle, the thing I've been trying to do ever since he died is to round up that muscle head of his, Murphy. I don't know anything about him either. I've only seen him once or hey, twice. Hey, Bolo, will you please? What's all this? Who's Murphy? The other side of Lefty's life, bodyguard, Aaron Boy. Myrtle's right. He never hung around the legitimate end. Murphy is a big, ugly guy with one cauliflower ear, which is probably the only ear that's ever heard Lefty in private with whoever he dealt with. Wait a minute. I'll get there. Hello? George, I'm down at the police station, and I gave them a description of that man in the hospital. Oh, Brooksy, yeah, yeah, I, I already know who he is. You do? Just caught on this minute. His name was Murphy. He's the link with the angel. Maybe Lefty's only link with his angel. Hey, watch this. Who are you talking to? Mr. Valentine, you mean you've seen Murphy? What wait a minute, Brooksy, listen. No, George, you listen. You wait a minute. Do you know that they found Murphy ten minutes ago in an alley? Do you know that Murphy's dead, that he's been murdered? <laughs> Say, this angel really gets around, doesn't he? Or is it Lefty's angel? Could be that uh, eager beaver from the DA's office. I wouldn't know. I only know a good thing when I hear it. Just like you're going to right now. Lefty Lumpert, the big shot no one could ever nail, least of all Bill McCoy, the DA's man who's always handled the case, is finally dead. 
from an automobile accident. But what's to become of Lefty's mysterious underworld empire? Well, the secretary who handled Lefty's legitimate business says that Lefty had an angel, a protector. But she doesn't know who it is, of course. A faithful bodyguard named Murphy might know, but he's just been shot to death. So if your name is George Valentine, you know that now it'll take some fast flying to catch up with an angel. But, Brooksy, where was the... That's all I know so far, George. The police are down there now. It was in the alley, just a block from the hospital. So it must have happened just after we chased him away from Myrtle. Okay, Brooksy, stay there at headquarters. I'll meet you later. Hey, Myrtle, you said you know where Lefty kept his safe deposit key. Yes, of course. All right with you, McCoy? Sure, if Lefty had a file on the angel Okay, then let's go. Sometimes files have teeth. Size boxes. At least he had plenty of room for this stuff. Miss Dane, Mr. Valentine. Hold it. Oh, well, hello, Mr. Emmers. And McCoy. I noticed you people come into the bank. I hurried over as fast as I could. Thanks, but I don't think we need you. Left your safe deposit box. That's what you're after. Any objections? Well, no, not at all, as far as I'm concerned. I've got the authority. I'll take the responsibility for approving it with a court order. Oh, my signature's on file as Lefty's secretary, if you'd rather we handle it that way. No, no, no. Go right ahead. <laughs> you just wanted to watch him. Okay, here goes. Hmm. Plenty of stuff. Well, these are just income tax things. Yeah. How about this? Oh, wait a minute. No. No, it's the same. And these are audits from the investment office, see? Bonds, 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 bonds. Brother, look at this. I know he had a lot of money invested in buildings. There's a million bucks worth here, or I'll eat it. Lefty never talked much about his money. Say, look, let's not be naive, Emerson. Lefty couldn't have made that kind of dough with his legitimate business. Of course not. Not a tenth of it. So you prove he had other enterprises. So what? We already know that. Now, oh, come on. This is no good. We're wasting up. A... Hey. Yeah. Dusty little envelope down at the bottom. Acme Rental Service. Here, let me have that. All right. Take it easy. Huh. A key. Nothing in it but a key. Well, it looks like a house key. We can trace it, all right. There's a date on the envelope. Acme will have a record. Well, sometimes I've called Lefty at his house and there wasn't any answer. I mean, lots of times when he was supposed to be home... And his wasn't... own home is pure as driven snow. So, maybe you had another house. A place nobody knew about. The guy playing it safe would keep a duplicate key in the bank. Okay. I'll see you later. What? I'm running over to Acme. Valentine, you worry about the murder. Running down Lefty's other life is my worry. Well, well, after all this time of getting nowhere, the heroic DA's man steps in... Sure, I'm after a headline, so what? Skip it, and I'll call you back in an hour. So you want to know about Murphy's record, eh, Valentine? A guy like Lefty can be a smart lone wolf, but not a strong man. Sure, that's the idea, isn't it? So you ask me about the weak link strong Johnson, man. Johnson, what's eating you anyway? Oh, nothing. Murphy was just as smart as his boss. Never been locked up, never had friends, never hung around bars and shot his mouth off. So he's dead and we might as well forget about him. You want to know something? I bet he didn't even know anything about any angel. Just left these big, faithful muscle And what's all this stuff on your desk here? Angels. I'm starting a list of angels. And do you know how many there might be? What do you mean? The DA's office always thought Lefty played it alone, like a genius. So now we get into it, because there's murder. And what do we find? Well, Emerson at the bank has dealt with him for a long we time. We find a corporation executive who played cards every Friday with Lefty for years. A real estate king, a fire chief. My friend, I'm telling you, there could be an angel behind every cloud. Okay, okay, Johnson, I get it. Now, which one is it? His lawyers, that's the best bet. Big, respectable outfit. Ask them to call back. Hello? Oh, uh, who is this? Hey, give me that phone. Man. Take the extension. What is this, a date bureau? Hello, Myrtle. Mr. Valentine, did he call you? Who? Bill McCoy. He was going to. He was going to call me, and it's nearly two hours. No, no, he hasn't, Myrtle. Say, where are you? I called his office, but they haven't heard from him, and I stopped by his apartment, but nobody answered. Listen to that. Everybody's getting into the... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Myrtle, I'll ask the police well, I to... checked the Acme place and they gave me the address he went to. It's a houseboat. What? But I still can't find Bill. Amateur detectives. Listen, lady. Mr. Valentine, come out here fast, will you? That's where I am. Lefty's hideout. The houseboat. Hey, 
Pretty fancy place. Yes. Great strictly for business, though. It's where he must have handled his contacts and things. Well, there's certainly nobody here. Say, was the door open like that when you came here? Oh, yes, I haven't touched anything. I don't care about that. I was just thinking about keys. What? What do you mean? Well, if a guy's careful enough to keep one in the bank, chances are there's only one other. Left his own key. Well, that was in his pocket in the wreck, George. Lieutenant Johnson checked the number of it for me. So the only key loose is the one McCoy has. So he must be the one who left the door open. But why? Unless he was in such a hurry. Take it easy, will you? He means quite a lot to you, doesn't he? And vice versa. No. No, I hate him. Always following me around. Hey, wait a minute. You notice the wall safe? What? Here, behind the table. George, it's been left open, too. Uh Ah, by somebody who knew the combination. Johnson can tear this place apart now, but I'll bet he won't find anything. Whatever there was is gone. Bill, I don't care about that. What's happened to Bill? George, yes. Whoever opened it had to know the combination, so it couldn't have just been Mr. McCoy that was here. He could have found it that way. Or he could have found somebody else here and taken the stuff out of it and headed for the DA's office. Oh, no, you know that's not true. George, if the angel was here, too... Stop jumping to conclusions, both of you. Come on. You heard me, no. Hasn't shown up at his office, hasn't phoned anybody. Look, Johnson, what about asking the traffic department? They can't find him either. They're checking taxis now, but no luck so far. Hey, where you going? McCoy's apartment. Try to get some more leads on him. George, look. Uh, McCoy? Hey, McCoy. Bill? Oh, you're wasting your time. Look at the bureau and the closet door. I'll say. Somebody sure went through here fast. No neckties on the rack. Drawers left open. Uh-huh. No razor blade. No toothbrush. George! Yeah. No suitcase in the closet, either. Somebody else must have been here, don't you think? I mean, it seems to me most likely... Hey, what are you doing at that fireplace? Listen, Get away from that... No. Yeah. Ashes. Papers. So you try to step on them and put... They're all burned, whatever they are. Hey, Brooksy, shut the door. Get rid of that draft in here. Maybe I can still make out this... Yeah, that's what they are, all right. All right, Myrtle, look. Whose handwriting is that? I don't know. A second ago, I thought you were scared because you thought McCoy might be dead. Now, come on, whose papers are these? I don't know. They're burned so badly, okay, I can't Okay, you tell... won't tell me, but I know somebody who can. Naturally, I've seen Mr. Lumpert's writing many times. I doubt if the lab will get much out of them, Valentine. But that's what the papers were, all right. Records of payoffs, dealing with gamblers, the whole works, whole underworld empire. Lefty Lumpert, his records. Except for one page concerning his angel. Mr. Valentine, no, it it, it can't be true. He wouldn't His have. angel by the name of Bill McCoy. Well, it's happened before. No one in a better position to protect him. The investigator who somehow could never find anything. Until today. And then he destroyed it as fast as he could and ran. Well, that does it. I got all the evidence we need. Uh Uh-huh. All over but chasing down McCoy. And Myrtle, you'll feel different when we find him. And if we hurry, I know how to do it. Once you said I was tough, Mr. Valentine. Well, now you know why. Take it easy, take it easy. You rationalize yourself into taking a job like mine with Lefty. You deal with phonies. And the first nice guy who pays you a lot of attention. Turns out to be a phony, too. It's that kind of a word. I know, I know. You said you knew where to find it. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I phoned the River Patrol to meet us. Who? Lefty Lumpert's underworld business is still really intact. Those ashes won't tip off any names or places. And it's a good business. Worth continuing. You mean... You mean you think I Bill mean, is I mean, suppose Bill wasn't the angel. He was really a partner of Lefty? Suppose Lefty's? there wasn't any angel. After all, you're the only person who ever said there was one. What? Just like you made a big show of being frightened. To prove there was one, I guess. But Lefty so often If Lefty me... wasn't a lone wolf, the way everybody else figured, then the only possible associate was you. Mr. Valentine, you're I really You're tough, all right, he... sister. Suppose that's what Murphy knew. Suppose that's what he wanted to see you about. You, the new boss. What? Suppose that's why you shot him in the alley near the hospital where he waited for you to come out. Shot him to quiet the only person who knew your real position. This is the most ridiculous oh, accusation. Oh, wait a minute. Except Bill McCoy, of course, sure. 
the man who was breathing close to the truth. And that's where we're going now, to drag the river real fast before the mud and silt keep us from finding his body forever. His, his body? Sure. But, but he was the angel you, you saw left his own Private file. Private secretary and... for years. That forgery would be a cinch for you. Just like you had time to murder McCoy there at the houseboat. Then tear over and fix up his apartment to look like he'd run away. Burn those papers, but leave just enough stop so we think... Stop it, stop it. I won't listen if to you. If we find his body where you dumped it, then there's no other way it could work, is there? Yes. Yes, there is. Like, you could keep on driving right across the bridge, oh, right out of town. put that gun away, sister. And never mind attracting any attention to speeding. You see, there's no reason for me to do all those things. Why would I? Lefty was my... Where did he come from? What are you trying to... Right behind us, sister. Head of the traffic department. I asked him to pick me up. Wait, you... Oh, no. Careful with that thing, sister. I'm going to ask the department to reinvestigate that accident of Lefty's. The one with you driving. Because that'd explain everything, wouldn't it? If this case really had three murders. Well, Myrtle, those policemen are getting out of their car... You've only got about two seconds to make up your mind what you're going to say. You know what I'd say if I was in Myrtle's shoes? Bye. Of course, you couldn't count on it working. Not to the extent, anyway, that you can always count on this. Mr. Valentine, you don't count very well, do you? Oh, yes, I do. Three murders. Because everything that's happened would make plenty of sense. If you maybe happened to give Lefty the extra blow after that accident that supposedly killed him. Or you could have rigged the accident I by... I said you don't count very oh, well. Give me that. Oh. oh, yeah, I can still count. So can you. Three murders, I said. Not four. First Lefty, then Murphy, then McCoy. Real tough woman, Brooksy. But she wanted to take over Lefty's empire. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, at least one thing tonight, George. I noticed this case made you stop calling me Angel. Yeah. just heard another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey starred as George, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. A few years ago, a new slogan or slang expression was thrust on the vocabulary of the American public. You remember it. It came in very handy when the wife wanted you to clean out the attic. Or your brother-in-law put the bite on you for a ten spot. It was, quote, drop dead, unquote. Of course, it never did you any good, but it was better than 23's could do or go jump in the lake. If you listen carefully, you may get some tips on how to use the expression with more effective results. It all started with a phone call to George Valentine's office by a little fellow who was just full of questions. 
Oh, let's see if George has any of the answers. Don't you want a story? Hold it, will you? Who is this? Jerry Yule, I said. I'm a writer and I have a story. Yeah, well, this is George Valentine and I'm not a publisher. Please listen to me. You've got to meet me right away. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. The old waterfront district. The captain's who's what? I live here. It's an old hotel. I'm collecting material. But this particular story, I'm afraid I don't know how it ends. And that's why I need you. Sounds to me like it goes around in a circle. I want to be there when it ends. Don't you understand? That's why I'm calling you instead of the police. Police? What kind of a story is it? Well, it concerns a mysterious stranger and a seaman who chews tobacco. And mostly, of course, the parrot. The what? The parrot, a green and orange parrot. Ordinarily, I don't like parrots myself, such mangy, squawking creatures, but Captain Charlie, of course, will... A green to... and orange parrot. Now, look, friend, and if Meet you... me in 15 minutes at the foot of Tide Street, please. You don't want anyone else to get their hands on this story, do you? <laughs> Well, I don't know, Mr. Yule. It all depends whether or not this story has a happy ending. And from where I sit, I'll bet you it hasn't. However, to keep things even, here's another kind of story that I know has a happy ending. Now, let's see. Uh, George and Brooksy were supposed to meet a Mr. Yule at the foot of Tide Street. Say, that's a pretty rough part of town. You better watch it, George. You might get in over your head. Is it always so foggy down here? Well, only in the summer. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. Quite an ornate old place, isn't it? Oh, the rooms are empty now, or most of them, and half of it is locked off, of course. It tips like a one-legged man there where the pilings underneath are sinking. The commercial docks went away and left this district, you see, when they built the new piers yeah, farther down. Yeah, I know. Beer and sandwiches. Step into the kitchen and make your own. Rooms, 50 cents. Quite a come down from the kind of hotel it must have been once. Oh, but there's no transient trade, you understand, Miss Brooks. Just the ones Captain Charlie asked to stay permanently. Like writers who specialize in foggy stories. <laughs> now, just be patient, Mr. Valentine. I want you to understand this setting, that's all. Its mood, its its character. It's strange, Shut yet. The door. Oh, hello. You want some coffee for your own? Oh, no, look at me, friend. Captain Charlie, I suppose. No, no, this is Mawson. Sure, I'm not crazy. I I just look that way. The business cards, menus, and wedding announcements. That's his line. What? Why, he used to do the menus on the Lusitania, no less. Mm, been sunk ever since. <laughs> <laughs> he prints Charlie's stationery for him. Not that Charlie ever uses any, but that's how he took him in. Where is it coming from? The door. That's all right, Sadie. Go back to your knitting. Oh, there, that's Sadie. She used to own the place back in the gay days when it was Sadie's Neptune. Sure, place. sure, but Captain Charlie never had the heart to throw her out either. Who are your friends, you? Oh, never mind us. All we care about is a story. Not that we'll ever get it. Yeah, well, now, Morton here, he was in it. Oh, no, I'm not. Charlie, give me a check for the 25 bucks. Don't mix me up in your fiction. Parrots. Ha! Bird feathers. I said who's down there? You, Captain? Look, Buster, for the last time, will you tell us what this is all about? Come on, come on. Through here. No borrow. I'll do you all right. Well, 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 and who might your friends be, Mr. Yule? No matter, no matter, the welcome's always out. But you know what I've been here sitting and thinking, me and Limey here? Right, Skipper and me been thinking. Be quiet. Right, Skipper. The next thing this hotel needs is a rubber plant. I remember in Bombay once, I, I seen the most lovely rubber plant... Hey, wait a minute, I wanted to tell these people about last night. Oh, that. Well, now, I don't blame you. Last night, young lady, I bought the most lovely green parrot that any man ever saw. Do you know this morning he Captain, actually... would you mind sticking with last night? What is it? What happened last night? He told you, Governor, he bought a parrot. No, 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 no. But a story should begin at the beginning. And, Mr. Valentine, the very first thing was $25. That's what woke me up. What? Yeah, right. I woke you up to borrow it, see? Only he didn't have it. And neither did Sadie, so I had to break the lock on Morton's room and dig it out of his stuff. It, that's on account of the skipper there was a little short in the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> made Morton sore, too. Made all of you sore. Oh, not me, skipper. Nobody appreciates a good parrot, young lady, but I do, and I bought him. 
Had to scrape up a whole hundred dollars. That's the story. But I made it and I bought him. Limey, run fetch the bird. Show the people. Uh, all right, Skipper, whatever you say. Uh, I'll give you a hand in case he talks back. Ah, uh, Yule, is that all there is to it? Just that the captain bought a bird? Uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, the, the, the stranger. Now, let me tell you about him. The man he bought the bird from. The mysterious stranger. Uh, uh, don't look at me that way. He was. He was a foreigner of some sort. He was a Hindu or Sikh or something. One of those big fellas with a beard and a turban. Uh, but a sailor. And he and Charlie gibbered away at a great rate in some heathen tongue. Oh, now, look, friend. He wanted to get rid of that bird, the Sikh did. Act as if he was afraid of him. That's why all the fuss about the money. He was so anxious to get paid and get out. And when he left, he left a running. Well? Hey, here, now wait. <laughs> here he is, right here, you ducky low. Careful there, Limey. Careful he don't slip off your shoulder. <laughs> He's taking quite a fancy to Limey here, you know that? So that's the parrot. <laughs> Isn't he the most lovely bird you ever saw? Well, I wouldn't exactly say Oh, he... Limey's going to clean him up a bit. You know how it is. But here, here, let me show you. This is a piece of resistance. Now, come on, baby. Say it. Speak out for the people, oh, baby. Oh, fine bird. He talks you. That's a baby. That's a baby. Talk right up like you did to the heathen. Speak out, baby. Speak ah, drop dead. Drop dead. Drop dead. <laughs> drop dead. Isn't he the most lovely thing you ever heard? Drop dead. That does it. Uh, Valentine, wait, 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 wait. Wouldn't it interest you if I told you that I took a walk this morning just before I called you and that I found the sick... That heathen sailor who was so afraid and so anxious to get rid of the bird. And that the poor man was just lying there in an alley. Dead. Now, wait a minute. That man didn't drop dead. He was rolled. Look at his pockets. See for yourself. Slugged and rolled, that's all. Yeah, you're right, Lieutenant. Only whoever hit him tapped him a little too hard, Chuck. It's happened more than once down here. But don't you think it's interesting that... Uh... And never mind that Eye of the Idol mystery magazine stuff either, Mr. Yule. What I want to know is why you didn't report this to the police quicker. But here in the alley, I knew no one would find him. Besides which? A beard and a turban. You don't even know he's the same guy you saw last night. I think he is. Ah, there's a whole shipload of these birds in port. Can you tell them apart? Routine, that's a routine case, and you've got to clutter it up. Big mystery. <laughs> okay, boys, where's that wagon? Well, Mr. Yule... I wrote a story about one of these fellas... Hey, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Johnson will cut your gizzard out if you touch that body. You're in enough trouble as it is. Let go of me! Ah. The turban. Here, hold that flesh out. Ah. Oh, brother. There. You see? I told you it was the same man. Yeah, whoever rolled the sailor just wasn't so bright about where he'd carry his money, huh? No, 60, 70. Yeah, give me that. Yeah, it's the hundred bucks, all right. No, 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 I'll keep it. Only so what? This still doesn't mean the parrot had anything to do with it. Hey, Mr. Valentine, look at this. Did you ever see an Oriental who chewed tobacco? Mm, what? A plug. Okay, so there's been somebody around here lately who chews tobacco, but... Oh, yeah, I remember. You said on the phone something about a seaman who chews tobacco. Yes, 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 a big fellow, but an American seaman. Well, where did he creep in? Now, look, Buster, you'd better spill the rest of what you know fast. I've told you everything, honestly, I have. He was just a seaman, that's all. I didn't get much of a look at him, but this morning when I woke up, he was peering in my window. And when I shouted, he ran. I came out to look around. That's when I found the body. And then I ran. Hmm. Well, that's a good idea. Hey, Mr. Valentine. All right. You too, Doc. Miss Brooks on. is still back in the car. You will out of the other way. Tell Johnson I went to get her, will you? Or some other lie? Uh, what? But I... No, no. You stay there and hold hands with Johnson. Hey, Valentine. See you later. I'm going to write a story. George, remember... He said that man in the turban seemed so anxious to get rid of the Take birds. Easy, and... Hey, Captain. Captain Charlie. This is a crazy, strange place, isn't it? That captain gives me the jitters. Ah, never mind. I don't want to see him anyway. Limey's the one who'll talk for us. A weasel if I ever saw one. But why? What can he tell you? What is it you're doing? Here we to... are. Through here. Just check the information we've already got, Brooksy. 
Yeah, I'd like to weed out some of Yule's weird notions. He's about stupid enough to think that bird is some sort of weird super... George. Relax, Angel. Over the head of the stairs, that's all. Come on. But speak of the devil. Yeah. Yeah. Something at the bottom of the stairs, too. Limey. It's Limey. He's dead. Drop dead. Drop dead. You know, I've always found it pretty tough to squeeze juice from a lime. Well, that can't be true with everyone, because here's a case where somebody squeezed a limey too hard. Couldn't have been the parrot, but he might have been the inspiration. Now, uh, if you're in need of inspiration, why don't you give this a lesson? George Valentine, you don't believe in the kind of story that has a parrot in it. When the parrot says, drop dead, people drop dead. The only trouble is, they do. First, a foreign sailor who sold the bird, and now the next man that the bird took a liking to, Limey. Yes, Limey is just about as dead as the sailor was. Who's going to be murdered next, George? Oh, Brooksy, cut it out, but would you? Limey didn't just fall down the stairs. It's a dark stairway. It could have happened. Only you doubt it. Yeah, and I guess he was dead before he fell. But a guess isn't good enough, is it? It's all so unbelievable, all these crazy characters. There's another explanation of some kind. You want to bet it's nice and simple? No. (laughs) Okay, maybe not. But for instance, why is the parrot important? Why was that mangy captain so anxious to buy him in the first place? Why is Mr. Ewell so interested? I get the idea. So run out and get the police, will you? Well, what are you going to do? I want to see who's around, Angel. Mostly upstairs. Well, the bird is, for one. Yeah, I know. He hopped off down the hall. See you later. All right, George. You sure fell all right, Buster. Well, so who pushed you? Or slugged you for a Get him off me! What the? It's Sadie! Sadie! Get him off! Get him off of me! Oh, what? Get out that window! Boy, shoot! All right, all right. Just a parrot, that's all. Just a. Of all the ugly me! All right, speaking. take it easy, take it easy. He's out the window now, huh? Ah, sitting there on the kitchen roof like he was real proud of himself. Only what happened? Hop through here across my face. I was sound asleep. I told Captain Charlie I wouldn't stay here if he kept that bird. I never allowed parrots when it was my hotel. This was a respectable place. Sure, sure. Was... But look, Sadie, did you hear any noise out by the stairs a while ago? Maybe about half an hour ago? No. Why should I? Everybody's been out except that awful creature. I heard them go. Why? Skip it. Only tell me something, Sadie. How long have you lived here? Forty years now, I'd say, off and on. Barring a couple of marriages. But I always come back. Oh, my lands, I wouldn't know any other place to live. None of us would. All been here for years with Captain Charlie, huh? Well, of course. Except that Yule, naturally, he's recent. We're all sort of has-beens, but... The captain, he keeps us all under his wing. He's a wonderful man. He's a generous, honest... That was what you wanted to ask about, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, Captain Charlie. Ask anybody in the district about Captain Charlie. Okay, okay. Nothing bad about anybody here, except for that bird. Yeah. Well, I'd better get him off that roof. Well, don't you bring him back in here. I won't have that thing screaming at me. Oh, be quiet, Sadie. Somebody else trying to get him off that roof, too. Huh? Very popular bird. No, no, stay there. I can make it around the ledge. Just stay in your room. Easy done, my boy. I'll be up there and get you in just a minute now. Well, keep the big trap shut, will you? Less noise now, that's hmm. the stuff. Don't you know, a seaman. Now we got you, baby. Would have been easier to climb up with a ladder. What? Bird watching society. You always chew tobacco when you go parrot hunting? Beat it, will you, buddy? I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Not on a slippery roof. Stay out of it, Mac. Hey, don't reach for that bird. I want to talk to you. I ain't the type. Stay where you are, I said. Drop that, drop that, drop that. Oh, still, you blast. 
Yeah, now look what you did. That's the kitchen flue he's climbing into. Now we can all have fun getting him out. Yeah, well, let him stay there. Forget him. You're the one I want. There's a little matter of people dropping oh, dead. Oh, no, you don't, Mac. I had enough. I don't want no trouble. This is where I came from. Oh, don't try that. Hey, you... So long, sucker. Look out. You, you'll slip. Ah! Drop dead, drop dead. Valentine, you're the oh, one. Oh, stop it, Johnson. Drink your coffee. Yeah. Thank you for everybody here, folks. Help yourselves. The seaman isn't dead, Lieutenant. His skull wasn't fractured. So we got to wait for hospital reports before we can get him to talk. Johnson, for the tenth time, leave me alone, will you? Go solve your two murders. Have you checked all these people on when they last saw Limey? No, uh, we checked and double-checked and still haven't found anything. Okay, then leave me alone. I'll drink my coffee and think about it. Sure. First, you pocket a hundred bucks and run. Then you find something but won't say what it is. Then you... Johnson. What kind of an idea did that seaman give you? What you got up your sleeve? I'll break up this picnic and maybe you'll find out. No. But you were... No. All right, all right, everybody. Get out of here. There's a genius working on a story. That's all for now. Break it up, break it up. George. All right, they've gone now. So come here, brace me, Angel. Then you can beat it, too. Brace you? What in the name? George, get off of that stone. It's a big one. Got a big ear, man. What? The flu. Hope he's all right. Yeah, now I can reach you. Oh, where are you, boy? Come on, come on. Oh, brother, suit, grease, and cobwebs. You mean he's been there all this time, the parrot? I hope he's in here. Hope I can reach him. Sure, here we go. Oh, look at the poor thing. Yeah. Well, I'll clean him up a little. He'll be all right. George, what are you going to do with him? I wouldn't touch that bird if it laid golden eggs. All right, hold still, Rabney. Now, Brooksy, listen. we got to find out once and for all if this bird really does have anything to do with all the crazy stuff going on here. You're sure hard to convince. Hey, hey, get off my coffee. If you're thirsty, boy, we'll get you a drink. Now, Brooksy, you go in the bar where Johnson is. Give me five minutes head start, then tell people I found the parrot and took off down the alley. Well, of all the reasons... Well, this is the only way to find out, isn't it? To see who comes after me. The bird itself can't have any value, but maybe somebody thinks it does, or... Drop that! Drop that! Oh, Brooksy, now look, just because everybody who's been around this long-nosed chicken has got into all trouble... All right, all right, I'll do it. But there must be easier ways to find the end of a story. Okay, bird. Let's get some of the grease off your feathers. Bird of Illumina, huh? big mystery bird. Oh, you like that, huh? Well, get yourself all stretched, because in about five minutes we'll go outside and see if anybody meets us. We'll find out just how dangerous it is to hang on to you when you're... Drop you know... that, drop that, drop that. Hey, hey. <laughs> cut it out, cut it out, will you? Drop That's better. Drop that, huh? drop, drop, drop. What? Hey, bird, snap out of it. What's the matter with you? Hey, Abner, come on, boy, come on. That... This... It's nothing wrong. Oh, brother. Dropped it, huh? Coffee. The coffee you took a drink of my coffee. Brooksy. Johnson, what? John. George, listen to me. Can't you hear me? Here. Here, slap him with the wet towel some more. I'll do it. I'll do it, Captain. That you... stuff can't hurt him any. Get you and your crazy joint. Get out of here. All right. All right. Oh. You you all drink that stuff, too? Oh, George, here now. Don't move. You told me five minutes. It was five minutes before anybody even started oh. to look for you. Sure, sure, sure. Just me, huh? Just my coffee. We're not all dead, huh? Valentine, I regret never to mind, say. Never mind, I know. I lost it up again. An old-fashioned knockout drop. They keep them behind the bar. Naturally, the wood in this kind of a place. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The bird. He's all right, George. And making a lot more sense than you are. Okay, Johnson, somebody dope my coffee. Everybody had a chance. Everybody knew I was going to be here alone. But at least it proves that somebody right here, doesn't it? Hmm. You eliminate the seaman? Yes, but why did this happen, George? We found you and the bird hadn't been touched. Hey, did or... you move me? What? Here, I'll help you. No, get no, up. don't touch me. If it wasn't the bird they were after, it was me. Only why me? What have I got that they That bought? hundred bucks. Look in your pocket, see what was taken. Yeah. I thought I had it in this pocket. Oh, the wallet's okay. Everything else? 50, 70, 80, 90. 
Now it's all there. Well, nobody'd commit crimes just for that amount of money anyway. No, no, of course not. So get on your feet. We start all over at the beginning. Johnson, I think better on the floor. You know, all this business could be awfully simple. Sure, Hindus and parrots and sea captains This thing and... with me could be a mistake. Limey could just have fallen down the stairs. The first guy we already know is just slugged and rolled. I think you'd better stand up, George. Okay. Too far-fetched, huh? But a desperate man might hope that's the way it'd go down. Like what, man? Like why? What are you talking about? Captain Charlie's respectable, isn't he, Johnson? Honest and good with the police. That's right, for years. The same goes for the people he's kept under his wing. Morton, Limey, Sadie. Sure, sure, sure. Charlie keeps the place clean, all right. Only, what's that got to do with... now listen. A foreign sailor comes in with a parrot last night and all blazes breaks loose. Everybody's imagination dives off in seven directions. It isn't imagination that the bird was involved in every crime, though, is it? Here with you, with Limey who took care of him, with the sailor who brought him in? Sure, and you get so wound up you don't notice something else that was involved with everyone. What, George? The money that paid for the parrot. Huh? But you just said that dough in your pocket hadn't been touched. I thought I had it in the other pocket, that's all. But suppose while I was out, suppose the reason I was dope was to get at that money and do something with it. Now, look, if it's there, it's there. And that something was the last crime that needed to be done. From here on, the mysteries could stop. George, for heaven's sake, okay, tell Okay, Angel, okay, words of one syllable. Suppose in this place, one person isn't so respectable. Being fooling Charlie along with everybody else for years. And last night, Limey broke a door, a lock. Why would anybody lock a door around here, incidentally? But who are you... Fi- because Charlie needed $25 more to make up the 100 the sailor wanted for his bird, remember? Well, Limey got it all right. He found it in Morton's room. Well? Well, Johnson, from there on, one, two, three. Morton was mad, remember? But the sailor had already gone. Then the sailor was slugged and rolled. But if it was Morton, he couldn't find the money he wanted to get back. George, Limey didn't have any money. Limey so- was a weasel. Suppose he got to asking Morton about that money he took. Suppose he caught on to what I'm catching on to. So Morton killed him, scared to death of discovery now, with one accidental murder already to his credit. All right, then came me. Do you want to bet I was dope so that 25 of that 100 could be replaced with a different 25? Holy smoke. Sure, that's right. Replaced with genuine money. George, Morton's a printer, isn't he? You got it. His press must be in the locked room. He printed menus, remember? Green ones with pictures of Lincoln and Washington and people like that on them. That's the idea. And it explains everything. A counterfeiter, trying to keep from being discovered. Well, come on, don't just stand there. Martin. Hey, Martin. He was here just a second ago. He ran upstairs when you came out of the kitchen. There he goes. Martin, stop! Sergeant, Sergeant, get him! Hold it, Angel. Let the police do the rest. Hey, what's going on, anyway? Look, ma'am, ain't this a lovely bird? You know, someday I'm going to get me a rubber plant, and then... Oh, but George, even if Morton did commit those crimes, it still doesn't explain everything. There's still that tobacco-chewing seaman who fell off the roof and the parrot... Hey, hey, you didn't start this story. You did. So stick around a minute, and I'll give him the rest of it. You're right, Brooksy. There are a lot of questions that still need answering. So, while George is getting his story straight, suppose we all give this story a listen. Yes, he was a counterfeiter, I understand. All he wanted was to get his $25 back. But the seaman, George, Oh, yes, yes, yes. The mysterious man chewing tobacco. Well, I'll use a little logic. The sick, the foreigner who was so anxious to sell the bird in a hurry, didn't speak English. Yes, that made it all the more... Oh, where did his bird learn to say drop dead? Oh! Yeah, and every clue Yule gave me about him suggested the obvious. The sick had stolen the bird and was trying to sell quickly before the guy he stole it from caught up with him. You telephoned the hospital, huh? Well, this might not be all clairvoyance, but sure... The seaman didn't want to get mixed up in any trouble, but he still wanted his bird back. Huh. His bird. And that's all there was to it? Oh, my beautiful, romantic story of the waterfront. With all those strange characters. Watch it, watch it. Don't get carried away again. Oh, dear. My beautiful story. Anyway, cheer up, Mr. Yule. Maybe you could sell it to one of those mystery shows on the radio. Sure. Call it... 
Drop Dead. Just in case we lost you somewhere along the way, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Brooksy played by Virginia Gregg. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the tale and Eddie Dunstetter played the music. Now this is yours truly inviting you to our next visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say... Have you got any skeletons hanging in the closet? If so, dig them out and set them by the radio. Because we have a dandy story that's going to make them feel right at home. It's called Uncle Harry's Bones. And it's complete, all except for his floating ribs you lost somewhere between 18th and 19th on Chestnut Street. Now, where they keep Uncle Harry's mortal remains, only time will tell. Besides, George Valentine has to have something to do for the next little while. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to go around saying, let George do it which would not be good since that is his aim in life. Anyway, if the maestro will throw us a bone in E-flat, we'll get on with the epic. My dear Mr. Valentine, you will please report to me at the Stedman Farm. That's two miles down the road from Pine Lake if you turn right at the Red Silk Post Office or the house with the unpainted shutters if you come over the hill. I want you to clearly understand that you're working for me, no matter what anybody says. And Lordy knows the people around here know how to say things. For instance, they all say Uncle Harry is their uncle, but he's not. He's mine, and nobody else's. <coughs> Mr. Valentine, please come quick. My trouble is, I don't know if Uncle Harry is Uncle Harry, or somebody else's who's not important. I've got to find out, now don't you think? Sincerely, Sophie Sturdivant. <coughs> Hey, friend. Hey, you. What's your trouble? Hello. We're looking for the Sturdivant place. Oh, well, down the road, past the hill. If you're looking for Doc Sellers, he's just gone into town, I think. Doc Sellers? Who's he? No, it's Sophie Sturdivant we wanted to see. Oh, Sophie. Her. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Eh, nothing. Doc's her brother. He's all right. Well, what's the matter with her? Nothing. Okay, thanks. Look out for your foot. Now, hold up, hold up. Don't see many strangers around here. Where are you from? Looney Bin? Uh, Looney Bin? Sure. Uh, Sophie's all right. What are you driving at, Buster? My name's Dorky. What are you driving at? Say, so tell me something. Where does Sophie's Uncle Harry live? Who? Uncle Harry. Some kind of a character around here, I get it. Nope. No Uncle Harry around here. But she wrote... Uh, look, was... this is a nice, peaceful place. People don't like strangers making trouble. None of my business, none of yours. Let well enough alone, I say... You'll live longer. You know what I'd do if I were George? Go back to town. Ah, but not fearless Valentine. Besides, he's got Brooksy there to help him. Just like I've got this to help you. Now let's see if George and Brooksy took the old-timer's advice to get out of town. Nope, I guess they didn't. Because there they are, walking up to Sophie's front door. It's kind of a run-down place, isn't it? And all the places around here seem to be, George. Yeah. Mrs. Sturdivant? 
The door's open. She's probably out back in the kitchen. Mrs. Sturdivan? Sophie! Hmm. She's not in the kitchen, George. Of course she isn't, huh? Well, who do you think does the cooking around here, anyway? Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. We didn't mean to walk right here. must in. be Doc Sellers. Well, I ain't Abraham Lincoln. You looking for Sophie? Uh-huh. I'm George Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. I've seen your car out there. Just come in myself. Hey, sis! Come to the party. You're a doctor, are you? Sure, sure. <laughs> Want a pill? <laughs> Cheers. Oh. <laughs> Pretty good size, huh? <laughs> no, I haven't practiced for years, but I still got these. I was over trying to unchoke a neighbor's horse yesterday. Eminent sawbones, that's me. Uh huh, you're a vet. Yep. <clears throat> Retired livestock killer. Sophie! Hey, Sophie! Uh, upstairs, I guess, working on a butterfly collection. Come on through. Sophie, for the love. must have fallen down the stairs, George. I'm all right. I'm Here, all right. Get her over to the couch. I'm all right. Um, the ox, what you do? Tip over your own feet? Oh, here, let me. She didn't fall downstairs. Huh? Yes, I did. That's what I must have done. But how did your face get those blotches on it? How'd you get that black eye? No one hit me. What would you say that for? I mean, I, I fell, that's all. Look, did somebody slap you, knock you no, down? No, 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 no. Well, who was it? Why? When did it happen? No, stop it. Stop it. We've come to help you, Sophie. So I want you to tell us what... Oh. Huh? Huh? What are you looking at me for? No reason. Just wondered why she's still so scared. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Doc's my brother. Oh, hey, Douglas! Douglas, come on in here. Is Douglas with you? Yeah, I just got back from looking at the old office. Oh, what did you find? Nothing, not a blame thing. Oh, look, both of you, what are you talking about? Yes, Doc, what is it? What do you want? Hey, Valentine, Miss Brooks, Douglas Kent. Just says you're law, I'm not the kind of man beats up his own sister. Uh, how do you do? Hi. I... Sophie, what's happened? I'm all right, Douglas. I... Doug, here's another crazy eager beaver like Sophie is, Mr. Valentine. Going off half cock whenever Ooh, he gets... Mr. Valentine's here to help us. Isn't that right, Sophie? He's here to help find out. Oh, look, will somebody please explain what this is all about? No. No, I I think that perhaps I was wrong. What? Mr. Valentine, I shouldn't have been so hasty in writing. Uncle Harry, that's what it's all about. Uncle Harry? No. No. Douglas and I only thought... Oh, be quiet, Soph. You started it, let's finish it. Come here, I'll show them to you. Show him? Uncle Harry. The great Uncle Harry, so they say. Yeah, see for yourself. <gasps> skeleton. Nothing but a skeleton. Uncle Harry's bone. Says you. I was out fishing in the lake, Mr. Valentine, and my line got tangled, and here he is. But just a skeleton. I don't see how you can tell. Who was Uncle Harry? Man disappeared five years ago. Man who bought out the breeding farms, a hermit. Sophie's uncle. Uh-huh. Well, look, I don't know much about anatomy, but is a shin bone supposed to look like this? Well, go on, Doc. Tell him. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Jump to conclusions. Yeah. I made the mistake of remembering that I once set a fracture for Harry. That's all. It's what I get for play in M.D. We've been downtown looking for the x-rays in Doc's old office. We were going to the barn, too, to check in his old trunks and things. You see, I thought that if we could find the x-ray that he took five years ago, it might give us a positive way of identifying... Bones the... are bones. It's not going to tell you anything. How about this? piece of rusty wire tangled around his leg. George. The lake is full of stuff. It don't mean anything either. But it means something if we knew his leg was tied with wire before he died. Exactly, Mr. Valentine. That's just the way yeah, I... See, everybody who reads mysteries goes off half-cocked. Well, what kind of a skeptic are you, Doc? Why don't you think it's Uncle Harry? Mister, I don't think one way or another. Only lots of people come up summers to fish in that lake. Could be practically anybody. Okay, Doc, I'm going to go with you to keep looking for that x-ray. Douglas, get the local sheriff up here as fast as you can. And tell him to send for a police x-ray man, too. Brooksy, take care of Sophie. Look, I I'm just as upset about Sophie as Don't you are. Don't bother, but... Doc. I finally got the idea. It's a skeleton in the closet we're after. Well, come on, then. We're going to start opening doors. <laughs> Set the blame leg in the first place if there was a real sawbones around. 
Last a bunch of recluses in this part of the woods. Yeah, sure. Did you try this box here? Old Sears Roebuck catalogs. Yeah. Blast your cobwebs. Hey, how about the tin one? Uh, oh, yeah, let me see. Your x-ray stuff ought to be boxed up somewhere that you could find hey, it. Hey, Doc, where are you? Oh, is that you, Sheriff? Right here. Come uh, here, meet Mr. Valentine. We're some cleaning out an old attic. Fine. Don't stick your paw at me, young man. Wow, wow, wow. What's your trouble, Sheriff? Don't you like to know what's going on in your territory? You know all about it. Don't need any city boys to come telling me what my job is. Uncle Harry disappeared five years ago. Let's leave him that way, I say. Uh-huh. You're not interested in skeletons, huh? Sheriff, I think I'd like to have a little talk with oh, you before we... Oh, quit your blab and give us your pocket knife. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, airtight box. Maybe you've got it. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that looks like negatives. That... Hey, look out for that spider. Mm. Yeah, open up closets. Got to expect being bit. Here. Let's see. Uh-huh. No, that's... It's a horse, isn't it? Uncle Harry, horse, spider, what difference does it make? Uncle Harry, there you are. Can't name day, chin bone. That's him, all right. Here, let's get it in the line. Well, now, it could be the same as the skeleton. Yeah, looks the same to me. Set crooked on top there. Like a hundred others, I suppose. Holy smokes, Mr. Valentine, I can't tell for Sheriff, sure. did you get that police x-ray man? Yeah, over at the house. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, give me that x-ray. Come on. Absolutely, there's no question about it. But isn't it true lots of people have broken bones, Kennedy? I'll be glad to swear before a jury that this is the same bone. Before a jury? Of course, Mr. Valentine. Hasn't anyone here noticed the fracture in the skull? Mm. Here, right here. Why, no. Enough to cause death, I should say, in that location. I will also testify that the fracture must have been made before the body became a skeleton. In other words, the x-ray proves it's Uncle Harry. Precisely. And the combination of fracture and wire around the legs unquestionably proves that he was murdered. There you are. Quite simple. Murder. Uncle Harry, all right, Sheriff, but the important thing is, who did sure, it? Sure, sure, Sophie. Now me and Mr. Valentine Wait a minute, to... listen to her. Young lady, I've known Sophie for years, and anything... But she that... knows who killed him. She what? Of course I do. And I always knew it had happened, too. And that's why I hired you, Mr. Valentine, to catch him. Somewhere in Manitoba, Canada, I think, was the last place. You know, he sends me checks. You see, that's because he feels guilty about the way he treats me. Harry was a skin flint, a miser, a bloodsucker. I've sent descriptions. I've had detectives after him lots of times, but they've never been able hey, to catch him. Wait a minute, him. wait a minute, please, both of you. She's talking about her husband, George, her second well, husband. He only married me because of Uncle Harry's money, and I was the relative. But Uncle Harry was too smart for him. He'd never give him any. Oh, no, not him. Sophie, why do you... Bunker, his name is, and when you find him, you'll hang him, won't you, Mr. Valentine? I know Bunker did it. He always said he got Harry's money. And five years ago he did it, don't you see? And then he disappeared. Hold it, hold it, would you please? This Bunker, what happened? Was he a husband that ran away from you? <gasps> I beg your pardon? I sent him away, don't you understand? He was no good and I sent him away. That's why I'm using my first husband's name. Bunker was a lying cheat. And he killed Uncle Harry, and I sent him away before I knew what he'd done. <laughs> well, get him, that's all. Get him and hang him. And now, Valentine, will you listen to the voice of reason for a minute? Bunker ran away from Sophie in San Francisco, but it was two months before Uncle Harry disappeared. Oh. Sophie's just a little cracked on the subject, that's all. As I figure, Bunker's the one person probably didn't kill Uncle Harry. Forget him. What do you mean? Lonely area around here. Anything can happen. Nobody will be able to remember. Five years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I understand it all now. It isn't just the skeleton in her closet, is it? Nope. Yeah, Sophie wanted me to prove it was Uncle Harry so she could prove it was her no-good husband who did it. 
Instead, now we've got to solve a five-year-old crime that everybody else would have to have hushed up. Because everybody in the whole area is a suspect for murder. And you know who'll get the last laugh? <laughs> Uncle Harry's bones. Now tell me, how is that possible? For Uncle Harry to start laughing, that is. It isn't. Not unless all that's left of Harry is his funny bone, which is a nice, happy thought. However, in case it didn't hit you quite right, here's something that's not off the elbow. It seems your client, Sophie, is the only one who ever liked Uncle Harry. Everyone else, including the sheriff, would prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. And if your name is George Valentine, you know how hopeless it will be to try to solve a five-year-old crime when everyone in town is a suspect. Sheriff Harry was a miser, wasn't he? A hermit and a miser. What are you getting at? I don't know. Gold. Misers have gold, don't they? Of course they do. If they're smart, like Harry was. Well, sure, that's why he was killed, I guess. What do you mean? Well, most of his money was in property. But people always said he had a good many thousand dollars stashed away somewhere. Somewhere like where? Oh, up around that place of his. I could never find any. And I'm the one who boarded the place up after he disappeared. Oh, Uncle Harry's place. You mean, you mean there's a house, a farm or something? It's a cabin. Nothing but a cabin. Well, come on, Brooksy. What are we waiting for? About a mile around the lake from here. I boarded her up solid in case he ever came back. George, what about Sophie? Never mind her. Now I know who smacked her. Not much of a cabin for a rich man, is it? No. Yeah. I don't know. At least he kept it neat and clean. Turn your flashlight over here. Oh. Just a desk, that's all. You think there's any point in going through it? What if you're looking for money? Listen. Well, it's just the wind, I guess. Hey, wait, Brooksy. What? A brick out of the fireplace. Yeah, a nice little hole underneath. Hmm. Maybe Uncle Harry did have some money. Sure, of course he did. What's the matter? Hole in the mattress. Place for a box, sir. Hey, look out. I tripped. <laughs> Well, there's nothing funny about it. Yes, there is. Loose board, ain't it? This place is honeycomb with old hiding spots. Yeah. All of them empty. Look. Look, here's a coin. This one wasn't empty. I mean, once upon a time. None of them were from the looks of it. I mean, that doesn't quite make sense, does it? What do you mean, George? You know, with the kind of tough old guy that Harry must have been. I don't... Duck, duck, Angel. What? Get down, get down. Turn off that flashlight. George. Take it easy now. This is who I think it is. The man with the shovel. I didn't see him in the doorway. All right, shut the door, Buster. There's a dram. Uh, Never mind the match. George, look out for the shovel. Get away from him. All right, I guess now we can have some light, Angel. Well, it's our neighbor. What's your name? Dorky, is that right? Let go of me. Sure, sure, I'll let go. The man who warned us away, the man who said Sophie was the just The man who different... warned Sophie away, you mean? What? I did not. You got mad and hit her, too. That's a salt. Now, look, listen to All me. All a matter of geography. I remember what she wrote me about the two roads. And Doc Sellers and Douglas went to town this morning. That's in the other direction from your place by the hill. So how did you know that Doc had gone to town? He wouldn't have gone past you. That's the wrong direction. So I guess you knew he was gone because you'd been over there. Sophie herself must have told you where he was. All right. Don't prove anything. No, but your shovel does. I wondered why a guy who'd committed murder five years ago would be stupid enough to commit an overt act today. Murder? Now, look, I hated Uncle Harry, I sure, but I... didn't say you did, did I? Relax, relax, Buster. You're just a little greedy, that's all. Come digging for the miser's cash. George, I don't understand. When people thought Uncle Harry disappeared, they'd naturally assume he took his loot with him. Now it seems he was murdered. That makes it a little different. Nobody alive would be smart enough to kill him and find all of it. An old cowhide skin flint like that. I know, I know. That's why you wanted Sophie to stop raising alarm. 
If everybody knew for sure Uncle Harry was dead, why, you'd get trampled in the rush up here. He built me out of some of my property. You can't blame me Buster, for what Buster, I'm he... not blaming you for anything. That's not my job. Now get out. Go on. Go home. George, why don't Come I... on. Come on. You heard me. There isn't any gold around here. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Don't you understand? We're all through with this case. <laughs> Oh, sure, coroner. There's not much to say. I've given my testimony. He's identified the body. That's all we need from Doc Sellers. Well, Sheriff, who has got something to say? I understood this fellow, Valentine, had caught somebody up at Uncle Harry's shack. I know this isn't a court, but we sure want to hear everything that... I haven't got anything to add, coroner. Now, see here, Valentine. No, no, coroner. I'm all through with this case. Yeah, I'm on my way back to the city. Valentine. Valentine. Yeah. Yeah, what was the idea back there at the, at the inquest? There's no idea, Doc. Well, see here, if you think our sheriff is capable... The sheriff's all right, Douglas. Yeah, big compliment. <laughs> he only wishes it were true. All right, now listen, all of you. Uncle Harry was a heel. The whole town wished him dead. Sheriff, when the skeleton was found, your idea was to let sleeping dogs lie, huh? Not exactly, but holy smoke, we got to live with the people you know. This place has been pretty nice for the past five years. Well, then... We'll take care of Dorky, all right. For but... assault, that's all, Sheriff. That's your business. Yeah, but now I got a murder to solve. You help get this rolling, you can't just walk all off. All right, and... all right. Keep your shirt on, Sheriff. You won't have to nail anybody in your town for murder. But you said that the... Well, let's start at the beginning. Five years ago, Uncle Harry, the hermit, the miser, the boy with the gold. Somebody comes and tries to get his gold. Kills him, takes his gold. But you've been up to the cabin, Sheriff. How did the killer find all the loot? In at least three separate hiding spots. Well, he could have twisted the old boy's arm or dug around. Nothing was he... disturbed. He went right to the spots. Yeah, I remember. And if he got rough with Harry, would Harry have told him where all the spots were? Well, no. I see what you mean. No, you don't, Douglas. Maybe Sophie's an unhappy, bitter woman, but uh, she had the right idea. Sheriff sent some telegrams to, uh, where was it she got her last money order from? Someplace in Manitoba, Canada? Bunker, that, that no good husband of hers, he's the one. Bunker? Well, I grant you, he could have come up here after he left Sophie in San Francisco. I guess nobody would have known if he was out at Harry's place. Yeah, but she's had detectives looking for Bunker, tracing those little, those little money orders he sent once in a while. Mm, that's right. They ain't been able to find him, Valentine. Okay, okay. But, Doc, you wouldn't be able to lie about x-rays of anybody who's still around here, would you? I mean, right out in public court and all? No, 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 you couldn't do that. You'd be caught up. What are you talking about? Perjury. I waited just long enough for you to commit perjury at the coroner's inquest, Doc. Well, what are you... What are you talking about? A tin box with a live spider in it. Spider? Yeah, that's what gave me the idea, and it's the only way to explain everything. Suppose the spider got in there when the box was open, say, a few days ago. By Doc alone. You're crazy. No more than your sister is. Suppose you switch some x-rays. We'll tie that together with what I said about Uncle Harry's hiding places. There's only one person who could have gone right to the hiding places. And that's Uncle Harry himself. No, now look. But he couldn't do that if he were dead, could he? All right, then. Suppose Doc here once treated a fracture for Bunker. Bunker? Yeah. Oh, boy, that would... Yeah, hey. simple as that. Five-year-old crime. Man killed another man, threw him in the lake. And now, because his sister would inherit some property and so on, Doc decides to make the skeleton into Uncle Harry, when it's really the skeleton of Bunker. That's not true. Now, Sheriff, you've got to believe me. Perjury, I Doc. Perjury, remember? Uh. But, Sheriff, I think the reason detectives haven't been able to trace Bunker is pretty simple now, don't you? Wrong description. Just send a description to Canada of Uncle Harry. They'll get him all right. <laughs> and there you are, Sheriff. Instead of just a bunch of bones... Uncle Harry is a real live murderer. Uncle Harry? Well, I'll... Hey, Valentine, wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to the gal what brung me. Sophie. Yeah, there's a lot more important stuff to clear up in this case than dead skeletons. Yeah, Sheriff, I got a live client to drag out of her closet. A gal who hired me and then slammed doors in my face. Why? Well, in a couple of seconds, I'll find out.
You know, I'm kind of sorry for old Sophie. I've got a feeling that when George gets through with her, she'll be sorry the story wasn't called Aunt Sophie's Bones. But while we're waiting for the worst, let's give a listen to the best. He hated Harry. Bunker hated Harry. Sure, Sophie. He must have come here to get some money out of Harry, and, well, Harry defended himself, I guess. It's been sweet of Uncle Harry to send me the money orders all this time. Even if it is trapping you. Mm, I wouldn't be too sure it was sweet. It's kept the illusion that Bunker was still alive. He'd do that on purpose. Oh, yes. Perhaps. In fact, I wouldn't be too sure you love that uncle as much as you claim. I think you just hated Bunker. But now Bunker's dead. Now you know he's dead. People can waste a lot of time hating, can't they? Oh, Sophie, I'll tell you something. You wasted a lot of our time before I caught on why you hired me, then didn't want to talk. Well, I, I told you you were working. Well, I didn't think it was just Dorky's getting rough. It was the fact you began to remember whose leg had really been fractured, wasn't it? Well, I, I couldn't understand what the doc was up to. <laughs> I'm so glad it was only perjury. Makes me feel much better. He'd been willing to wait another two years. You might have had Uncle Harry declared legally dead and collected his property that way. Yeah, but Doc wouldn't wait, that's all. Too good an opportunity. <laughs> and the ironic part is, if it had worked, Uncle Harry couldn't have done anything about the inheritance slipping away from him. Not without admitting the whole story. Oh, well, I can see why Doc was tempted already. Right? Doc hated Harry. Such a waste of time. You said that before. About hatred being a waste of time. I collect butterflies, you know. People say I have about as much brains as one. But anybody who wastes time is uh, crazy. Uh, sure, butterflies, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> He's stupid, isn't he? <laughs> Doesn't learn any lessons from seeing what happens from, from an unhappy marriage. Don't worry, Sophie, I'm the teacher. What? Hey, what is this? Come along, George. Time to say goodnight. Oh, now you haven't seen my butterfly collection. You come upstairs with me and I'll show you my real Well, you can hang Buster back in the closet now. It's all over. Oh, but before you do, be sure to tell it that uh, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Virginia Gregg played Brooksy. The story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, and Eddie Dunstetter dug up the music. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. if the time will ever come when George Valentine runs into a problem that's even too big for him to handle. So far, he's been lucky. But you never know. Take this uh, Peter Van Rassel that he's about to tangle with. Peter is one of those charm boys with an accent who just arrived here from Rangoon. He looks like the type of character who could handle himself under almost any circumstances. But he must have hit a snag. Because right now, all Pita has in mind is let George do it. My dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Peter Van Russell. I'm a research chemist for one of the rubber companies with offices in Rangoon. 
I have devoted my life to my work, which I suppose to someone else would be about as dull as my own person. It has been years since I have even followed the American newspapers, let alone kept abreast of your customs. I have never been in your city before. Now, I say all this so you will understand how impossible it is for me to find, to locate, a certain man without your help. A man who, like myself, has just arrived from Burma. A man who is here, but is not here. It is a debt of honor, you understand. Purely a personal matter. I must see him. I only have a few days before I, I return to the jungle. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Van Rossel. You said this man is here, but he isn't here. No, I assure you, it is just as confusing to me as it is to you, Miss Brooke. Well, to start at the beginning, what's this man's name? Uh, Hollowell. Terence Hollowell. Uh -huh. He's uh, always about 40 years old. Tall, quite distinguished. Oh, well, you know. uh, does he live here? Did you look him up in the phone book? Oh, yes, yes. He maintains a residence. Well, then what... Now, I telephoned, you see, from my hotel, and I was informed by a caretaker that Mr. Hollowell won't be arriving from Burma until tomorrow. Well, okay. Then he just hasn't got here yet. Now, yes, he has. I came by plane. I'm sure he was at least a day or so ahead of me. Uh, here. Now, that's a little torn. Uh, cablegram. Van Russell, Pan Am, Honolulu. Was waiting for me at the airline's office yeah, in Hawaii. Yeah. Waste of time, you're trying to contact me. Go well, right in detail, but assure you that under present circumstances, our meeting one another would be needlessly painful to you. A stroke of fate, that's all. Please understand, Terence Hollowell. Now here, this, this piece here, you see? That cablegram was sent from this city. He sent from here. So he is in town. Yet... At his house, they insist he is not. He is here, and he isn't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Van Rossel, apparently this man doesn't want to see you wherever he is. Uh, what sort of person is this, Hollowell, anyway? Oh, a traveler, a, a lecturer. You know, most charming fellow. He stayed with me for a week or so at my plantation north of Rangoon. No, but so easy going. Not the sort to be mixed up in anything troublesome, you know. And you have no idea what he's talking about in that cablegram? No. And I think I should find out, don't you? There's a pearl necklace. Ten black pearls and a necklace. What's that? Well, that's the only thing I can think of. Hollowell is a man who admires beauty. I helped him to obtain a necklace, that's all. Oh, it's valuable. He paid nearly every penny he had. Nearly $2,500 for it over there. So it's worth a lot more here. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what could be that... Yeah, I understand you, Mr. Van Russell. What could have happened to a perfectly nice guy that made him disappear and yet not disappear? Yeah, precisely. Only what do I do when and if I find him? What is it you wanted to see him about in the first place? Oh, naturally, Mr. Valentine, I will explain anything you wish when the time comes. But right now, the urgent question seems to be why is Terence Holloway trying to hide? And most important of all, where? <laughs> You know, if I had a monster like this Peter on my trail, I'd hide too. This boy spells trouble with a capital T. But then George is smart. He'll know what to do. And if you're smart, you'll know what to do when it comes to this. Now let's see how George is doing in his search for old Terrence. I guess so far, not so good. And Brooksy isn't being a bit of help either. George, Mr. Van Russell has already tried calling the house here. I, I can't see any reason Always for Always start with the obvious, Angel. Maybe this Hollowell just doesn't want to be bothered with our Dutch friend. You know, look me up sometime, and then the people take you up on it and you're stuck. But he was his guest in Burma. He wouldn't be rude. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Hmm? Good morning. Uh, good morning. Are you from the house here? I mean... It uh, seems so unusual. All those wonderful little birds out at this time of morning. Don't you think? Well, they should be sleeping in the middle of the day. Yes. But it's not hot, is it? There's no reason for them to be sleeping here. <laughs> well, we just wondered if you... Oh, were... my, no, no. I'm not from the house. No, no, indeed. You see? I have my umbrella. 
Yes, I see. Yes, uh, this is Mr. Hollowell's house, though. I only carry my umbrella from habit, I suppose. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, you haven't rung the bell yet. Yes. Yes, it's Mr. Hollowell's house. It's his. It's not like him, though, do you think? We've never met him. Oh. Oh, you've never heard him talk. You've never heard the beautiful words he uses. It was such a sad expression. But so exciting. All the romantic places. The intimate, beautiful thoughts. What did you say? Oh, no, I haven't rung the bell, no. You may if you wish, but it won't do any good. Why not? She's at home. Perhaps she'll throw you out like she's at me. What? His wife, Mrs. Alliwell. Yes, his wife. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just waiting. Just waiting. <laughs> Lisa, for heaven's sake, please. Not a day uh, over 18 and straight out of a modern agency, if you ask me. You've seen her. How could any man help seeing her? I tell you, George, I didn't. Yeah, then who the maid did said they wait in the hall. But... I won't have her around the house. Uh, I did not, Lisa. Now, uh, please, why do you care? It's not your house anymore. You get your separation checks. That's all that's that That's why I'm here. I haven't had a check for two months. You've been holding out again. There isn't any money, I tell You're you. You're lying. Oh, Lisa, darling, I couldn't lie to you if I tried. Don't you believe? Ah, uh, hello. Is anybody... Oh, excuse me. Ah, uh, how do you do? Um, excuse us. I I'm Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Valentine. The maid said of to Of course, of course. Visitors all over the place. Why not? I'm Mrs. Hollowell. Oh, but then you must be Mr. Hart. My name is Cy Kirby. And you walked in and are offended because I make a lot of noise. All right, I don't mind. I'm a nasty woman. Mr. Kirby is my husband's business partner. He belongs here. I don't. He's the one you want to see. Uh, what club do you represent, Mr. Valentine? Uh, what club? <laughs> don't tell me you're a process server. Which one of my husband's rich women friends do uh, you... Lisa... Isn't it about a lecture? Really, that's our only business, you know, travel talks. And oh. I just assumed you were like the lady out there with the umbrella or the committee of women out in the hall. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, newspaper, that's all. Uh, wanted an interview. We understood Mr. Hollowell had just arrived from Burma. He won't be back until tomorrow. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, I see. Well, I understood he might have arrived already. No, but I'm sure Mr. Kirby can tell you everything you want to know about my husband. Uh, of course. Every bit of publicity counts. Uh-huh. Well, uh, look, I wondered if we could get a picture of Mr. Oh, Hollowell. Well, naturally. Delighted, I suppose. Even Burton Holmes needs a little press cooperation now and then. Uh, come along. We'll find a photograph in his desk. George, you'll never locate a man just by carrying his picture around. I will buy a telephone pen, Angel. What? Yeah, it was on his desk. There's the name of an employment agency scribble on it. It may be just a cockeyed hunch, but come on. Flavin Home Service Employment Agency. No, no, Mr. Flavin, there's nothing wrong. I just phoned you to check, that's all. So Mr. Hollowell did hire the girl himself, huh? I see. And he phoned from the Benson Hotel. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, the man in the photograph? Why, yes. Oh, yes. He's staying here at the Benson. His name is... Uh, Bob. could you just tell me what his room number is, please? Mm, 325. Oh, but his key is in. I think he's probably across the street. Uh, what's this all about, Mr. Valentine? You mean that theater over there? No, no. A little jewelry store. I've seen him go in there before. Jewelry? Yeah. George, remember the pearl necklace? Yeah. What's that? Uh, I don't know, friend. It's all too much for me. Uh, suppose we just wait... What's the matter? Give me that photograph. George! That's him, isn't it? Oh. May I have my key, please? 325. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people were just uh, asking about you, Mr. Smith. Oh, they were? Mr. Smith? Why, yes, young lady. Mind if we step over here a second? Well, no, not at all. 
But uh, what do you wish to see me about? It's Hollowell, isn't it? Isn't that your name? <laughs> oh, by yes. Yeah, but who are you? I, uh, I don't understand. Neither would the clerk over there if you told him. Neither would I. No, I don't think there's any law against a man being incognito, is there? Who sent you? My wife? Her lawyer? <laughs> well, that's the obvious explanation, isn't it? She has a little trouble collecting money from you, I understand. Well, I suppose everyone has money troubles. Never mind, days. I'm not interested. But uh, what is it you want? Every minute I want less and less, Buster. Come on, Brooksy. We've done our job. Nice to have met you, Mr. Hollowell. But, Mr. Valentine, I located I would... him. That's all you hired me for, Mr. Van Russell. Yeah, the Benson Hotel. Now, you've done a very good job. Oh, wait a minute, I... wait a minute. Not so fast, friend. You said you'd do a little explaining yourself. Why he sent a wire brushing you off is another matter, and oh, I want to know. Oh, of course, yes. I said I would tell you. Well, a, a debt of honor, that's all. And I appreciate so much your finding him. I am really not concerned with whatever his little problems are. Well, then? Because I am only here from Burma, you understand... To kill him. This boy Peter is just full of good news. Wonder how he has the nerve, though, to go blabbing it to George. You know, if I were George, I'd hotfoot it right over to police headquarters. And if I were you... I'd pay close attention to this. And now, back to George Valentine. The business of Terence Hollowell is travel talks. Only from what his partner says, they're not making much money at it these days. Hollowell has trouble with his wife, too. But most of all, he's likely to have trouble with your client. Because if your name is George Valentine, then you have a harmless-looking client, Mr. Van Rossell, who has just said, thanks for finding Hollowell, because now he can kill him. Hey, wait a minute, you... Van Russell gone, George? Oh, yeah, sure. Hung up and ran. But it'll take him at least 15 minutes to get over here to the hotel. Well, he wouldn't just come and kill him. Why would he tell you? Why would he warn anybody and then do it? Oh, lots of crazy people in the world, Angel. But this is no time to argue about it. Hollowell went upstairs to his room, didn't he? Mm, that's right. Okay, play it safe. Find the house detective. Tell him what it's all about. Oh, as if I knew. Tell him to keep Hollowell there until I meet you. Where are you going? To try and tie this together fast so it does make sense. The jeweler's across the street, Angel. That pearl necklace is the only thing I know about that ties a would-be murderer to his corpse. Ah, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Such pearls I have never seen. You mean this is it? This one right here? Ah, uh, yeah. A relic from the days when there was time to collect, when beauty was not rhinestone. Uh -huh. Now look, I ask you... Ah, so even to buy something, you must be in a hurry. All right, all right. Fifteen thousand dollars. Uh... There, there, you see? Now you think it is too much. Such a hot day, you, you, you should take your time. You should sit down. No, no, I was just surprised they were for sale. Well, with Mr. Hollowell's pearls you asked about... Now, look, he sold them to you. These are the ones he bought in Burma. I know the man who helped him get them. Oh, yeah, well, well, of course he sold them to me. Now I sell them. But he's been spending a lot of time over here. His hotel clerk said he what, was over... Why, what do you do? Make puzzles for yourself? Two days I spend making another necklace for Mr. Hollowell. That's all. A uh, cheap, bad one. Culture stuff. Uh, John. Wait a minute. You mean he sold you this one for a nice profit but got you to make an imitation? Uh, every time you turn around, it's got to be a mystery. No, 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 no. No imitation. Just a bad one. That's all. Pearls, yeah. Black ones. But nothing illegal. Nothing to fool anyone. Nothing to fool a jeweler. 
<laughs> Only to fool a wife, perhaps? Huh? Uh, I know this man from before. Well, what's wrong with that? I, I fool my wife. You fool yours, don't you? So, all right. It's a hot day. Yeah, Rosine. George, he's gone. Mr. Hollowell's gone. You sure? He piled some of his luggage into a cab the minute we left earlier. Oh, brother, everybody disappears. No, George. The starter remembered the address, or at least enough of it. Well, where did Hollowell go? His home. The big travel expert's gone home, that's all. <laughs> such a strange thing to do, such goings on. Lady, this, this, George, you should put in a mystery show. Mr. Valentine, I'm so sorry I was rude this morning. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Hollowell. Drew here, please. He's unpacking now. And look here. He brought me this. Hmm. Pretty necklace. Oh, you already noticed it. But see, it's real black pearl. Nice husband. He bought it with his last penny in Burma. I know it was because Cy keeps the books and he told me. How could I stay angry at a husband like that? Oh, Terrence. Terrence, darling. Yes, my dear? I, uh, I won't keep him long, Mrs. Hollowell. <laughs> and he wants to kill me, you say, Van Russell. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine his even being here. Sure. It's very amusing. He's insane. Of course you know that. Lived in the jungle too long. Nothing but work. I think it's very amusing the way your wife fell for the phony necklace, too, Buster. What's that? Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to tell her. She'd start worrying again about that pretty maid you hired. <laughs> <laughs> How much does your partner, Cy Kirby, know about that little profit you made on the necklace? Buying it for 2500 Buying? Well, didn't you? In Burma? The real one? Or is that what Van Rossel is upset about? Something to do with that necklace? Oh, get out of here. You've given me your little warning, and thanks very much. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, no, no. My curiosity gets bigger and bigger the more this I talk. This is my house. I've done nothing criminal. I got out of here, I said. I'll get it, George. Hello? Oh, George, it's Lieutenant Johnson. Yeah, I asked him to call us here. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes? Uh-huh. George, they finally found Von Russell. They picked him up at 5 o'clock. He's been watching that hotel of Hollowell's all afternoon. Oh, give me that phone. Hello, Johnson. Let me talk to that guy. No, thanks for picking him up. No, thanks for anything. All right, all right. Thanks. Well, would you... Besides, you're not going to talk to him. He just fainted. Besides, he's downtown, and I'm not... What? He what? Things got hotter after you left, I guess. I went at the Hollowell's, and boy, do you get things turned around... That Van Russell of yours is the only one who couldn't have murdered him. Murdered? You heard me. Hollowell, the big travel and charm boy, stopped three bullets. I don't know. I barely got here myself, Valentine. Well, his wife was upset. First she was hating him, then she was... Yeah, 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 I got that. But after you left, she drove to the hotel to get some more of his baggage for him. Took the maid with her. They were the ones found the body when they came back. Yeah. Right here in this hammock. That's right. In the hammock. Yeah. What a light. Not if you did. We got the place pretty well roped off and fast, but it's big. Lots of space. Cy Kirby. Been this guy's partner for years. Says he was upstairs and didn't hear a thing. We tried it out and you can't hear oh, from wait there. Minute, Johnson, wait a minute, will you? What's the matter? Look, Johnson, I could have stopped it. I could have added up all the little tips and stopped Take it. Take it easy. The guy was a heel, big soft soap artist, big fake, romance with a buck. But I could have figured out why a man would tell me he was going to kill in advance. Sure, sure, a debt of honor. Look, I told you Van Rossell wasn't within my... He hired me to find the guy. He showed me a wire. But suppose it wasn't his wire... Yeah, torn, that's right. First part of the name was torn. Beat yourself with something I can recognize, will you? Look, Johnson, every little thing adds up in one direction. So funny the bird should be awake in the middle of the day, she said. Said it wasn't hot on a very hot day. Look, I know, friend. I know I'm crazy, but so's murder. We don't even scratch the edges of it, Johnson. But an umbrella does. Huh? Yeah, look. Suppose she came from Burma. Suppose Van Rossell was chasing after her, too. 
trying to protect her in advance, or trying to get Hollowell protected in advance to stop it. Well, the umbrella over there, can't you see it? Suppose it belongs to her. Suppose she's not a club woman, Johnson, but Van Rossell's wife. George, there she is. Yeah, I know. She's got a revolver. She's watching us. Stay where you are. All right, lady, sure. Now, don't worry. My name isn't Hollowell. I killed him. Did you know that? I know, I know. But take it easy, please. It's all over. No. No, it was all over a week ago. He told me that when he left them. But I wouldn't believe she was in love with him. Oh, George, the poor thing. No, just waiting till he got here to shoot him. Oh, leave me alone. Please, leave me alone. You are Mrs. Van Russell, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I was. I, I mean... I know. Your husband told me about Hollowell visiting you for a week. I followed him, what of it? So I'm a stupid middle-aged fool. I saw the cablegram that missed you in Honolulu. Get away, please. Please get away. I'm sorry, lady. I want that... I'm all right, Brooksy. Take it easy. She's shooting in the dirt. She doesn't want to hurt us. It's just Hollowell that she... Stop what I said. Get away. Hey, that's three shots, Brooksy. And there's three in Hollowell. That makes six. All right, it's all over now, lady. You've done all your shooting. Get away, I said... Oh, brother, have I been wrong? George, she's pointing it at herself. Hey, look out! Yeah. Sure, lady. Still another shell. All right, now let's see your purse. You've got your purse, haven't you? There it is, George. She dropped it. No shells there. Guess we did some good after all, Angel. Everybody else had a motive, too. Wonder which one shot him first. I shot him. Lady, you fired your gun four times just now. There are three bullets in Hollowell. Three and four are seven. So who shot him first? George, that's a very good question. Now, uh, how are you fixed for good answers? Oh, you want a minute to think it over. Okay. You give it some thought, and we'll give this a listen. Cy Kirby, Mr. Van Russell, he was the only one it could have been. You see the others, his wife and... Yeah, the I understand, I understand, yeah. Well, they got him fast enough. He didn't have any story cooked up. It wasn't premeditated or oh, anything. Oh, of course, of course. I think they'll be able to prove that your wife only shot a dead body, Mr. Van Russell. Yeah, I see, yeah. Uh, you don't really, do you? I mean, you still haven't told us about your wife and Hollowell and... Kirby, Hannah. that was his partner. You had to swat some difficult... Well, he'd been holding out on him. Over $10,000 profit on a necklace. The only reason Hollowell lied about his return to Kirby was to give him time to arrange for a sale without anyone knowing. Been going on for years, apparently. This time, Kirby caught up with him. Oh, it wasn't really that, though. It was Mrs. Hollowell. No matter how mad she got at her husband for carrying on with other women, no matter how many times they separated, she always went back to him. And Kirby couldn't stand it. He loved it, too. It's always love, one way or another. The same as your coming after your wife, even after she'd left you. I suppose there will be a trial. I suppose my wife... Well, there certainly will be an investigation. Maybe about shooting somebody who's already dead, but... Why won't you talk about your wife? Why don't you tell me what I want to know, that silly business of the necklace that kept confusing us? That was a wedding present I gave to her years ago. She gave to him. That's all. Nice guy, Hollowell. Yeah. But your wife, I mean, she knows that you came after her trying to help. She knows what you're really like or she wouldn't have tried to kill Hollowell. Don't you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is a dull place we live in. And I am not much excitement myself, not glamorous like United States. No. We work it out somehow. Don't worry so much. Goodbye. Yeah. What was that line of yours, Brooksy? One way or another, it's always love. Go on, darling. There's nothing I'd rather hear you talk about. You 
have just heard No Escape from the Jungle, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Our story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Change is my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, you all set for another visit with Valentine? Ready or not, here he comes, and is he loaded. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I don't mean in the true sense of the vernacular, nor is he toting a Tommy gun. He's just up to his chin in bliss. You know why? He's going on a vacation. Now, whether you think this is the proper time of year to take a vacation, or whether you think he deserves one, is of no consequence to George. He just got tired of letting George do it. And packed Brooksy in his bags into the car and took off for his favorite seaside spot. Now, at first glance, this may look a little on the dull side, but stick around. It's only the beginning. Fish do. George, are you sure this is the right road? It's so dark, all I can see is fog and sand. Yeah, I know, and they're both the same color. Now, don't worry, I can tell them apart. I tell you, Brooksy, the Italians call it Giappino and the French call it Bouillabaisse. But this stuff here tastes so much I better know. than what they... I know, and Miss Gallagher just calls it fish stew. You've only told me about it ten times. Well, now, look, everybody else in the world gets a vacation. Why can't I? At least once a year, can't we go off somewhere George, and have I'm some not fun? complaining about a vacation. I think it's wonderful. No mysteries, no letters from people getting murdered. But, I mean, it's so silly just picking up and going someplace you happen to be once where they have fish stew. Oh, but, Angel, you haven't tasted it yet. Besides, I wrote to her, didn't I? Huh. Still like to know why she didn't answer. Miss Gallagher? Well, that's right. Why look on the gloomy side? Maybe she's in poison at her own cooking. Oh, darling, if I sound like a gloomy... What's the matter? Road sign. Oh, I guess I'd better powder my nose, hadn't I? Sandy spit. One mile. Yep. Almost there. Fog's clearing a little, too. Mm, here comes the moon. Looks cold, doesn't it? <laughs> Sandy Spit, I don't blame you. Even the name of the place is crazy. But it's quiet. Nothing ever happens here. Nobody ever comes here. Aren't there any tourists or summer visitors? Uh, not many. You've seen the roads. Just sand fleas and seagulls, mostly. Oh, a few artists or hermits, maybe. But I think most people are afraid of this kind of country. Too lonely. Just miles and miles of sand dunes and wind. Yes. George, I take it all back. I think I'd like something warm and friendly like a fish stew. The place looks totally different, you know, in the daytime. I mean, when the sun's up. Well? Oh, well, hello. I was looking She's for... not in. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Miss Gallagher. Well, obviously, I'm not her, am I? My name's Dr. Crowell, and you can take my word for it. She's not in. Good night. Well, uh, uh, you see, we're down to visit. She might not remember, but Mr. Valentine here wrote for reservations, only she didn't answer, so I'm not got... surprised. Probably wouldn't answer if you were standing in the same room. What? She don't take in guests anymore. I'm the only one left. And the way things are going, I won't last much longer. Well, what's happened that changed... Or am I wrong? Sure, sure, you're not here for hospitality, are you? Wasting my time, aren't I? What on earth are you talking like about? Like all the rest, just nosing around. Well, I'm not going to show you no gold cup. Uh, gold cup? For my money, it ought to have stayed buried another 300 years. 
and Gallagher along with it, her and her big secrets and mysteries. Yes, and you too. You should all be dead. Now, that's what I call a fine example of seaside hospitality. I think George better give up the idea of fish stew, or he'll end up dead as a mackerel. All of which makes me think that I'd better clam up and let you hear something that's not a fish story. Now, let's see how George and Brooksy are making out. I don't think this little safari to the sea is going to turn out to be much of a vacation. And neither does Brooksy. Nothing ever happens in Sandy Spit. Ah, oh, the guy's nutty. Just Come on. warm fires and good food. What I want is a vacation. You know, once a year, get away from all the puzzles and excitement and mysteries. Oh, cut and the... it out, Angel. It doesn't mean anything. Only, what did he say about a gold cup? George. Hey, wait a minute. Never mind. Listen. What? <laughs> Yeah, a party going on down the street. I thought everybody was a hermit in this town, like Dr. Crowell. Great party, great party. For the little woman and I, we sure appreciate it. Sure do, Mr. Lewis. Likewise in space. Yeah. Come along, Clyde. Well, at least nothing so very wrong can be going on here with people that happy. Anytime, you two, anytime. But uh, it's your house tomorrow night, eh? Huh? Oh, no, it's my house. Oh. It's fun to get together, isn't it? Yeah, night, Miss Gallagher. Sure is. Night, Miss Gallagher. Come on, George. Clyde, at hey, least I there's our Miss Gallagher. Yeah, come on. Let's. Hey, where is she? Well, she lives back this way, so she must be coming. No, she's disappeared. And another couple, a big blonde and her husband. Where are they now? Well, you might have noticed where she went. An item like that. Oh, come on. People don't just get swallowed up in the night. There aren't any cabins or houses out this other way, but Miss Gallagher. Nobody here but us vacationers. Now, wait here, Angel. She must have gone this way. I'll catch up with her. Oh, Miss Gallagher. Miss Gallagher. Oh. Hey, what do you think you're... Oh, uh, excuse me, Mac. Sorry. No, 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 my fault. I didn't see you uh, hiding there. What? I, I don't get you. Me? I'm you know, just tying a shoe, that's all. Just... Who are you? Oh, now, take it easy. I'm just a visitor, that's all. Yeah, let's not kill each other, Mac. My name's Mercy, see? Clyde Mercy. Mercy Carnivals. Have you heard the name in better days? I even used to do a muscle act myself, see? So don't bother with no double talk. Hey, hey, what makes you so anxious? My name's George Valentine. Just going through town, that's all. Oh, oh. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's the way with me, too. Yeah. Just visiting, that's all. The little wife's in training here. The long-distance swimmer, you know. That's a dead little place. Nothing ever happens. You won't have much fun. I was just on my way for a little stroll on the beach before I turn in, you know. <laughs> it was a silly idea anyway, I guess. Mm -hmm. huh? Oh, yes, dear. Right here. I was just... Did you see her? Baby. Did you see where she went? Please. Or did you pull another stupid... Baby. Thing? Oh. Hello. Hi. Well, uh, let's get home, baby. Time for us to be in bed. Well, good night, Valentine. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Nothing ever happens here. Come on, Angel. Down the beach. <laughs> Yes, I'm Liza Gallagher. That's that's right. Well, we didn't mean to scare you. Hey, you know, the climate must make people jumpy around here. Uh, Miss Gallagher, don't you remember my I, name? I was just going for a walk on the beach, but you didn't see anyone else, did you? Clyde Mercy Look, or... Miss Gallagher, what's happened to this place? In the old days, people didn't go in for parties. And afterwards, they didn't go sneaking off at this time of night to go in for... Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, but I thought I heard... Know about the old days? What do you mean? Well, I was here last year. Don't you remember? George, wait. There is somebody. Stand still. Please don't move, Mr. Lewis. It's Todd Lewis. Don't let him see us. The man who gave the party. Yes, yes, he's a sculptor. There. Now he's gone. Uh huh. Does he always go walking up the beach with a clam shovel at this time of night? Is that the secret? You all sneak off to dig clams? He pretended he was going to bed. That's what he told everybody at the party. Well, he could be going to that other house out there, that big, empty, lonesome place at the end of the point. Oh, no, that's rented by somebody named Brown from the city. But he's only here weekends for his health. He has a bad heart, Mr. Brown does. Besides, he wouldn't notice if anybody came walking past his place up the beach. Notice what, Miss Gallagher? <gasps> George Valentine. What? That's who you are. I remember now. 
You're the one who was sort of a, a detective. Well, yes, but... The post office. The post office sent you, didn't they? It was because I didn't report the fire. Hey, What's wait a minute. What's fire? And now you've come to... You've come to... Arrest me. Oh, Miss Gallagher. She's fainted. Miss Gallagher, please, start at the beginning, will you? If you feel all right, and I've convinced you I'm not a post office inspector. Yeah, yes, I'll show you the gold cup. It's a relief to tell somebody. About a fire in the post office? Yes, yes, because I'm the postmistress, too, in this town. Use the back of the grocery store. Oh, so that's it. And there was a fire, oh, just a little tiny one. No one else ever knew about it, but that's when I found the cup. Go on. Uh, I keep a sack out for people to mail things, and everybody sends packages, sends shells or paintings, or even once that Mr. Lewis sent a whole bust of General Grant in concrete, too. Mm, you must sell a lot of stamps. Oh, I, I didn't do anything dishonest. It, it's just that somebody dropped a match or a cigarette, I guess, and this one package got burned, and I couldn't tell who was sending it. You know, the return address. It was all charred. But it was going to a jewelry buyer in the city. I know that because I rewrapped it and sent it on. Only pull down the blind first, will you? Hmm? Oh, here. Now, look, if this cup was in that package you sent on, then how can you show it to us now? Wait. There. There, you see? I made a cast out of it with some of Mr. Lewis's clay. It's sort of a funny-shaped cup. It was found someplace here on Sandy Spit. It must have been, because someone was sending it. Found it buried in the sand. They must have. Mm-hmm. This is just like the original? Oh, yes. You can even see the markings. Oh, that's what I meant. I don't read Latin so well, but it's a good 300 years old, I guess. Spanish. It's Spanish. I looked in a book. I mean, the design and everything. And made out of hand-carved solid gold like that. You know how much it weighed, Mr. Valentine. Don't mind. I get the idea. Thing that size. Somebody went digging for clams or fishing for a stew and made a fortune on the hall. <laughs> And this is a vacation, George? Oh, Brooksy, who wants to just eat on a vacation? Who knows? In the morning, you and I might do a little digging for buried treasure ourselves. Who really found that cup, Mr. Lewis? Ah, <laughs> the $64 question. Me, I'm about as subtle as a hammer. I just ask people. And somebody's a liar? Well, would you tell? Or would you tell where? Or would you let people follow you to the right place? <laughs> nah, nah. You were a boy once yourself. Okay, okay. Some rich guy named Brown from the city owns this property. Oh, and therefore... that bird was never out here? No, no. Property lines don't mean anything where treasure's concerned. Finders, keepers. <laughs> no, no, there, see? A guy like that. Yeah, he's my choice. Ah, uh, what? Well, look, over there in the sand, taking a nap, see? <laughs> hey, come on. Let's give him a thrill. It's that carnival guy, isn't it? Clyde Mercy? Right. The one with the blonde wife? Yeah, don't talk so loud. Wind's behind us. Yeah, get around to the other side of this dune. <laughs> carnival. <laughs> Clyde's a big-time failure. I don't know how I ever snagged a babe like her, but... Shh, easy, easy. No, oh, brother. Not enough we got a treasure hunt. We have to play games, too. Well, what do you come to the beach for if it's not to have a little fun? Come on. These people all take it so seriously. Here, now wait. This will wake him up. Put it hands up, Clyde. We want the gold in your teeth. <laughs> and don't pretend you haven't found something. Yeah. Clyde's not laughing. You didn't scare him at all. He's too dead. Say, I wonder what inside information Clyde had on that buried treasure. Must have been pretty good to have someone rub him out for it. Or is that the way it happened? Well, let's give a listen to this first, and then maybe we'll find out. Back to George Valentine. 
Sandy Spit, a place for fleas and seagulls. But if your name is George Valentine and it's your vacation, you want to go there because of Miss Gallagher's fabulous fish stew. And then, like everybody else, you get curious about the treasure, an old Spanish gold cup that someone found buried in the sand. Only now you've found something else in the sand. The body of a man, Clyde Mercy. Murdered. Sure, sure, you don't need a diagram for that. Look, clam shovel. Hey, don't touch that. All right. But it's what somebody used to smash his head with. Yeah, put up a little fight, though. Must have hit him several times. I told you people took this treasure stuff too seriously. Did Clyde here? Yeah? Oh, sure, sure, worse than anybody else. Yeah, you see his wife, the blonde, she's in training for long-distance swimming or something. She'd go trotting off in a white bathing suit every morning, and the minute she was gone, this little guy would sneak out into the dunes and start his daily prospecting. Get rich quick. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure. Clyde here found some gold. What? Yeah, his hand here. Look. Holy smoke. Hanging on to it for dear life. That's right. Gold coin. Spanish. About the same date as that cup. <laughs> Such a silly name. I always yelled at him so. Yeah, we understand, Mrs. Mercy. No, you don't. How could you? People like us. My third husband, you know that? And when I met him, I thought he was such a silly-looking ape, gawking at me in a bathing suit. Here, have a drink. It'll make you feel better. I married him for his money. Do you know that? That's the funniest part. He used to own a carnival, see, and I... I thought your husband was broke. Well, he lost it, naturally. No, he wasn't any good. And me and my big mouth, of course, I told him so and yelled at him, and he just got broker and broker. Until all I could think about was digging for buried treasure, huh? Sure, you got the idea. Saps. We're all just saps going around. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What did the sheriff say, Mr. Valentine? Oh, nothing yet. Just that this forsaken place has a population of 73. 73, the sheriff says. 75, counting us. You want to bet the sheriff will be a lot more interested in finding out about the treasure than who killed Clyde? Look, Mrs. Mercy, why don't you go on home and stop? I home? know, I know. Stop crying. Clyde's dead. If there's anything more I can do, I can Of go. course there isn't. I'll go swimming. That's what I'll do. What do you think I am, a baby? Oh, come on, Angel. Let's go back in and talk to Mrs. Gallagher. Oh, no, how do I know who it is? Who cares? They're out in the back. But Dr. Cole, wait. Don't get in such a lather about me. Hello, Miss Gallagher. Oh, Mr. Valentine, he's gone. He took his bag and just ran out. I told him to wait for oh, you. What are you talking about? A, a phone just came from Mr. Brown's house. Brown? Rich guy out at the point, Angel. He's sick, remember? Oh, no, no. That's not what I mean. Dr. Crowell couldn't tell who the voice was, but, of course, that doesn't mean anything to him. He doesn't believe in mysteries and Never treasures. mind, I get it. Brown's only home on the weekends. Yeah, I remember. So then who called the doctor and why? <laughs> House is just up around to the right there, overlooking the beach. Yeah, sure. Just wait a minute, will you? What is it, George? Hurry up, please, Mr. Valentine. I was just looking at a piece of paper. Taxi slip, see? Oh. Uh, somebody's been here, all right. Been here pretty often, too. Look, another one over here. Here's still another one. And th those little slips, they tear out of the meter. That's right. And one of them's so fresh, it isn't even damp from the salt air. Come on, step on it. <laughs> Brown doesn't put the shutters up, but the place is always locked up tight. This path here? Most of the time, he uses the door back here by hey, the shed. Wait a minute. Mr. Lewis! Hey, what are you doing out here? Well, now, that's a question I was going to ask you. Eh? Well, I'm trespassing, naturally. No, no, I just saw a man hurrying in here from across the dunes carrying a bag and wondered what was up. That was Dr. Crow. Sure, but Miss Gallagher, you wait here with Miss Brooks, will you? Come on, Lewis. There's All you. right, George. Hey, what's she so upset about this day? I don't know. Hey, the door's open. Yeah, uh -huh. Back way goes through the tool shed, I guess. Front doors just let sand in in this country. Yeah. Oh, but that's not all. Yeah. yeah. Lying on the floor by the hall. Come on. Yeah, look. Doctor's kit beside him. Oh, brother. Now, wait. Don't touch him. He's not dead. I don't see any marks on him. Don't touch him. Huh? 
Who's that? It's Dr. Crow. Let him lie just the way he Wait is. Wait a minute, doctor, but this guy on the floor, who's... It's Mr. Brown's house, so I guess it wouldn't be too far-fetched if this guy were Mr. Brown. Ah, boy genius. I don't need your help, gentlemen. The ambulance is on its way. Just telephone. Yeah, but who hit him? Who slugged him? Be quiet, will you? What happened, doctor? Heart attack. Yeah, I was... Uh, He'll be all right. Just needed a little shot, that's all. Was well, it all right if I ask him a couple of questions? No. I'm no specialist, but he's sick. Now, go play your Captain Kid game someplace else. Okay, okay. I guess he wouldn't answer the questions anyway. You know, Mr. Lewis, you seem to be around every time something happens. You're the one that I saw out walking last night with a clam shovel. Everybody here's got one. There's a hundred of them, several in some homes. Any one of them could have been used as the murder weapon? Oh, sure, sure, and they all look the same. Only, uh, there's none here. I can't find Mr. Brown's clam shovel. And yet there are clam buckets, the rest of the stuff. Uh Uh-huh. There ought to be one, shouldn't there? Wait, I'll take a look at the outside lock. Yeah. Uh, Hasn't been touched. Ones in front of the house haven't been either. Okay. So if there was a clam shovel in there and somebody wanted to use it, they'd have to have a key. So you eliminate the mystery, don't you? It's the person with the key who used the shovel that's missing. In other words, Brown himself. George? Oh, will you? Yeah, here, Angel. Did you get hold of that taxi driver? Yes. The driver remembered all right. Now, what's this? Go on, Brooks. He says he drove Mr. Brown out just half an hour before we came. you What did she tell you, Mr. Valentine? It's Mr. Brown who found the treasure, all right. Mr. Brown even paid the driver not to tell anyone he was coming out here. I mean, during the times when he was supposed to be in the city. Today, George, the driver told Mr. Brown all about the excitement here. Over the murder and the treasure and everything. Oh, simply everybody knows now. And he said Mr. Brown suddenly looked very ill. He didn't want to talk about it. He seemed frightened. Then he went in and had a heart attack. Well, that's it. What more do you need? It's been him all along. Yoo-hoo! Mrs. Mercy! She's out there swimming. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Brown found the treasure. Poor little Clyde stumbled into what he was doing and... Come here, Mrs. Mercy! Come here, quick! Mr. Brown will have to tell where the treasure is, naturally. They'll make him, and I guess all the rest of us can okay, just... Okay, okay, we'll all be rich. It's all over with the shouting. Come on, Angel. Yeah, George. What did I say? Oh, I wouldn't worry. What's the matter? Uh, gold makes people do funny things. But I guess there's more than one kind of gold, isn't there? What? She has beautiful hair, doesn't she, Mrs. Hmm? Oh, that Mrs. Mercy. Yeah, that's one kind of gold, white bathing suit and all. George, I don't understand. And then there's another kind of gold, like Mr. Brown has, the kind in the bank. Oh. Are you trying to say a rich man wouldn't be likely to commit crimes and then be so surreptitious if he'd found a buried treasure? Mm Mm-hmm. But he might be surreptitious about something else. Mr. Valentine. Hello. Wow, there, I feel lots better. Water's wonderful. Hello, Mrs. Mason. Uh, this is the only good place around here to swim, I guess, isn't it? Down here by Mr. Brown's diving platform. Oh, sure. Do it all the time. I'm in training. Uh Uh-huh. Well, when a man is struck several times, when he's fighting for his life, do you think he could be greedy enough to still hang on to a piece of gold? What's that? Oh, please don't talk about Clyde. Why not? Your third husband who was getting broker and broker. You left him every day, didn't you? Parade in front of the window of the man who would often leave his job to be here. What? Say, what's eating you? The gold coin. Clyde fought for his life. His hand would have been open. The coin would have dropped out. So somebody put it there after he was dead. And certainly that wasn't the one who found the treasure. Why put the finger on himself? So there must have been another motive. I don't get you. All right, take a package being burned in a post office sack. Somebody could drop a cigarette or match, and it might burn just the right part of the package. But it would be a lot easier to do the burning first, and then put it there for Miss Gallagher to find to be curious about. Again, there must be a motive. I'm going up to the house. I think you're crazy. Mrs. Mercy, you should have put another shovel in there, so that Mr. Brown wouldn't see his was gone and catch on to what you'd done. Mr. Brown's not here. He's in town. So Mr. Brown wouldn't realize what you were really like, realize you'd murdered your husband, and have a heart attack because of it. No, I did not... Heart attack? No, he didn't. It's not true. Oh, lady, you give yourself away every minute, don't you? Yeah, the lady who killed her husband so she could hook a man with gold. Only, ironically enough, Mr. Brown had a heart attack. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 
Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. He can still marry somebody. But it won't be you. Sure, that's right. He's not dead. You are, sister. But the gold, George. That cup and the coin, the treasure. Oh, there isn't any, Angel. Don't you see? Mrs. Mercy just used it to set up a perfect murder. This is Sandy Spit, remember? It's just a place for fleas and seagulls. Stick around, I'll prove it. Well, now that we know who bumped off Clyde and why, I still have a question. When is George going to get around to having some of that fish stew he's been yapping about? This I gotta see. Just like this, you've got to hear. <laughs> More, Miss Brooks? Doctor, don't interrupt. Yeah. Well, anyway, Mr. Brown wasn't mixed up in it at all. It was just Mrs. Mercy. He confirmed that finally when he got over the shock of finding out what she was like. You see? Mm, well, go I... on, George. Oh, lobster. Look at that. Pieces of lobster. Right, young man. Whitefish, too. Oh, love whitefish. Yeah, man. But she started the whole treasure fever with an old gold cup and a coin. Mailed the cup. Made sure Miss Gallagher would see it and spread the excitement. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, Gallagher's all right. She's back on the job now. Uh, pass the bread. Yeah, sure. Hey, you know, the idea was a good one. With evidence of Clyde having been killed by the person who found the treasure, the police would never think of his wife as the murderess. Seventy-three suspects. A crime blamed on greed. Sure good idea, but it didn't work. Yeah, women should stay where they belong. Isn't that so, Liza? Oh, now, Doctor, stop it. At home, you mean? Yes, I think so, too. Um, I couldn't help noticing you and Miss Gallagher, Doctor. You seem so happy now, so different from when you... What's that? What's that? Me and who? <laughs> uh, now, don't get any wrong notions, young lady. Valentine here, he understands. Woman's place is in the kitchen. Sure, sure, that's all the Doc wants, Angel. You see, I do understand. I'm a fish stew man myself. You have just heard Murder on Vacation, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Our story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. You've all heard of the man behind the plow. Or of the man behind the gun. But have you ever heard of the man behind the frame? Well, if you haven't, you are right now. Because that's the title of our Let George Do It adventure. Now, one does not have to have a high IQ to figure out that the man behind the frame is not some small character who keeps that picture of Uncle Egbert hanging up over the fireplace. On the contrary, he's the kind of schmo who likes to have others fight his battles for him. And George Valentine is a fellow who is always ready to put on the gloves, with or without horseshoes. Now, it all started with a bunch of the boys getting together for a little ad-lib sing-fest, which is a pretty sour way to start anything. It's the best office machinery. Hold it, you guys. Shut up. Shut up, will you? 
I'm trying to talk on the telephone. How can I... Ah, that's better. Bunch of crazy banshees. Hello. Yes, yes, now I can hear you. Lawrence Ferguson? The kid? Well, sure he works for me. Came down from Emmitsville with me just yesterday. What'd he do? Get high on too much soda pop? <laughs> oh, look, friend, whoever you are, I'm no nursemaid. Don't bother me with any of this. Uh, shut up, you guys. He what? When? Where did he... Look, Lieutenant, for God's sakes, tell me. All right. Of course. County jail. I got it. Dear Mr. Valentine, my name's Vic Burnett, Federal Office Equipment Company. You remember, the guy sold you the wire recorder for your office. Well, I'll cancel out the last three payments on it if you come down fast to the county jail. I need help. A crazy rube I brought into town for a convention just so he could see the sights is now staring at the inside of a cell. He's been locked up for murder. I think that this uh, Mr. Burnett should have coached this young hothead on how to act before he brought him to town. You just don't go around killing people any more than you turn a deaf ear to this. Now let's see if George has gotten into the act yet. Oh, yes. I see he and Brooksy have just walked into Lieutenant Johnson's office. Okay, Mr. Burnett, But okay. I feel responsible for him. He's never been down here before. He's not even a salesman. You see, up in Emmitsville, you I have this You want to see him, kid... Valentine, or don't just you? Just a minute, Lieutenant Johnson. He's never done anything but read comic books. But I can't let him get railroaded like a well, common... I'm every... sure he's not being railroaded for anything. And a woman is dead, isn't she? Miss Brooks, listen to me. This kid That's is... That's a good idea. Some... You listen to her, Brooksy. Come on, Johnson. Gladly. Oh, Valentine, wait a minute. I just want to hear it from the kid himself. That's all. What a job. My poor boy's in the hands of the law. <laughs> oh, well, that guy's just trying to help. I'm an old man. This guys like Burnett help me get that way. What's eating you? You'll see. Here. Through here. A woman was murdered, huh? Take it from there. Hotel apartment where she lived. Name was Sally Fife. High-speed typist. <laughs> typist. Yeah, where do you meet her? What happened? You'll see. Oh, look, Johnson. Blow you... on the side of the head with a bottle. Oh. Little party? Little gal about 35, fast talker, neat, clean, small business of her own that didn't amount to anything. Fight, sure, a fight of some kind. What else? This is a very refreshing original story. Why was the kid picked up? Were there witnesses? He was caught trying to run down a fire escape this morning. Taking us all day to even pry his name out of him. Well, I don't He's see He's 26. What... Skinny, sandy-haired, pimply-faced 26, and probably never earned more than 26 a week in his life, either. You see for yourself. All right. Hey, wake up. Ferguson. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Hello, sir. Sure. I oh, don't stand up. Just thought you were asleep. No, sir, I can't sleep. I just shut my eyes like that. I do it in the office sometimes so people don't know I'm thinking. Okay, I'm not sir. This is Mr. Valentine. Sure. How do you do, sir? Whatever you say. Yeah, hello. Sit down, Lawrence. Yeah. Uh, you want to hear it, too, I guess. I don't feel very good, you know. Last night you had some drinks. Yeah. See, Mr. Valentine, I'm just a... Up in Emmitsville, I mean. Been there nine years. Uh -huh. I begged so many times to come to conventions of boss. It's Mr. Burnett. He, he finally... Last night you went to a movie, and after that a bar called The Silver Duck, and you had some drinks. Uh -huh. There was a banquet on the schedule, but, of course... I'm not a regular salesman. I mean, just a clerk, you know. But I do handle the boss's correspondence and the district records and things. Well, I, I was alone last night. I don't know anybody in the city or anything. You knew this woman, didn't you? This Sally Fife? No. What? No, I, I didn't. Not until then. In the bar, I mean. He met her there. Very refreshing. It's true, too. Go on. Well... I had several, I guess. You know how it is when a guy's alone, on the town, so to speak. I, I don't remember very well, but I guess I met her. She was awful nice. Anyway, sometime later, I didn't feel very well. Yeah, sure. 
It was a long way back to the hotel, and she said she'd make me some coffee up at her place close by. But she was nice. I, I don't want you guys thinking anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know all about it. Tell them what happened when you got there. I told you. I, I, I don't know. It, it's not clear. I'm not used to... I mean... I don't know whether I drank the coffee or not. All I know is that it's daylight and I'm asleep on the sofa. All right, hold it, kid, hold it. There was a fight, wasn't there? You had trouble with this oh, girl and then... stop it. Leave me alone. I... All right, I, I ran, sure. I ran. I, I tried to get out the fire escape, only my head was all dizzy. I would have got away if it hadn't been for that. That's this morning when they caught you. Get back to last night. Well... <laughs> there she was... What do you think? I killed her. Oh, you did. Well, tell me about it. Refreshing original story. I don't know. Tell you what. I, I wanted to have excitement, what it feels like to be kicked around and yelled at by all them salesmen. A clerk, sure. He'll never get any place. Well, they're all fakes, all of them. Loud mouth jerks I could wrap around my finger any time you ask. Salesman. I'm better than any of them. Cut it out, kid. Now, easy. You said you killed a woman. I must have. Don't you see? Nobody else was up there, remember? I'm sorry I shoot my mouth off, but I'm just trying to forget. I wish I was just being a clerk now. Uh, remember, <laughs> forget. It was her idea you have some coffee last night, I suppose. Well, it seems that way. It wasn't mine. How did you know? Oh, for the love of... Kid, haven't you ever heard of a thing like this happening to anybody besides you? What? Well, nobody ever got in trouble like this before. Nobody ever did the things that I must... Oh, cut it out, Rube. I can't stand it, eh? Yeah, the facts are all true, Valentine. The ones we could check. Same old story. What are you talking about? I'm just a guy who wants... Hasn't it ever occurred to you you might be a sucker? Oh, never mind, Johnson. Never mind. What's he held for? He signed a confession of anything? You think I take milk away from babies? Suspicion, that's all. Then how about taking him out of here? What's the name of that bar you said? Uh, the Silver Duck? Come on, Lawrence. I want to see if you know how to swim. What's the idea, Mr. Valentine? This is where I was, all right. Relax, I... relax. Nobody's noticing the handcuffs. Yeah, but just to stand here all the time. Keep watching. <laughs> Neighborhood place, same people every night. It's about the same time now, too. The girl, Valentine. That's the part of it that doesn't fit. She wasn't the type. Wasn't a regular customer. Yeah, Johnson, it does. Fit. I'm just all mixed up. I want to go back Lawrence, to... Lawrence, the... on your first night in the big city, how did you meet this Sally Fife? Uh, how about a demonstration? I want to see how a boy from the stick strikes up a conversation with a strange woman. Well, I, I know my way around. I, oh, no. I, I don't know. She said hello to him. What do you think? He probably blushed, too. Johnson, you contradict yourself. You said she wasn't quite the type. Brisk, sharp lady with a job. There's one. That guy. Huh? Which one? Point him out. There with a cigar. Just came in. Oh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I must have seen all the people over here last night. I remember the waiter. Excuse me. Valentine, Lieutenant, wait. wake up. What's the most likely way the kid here met Sally Fife? Got picked for a patsy or whatever it was. Somebody probably introduced him, don't you think? So I'll see you later. Hello, friend. Huh? Uh, oh, excuse me. Just wondered if I could borrow your newspaper a minute. Hey, what kind of a cigar is that? Did you change, Loopy? 15, 20, 25. Okay, Jake, I'll see you. Wait a minute, friend. The newspaper? Help yourself. See you later, Jake. And sit still. What are you picking the fifth? Must have hit it nice and fancy cigars, paying off your debt. I still got to figure how you leave. Hey, look on my arm, man. I want to ask the bartender, Jake, here about you. What do you want? He's all right, mister. Sit down, sit down. Name's Loopy, huh? What do you want? Turn around. That skinny young guy standing over there. Ever see him before? One next to the heavy set man? No. Hey, Jake, what do you let snoops like this in for? Loopy's all right, mister. Loopy, you haven't been dope on the races at Hialeah. Papers turn to the front page. News about a murder. And that kid's picture. So at least you've seen it before in the paper, haven't you? I didn't notice. Hey, what do you want? 
Here, Jake, here's my selections, all of them. I'm getting out of this. Sure, Lopey. Give me that. Hey, look out. Get your hands off. I got him, so cool off. That other guy coming is a cop. I... I got nothing to be afraid of. Oh, no, no, no. Just wanted to get rid of these notes in your pocket. Only they're not all racing selections either, are they, Loopy? <laughs> Pawn ticket, huh? Mister, I told you, Loopy here's all right. What's going on, Valentine? I don't know, Johnson. Pawn ticket for a thousand bucks. What? Yeah. No wonder he pays his debts today, smokes such fancy cigars. Now, look, Golly, I ain't got nothing to hide. I just been wondering what to do about it, that's all. I'm Loopy Fife. Huh? Fife? Did you say? Sure. This tamer got killed. It. Well, I've been wondering if I should volunteer as expert testimony or something. I mean, she's my wife. <laughs> Rhymes. Sally Fife, she's my wife. Well, how do you like... Come on, friend. We're going to have a little talk. Now, look all me. Come Take on. it easy. I ain't done nothing. Oh, no. Just hawked a mink coat for a thousand dollars. Well, that's what it says here on the pawn ticket. One mink coat. Oh, here's no doubt. Well, it's a cold All night. right, so what? So I did so what? Sure, it's here, but I've done it before. She don't mind. I always get a winner the next day. Brings me luck, that's all. Raise a little quick cash. She don't mind. If you're talking about your wife, what do you mean? That she's too dead now to mind? Cut it out, I said. She and me were just friends. God rest her soul. So stop looking at me that way. I didn't kill her with the boss. Ain't it so, Jake? That's what you call platonic, that's all. Picking the guy who gave her the mink, not me. Sure, go up to Emmettsville. Big shot salesman, he's the one. Vic Burnett. Yeah, ask Vic Burnett. Well, what do you know? Mr. Burnett goes around giving out mink coats to little married girls. You know, somehow he didn't impress me as being that generous. Anyway, while George Valentine is working that tip over, let you and I work this one over. And now, back to George Valentine. Vic Burnett, the big man from Emmettsville, here in town for a convention. He wanted you to help one of his employees, the young clerk, Lawrence Ferguson. Because Lawrence was locked up in jail for murder, too confused even to defend himself. The only trouble is, though, the girl Lawrence said that he met for the first time last night, the night of her murder, now seems to have been mixed up with Vic Burnett himself. So, if your name is George Valentine, you're pretty much inclined to agree with Claire Brooks when she says... I never did like his looks, George, from the day he sold us this wire machine. I didn't like the kind of stories he told. Oh, sure, was... sure, Brooksy, but don't break the recorder on account of him. You get the rest of my notes on it? Oh, didn't you finish? I'll hook it up on the phone again. No, no, that's all. Barnett didn't tell you where he was going after he left the county jail, did he? No. Huh. How do you like that? Write up your notes for a client that doesn't even... Well, we can't find him either, Brooksy. Salesman must have sold himself a powder and then taken it. That's a Valentine. Now you're just getting my boss in trouble. He wouldn't have done a thing like that. Kid, you want to save your job or your neck? I don't know. I'm all confused. I don't feel very good. This place just reminds Lawrence, me... Lawrence, of... we brought you here to her apartment to see what else you could remember. Well, I'm not helping any. I know I'm not helping any, but... If you just leave him out of it... Burnett's in this up to his ears. Now, for the last time, relax. Forget what a sucker you've been and think. I'm trying, Lieutenant. That's the couch I woke up on. I know that. Wash the glasses. Did you? Mm, no, I don't think so. Must have been drugged. Clean glasses. With liquor stains on the table and floor. I came up here to have a cup of coffee, I know, but... Kid, that husband, Loopy... You saw him in the bar when you met her. Didn't you see him up here, too, later on? Sure you did, didn't you? I didn't see anybody here except her. Oh, for the love... Okay, Rube, wait for us here. And by the way, there's a sergeant outside the other door. Well, going to get around to me now, huh? Just wanted to give you time to make your story good, Loopy. I know you guys. I think if you keep me cool and I'll get hotter, hey? Well, let me tell you. I'm just a husband, see? But we're divorced. I'm not surprised. She was a businesswoman. 
Little sharp around the edges, maybe, but standing the guy like you is a horse of another color. Incompatible, that's all. Just one of them things. Give the little lady her happiness, I said, but still play tonic. Soft spot for old Loopy. You know how it is. Which brings me to the mink coat. A little matter which was over and done with yesterday afternoon. A little load of the mink, so Loopy could pick the horse of the right color. If you don't mind my lifting your figures of speech. Just saw her for a minute, met Bob, but I never came up here later on. Vic Burnett gave her the coat, huh? Yes, sir, but you see... When? Last year. How long has he known her? Oh, several years, maybe. Fancy apartment. Her typing service didn't buy her all this. It's how she met him. Special work on his district records or something. He's down here a lot. And she used to write to his office when he wasn't. Boyfriend, that's all. It's perfectly legal. In love with business. <laughs> and he paid her in mink. All right, so she knew a few things about him. So she had a liking for the finer things. Now you're warming up, friend. She blackmailed him, huh? She did not. You can't talk that way about my wife, God rest her soul. A shakedown artist. So that's what you are. I didn't say that. Oh, stop it. Huh? Well, look what's here. You see, I wasn't running any place. Just dodging a little. I know, Mr. Burnett. I guess you don't need me anymore, so I guess I'll just... Oh, no, you don't, Luby. Stick around. Okay, okay. Listen to me. I want you guys to understand something. I hired you, Valentine. Don't forget that. Yeah, to rescue a guy so dumb he walked into the oldest frame-up in history. So old, no matter what he said, no jury would ever convict him. But that doesn't mean you couldn't be the man behind the frame, does it? Sure, he must be. Listen, I said, I would have told you everything, but you know how it is. When did you see her the last time? Last night, supper. Go on, make something out of that. There you see, supper. He's all at supper. How was she dressed? Huh? Well, I, I don't remember very nicely. Was she wearing a mink coat at supper or wasn't she? Sure. The one I gave her. Why? Grab that guy. Louis. Oh, no, you don't. I'm no Somebody sergeant. Him. Grab him, sergeant. Grab him. He's the one. He did it. Get him. He got away, George? Oh, yeah, sure. Of course he got away, Brooksy. Johnson and Burnett after him like a couple of overfed bloodhounds. The kid's here with me. Oh, well, why didn't you go with... I wanted the... you to read me back some notes, that's all. You see, the closet's been all torn up, ransacked. So it had to be Loopy who got the coat, we know that. But he didn't get it until after supper. So he was up here late, probably after he'd been in that bar. George, he saw his wife with Lawrence, so it would have been easy for him to follow them up there and... Yeah, yeah, sure, it was... George? Yeah, I'm right here. Uh, look, I'll, uh... I'll be back up to listen to those notes myself instead, okay? Well, I'm just typing. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be up at the office. Let Johnson look for people. I'm all through. Wait for me. Notes for Burnett. Interviewed Lawrence Ferguson in jail. Has stack of circumstantial evidence against him, including the fact that he was caught oh, running George, the scene of crime. I'm just getting started. The I'm... only trouble is. Oh. Hello, ma'am. I, I heard that voice. And thought it was Mr. Valentine. Oh, I thought you were. You're Lawrence Ferguson, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Do you, you mind if I sit down to wait for him? How'd you know? Hmm. No, no, sit down. He described you, I guess. Oh? I was all dressed up last night. I don't look like much anymore. Oh, don't be silly. It's... I thought George was with you. I can't afford to buy the kind of clothes a salesman do. They're jerks. You know that? Every Where sing... is George? Oh, I don't know. He was on the phone. I, I, I was waiting for him. Then he hung up and took off like lightning. Thought maybe he'd come over here. Go on with your work. I'll, I'll just sit here and, and wait. Well, thank you. Only trouble is, a matter of a mink coat. Loopy, Sally Fife's divorced, no good husband, hostage. Oh, Mr. Valentine didn't know yet, I guess. Loopy got the coat last night. That's what there made... is. With a man who committed murder, maybe even with a coat as motive, Hockett, seems to me he'd be a lot more likely to sell it. <laughs> Mr. Valentine's a smart man, isn't he? At the time Loopy hocked the coat, today, he didn't even know his wife was dead. I'm sort of like Mr. Valentine in some ways. Smart. Where is George? Tell me. 
If he left to come here and you were with him, he'd be here by now. I don't know. I'm waiting. Just like you are. Yeah. He said the closet at Sally's apartment was all ransacked. Loopy wouldn't do that, would he? He'd know where the coat was. Maybe he already got it. You mean while you were in that bar with his wife? Maybe. She wasn't wearing it. How did you know she even had a mink coat? I don't know, ma'am. I'm all mixed up. Yes. Play some more. That machine, the salesman sell. <laughs> Big shots, the jerks. They even got a song. Salesman of all FOE, we will have prosperity. <laughs> Isn't that a laugh? Like a bunch of high school kids in a football game. I see what goes on. I can make more money than any of them. Lawrence, stop. Stop. I'll, I'll, I'll play it if you want. Sell it. Also, Mr. Burnett, it bothers me you'd hire me and still keep things secret. But you did hire me, so answer a few questions. Your correspondence up there in Emmitsville, Sally Fife did business with you, so whoever handles your correspondence would know about her. Check. And that's your clerk, Lawrence. He would have known about her through the handling of district records, too. But he insists he didn't even know her name until last night. Why? <laughs> you killed her. The poor innocent boy being framed. You killed her. Mr. Valentine, smart. You're stupid. You killed her and ran, but you got caught. Don't say that. That's what she said. I'm sorry. They were sorry for me. They thought I'd been framed because I made it look that way. I spilled liquor on the rug and the table. I pretended. I used to give Sally information about Mr. Barnett. And then she'd get mink coats and things. I don't care. I don't want to know. She wouldn't give me my share. She said I was stupid the same thing you said. Don't, don't touch me. Why not? I have to kill you. Get away. Sally couldn't give me my share. But I got even with her. And even if they caught me, I still made it look like I'd been framed. I looked for the coat, but it was gone. Get away, I said. But I still got away. Stop it. You Lawrence, stop I, I it. To see. I wasn't framed. They, was they thought I'd been framed because I made it look that way. I still make her on the rug at the table. I pretended. I used to give Sally information about Mr. You did that. get me coats and things. Listen. Here, I don't want to know. You turn that thing and try to record what I said. That was stupid. The same thing you You think you've got a confession, don't you? I know. There's a button on this crazy thing. I didn't know. No, I didn't. You both did yourself. Oh, you what kind of a prove I am. And so, Mr. Burnett, I guess you don't need a report. The kid you wanted me to help is nothing but a pin-brained loony. Oh, you button. Turn it off. Oh, yes, it will, Buster. Oh, George, you're here. I'll show you the button. a close call for Brooksy. I wasn't sure there for a minute whether or not George was going to make it in time. Now, while he's quieting Brooksy down, let's take a minute to listen to this. Now, oh, hey, hey, Angel, cut it out. It's all over. He didn't hurt you. But I didn't know where you were. I thought he'd done something to you. Well, back when I was telephoning, he was outside with a cop. He slugged him and ran. But I told you I was coming right over. George, why didn't you say what had happened? Why didn't Look, you... Well, now, take it easy, Angel. I didn't want to scare you. I wasn't positive he was headed here, and... Besides, I came as fast as I could. But you must have got here a long time ago. You must have been standing outside and listening. Angel, it's all over, I see. I know said. you needed real evidence against him. Only I wouldn't George. have let him hurt you, Angel. Come on, let's go. You didn't do that on purpose, did you? I mean, not warn me and then let Brooksy, that... see. what kind of a guy do you think... Well, it just happened that way. Oh, look, darling, come here. Yeah. 
convince you? No. I don't believe you. Oh, oh but don't stop trying to convince me. If at first you don't succeed... You have just heard The Man Behind the Frame, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, I wonder if you like Runyon-esque characters like I do. You know, fellows like Harry the Horse, Nicely Nicely Johnson, and all the rest. But don't get me wrong. This is not a Runyon story, but a Let George Do It adventure. However, there is a character called Lou Mendel in this little tale that must have associated with the boys, because you will see that plenty of Broadway has rubbed off on Lou. On top of that, the boy has got trouble. So much so that even his trouble has trouble, which is bad. So what is to do? Get in touch with George Valentine, which he does. My dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Lou Mendel. I own a nightclub, the Club Top Hat, which I'm sure if you've ever been there, you'll admit is a very high-class place. It's not the type of place where we have any trouble, and everything is strictly above the board, which is where you fit into the picture puzzle, Mr. Valentine. There is this girl whose name is Dove. She's a new dancer on account of she can't dance, but I like to be big-hearted. But as of to date, my big heart has got me nothing but a blow on the head. This is the essence of the puzzle. Who hit me? Even more important is what about Dove? She is somehow in the middle of the trouble. And for such a nice girl, I don't like it. Oh, yes. This is a lot more than just what you may be thinking. Because... Poor little dove, you understand. Looks upon me as uh, a big brother. And how do you look upon her, Mr. Mandel? What's the matter with me? You think I'm inhuman? Well, if she was the third girl from the left, I'd say... Never mind, never mind. You'd say the wrong things anyway. To me, she's nothing except... I think I should help. You think she's in trouble? I do not think very much, but there are some things I know. Uh, here, here. Dressing rooms are down this way. We'll wait. Suppose you start at the beginning and we'll... I... Huh? Oh, uh, hello. Oh, good evening, sir. I think perhaps you're in the wrong place. If you were looking for the check room no, or no, the... No, uh... not, Mr. Mandel. See? Oh, what beautiful flowers. Oh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I was in your way. Just waiting, that's all. Well... Not at all, uh... Haven't I seen you someplace before? Oh, no, sir. No, I'm quite certain. Uh, no, sir. Stage door, Johnny. Hmm? Oh, no, sir. I just... Uh, well, good evening. Come on, Mendel. That dance number will be over soon. I want to hear your story No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, uh, which girl are you here to see? Me? Oh, well, I don't... I don't think that's any of what your... What difference head? does it make? Come on. Let come go on. of me, Valentine. Which girl? Now, see here. That dumbbell it... dove... What do you think? What? You keep out of this, it's none of your affair. So who else should rate my taxi around his dump, huh? In advance yet, with my meter running. 
I told you to wait outside, driver. There's got to be a light to read heavy stuff like a funny magazine, ain't there? Now shut up, Paulie. Good idea, Buster. Come on, Mendel. For the last time, will you Dove, please... that man's going out with Dove. No, no, no. There's nothing to get excited about. I should have explained. I'm just a friend. My name is Andrews. Oh, good heavens. Nothing to be jealous about. Me? Jealous? Dry up, all of you. Well, I mean, well, well, look at me. My heavens, I'm old enough to be... Well, to be her big brother. You know, this dove gal must be a real doll. Mendel says she has no talent when it comes to hoofing. So I wonder what the gal has got. Maybe it's those black net stockings. Or maybe she was smart and listened to this. Now let's get back and see how George Valentine is doing as to finding out who gave Lou Mendel a hit in the head. Mr. Mendel, please. Look at this. What happened? Look at this. See? See here? Just where my hair is thinning? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you got hit all right. Must have felt nice, but when and where? Last night, here, by the door to a dressing room. There wasn't a convention here then, huh? Well, after closing, I noticed the light. I'd heard a door shut, and I came to see what it was. It was a door to the street. Only then, all the lights went out. I was hit. Uh-huh. Well, go on, go on. Where does she fit in? Well, I, I stooped to look at an envelope lying under the door. In it was a thousand-dollar bill. Wow. Yeah, note, too. I was reading the note. Do you remember what it said? Yeah, yeah, it said, uh, the picture was not even worth the price of a loge, but this is where I came in. Oh, brother, this is where I came in. Yeah, but it happened. So it don't make sense. So what? Is that any reason why you should turn up your nose like this? Oh, I don't doubt you're worried about what happened. It's just a little too simple. But so... it happened. The picture wasn't worth the price of a loge, but this is where I came in. No signature. I don't know who wrote it. But I got knocked on the head, didn't I? And when you came to, the thousand dollars was gone, I suppose. Money, note, the works. Of course. Well, don't you believe that? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm disgusted because the note is so simple, and the money, too, that I wonder why you need my help. Hey, what's this really about, Mendel? What kind of a dumb act are you trying to play? Oh, no, no, please, please. Just because a man has a nightclub, you know, that does that make he's got to be suspectable? Can a man in a tuxedo be, be just people like anybody else? This thing I don't understand, this this bump on my head, yes, this, this what's... Yes, George, yes, can a man who's obviously in love be blind when it now, comes wait a to... There she is, there she is, the dance number's over. Now, Valentine, quick, what did you mean by what you... Miss Dove, I brought you some flowers and I have a taxi waiting. What? And I... Uh, I'll change in a minute. Well, hello, everybody. Uh... <clears throat> Dove, my dear, I want you to Bye, meet... Mr. Mendel. Now, wait a minute. I want to hear what you... See you again sometime. <laughs> That's it. Go join are. the boys in the back room, huh? Goodbye. Oh, gee, you shouldn't have done that. He's the boss. Oh, he'll get over it. So you're uh, Dove, huh? Mm-hmm. It's a family name. Oh. And this is the face that launched a thousand ships. <laughs> well, I think I get it now, George. What'd I do? Uh, you mean we had lunch together or something? And I don't know any sailors. Uh, yeah. My name's Valentine. Well, I'm very pleased to know you. No, you're not. I want to know about the thousand bucks you charge somebody for a picture. What? Picture of what? Oh, now, don't be so innocent. That's your line, isn't it? Shakedown? Oh, well, well, I'm pretty new to dancing. I guess I never heard of that routine. You never Let heard... Let me, George. Darling, we're talking about blackmail. You don't mind, do you? No, not at all. What is it? Oh, now, look, sister. Oh, I mean, that thing they always do on the radio. Uh, sure, on mystery shows. Only, gee, you're not one of those private eyes, are you? Well, sit down, won't you? I mean, I'd sure like to hear about your work and everything. Oh, for the love of Pete. Now, what did I do wrong? I didn't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. You know, I'm always saying things Well, it that... isn't what you say, dear. It's what you do. But I don't have anything to do with blackmail. I don't even know Dove, what you... I don't believe you. Ah, lay off her, will you? Pick on somebody your own size. Ah, what? Oh, Max, Max, it's all right. They just don't understand It's a what... big idea anyway. You work for that jerk boss of hers? Now, just take it easy, Buster. Nobody's going to push Dove around I while I... thought I'm... the other guy had a date with her, not you. You're just a taxi jockey. I got just as much right to interfere as you got. Ain't that so, Dove? She looks on me like a big brother, see? Oh, no, not you two. Oh, yes. Max here's been very kind to me. And whatever it is, she got nothing to do with it, see? That's all I'm telling you. This baby is nice. 
Which is just plain dumb, do you get me? Buster, nobody could be as dumb as she's been pretending oh, to yes. be. Oh, yes, that's true, I'm afraid. I mean, I could. <laughs> I can't help it. It's just the way I was born, I guess. But at school, they always told me, never mind, it didn't make any difference. I had other attractions. I mean, uh... <laughs> that's what I mean. There. You need further proof? Or do I have to knock your block off? Hey, Buster, you want to take a trip out to the alley? George? Oh, no. Come on, you ask for it. Now, look, look, listen. I got a wife and three okay, kids. Okay, this looks like a good place. Now, look, look, it's, it's only I can't stand people should think things about dumbness, that's all. Gets me sore. Dove is like my myrtle. She wouldn't even know how to blackmail a butcher. Hey, want a cigarette? What? <laughs> Relax, will you? All I want is a little private information. Oh. <laughs> well, now, look, don't think I was afraid of you. Oh, no. It's only since I get married that I figure fighting is stupid when you don't have to. Uh, I mean, on the outside. Yeah, sure. Say, uh, how many big brothers does Dove have? Oh, I don't know. Every guy that meets her, I guess. Sort of brings out the protective instinct, that type, don't you think? What about that guy with the flowers, that guy Andrews? Well, all I know is she went out with him the other night. Because I rode him out to a supper place. Well, don't get me wrong. Dove strictly wouldn't even hold hands with a guy like that. He's about as hard. What about her boss, Mendel? Search me. I'm no detective. Well, I guess you could find out about him easy enough. Yeah, yeah. That's just what I'm going to do. Now, if you want, I can check with Dove's landlord. I've seen him one night. Looks like kind of a nice guy, but she says he's an awful snoop. Uh-huh. Well, now you get the idea. Who are her friends? Who does she go out with? You're a driver. It ought to be easy. Let me know, will you? Sure. Just so long as you don't think she's mixed up in anything. Buster, so far there's only one person mixed up. George Valentine. <laughs> Oh, yes, he came back here to the office. Here, let me have it, Angel. Hello? That's me, Mr. Valentine. I thought you'd be with that man alone. Oh, Max. Uh, no, no, I left him an hour ago. He's even harder to dig information out of than you are. Now, but did you get anything on him? I mean, did you check his record? Hey, hold on a minute. Why do you want to know? Well, I'm at Dove's apartment, see? Only she's not here. And you remember that Snoopy landlord I told you about? Yeah, sure. Only look, Max, I doubt if this case is worth all the... Well, th he's here. The landlord, I mean. What? I guess he could give you information, all right, only he's dead. Hey, you hear me? Dead, I said, from bullets. I mean, it's a case, all right. Yeah, get here fast, will you? I got a wife and three kids. I'm bowing out. From now on, what Dove needs is a big brother like you. Well, there's one thing I know for sure. This dove gal is certainly no dove of peace. Of course, I can't feel too sorry for that landlord since I never got to meet him. But I will feel real sorry if you don't lend an attentive ear to this. to George Valentine. Big brother. That's all that a girl named Dove wants any man to be, but somehow every man seems to want the role. And you're not surprised. Dove is something, all right. But what? Well, if your name is George Valentine, you think it's about time to find out when one of the big brothers, her landlord that you haven't even met, turns out to be dead, murdered in Dove's apartment. Yeah, yeah, it was a gun, all right. Four bullets. One would have done the trick. His pockets are practically empty, huh, Lieutenant? Sure, sure. What do you expect? Free cigars? Okay, okay. Somebody after something he had, huh? Only what was the landlord doing in Dove's apartment? That's what I want to know. Max out there said he didn't touch him. He was lying in front of the desk here. Yes, and one of the drawers has been opened. Sure, sure, the paper's all messed up. Aren't there any fingerprints? Fingerprints? My friend, there's not a single one in this entire apartment anywhere. Oh, uh -huh. So whoever did it spent his time cleaning up, huh? After rifling the desk. No, I don't think so. What? Oh, you don't? 
Mice did it. The landlord did it? Yeah. Huh? Well, look around. Isn't that what happened? The landlord was rifling the desk here when somebody came in and killed him. Looks like he even put up a little fight first. But since his pockets are empty, whatever the killer wanted was on the landlord, not in any desk. Big deduction. Solves everything. The picture wasn't worth the price of a loge, but this is where I came in. What'd you say? Double feature, Johnson. Uh-huh. Sure, I guess I was right. Look here. Hole in his pocket. Yeah, it was down in the lining. The picture. <laughs> Don't look so blank, Lieutenant. Remember that note I told you about with the alleged thousand bucks? It's a picture of Dove, George. Let me see. It's not very clear. It's taken so close up. Enlargement of part of a picture, that's all. Uh, only look at that. Some guy's got his arms around her. Evening clothes. Which one is it? Which guy? So no one. Search me. I never saw him before. Well, he looks awfully respectable. There's nothing really wrong, but a picture like that would be worth something. Dove's so attractive that if any... As a married man, I can tell you that a picture of any man within 500 miles of that babe would be worth something. Oh, but she's so innocent, so dumb. Take it easy, Johnson. The background's blurred. The color values in the picture are all haywire. So what? Sergeant, send that babe in here. Yes, sir. Only, she, she's kind of upset. Not half as much as she's going to be when I get through with her. Listen, Johnson, let me do it my way, I will you? I think you ought to go kind of easy with her, sir. You know, she's pretty young. Oh, you suckers, all of you. Dave, get in here. Yes, sir. I don't want to be in any trouble. Just whatever you say. Now, listen, sister. A man was shot while rifling your apartment. Oh. Who's the most likely person to object to a trespasser? You. Oh. So you better start. Ah, uh, yeah. Here, Dove, look at this. Who is it? What? Guy in the picture. What's his name? Oh, for heaven's sake. Never mind the surprise act. Stopes. J.J. Stopes. I always called him Mr. But can you imagine us putting his arm around me like that when I never even let him hold hands? You see, I always looked upon him as sort of a big... Well, as if he was my big... What's the matter? Say, brother, I dare you. Just say it once. Oh, Lieutenant, you're angry about something. I don't understand any of this. Honest, I don't. You can't... Stop acting dumb. J.J. Stopes. Okay, Lieutenant, why don't you find him? Come on, Dove. Oh, yes. Valentine. Hey, Max, where are you? Where's your taxi? Dove and I are going for a ride. Valentine. Let your sergeant follow me, Lieutenant, but you find Stopes. Try looking in a book, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, there were 17 Andrews. As you, as you said, you took him home the other night. It's around here someplace. Don't worry, I'll find it. But I didn't go out with Mr. Andrews tonight. I changed my mind. I mean, Mr. Mendel got all upset, and that made me upset. So I went to a late movie. I mean, after you left... Uh, and... Look, will you not talk except when I ask you to? I, uh, I get mixed up every time I look at you. <laughs> it's very sweet of you to say so. Uh, yeah, well, that wasn't exactly... Hey, take it easy, Max. Just remember, that's all Andrew's place. I'm on the wrong street. So am I. What? Hey, Dove, tell me about that landlord. He was a snoop, is that right? Curious about you, watching to see who you went out with and so on, is that right? Uh, shall I answer you? Oh, now, look, Dove. Well, I mean, you mix me up, too, you know. Uh... Well, I mean, yes, yeah, sure he was. That's all I know about him. I mean, I don't go out with so many fellas, only there's no reason I shouldn't, is there, if they're nice and they ask me. And they usually do, you know. Max up there, he says I'm one of the forces of nature. Of course he exaggerates. Only I can't help it, can I? Well, here we are, Chief. Well, what are you waiting for? Turn her over to the sergeant back there, will you, Max? Oh, Mr. Ballard. So long, baby. I got another date for tonight. I do not know anything about a thousand dollars. Well, for the look of your house here, you can afford to, Mr. Andrews. Please, please, don't talk so loudly. You'll wake up Mother. Huh? Well, this is Mother's house. In fact, it's, uh, it's her money, too. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought before that I'd seen you someplace, uh, society stuff, huh? Now, Mr. Valentine, please, would you get out of here? I don't know anything that would help you. Where did you meet, Dove? Oh, uh, well, I... Saw her and wanted to meet her. Who wouldn't? A blind man. But don't you get it? It costs money for a guy like you to be seen with her. Oh, no. Like uh, maybe a thousand dollars. 
And you write a big joke note to go with it, and you deliver both last night to a dressing room, but you see Mendel nosing around, so you have to tap him over the head. No. I'd never paid anyone a thousand dollars. And besides, the murder wouldn't make sense that I would do it. Anything could make sense, Buster, where that dame is concerned. Now, look, the landlord was nosing around. He got his hands on some of the pictures. You could have killed him. I was here at home, and you can ask Mother. Okay, I will ask you. Oh, no, 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 stop. Wait. Well. I I didn't pay a thousand dollars. Because I paid two thousand. Well, now, I thought you'd have some answers. What for? A picture? Yes. Oh, but it was a fraud, I assure you. Arms around her? Yes, but I've, I've never even thought of Dove that way. She's just so beautiful, and she... Well, she needs protection. It was some sort of process shot. Yeah, I already thought of that, sure. Two pictures put together, maybe. Only why so tender about a blackmailer? Oh, no, 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 I can't believe it. That's why I was at the club tonight. I wanted to ask her about it. Why didn't you ask when you gave her the dough? Well, I sent it to the post office. You did what? There's a box number. It wasn't to her. You see, I received the instructions by telephone, and it definitely was a man who called. Man, huh? By telephone. Where's your phone? Oh, there. But it's an extension, and my mother might... Be quiet, will you? You'll wake her up. Hello, give me Lieutenant Johnson. This is George Valentine. Mr. Andrews, I think you just wake me up. This is a very simple crime. The clue has been lying right in front of me. Valentine, where you been? Your sergeant told you where I'd be. Now listen, Johnson. I will not. You listen to me. I'm just on my way out. Traffic called in. That taxi driver, Max, had a wreck. What? That's right. All over a retaining wall at the bottom of Commercial Street Hill. You want to know who caused it? The guy who hired you. Lou Mendel. I let go of me. I didn't do nothing, see? Motorcycle cop picked you up in your car, didn't he? Yeah, well, sure, but Johnson, I... Johnson, Max says that Mendel here sideswiped him. Well, he's not saying much of anything the way he's banged up over there. But, yeah, Mendel followed him, then passed him on the right, so he'd have to swing out into a truck. Well, Mendel... No, I Max didn't. Max gunned the I... cab instead and couldn't make the turn at the bottom of the hill, that's all. It's not true. Not a word of it. And there's no way you can prove that I was even on this street. Okay, I won't bother. I'll let Max do it. What? Now, listen, wait a minute. I'm, I'm hiring you because a girl's in trouble, see? Now, you got me in it. Now you say she's a blackmailer. Now you hey, say... Hey, Johnson, did you find the guy in the picture, Stopes? Yeah, yeah. He was the one who wrote the note and sent the thousand, all right. But he hasn't got anything to do with the murder. Neither has Andrews. Suckers who've already paid up don't kill people. Only who asked Stopes to pay? Well, that's a haywire part. Stopes sent the money to Dove because he just assumed she was the one behind it. A man's voice on the phone said, send it to a post office box. What is all this? Hey, see, Mendel? We're getting the girl out of trouble, all right? Uh, yes, but He's I... He's smart. Most people you get out of trouble, the fewer there are to be in it. It's who's behind the girl. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hello, Max. How do you feel? Oh, lousy. No bones broken, but we'll take him down to the hospital as soon as you get through. A little through. messed up, though, huh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Mendel here did it? I don't know. Looked like his car, but I don't know how I could prove it. Yeah, I understand. Messed up your cab pretty bad, too, didn't it? Yeah, burned. I just got out in time. Uh-huh. This time of night, nobody around to help you. Or see, either. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, will you listen to me? I tell you, I'm driving my oh, car. Stop shaking, I... Mendel. Look at Max here. He scratched himself all up and wrecked his cab, too, and he's not nervous. Just scared to death, that's all. What? Valentine, what are you talking about? Johnson, you know a man's pretty desperate when he's committed murder. What did you do with the meter in your taxi, Max? Me? What in the that's name? That's why you wrecked the cab, isn't it? Because you knew I'd catch on in about one minute flat. Got rid of the meter and then wrecked the cab and burned it fast before I could tear it apart. You're crazy. It's not enough dough in five weeks in that There's meter. There's a camera be... in it, though, isn't there? Camera? Hey, Valentine. Yeah, that's right. Come to the party. Pictures were fuzzy, taken too close, color values haywire, infrared, I suppose. You can't prove nothing about nothing. I'm hurt, see? I'm going to the hospital. Oh, I can prove everything. For instance, trying to point a desperate finger at Mendel here. What did you do? Wait till you spotted him driving home, or was that just luck? That's a detective for you. His best friend he'd frame in or something. His old grandmother, probably. Valentine, with my own bare hands, I ought to throttle you. Oh, Buster, you just said it yourself. With your own bare hands. 
Huh? Yeah, that's how you trapped yourself. You know what I'm talking about. No fingerprints. Not a single fingerprint in that entire apartment where the landlord was killed. Not anywhere. Uh, so it's my fault, I suppose. You I... were too careful, Max. Because you reported the crime to me from that same apartment. Well, Buster, why didn't they find your fingerprints on that telephone? I got him. I got him. Get your hands Valentine, wait. Let go. Hold him, Sergeant. Hold him. Where are you going? It's all over. Oh, no, it's not, Johnson. You're going to look for that taxi meter, aren't you? Why, sure. Okay, but if... then. Before you find it, I got about two seconds to find Brooksy. My explanation hasn't even started yet. I wonder what George has up his sleeve. Seems to me this case is open and shut. But I guess we'll just have to be patient for a minute, which won't be hard because of this. George, I understand all that. And I can read his confession in the morning. Well, I just wanted you to get it from me first. Hey, driver, get off the main street, will you, and go a little faster? Sure. No place faster. That makes sense, I should argue. George, the thing I'm interested in is Dove. Well, me too. What man wouldn't be? But she was responsible for all this. Max couldn't have done it without her cooperation, no. so... No, no, Angel. I think she told the truth. I think she's just dumb. You too, huh? Mm. Not that she isn't dumb, but... See, I wanted to demonstrate something to you. That's why we're in this cab. You see, I was in Max's cab with Dove earlier, like the other guys had been. And I, I saw how it could have worked. How what could have worked? Well, if they ever develop pictures from that meter, one of them will be me. With my arms around her. George! So, that's why I think she's so innocent. And she couldn't understand the pictures herself, so therefore... You mean she's a menace to... Hey, driver, take that corner a little faster, huh? George, what on earth are you... you... <laughs> See what I mean? Just accidental, that's all. The arms, that is. Well, that's your story. Yeah. Take another corner, will you, friend? Sure, let's get dizzy. Hang on. Hey. Hey, you too. I ain't going around no corners no more. Oh, well. Maybe he's a brother or something. You have just heard Big Brother, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. The story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Changes my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. See, it's time for another Let George Do It adventure. Now, this story has to do with a worry wart by the name of Shorty McGowan, who runs a pub over on the east side. Shorty's the type of fella who, if he hasn't got a problem, he goes out and finds one. Right now, he's just returned from a most successful hunting trip. And boy, has he got a beaut. Say, Mr. Valentine, what's become of Terry Cable? Terrence J. Cable, sweetest man ever blew foam across the woodwork in my place. Now, I suppose you could say it's none of my business why a good customer and friend like that should just up and disappear. 
But then again, what kind of a human being would that make you? Yeah, suppose he's in trouble. Sup suppose he needs help. Well, Mr. Valentine, I found something yesterday in a hawk shop that scares the daylights out of me. Oh, Terry Cable's in trouble, all right. Believe you me. So get down here, will you? Give me a hand. Everybody knows where Shorty McGowan's place is. Here on East Commercial. And Shorty McGowan? Well, that's me. The guy with the towel in his hand. Watch? Just a watch? Yeah. Terry's watch. Here it is. And that's what you found in the hawk shop, huh? uh, You know those ones down by the railroad station? Well, I was coming back from Mayville yesterday. I took a couple days rest and walked along the street. That this thing in a window just up and hit me in the eye. Terry's watch, I said. That's Terry's. Let's see. Terrence J. Cable, first place, 100-yard dash, Tri-State Conference, 1927. Sure, yeah, that's how I knew. <laughs> he liked to show it off. Something he won in high school. You know him since high school? No, 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 just the last year or so. But he come in all the time, know what I mean? Uh, he had a philosophical turn like I do. I tell you, he's the sweetest Okay, nice... okay, but uh, just out of curiosity, how'd you get the watch out of the hawk shop without a ticket? Well, it hadn't been claimed. That's what I mean. I just bought it. Uh-huh. So it must have been hawked at least 30, or is it 60 days ago? Wait a minute. Why does just finding his watch in a hawk shop mean that he's in danger? I don't know. In the what... first place, young lady, he wouldn't hawk that watch. He wasn't the type. In the second place, he's not the type to just walk out of here six months ago and never come back without saying goodbye, you know what I mean? And in the third place, or fourth, whichever it is, Terry Cable was expecting a check, a big, big check. Mola, 50,000, he said. Okay, so what? Check from where? Well, how should I know? Rich Uncle Dudley, maybe? Uncle Sam? <laughs> Search me. But, but a man wouldn't disappear without waiting to get it, would he? And only if he got it, then why hawk the watch? See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Maybe see why you're so interested in finding him, too. Oh, no, you though, not me. No, no, I'm more one of them uh, ultras, you understand? Yeah, to me, he's just a fellow human being. <laughs> I'm no more interested in his money than I was in his gun. His gun? Oh, this gets better all the time. Oh, sure, sure. He had a gun, all right. Yeah, I saw it once when he dropped something out of his pocket. <laughs> don't ask me why. A fella's got a gun? You don't ask questions. That's what I always figure. Very considerate. Shorty, tell me some more about this cable, where he lived, his family. Now, listen, listen. It might be something, but it might not. Don't you understand? I tried to ask some questions like that once in a while, but he'd just laugh and go on talking about the baseball games or religious aspects, things of that type. You see, I, I don't even know where he lived or who his other friends were. All I know is, for a while, he had a job over at Fat Williams' warehouse, a load checker. Fat Williams? And also, I know this is the kind of neighborhood when things happen, you don't meddle. Me, I'm staying out of it. Only, what's become of him? It's driving me nuts. What's become of Terry Cable? <laughs> You know, I think I know what's wrong with Shorty. His needle is stuck. But George will figure that out sooner or later. And while he does, let's take a minute for this. Now let's get back to the old question. What's become of Terry Cable? Cable? Never heard of. They call you Fat Williams, don't they? they call me a lot of things. So what? In the warehouse business, Sunday, not lost and found. But we were told that you Who would... told you? Who sent you around here to bother me when I'm trying to take a day off for a game of golf? Never mind who sent us. I'm just looking for Terry Cable, that's all. He worked here as a load checker once. I uh, saw a couple of hundred other bums. See out that window there? Don't see any streets for three blocks, do you? All warehouse, all mine. Got a keg of nails, I'll store it. Sure, sure. Got a hot car, you'll store that. What's that? Oh, I've heard your name before, that's all. Just take it easy. <laughs> Sonny, I thought you wanted help, not a button through your collarbone. Skip it, I said. Your place burned down here about a year ago, didn't it? I didn't realize you were still around, that's all. You mean you wanted me to know you were a real hep character? So any information I got, I better give you. Oh, these eager beavers. I can pester your employees to find out about cable. But it'd be so much easier to get information by just saying please. Now there, see? Terrence J. Cable. No home address, worked here three months, paid $52 a week. Where did he go when he left here? Fired for spending too much time in the gambling joints. 
Like Lou Sprinkle's place. And that's all, huh? That's all you got to say. Well, for the love of dog food, yes. What do you think I am, Sonny, a day nursery? What do I care what happened to some jerk I never even... What's that? His watch. Why'd you say so in the first place? <laughs> you want to find this guy and tell him what time it is? Oh, get out of here, will you? I got a game of golf. Sprinkle. Lou Sprinkle. Well, this is about where I thought his gambling joint was, but... Huh. Yeah. It's all new construction. Anyway, George, how would a man who earned $52 a week be able to afford such gambling? Oh, I don't know, Angel. This Terry Cable doesn't sound like a very straight character so far, does he? No. Carried a gun, expected some big money, fired from one job that we know of. You know, I'm not even sure why we're looking for him. Well, we're not going to find it behind a board fence, Angel. You're just as curious as I am why Shorty thinks it's important to find this. Oh. Hello. Admiring the building? It's going to be nice, isn't it? Good land. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you work on it? No, no, just watching. Watch every day. Going to be 115 offices in that building, mister, and all mine. Every one of the mine. Yes, sir, I own it. Oh, well, congratulations. Wait a minute. Uh, you must know this neighborhood, huh? Sure do. Been located here 15 years. B.B. Manx is my name, in case you're looking for a place to get situated. Good transportation here, you know. Central heating, each office. Oh, uh, no, no. I'm just looking for a joint. A joint? Well, uh, Lou Sprinkle had a gambling place around oh, here. Oh, him, sure. He's got a new place across town. Real fans, they tell me. He used to be here all right, but he moved out after the fire. Well, what's the address of the... What fire? Well, the same one burned the old Manx building down. My place was in the newspapers ten months ago. Oh, Mr. Manx, you're giving me an idea. Did you ever happen to know a man by the name of Terence J. Cable? Cable? Yeah. I'm searching. Hey, wait a minute. They call him Terry? Yeah, that's the one. He was a foreman, I think. Boss the cleanup gang after my fire here. Why? Never mind. You don't know what's become of him, do you? No, no. Search me. You're looking for him, huh? No. No, not anymore. Joe. I think I know all I need to know about him. Come on, Angel, let's play a fast hunch. Don't you get it? Terry Cable wasn't a crook at all. Just the opposite. Uh, yes, Mr. Valentine, Terrence Cable has been with us for years. Fire insurance underwriters, George, you're right. Yeah, every place I looked, I seemed to run into a fire... Any guy who once in a while carried a gun and who so gratuitously could wrangle jobs in places that had burned... He had money to spend in a third place that burned. Had to either have an angle or an expense account, Mr. Everett. What is Terry, a fire investigator? Uh, yeah, yes, that's right. So if that answers your question... Well, it solves the riddle. Yes, Mr. Everett. But what did he find? We can't help being curious. That fat Williams warehouse had a lot of valuable furs stored in it when it burned. And... The furs were never definitely linked with the fire. We looked them up in the newspapers. This B.B. Manx collected quite a bit on his fire, too. And as for Lou Sprinkle, knowing the kind of guy he's supposed to we be... We investigated the fires, naturally. That was Terry Cable's job. But now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Valentine... But he didn't find anything wrong, is that it? He was just pulled off the case, and that's why he disappeared from that part of town. Uh, yes. Yes, that's the idea. So there's really no mystery now, is there? You can go home and forget about it. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Yes? Why don't you tell us the rest of it? Where's Terry Gable now? What's become of him? Are you asking for a client or for yourself? Well, what difference would that make? Mr. Valentine, it wouldn't make any difference one way or another. You see, Terry doesn't work for us anymore. I really haven't the slightest idea where you could find him. Oh, you mean you won't tell me? Or you don't want me to look? I mean those cases are closed. Besides, Cable doesn't have anything to do with investigations anymore, so what business is it of yours? But he disappeared so quickly, we thought... Well, I don't know what became of him. Left town, I think. Now, really, Mr. Valentine... You're lying, friend. But okay, if that's the way you want it. But I'll be back. What? You don't want me nosing around because you know what's become of Terry Cable. Or maybe your closed case will be reopened as soon as I find out why my client was so anxious to reopen it. George, I still don't understand Brooksy, why... Brooksy, it's simple. Look, don't you see why the insurance companies that want to protect their own good name? But what did Terry Cable have to do with Angel, their... Angel, now look, think back. It's all there. The kind of a guy Cable was, what he did, and why he disappeared. Hey, Shorty! 
No customers. Oh, out and back, I guess. Hey, Shorty. George. Yeah, Brooksy. I guess the explanation of Terry Cable will have to wait a while. The guy who hired us seems to be dead. Someone must have gotten tired of hearing him spout that same old question and shoved a bar rag down his throat. Well, uh, maybe it wasn't quite like that, but we'll find out all the gruesome details in just a minute. To George Valentine. The man who hired you is dead. Shorty McGowan. He's been shot. Well, if your name is George Valentine, then the mystery of what's become of Terry Cable is now more important than ever. No, Brooksy, Lieutenant Johnson said there weren't any witnesses to our friend Shorty's death. And it happened just a few minutes before we got here? Yeah, that's what the doc says. Somebody stepped in from the street and shot him, and that's it. But, George, why? He was such a friendly little man. Yeah, but it seems he's been mixed up in a few things, too. Oh, what kind of thing? Oh, petty theft, hold up once. But what's important? Never arson. Arson? Yeah, come on, Angel. Where are we going? To get a new client. The insurance underwriters. All right, you're hired. I thought I would be. Only you understand, I'd just assume the police... Sure, didn't... sure, sure. Protect your office's reputation. I understand, Mr. Robert. I'm rather new here. I'm only pinch hitting for the regular man who runs this office, and but I... what do you have to hide? Brooksy, Terry Cable worked for this office. He was a bonded, trusted employee. He was in charge of investigating all those fires. Yeah, worked hard, I guess. Got jobs with the guys whose buildings had burned. We and... thought he had to do it that way. There wasn't any superficial evidence of fire setting. The companies had to pay off, but we thought in time... You hoped he'd... he'd discover something about them anyway. Yes. He was convinced there was something phony about the fires. Each case resulted in actual profit as far as the owners were concerned. Okay, then let's lay the cards on the table, shall we, Mr. Everett? Terry Cable found some new evidence and then disappeared with it, right? Yes. He was bought off. I'm afraid so. There was plenty of proof that he left town, all right, and to show that he had destroyed his own investigation records. Some of the best men in the country have worked on it without finding But he left of his own free will. There wasn't any force. That's or... right, Miss Brooks. Here, this is the only concrete thing we turned up. B.B. Manx. Huh? The day before Cable disappeared, this man Manx drew $12,500 out of the bank. In cash. Nothing we can do about it because we can't prove how he spent it. But neither can he. Cash to pay off Terry Cable. But now that there's been a murder, maybe you can legally force Mr. Manx I to... I called him before you came back just now. Mr. Manx seems to have disappeared, too. Oh, yeah, sure. He looked like the type. Play it safe. You might try looking for no, him. No, no, but... skip it. I've got a different way to figure out what happened a long time ago. And maybe why Shorty was murdered today. Yeah. I'm going to throw a few dice at a gambler named Lou Sprinkle. And what is this proposition, Mr. Valentine? Very simple, Mr. Sprinkle. I want some money. Does that make you a man from Mars? Who doesn't? No, I come from closer home. From Terry Cable. Is that so? Yeah, I think you've done business with Terry in the past. Yes, yes, I remember. But I don't think the nature of the business would concern It was you, gambling, but... of course. If you say so. <laughs> Maybe it was gambling on your part to think Terry wouldn't want to do some more business. Merely because I don't choose to make a definite statement doesn't mean that you can. All right, all right, here goes. I come from Terry right now. Terry sent me. He wants some more money. I don't think I heard you correctly, Mr. Valentine. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm a very busy... And because man. you might not believe me, he gave me his watch to show you. Here, take a look. How much does Terry want? Oh, $10,000 that keep him quiet, I think. That's ridiculous. He said he still has testimony regarding a few fires. Just in case you tried to rub any sticks together. I'd have to see this man myself or through my own representative. Do you mind? No, no. But you are willing I to... I couldn't discuss it with you at all. I'm sorry. Here. What's this? Present for your trouble. A thousand dollar bill? Show it to Terry. 
He'll understand my good faith. So will I. Cautious, but faithful. So long, Mr. Sprinkle. George, what did you find? Made money in a hurry, Angel. I know. The hawk what... shops are the next stop. Down by the railroad station, remember? Brooksy, what I may have found is the answer to this case. So you were going to find the answer, huh? <laughs> you can't even find the hawk shop. Yeah. Looks like Shorty McGowan wasn't telling the truth even on that one, was he? Well, there's not a single pawn shop where they remember ever having that watch of Terry's. Uh-huh. So from here on, the answer's one, two, three. What could have happened, Angel? So I'm going to try a trip to Maryville. To where? It's not far, and that wasn't a lie. Shorty just let that one slip. The place he'd been for a couple of days, remember? You know what I'm going to look for in Maryville? Terry Cable himself. Hey there, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, right here. My name's Duncan. Chief of Police asked me to meet you. Thought you might be driving. No, no, no. The train's a couple of hours faster. Only maybe you figure in this kind of a case, speed isn't important. Well, I wouldn't say that. Of course, we do things a little differently out here. Let me have your bag there. Okay, thanks. Did you get the description? Oh, yes, yes. You got that all right. Miss Brooks phoned it up. They sent the wire photo fingerprints and all that fancy sort of stuff. But, you see, we really haven't gotten around to your case yet. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, as soon as you We're do... We're a little understaffed here, and we've been pretty busy with something else. Here's the car, of you. Okay. You figure this Terry Cable may be living around here. Huh? Well, it's not such a long shot. A man named Shorty McGowan apparently came up here and then returned with Terry's watch. Of course, that doesn't mean Terry would still be using his same name. Yes, I mean... yes, yes, I understand all that. Do you? Not quite sure I do. <laughs> well, let me tell you some of our problems, and it'll take your mind off it. You see, there's a county graveyard out here that doesn't have a care to Yeah, well, look, or... Duncan, I'm only interested in... And a couple of days ago, there's been some digging where there shouldn't have been. What? Don't mind if we go out and take a little look, do you? That's why I couldn't get right on your case, you see. The county inspector claims there's one too many bodies out there. Since when? <laughs> see, I thought you might be interested. It's nothing recent. In fact, it's uh, since maybe six months ago. About the time Cable disappeared. Now, I guess you don't mind a little side trip, do you? Got a man over there working on it now. The guy with the shovel, huh? Yes. You see, what happened was somebody noticed the earth had been turned up since the last rain. Only when we take a look, it wasn't a new body thrown in. It was just an old one. It had been put there three months ago. How do you know it was originally put there about the same time Cable disappeared? Well, that's the easiest time to do it, isn't it? <laughs> Not a bad way to get rid of a body. Just add him in when the grave is fresh. I mean, the time to do it was exactly six months. All right, all right. Only let's get rid of that guy with the shovel quick, huh? Why, it's getting dark. I want to get back to supper. No, no, listen to me. The extra body, if it's Terry Cable, was put in there months ago, right? And what happened two or three days ago was just that the ground got disturbed. But that's right. Only... Like disturbed by somebody looking for a watch. Look, I got a complete file on Cable. Now, the thing for us to do, if we want to identify him once and for all, is to get him out no, of no, here. No, no, get that workman of yours out of here. I don't catch you. Look, I told you, the train's a lot faster than a car, so it's getting dark. That's all the better. The thing for us to do, friend, is miss our supper. Why? Because maybe I got here first. Okay, so here I'll be, digging. Be careful you don't strain yourself on the train. Quiet, will you? You're just supposed to be watching. You know, I watched a digging scene once in Hamlet. That's by Shakespeare. You don't say. The grave digger, he worked just about as slow as you do. Come across a skull, as I remember, just when... Hey, shh, wait a minute. Automobile. Yeah, but no headlights. You know. You sure make a pretty target out there in the moonlight. You sure make lousy jokes sitting there in that... Oh, hold it. Automobile stop. Yeah. Somebody's getting out. Okay, stay out of sight and wish me luck, friend. All right. Back to work. Hey! Hey, you! 
Yeah? Come in. Who is it? Valentine, come in. Oh. Oh, you know me, huh? Been watching me all day, I guess, the way you watch Shorty. How'd you get out of here? Oh, don't worry, I'm alone. I saw the body, though. Yeah, it's Terry Cable, all right. Pretty neat place to get rid of him six months ago. So Nietzsche didn't even have to bother to take his watch. But Shorty did. He finally figured it out, didn't he, huh? Came up here, found Terry's body in the watch. And then hired me to put a little fear into you so he could shake you down the way you shook him. Go on, talk all you like. Only be careful coming through that fence. Yeah, sure, I'll be careful. You don't want another body out here to explain. Because that's what happened, isn't it, mister? You guys had fraudulent fires and then bought the investigator off, huh? 12500 each. Only Cable was expecting 50000 as I remember. So that'd probably mean four of you instead of three, wouldn't it? Fat Williams, B.B. Manx, Lou Sprinkle, and who? Shorty McGowan himself? Was he the fourth? He have a fire, too? <laughs> Put down the shovel and get into the car. No, no, wait a minute. I know who you are, all right, only... Do you? Sure, sure. How's your game of golf? I guess the minute I left your office, you knew who'd sent me, and you headed right over to kill Shorty. To shut him up before he could go any farther. You've gone far enough, too. Fat Williams, the big shot. But a big secret, right? Something that Lou Sprinkle, for instance, didn't seem to know. That Terry Cable was really dead. That you killed him. Yeah. You're smart, too, aren't you? Well, it's fairly simple. You didn't pay Terry off. You just killed him. In six months' time, Shorty finally caught on to it. Yeah, Shorty was smart. He stole some furs. Did he tell you that? Furs? Oh, yeah, sure, from your warehouse. So that's what tied him in, huh? He worked with us. He was the fourth one. Look where it got him. Buster, don't try to tie the others in with you like that. Manx and Sprinkle may have been worried about their fires, but they paid off in cash. I suppose Shorty paid off, too. Only Terry was expecting a check. One check. He was smart. He'd want it that way. Yeah. So one of you must have collected the payoff dough from the others, one like you. Only instead of a payoff, you kept the dough yourself and killed the investigator. Yeah, that's all that happened. That's all that Shorty found out. Shut up and get in the car. By tomorrow, Sonny, nobody will even know we've been here. Hey, put the gun and the You... That's all. <laughs> Pretty fancy shooting for night time, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, sure. You'll get a medal. You missed him a mile. Hey, what? But thanks for spoiling his aim. I hit him with a shovel. Now there's irony for you. The great George Valentine saved by a spade. Get it? Spade? Sam Spade? Okay, sue me. But first give a listen to this. Don't you understand, Angel? Apparently, Terry Cable wasn't even crooked. Six months ago, Fat Williams just persuaded the others that Cable was. Then he pocketed their dough and killed Cable. The insurance people and his family and everybody will be awfully glad that you cleared his name. Only, George, I still don't understand how you knew it had to be Fat Williams. Well, you remember, Angel, he's the only one I showed that watch to before Shorty's death. So he's the only one who could have known that Cable's body had actually been found. In other words, that Shorty's nosing around had finally made it necessary for him to be killed. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Well, no, I mean it. Your powers of observation, your logic. Well. You know, George, while you were up in Maryville, I did some shopping. I found a real bargain on kitchenware, so being a girl who plans ahead, I bought some. Kitchenware, Angel? Mm hmm. For your one room apartment? What in heaven's name for? Well, like I said, planning ahead. You'll find out. <laughs> You have just heard What Became of Terry Cable, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and the music was by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it.
Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. If you remember your history of early America, the name Ponce de Leon should strike an old chord. He was the rascal who went looking for the fountain of youth somewhere in Florida. But all he could find was orange juice, which may have helped, but not enough. All of which adds up to really nothing, except that the heavy in our Let George Do It adventure is a character named Ponce the Lion. And from my vantage point, he seems to be quite a character. But suppose I let Buster here tell you all about old Ponce. Dear Mr. Valentine, I believe that Honolulu has been called the melting pot of the Pacific. Well, our little town of Baja Junction could very likely be the boiling pot. But the weather can not prevent our maintaining a pleasant, peaceful, forward-looking town. That is, for the past two years. Tomorrow, it will all change. Tomorrow, our town will boil in quite a different way. Unless someone like yourself can stop it. I was given your name by Fail Minahan, who lives here. But please report direct to me just as soon as you can. You see, Baja Junction is about to receive back its most disturbing citizen, a man named Ponce the Lion. Sincerely, J.H. Frankel, director of the Baja Junction Trade Relations Club. From jail? Jail. Exactly, Miss Brooks. Jail. You know, that's where criminals are occasionally sent. Do you mind if we sit down, Mr. Frank? Oh, excuse me, of course. You've had a tiring trip. Oh, it wasn't. Too bad, but the heat yes, was... Yes, yes. Pretty... Well, uh, I'm just on my way out. You see, I've asked Lawrence Pinckney to step in. Pinckney? A secretary of our organization. Been with us for years. He's more familiar with the facts than I am. What facts? Oh. Facts about Ponce the Lion, of course. You uh, wanted to see me, Mr. Frank? Oh, yes, yes, Lawrence. Come in, come in. Uh, Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, Mr. Pinckney. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Pinkney. Pleasure, Pinkney. indeed, pleasure. I've explained things. Now you'll take over. Uh, of course. Oh, yes. wait a minute. So far you've explained nothing. Maybe we can have dinner together. Uh, goodbye, Miss Brooks. If you need me, you know where to find me, Lawrence. Uh, I don't know how he does it. Does what? All that energy, drive, always organizing. Listen. That's more the style of the town, I'm afraid. Street singer. That's why most people live here. Mm. Sounds nice and sleepy, like I am in this heat. But we must earn a living, mustn't we? The Trade Relations Club is, is giving a great boost to the business All right, the Mr. Pinkney, let's get back to my business. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, please understand about Mr. Frankel's running off. Mm. He didn't think it uh, would look well if he seemed too uh, active in this, uh, his position and all. This, uh, this business of Ponce, I mean. Ponce the Lion, somebody just out of jail, right? Yes, Ponce is a strange fellow. Big, stupid, mean, conniving. Never did a lick of honest work in his life. Okay, he's unpopular. Where do you get the fancy name? Ponce? It's his given name. Oh, uh, you mean the lion. <laughs> he was a bouncer for years at Choli's Dance Hall. Been raised in the Oriental section, I guess. But he tacked that on when he tried to turn professional boxer. Town might have got rid of him then. We all hoped we did. What happened? Well, it was too much. He quit. Couldn't stand getting knocked out every night. All right, he's big and he falls down, but I don't see Mr. what... Mr. Valentine, I realize all this may seem uh, unimportant to an outsider, but Ponce has been in jail for manslaughter. And now, from all we hear, his sole interest is in committing murder. This Ponce is just full of the old Ned, isn't he? We'll see if he carried out his threat. But first, let's take a minute off for this. Now let's get back and see if Buster can throw any more light on Ponce. Well, uh, there isn't much more you need to... Uh... Oh, who, what, when, where? Why? 
Come on, come on. Well, uh, his, uh, his manslaughter sentence was uh, based on a knifing three years ago. Now, it seems that uh, Ponce has decided he should murder everyone who testified against him, who helped to put him in jail. You mean witnesses? How many were there? Well, now, see here, Mr. Frankel isn't crazy. Why don't you ask me the important thing? How could we possibly know that big ape's intentions? Know what Ponce is going to do? I didn't ask that because I assume they're just guesses and rumors, easy gossip. Tough guy wants revenge. Ponce the lion. <laughs> Even the name is hardly credible. Oh, many things are hardly credible here in Baja Junction, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> but you're quite right. Guess is in rumor. That's why you're here. You mean to tag Ponce around and find out what he's up to? To go at this thing sensibly. Uh, what Mr. Frankel suggested was that before you get all wound up in details of who might need protection... You uh, should find out the truth. Ah. This Ponce is a menace, I suppose. So an ounce of prevention. <laughs> that seems to be a good idea. <laughs> That's all your job is. <sighs> it's hot, isn't it? Uh, would you like a glass of lemonade? I don't blame you for looking me up, my lad. There's no better man on any park bench than Fail Minahan to tell you this. I looked you up, Mr. Minahan, because I'm curious. You recommended me for this job. Why? If you don't know me for madam. <laughs> and vice versa, you're thinking. Of course, lad, of course. Well, my qualifications are a copious curiosity, a world full of people to waste it on, and, and a lot of words. I was going to say, and a life full of time. All wasted. And this is the best place in the world for waste. And once upon a time, I saw your ad in the Okay, newspaper. okay. Is this the street that Choley's dance hall is on? Avoid the chickens and follow your nose. It's around the next corner. And I wouldn't walk this far for everyone. <laughs> I'm flattered. Mr. Valentine, when they say that Punch is no good, it's true. He's not. You're sure? I watch people I know. And you do well to watch them, too, all of them. Oh, like the guys who hired me, that trade relations outfit? <laughs> now you're warming up. They'll trade anybody's relations, I'm thinking. Oh, it's business, mind your business. But why in a town like this? Why should a lot of happy, ignorant shopkeepers of every nationality let themselves be all organized and progressive when they ought to spend their time on the beach like I do? <laughs> they ought to be fanning themselves. Hold it, hold it. In the hand. <laughs> Here he is, my lad. This is the horror. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, always kidding, ain't you, man? <laughs> well, say something. Ain't you glad to see me back? You're Ponce, aren't you? Beta, Taurus, beta. Oh, sure, sure, anything you say. I understand you're real tough. What's he doing, kidding? <laughs> yeah. You're the joker, too. Huh? I might have known. Any friend of mine? We're not friends. Huh? You're the guy I want to see. Now, look, I'm busy. Understand you just got out of jail, Ponce. Understand you got some kind of a big plan. Everybody talks about Ponce, don't they? I don't know what this town must have been like when I wasn't around. <laughs> well, no change. I'm different. No God, get out of my way. Look out, George. Never mind shoving, Buster. I'm going to stay here until you tell I made a discovery, see? Yeah, what? Yeah, me. Yeah, big dummy. Yeah, me. Right here in the same part of town I was raised in. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's not till I cool off in jail <laughs> that I wake up and get it. All right, I'll bite. Get what? You discover the Pacific Ocean or something? Hans de Leon found the fountain of youth, George. Uh, huh? <laughs> You're a kid, too, ain't you, baby? <laughs> Hans, there's men in this town afraid of you. Huh? And there's gossip that's been saying that you've threatened to... Oh, no, no, don't what? Don't, don't try to mix me up. With what you? Yeah. Sure, I'll tell anybody. Why not? I told everybody in town. The guys who put me in jail, I hate them, see? I like to kill them. But now I'm different. So, what's all the sweat about? Okay, what's the big discovery? Why are you different? I can tell you, my lad. Uh, you're on your way across the street, I suppose, Bunch. Yeah, sure, yeah. What, 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 what? I go there every day, don't I? What's across the street? A uh, Joss Hotel. Huh? 
I was raised with the Orientals, tourist. Now leave me alone, huh? The Joss House? Well, it's a place of worship to the ancient gods. So I got used to being alone and thinking in prison. Is a criminal to do it now? You think? Pray to us. Pray to the old-fashioned heathens that know ten times as much as us. Yeah, sure. That's the discovery of old Ponce, hey? Big, dumb Ponce, smarter than all of you. Oh, brother, what kind of a thing Get out of my place. Hey, George! And stay... Certainly hard to find. At his house, they didn't know he decided to go swimming for the afternoon. This must be the cabana over here. Yeah, Mr. Frankel. Around this side, I guess. Wonder why he didn't tell us in his letter, Angel, that he was a witness to that manslaughter of Ponce's. I don't know. Taxi driver who brought him here knew it. I suppose everyone knows. Yeah. Frankel. Frankel. George, he's, he's been stabbed. Just as Ponce threatened. Oh, just a moment, please. Uh, please, uh, no, come in, please. I'm sorry, Grandpa. Uh, I'm looking for Ponce. Uh, yes, every day Ponce comes to the Joss house, but it is not the custom to disturb I'm anyone. sorry, friend. Something's happened. He's the first man I got to see about it before the rest of the town yes, comes hey. here. Mr. Minahan. I was on my way to look for him, my lad. Did you find Frankel? Did you see him? Yeah. We found Frankel, all right. Well, thank heaven for that. You see, I've caught on to what that big crazy Ponce is up to. Here, this man is the Bonds. He can explain. The what? The Bonds, lady. He's the high mogul keeper of the place. He tends to the idols in there and the shadows. He maintains the incense, joss sticks, or whatever it's called. I would be only too glad to explain. And there's an idol that Ponce plays to. This man here told me so. It's your fay, the Lord of Sudden Death. What? Oh, look, Manahan, I got work to do, and I want to find out... And every day, Ponce comes here to pray to your fay, to the bringer of death. Don't you understand me, lad? Ponce has been here all the time, right here, praying Mr. Frankel to death. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine. Baja Junction. The boiling pot of the Pacific, as Mr. Frankel called it. A place where almost anything can happen, as Mr. Frankel himself found out. Because now he's been murdered. But the murderer used a knife, and the man who hated Mr. Frankel, a man named Ponce, has only been praying for his death in a joss house. Well, if your name is George Valentine, you barely know what a joss house is. This cow, the just. Over there in the shadow, you high money god. Many just sticks are burned to you high. <laughs> That's more for the likes of us, eh, Valentine? Hold on, Mr. Manahan. Hey. This your fair you mentioned. Oh, uh, it can be seen from here. There. The end of that room. Oh, it's a big thing, isn't it? A life size, as it should be, as uh, the bringer of death. Now, isn't that a ghastly idea, Black Face? Look at that, would you? And a clenched black fist stretched out before him, the Lord of Sudden uh, Death. Please, please, oh. uh, not talk loud. Please, there are people in here. Is that him over there in front of the idol? There on the floor? That punch? It is forbidden to intrude when a man is alone with his own thoughts and prayers. I said, is that him under the fancy silk robe lying on that prayer mat? Sure, it's him. I've seen him carrying that robe around. Born and raised in the oriental section, I told you he was. He's moving, George. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid we have disturbed yeah, he him. he saw us. Here he comes. Uh, it wasn't the bond who told me he, he was here. It, it was a I woman. I I told you to leave me alone. Like you left Frankel alone. 
Franco. Yeah, let's get out of here, Ponce. I want to talk to you. I will not. You interrupt me, Steve. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Praying people to death. He's told that to several people. So you wouldn't know whether Frankel's dead yet or not, huh? <laughs> it works. <laughs> Pretty neat, ain't it? You mean you've been working hard to set up an alibi? What's that crap? Oh, I saw you come in here a couple of hours ago. Minahan came here just a few minutes before I did just now and says you've been here all the time. Still, I don't believe it. Oh, hey, move away, will you, Mac? I'm busy. And you no more believe all this idle stuff than I do. Big discovery of Ponce. How to set up an alibi, that's all. Praying a man to dead, old brother. That takes the cake. But there is others that saw him, Valentine. They all say the same thing. <laughs> you're so smart. Sure, you're so smart. Get out of here. Leave me alone. I've got work to do. Okay, Buster, you win. But you better hang on to that alibi when the town starts pointing its finger. Wait a minute, George. Ponce, what work? What do you still have to do here? Pray I'm dead. Pray every one of them dead. You don't believe it, huh? <laughs> Your face shows me how. He's a great old piece of iron. Pray I'm dead. <laughs> Yes, I'm trying to hurry. It was Mr. Frankel who prepared the notes who realized... But them, Ponce said, them. And Mr. Pinckney, you mentioned before there was more than one witness to that knifing that Ponce did two years ago. Well, uh, there was Mr. Blake. He's with our organization here. Who? Oh. Uh, Blake testified he helped put Ponce in jail. But if Ponce has an alibi, then I don't... The police see... are working on the murder. Miss Brooks is reporting to them now, but I keep worrying about my own job here. Well, here, here. Here's the list. Franklin and Blake, they were the main ones, but there's a couple of others. It's a newspaper clipping. Yes, there were several other witnesses. Uh -huh. Where does Mr. Blake live? Well, Franklin had only told you all of this. Uh, my car's right outside. I'll show you. Only, let's see. Blake told me he was going somewhere. Oh, yes, his club, that's it. He's a member of a club here. Maybe if we round up all these guys, then we get to work on the murder. Until now, I've been wasting my time. The one guy in this town who couldn't have murdered Frankel is Ponce the Lion. Blake! Blake! Now you're wasting your time, Pinkney. Mr. Blake's dead, too. But, but he's been stabbed. That's what you said happened to Mr. Oh, Frankel. stop chattering, will you? This just happened a few minutes ago. What? Alone here in his room, reading. But he was facing the door, wasn't he? He's a big guy, pretty husky. Well, uh, there's only one entrance to the door. Yeah, that's what I mean. Come on. What? See, the door has a latch. So whoever it was had to knock. I, I don't understand. I'm, I'm going to call the police. Be quiet, will you? Wait a minute. Listen. Hey, what's down this hall? Well, the halls all lead to the back court. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Snips, there's a man out there. Yeah, the other side of the wall. We'd never catch up. Well, that's not the way to the gate. Wait a minute. Here's a trash can. That thing we heard first sounded metallic. What? What? Sure. Sure, we were in Blake's room just a second after the murderer was. Saw us coming and ran. Here, look. A knife? Uh-huh. No, no, don't touch it. The knife that was used both times, I'd guess. Let's, uh, let's get on to the police station as fast you as You mean we let's can. telephone the police? Give them those other names fast if they haven't got them already? But you and I, friend, are going to start correcting our mistakes, and I'll do the driving. I've never been in a Joss house. <clears throat> I've... I've heard about this one. Yeah. A little more deserted than it was. Old boy with the beards out for supper, I guess. It's so dark. With no lights, I can't... <laughs> hey, Valentine. Yeah. Minahan? Hey, right here. I've been sitting right here by the entrance. Just exactly the way you told me. Oh, it's you. Hello, Phil. Well? And I tell you, my lad, everybody else seems to have left. But not him. He's still in there, Ponce? It's too dark to see from... Come on. I, I'm telling him, lad, that he hasn't even said... Yes, yes. Him. Well, why do you bother him? He couldn't have done this one either. This one? 
A man named Blake was murdered. What? He was big and pretty husky. And to have been stabbed the way he was, whoever did it must have been a lot bigger. Of course, like Ponce. But if he was We're down correcting here... correcting mistakes. Like by not worrying about how you shouldn't disturb a man worshipping an idol. Well, be very careful, Lee. Here, follow me. Straight through here. Oh, these big blasts of tin guns. Don't you dare run into Okay, them. this is it. Yo, Fay. I can see that outstretched fist. I've got a match. Yeah. You can see Ponce, too, all right? There he is, under his robe, stretched out just like a silly frog. Yeah, he won't be for long. Careful, Mr. Valentine. Ponce is very rough with Oh, you. I know. He took a poke at me. So let's kick that fancy silk robe of his. Well, he know. He's not there. No, no, just a robe. And a bunch of rags rolled up underneath. Fail, I thought you said you were watching... And we drove here fast, so fast he couldn't have made it, could he? Yeah, we beat him back. But Fail was... Will you? Our Irish friend here sat by the door, not by the open window. What? Here, look, the other side of the idol. The place he spread himself out was right next to that, at the end of the room. Sure. Don't even have to stretch to get out of here, do you? But people saw him in here. In they... a place where it's forbidden to disturb anybody in meditation. In a place where a man might lie flat on his robe and stay that way for hours. Perfect alibi. A place where nobody'd notice when you slip a few rags under your robe on the floor and then you slide out the window. And getting back in would be just as easy. Shh, shh, shh. I think uh. I just heard something. Somebody's coming. I'm going to get out of here. Hey, come on, quick, away from the window. Come on, back out by the entrance. Hurry. Uh, Valentine. Look back. Look. See the shadow in the window there? Yeah. Get through the curtains here, quick. Well, this is where you were. Let's wait here until... Bring that hand. Fail. You still out there watch, Dogan? I've seen you all along from where I've been meditating. Pretty feeble fraud, isn't it? Back into the robe to finish his act. Sure, I see you, Minahan. I... Yeah, me. Hello. Oh. It's a party. Yeah, sure. To get your fingerprints to match against those on a knife. To haul you in for two murders. Oh. <laughs> Not tonight, Look out, Valentine! No, get out of my way, you will He's running away! Mr. Valentine? No, I'm all right. I just hate to have it happen twice, that's all, if you hadn't gotten away. Well, I, I couldn't help it. I'm not oh, you. Oh, skip it, will you? Did he get away? He ran back through the Joss house. There's a million entrances to that alley through the window. Yeah, and Menahan? He went after him. Oh, that'll do a lot of good. Funny you're knowing about the alley and this place, but you said you'd never been here before. What? Nothing. Nothing I say will do any good unless we get that big ape who committed the murders. Well, of course. Ponce was the one now who... listen, Buster. I know he did the dirty work. He always wanted to. But he's not bright enough to plan it. Not bright enough to take over an explanation for Mr. Frankel and mix it up to me. What? Oh, yeah, sure. I've been kicking myself because Frankel wrote me and then was killed. Only it was his own fault for handing the job of explaining things over to you. And you told me only what I needed to know for your time schedule. What time schedule? The one you cooked up for Ponce. I don't know what your angle is, but both Frankel and Blake were big shots in that same big money promotion outfit your secretary of. So I guess there is something to gain. And after all, you only had to encourage and help Ponce a little to get him dead. No, I... Now don't argue with me, Buster, because each time Ponce went right out from here and killed his man and came straight back. Well, how did he know where to find him? Now, see Unless here. somebody told him. Like you said, Blake told you he was going to be at his club. Sure, sure. You're the only one who knew where both men were. Because I still remember the last thing I heard Frankel say. It was, you know where to find me, Lawrence. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know something? You're right. It doesn't mean a blame thing unless the police can beat the truth out of punts. And you'll never find him. He'll, he'll get away. Oh, I don't doubt it. Hey, where's Menahan? Hey, Menahan! Now get back inside the Joss house, Pinkney. I got about one second to keep this whole case from falling apart. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Hey, 
Hey, Menahan. Yes, yes, my lad. I'm in here looking the place over. <laughs> Here I am, and you know something, I'm all right. Oh, well, don't scare me like that. Come on, come on, let's get out of here. Well, it was only having a little bit of a word with Teo the Just that I was... Huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> Valentine, you know, it's a strange and funny thing about people. Now, for instance, you take Ponce. He thought that thing with the black fist, Yo Fay, was something. And, well, maybe he had something. Man, hand, what's happened to you? What kind of a yes, conversation? Yes, yes, let's get out of here, out of the dark. Look, look out, look out, look out. No, look out for your step, no. Ah, what do you mean? Incidentally, you better get hold of Mr. Pinky's arm while I explain this to you. The arm of your fay is much longer. Look up there. Do you see it up there? With its clenched fist? Ah. Hey, if I guess... Oh, no, you don't, Pinkney. No, 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 no. <laughs> Aye, Mr. Pinkney. Your poor dumb punch is still with us to talk. Yeah, how about that? He never got out. Lying there out colder than a mackerel. <laughs> he ran right into his own idol. Right into the iron fist of Yofe. You have just heard The Discovery of Ponce the Lion, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and the music was by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, did you ever hear of a fearless clown? Well, just in case you haven't, that's the title of our Let George Do It adventure. Now, you're probably wondering what a clown has to fear in the first place, unless maybe it's a nasty elephant. And in the second place, how would you know when he's behind a couple of inches of grease paint? Well, all I know is that a very nervous girl is most concerned about a certain clown, and she's telling George Valentine all about it. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm sure you've heard of Fofo, the fearless clown. Maybe you've already seen his circus before, but it's here in town, opening tonight with an all-new show. And if he's ever scared you with a snake or, or made you laugh with his crazy tumbling, and I'll bet, like everybody else, you must have thought he's a wonderful person. But I know that he's not. In fact, if Fofo should happen to die, I am the person who killed him. What I mean is, Mr. Valentine, I've already practically confessed to his murder. It's your job to keep the most horrible man in the world alive. Sincerely, Relita. P.S. I'm the girl in the strawberry collared tights. Hey, there she is. Riding the lead elephant. How could you miss her? Oh, you spotted her before, this Relita? The tights, darling. Oh. Or didn't you notice them? Foolish question. <laughs> Opening parade. She said we could catch her after the performance. That's a good idea. It'd take a stepladder to get down off that elephant any other way, wouldn't it? Brooksy, I'll tell you a secret. Hmm? You don't get down off an elephant. You get it off a duck. Oh, George. <laughs> George! Oh, no, take it easy, Angel. That's the star of the piece, that's all. Fofo himself. 
You know, he's about the only performer who's ever worked up to owning his own circus. Must be quite George, a guy. George, he's got a snake. It came right out of his suitcase. Sure, sure. It's a good act to leave the parade with. But look at it. George, it's a cobra. Oh. Take it easy. Take it easy. Putty nose and the clown rig is what makes it look so exciting. He's jumping rope with it. Brooksy, I'll tell you something. The fearless little man with his snakes. Hey, look, he's turning somersaults now in front of the elephant. But he's the man you're supposed to keep alive. Don't worry, I told you. For your information, there's not one snake in this circus that doesn't eat with false teeth. What? Yeah, sure. It just looks dangerous, that's all. That guy's not crazy. All his snakes are a fraud. Maybe he is, too. I don't know. <laughs> well, I should have known, but... Hey, the elephant. The leader's on He's charging. But Popo's turning somersaults right in front of him. Oh, George! Come on, get through the crowd. That job of mine sure ended in a hurry. That elephant just went crazy. Popo didn't even see him coming. You didn't even have a chance to keep him alive. Look, see, what I want to find out was in the first part of Relita's letter. Maybe it was the elephant who trampled him, but remember? She said, if Popo should happen to die, I'm the person who killed him. It looks like poor old Fofo has gone bye-bye. And you know what? They'll probably blame it all on that nice elephant. We'll find out what's going on behind the scene in just a minute. But first, let's take time out for this. Now, let's get back to George and Brooksy. Right now, they're backstage at the circus. George. Yeah, George. The doctor says he's still alive. They got him into the ambulance as fast as possible. He's on his way to the hospital right now. Mr. Valentine, it was it was an accident, wasn't it? Well, George, you saw it yourself. That elephant just went crazy or something, didn't you see? He charged straight ahead. If Popo hadn't been so close sure, to Sure, sure, I saw it, all right. Relita, I think you'd better tell me about yourself in a hurry. Yes, of course. I... Well, it's, it's really quite simple. I, I'm new with the circus. I, uh, I do a little acrobatic dancing. I, I used to be with an act in nightclubs. Well, it's, it's rather hard to say this. I, I'm married, you see. And, oh, Mr. Valentine, Popo's death was an accident. That's all it could have been. Relita, we do need to know your story, but maybe not all of it. Well, it, it's... Popo is very attractive and charming. And, but anyway, he saw me... He saw me act, and I, I met him. He wanted me to come with the circus. Now I have to stay with the circus. What do you mean? I think he must have enjoyed being in danger. I I got mixed up with him. What do you think okay, I mean? Okay, okay. Emotional blackmail. Does that make it simpler for you? I wrote exactly why I was going to kill him. And Well, don't look like that. I didn't give him the letter or, or go out and buy a gun. In fact, I just tore it up. Or no, what I mean is uh, I put it in my wastebasket. I... I'd worked on my scheme, I guess. Anyway, I wrote everything to my husband instead, and I mailed that, and he understands. Well, why were you so frightened? Why did you want me? After the show that night, I came back to my dressing room, and, and the note I wrote to Fofo was gone, disappeared. Somebody take me out of my wastebasket. Uh-huh. You wanted me to find out who and get the letter back, huh? Yes, whoever had that note could murder Fofo and use it to put the blame on you. And I don't know who that could be. I don't know the people around here yet, but... Oh, was so popular, I can't imagine anyone else wanting to use that letter. I to... would kill him any day of the week. What? Otto. Uh, the show must go on, but somebody else can lead the band. Eh? I wanted to find you, my child. The leader, she will be all upset, I said to myself. Otto, what did you mean? You said you'd kill Fofo? Who are these people? Oh, uh, Miss Brooks. Mr. Valentine, he's, he's sort of a detective. Well, naturally, I would expect that. Well, Ada was just telling us that she doesn't have many friends around the circus yet. So? She has me and my brother, too. The boy, Freddy. Have you seen where he is, Lolita? No, I haven't, but oh, what did you mean sure, when... come on, let's have it. Why would you kill Fofo? Everybody knows that. My foot, you see? I didn't always toodle on an oboe and wave batons in a striped coat. I was on the wire. Otto the Magnificent. <laughs> yeah. So one day I fell and was injured. But Fofo, you think he would help pay my two years of hospital bills the way the law says? Then why did you come back to his circus? Why not? Perhaps to kill Fofo. I don't know. 
but neither does Fofo. That's what makes it interesting. Oh, Otto, stop it. You shouldn't say things like that. You are very mixed up, my child. And very innocent. Uh-huh. And you're trying to tell her that nobody likes Fofo, check? Light. Past tense. He was popular because he always liked to have around him the people who hated him. If this makes no sense, why try to understand that he's dead, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, practically. Killed by an elephant. Otto, is that true? That there were others besides me? Then, then that letter I wrote is, isn't so important at all, is it, Mr. Valentine? Everybody hated him. Even my little brother, Freddy. The sweetest boy in the world. And a good entertainer, too, but out of a job. You think Fofo would give him work? No, no, Fofo laughs. He thinks it is funny I should have to support my brother. Skip it, Otto. What about the man who was with the elephant? What? The, the one walking alongside when it happened in there. Trainer, whatever he is. Mm, his name is Boxer. Well, I don't know. But he probably hates Fofo, too. Okay, thanks. You've covered up enough for Alita. What, George? Where are you going? Well, I'll start with the snakes, I guess. Yeah, down this way, I guess. You sure that snake is locked up tight in that box? What, Susie here? <laughs> Don't you worry about her, mister. Not a fang in the circus, didn't you know that? Harmless is a ten-foot piece of garden hose or a, a goddess snake. Yeah, well, never mind showing me. Just keep the lid shut, huh, will you? Sure, all right. <laughs> Some people don't like snakes, I guess. Me, I kept him in my bathtub at home ever since I was a kid, knee high. Him. Got him over there? Yeah, yeah, there he is. Got them all chained up separate. Well, that's the sheriff's work. Poor old Emir. You know that elephant's been with us almost five oh, years. Oh, hello, Boxer. Me is all it's him. I'm George Valentine. Oh, uh, yeah. Sheriff sent word. Snooping, huh? No, not exactly. Boy, look at the change they got on him. No, what's the matter, baby? They got you. All right, all right. Show them the snakes. That's what you come down here for, ain't sure, it? Oh, sure, Boxer. Take it easy. All right, there we go, Susie. Don't eat up all his hay now. Wait a minute now. Better not let that snake get so close to his trunk, had you? Look, Mr. Valentine, the Amy here wouldn't care if a snake crawled up his trunk. Okay, okay. Hey, look, get her out of here, will you? That's good, thanks. You're welcome. All right, Susie, off we go. Back to bed, that's your bed. So it wasn't the snake, huh? Come here, Mr. Valentine. Ah, uh, don't be afraid. The ammo won't step on you. Ah, uh, no, boy. Give me your ear, boy. Ah, uh, that's it. Here, look. What's that? Bunch of brands? Same idea, only you mark the ear. See? Double X, that's one circus. Triangle, that's another. Crossed lances, little crown. That, that's for digging trees up for some Maharaja. Yeah, a whole string of them. In other words, the Amy has been through the wars, huh? As older than you or I or anybody else around here. Been everywhere and done everything. And Mr. Valentine never once has he caused a bit of trouble. A freight train couldn't make him nervous or jumpy. Then what did? I don't know. Suppose somebody put a lighted cigarette to his ear. Well... Suppose that stick you carry just happened to poke him at the right time. There was only me and the girl on top near him. Nobody did nothing like that. Well, if he's such a peaceful elephant, then how do you explain his actions? Maybe you don't explain it. Animals are funny, Mr. Valentine. Sure, sure, I know. An elephant never forgets. So maybe he didn't like Fofo either, huh? Don't be ridiculous. All right, then what happened? Something sent the Amir off. George. Yeah, Brooksy, out here. I'm just trying Come to... Here. quick. Huh? Here. Over here, George. What's happened? You here from the hospital? Yes, but... Here he is. Yes, well, this is Mr. Valentine. Now, that's right. Who are you? George, it's Fofo. Yes, of course it's me. <laughs> a quick recovery, wasn't it? I think I have nine lives. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Fofo, what happened? What are you doing here? Now, hello, Otto. Really, huh? Well, don't all stand there as though I were a ghost or something. I've been down to the hospital. I was in town. I heard on the radio what happened. George, he died. The sheriff just called. Wait. Wait. I don't understand. Oh, I get it. Somebody else was doing your act for you. All that clown makeup and costume. Yes, Somebody... yes. 
Ach, but Otto, I'm so terribly sorry. Only you yourself kept asking me to give Freddy a chance. Freddy! Otto! Poor fellow. He loved his younger brother a great deal. And he wanted him to work so badly. It's really his fault, I suppose, that Freddy is dead, no? Well, it couldn't be anyone else's fault, could it? Return to our adventure with George Valentine in just a moment. Now, back to George Valentine. Fofo, the fearless clown, seems to be a man with nine lives because it never occurred to you or the other thousand people who saw an elephant suddenly run berserk and trample him that the man under all that makeup wasn't Fofo. No, it was really a boy named Freddy who only wanted a job with Fofo's circus. Well, now Freddy is dead. And if your name is George Valentine, you go down to the hospital to make sure of your facts this time. Of course it was Freddy. Who else would it be? He spoke to them, the doctor said. Did you hear what that doctor with the glasses said? Freddy didn't say anything, Otto. He couldn't help any. No. No. How could the poor boy know who killed him? Oh, Otto, Otto, snap out of it, will you please? I know how much you loved your brother. But what's done is done. Yes, yes. Besides, what do you mean, know who killed him? Did I say that? Well, why not? Fofo killed him. How do you figure that? Look, closing time. All around us people going home. But for the circus, time off, that's all. Two hours between afternoon and night performances. Freddy liked the night performance best. Look, Otto, I asked you why Fofo would kill your brother. I don't know. You mean because Fofo so gratuitously took this afternoon off? So, accidentally put your brother in his place? It was a new performance. Yeah, yeah, that's what the big man told Miss Brooks. New lights, new costumes, new music, the works. Fofo wanted to drag some publicity men from downtown, to watch with him from out front for a change. That's what he told Miss Brooks. You think it's a lie? Everything he does is a lie. Okay, prove it. I... I can't. And Mr. Valentine, you will waste your time forever if you try to. You can't always win, so... All right, wait a minute. Come on, hop in. I'll drive you back to the grounds. No, no, it is closing time for me to... Well, where are you going? I will walk back through the park, I think. Go, oh, I'll see you later. I'm not young enough to just walk out on a job. All I mean is for me, it is awful. I will stop trying to say Fofo is evil. I will let you waste your time. This is dressing room? In the railroad car, George. It's the drawing room. Oh, yeah. Nice way to live. Sure he's gone? It's through the office part, they said. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Keep out. Private. Do not disturb. <laughs> nice, friendly sort of guy. George, wait. Well, Mr. Valentine. You're snooping, huh? Perhaps you came to steal something, huh? Yeah, maybe I did, Fofo. A letter. Uh-huh. A letter? <laughs> Let me see. You represent Relita, don't you? So, I guess I might as well start looking, huh? Where is it, the desk? You know, I like you. You are very shrewd. Now, look, Buster, she wrote a letter. It explained what kind of a guy you are. And why she would like to kill me. So the letter disappears. Somebody stole it. It doesn't take much shrewdness to figure you're the boy who took it. Relita is very young. She needed to be taught a lesson. She's already learned it. Stay away from clowns. But I suppose you got a lot of fun out of scaring her to death. Now, here. You may have it. It has served its purpose. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Fofo, you enjoy things like this, don't you? <laughs> what this guy Otto says about you is true. I think we can skip the psychoanalysis, yeah? Otto, stupid. He would never be able to do anything about the way he feels. I might. Sit down, Valentine. 
You know, you advertise for danger. You're the kind of man I've always wanted to meet. Oh, no thanks, Buster. My job's finished. What? Huh? Yeah, the reason I was hired, at least. So now the coast's clear to solve a murder, isn't it? And right now, I'd rather hear what Boxer has to say. <laughs> That's what I'm doing now. Here, hold the flashlight a minute. Well, maybe Fofo let it slip, but he mentioned you were claiming the Amir wasn't to blame today. I know, I know. And earlier I said I couldn't see how anybody could have made the Amir do it. I still don't. But you say one of the men heard someone out here. That's right, Miss Brooks. Two nights ago. Roustabout says the Amir was snorting around. Sure. Of course, I told Fofo. But you think he'd be interested if it was murder? You think he'd do anything but laugh over it? All right, skip it, Boxer. Just what happened two nights ago? Well, this roustabout was waked up by the aimer. Came over to see what was the matter. Sure, there was a man here. But he disappeared before he could get a look. Didn't report it. Didn't think it was important until today. George, look. Hmm. It's a sliver. Thin little sliver of wood. Huh? Ah, looks like a chip from the sawdust. Let's see what it looks no, like. No, wait a minute. God. It's broken already. Polished white wood. That's not sawdust. Well, maybe it's sharp. But that's nothing you're going to hurt an elephant with either. Here, I'll show you how tough the aimer's skin is. Don't poke him. If you think that was what was riling him up, when you got another thing coming. Wait, hold it. Now, you listen to me. Boxer, what would happen if you took the elephant here back into the main tent? The way he was when he tore loose this afternoon when the accident happened. I don't get you. Could you guarantee to the sheriff to have enough chains or enough men to keep him under control? Uh, sure. All right, the tent's empty now. It's between shows. Everybody's available. George, what do you want to do? A little reconstruction, Brooksy. It just occurred to me that the only one who can solve this crime in a hurry is the aimer himself. You all set, Otto? You want everything the same. All right, all right. Start your silliness. Old Salpus himself. Where have you been? <laughs> I'm back, aren't I? I guess, Mr. Valentine, I've been thinking about what Fofo should think about. How you can't always win. That you will never teach him. What do you mean? All right, let's get this parade going. Come on. You know, the Salpus, he plays bad music anyway. Why aren't you ready to walk through this thing, Fofo? Haven't even brought your snake box in yet. Haven't even started a somersault. No, I will do my part. Don't worry. I'm not afraid. Oh, skip it. It's because you know I don't need to go through with it, isn't it? Is it? Sure. It's because you know I've already got the answer. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. On the way back from the hospital, I stopped to pick up a book on elephants. Take the aimer here. He's been through the wars, hasn't he? No, that, that band is making so much noise. Oh, you're with me, all right. But here, look. The brand marks on the aimer's ear. Boxer! Give me the stick there. Well, don't you want me to lead him around like I did? No, I take him. I can handle him. Well, give it to me, I said. Well, sure, boss. Never mind, never mind. Here, take a look. Three X's. That's a circus. A crown. Boxer says he must have pulled up trees for a Maharaja once. Cross lances. Well, in India, that was the best job an elephant could get, wasn't it? Only goes to the biggest and finest. Battle elephant. You are the expert, not me. I suppose the lances might mean that. What are you driving at? The aimer's memory. Something way back in his training. Something he'd do on the right command automatically, fast as lightning. Practically a reflex action. Yeah, well, go on. What's up, Valentine? Oh, let's get this over with, Sheriff. I don't like it. Otto, stop that music. Hey, Otto, stop it. What's the matter? Okay, now. Play the same tune you played this afternoon. What? But I have told you, everything is the same Opening as it Opening performance was. of the new show was this afternoon. Sure, that's right. Everything was new, even costumes and music. So play that same march. Sure, I told you it was different, Otto. Yes, go on, Otto. You write the music, play it. Mr. Valentine wants everything the same. Unless you are afraid to. Be quiet, will you? Otto, your instrument, I remember, is an oboe, a reed instrument. Well, is this white sliver of wood yours? It's a broken reed. What? Somebody dropped it the other night, doing something that made the aimer get all excited. Playing softly in his ear, maybe. Testing a composition, maybe. I, I, I don't understand at all. I... Yes, you do. You're wasting time. Come on, boys. You don't need a leader. Play out those same arrangements you did this afternoon. Wait! Let her go. Here we are, Valentine. The aimer and I. What's the matter, Otto? 
The aimer here is really harmless. But if a man were turning somersaults in front of him and suddenly some horn started blaring out... Wait! No, Mr. Valentine! Wait, boys! I don't know the notes, but something deep in the elephant's memory, maybe. Battle elephant. And I suppose there must be a call for charge. At least that's what they use battle elephants for. Stop it! Stop that music! Stop it! Stop it! All right. I am the one you want. Imagine trying to kill me. <laughs> He's tried it before, but that's what his scheme was. Oh, he had good enough reason, I guess. No, but the irony of it, Mr. Valentine, he worked up such a beautiful way to kill me. I always told him he was never smart, no. <laughs> and then his plan backfired so tragically. No wonder he fainted when I told him his brother had taken my place. Uh-huh. Well, I just talked to Otto back there. He won't say anything. But how can he? Because he can't really prove that you'd caught on to what his plan was. That you had his brother take your place on purpose. <laughs> well, and uh, can you prove it? No, of course not. So why talk about then, huh? Yeah, that's right. Why talk about it? George, let's get out of here. Oh, leave me alone for a minute, will you, Angel? Don't you see? Fofo's right. I can't prove it. We will return to our adventure with George Valentine in just a moment. Well, the aimer won't have to be shot now. That's one good thing come out of it. Oh, sure, sure, Boxer. And you can go right on having trouble with your boss, and Relita can still be practically blackmailed by the guy who's still got his eye on Oh, George, stop beating yourself. There's nothing you can do about it. You said so yourself. Yeah, sure. In fact, Otto told me that earlier, before he stumbled off to walk in the park. Said I'd waste my time forever if I tried to get back at Fofo. You can't always win, he said. Oh, poor Otto wasn't bright enough to get rid of Fofo. And I came along, so he never got another chance at him. Uh, maybe I don't mean that, I don't know. Well, on with the show. Sure. Listen to them in there. In a couple of minutes, the fearless fraud will come galloping in with his little suitcase, opening the parade. The people will scream and clap their hands for him and the snake with false teeth and his somersaults in front of the Amir. So we don't like the way it ends, Brooksy. Hey, there's a police car come back to meet us, I guess. Come on, let's go. Only... What's the matter? Otto said a couple of funny things. It was odd his not being willing to talk about anything after he confessed. What? In fact, it was funny he didn't confess earlier. The shock of finding he'd been responsible for killing his brother and all. What are you talking about? That policeman getting out of the car as a funny cab. Made me remember Otto's wanting to go to the park, that's all, then Mr. showing Valentine. up later. Mr. Valentine, this guy's from the park. Yeah, so I noticed. City Park Zoo. We need help fast. Along about closing time, somebody broke into the snake house at the zoo. And, buddy, our snakes aren't amateurs. Our biggest cobra is missing. You have just heard The Fearless Clown, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and the music was by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you'll again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, it's time to 
batten down the hatches again, because here comes George Valentine. You must know George by now. He's the fellow who makes trouble to keep you out of it. Now, perhaps that doesn't make too much sense, but after all, what does in this day and time? So I just want you to be content with the fact that this has let George do it, and let the chips fall where they may. Dear Mr. Valentine, it's one thing to be the keeper of your brother, it's quite another to be the keeper of your brother-in-law, particularly one that you haven't met, that you don't want to meet, that you wish would stay in South America where he belongs, and that shouldn't have married your sister in the first place. When my sister wrote that she was meeting a husband's ship here in town, naturally, I insisted that they be my guests. But, Mr. Valentine, the price of hospitality seems to run high. No sooner had I put the welcome mat out than the word must have got round. The X must be on my doorstep, because now my house is being watched. I am being watched. Well, Mr. Valentine, I am not an excavation, and I have no intention of letting brotherly love dig me into any sort of premature grave. Sincerely, Franklin J. Scott. Uh, Sit down, sit down. This is a lovely place, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Miss Brooks. It's been in the Scott family for years. Yes, I've heard of your family. (laughs) Certainly not on the financial page. But you know, that was the difficulty when my sister married Sid Forrest. Uh, The social thing, I mean. Now, please understand, I'm not a snob. But she certainly made a peculiar choice. You see, she was back east at the time. Yes, I think you mentioned that. Look, I'd uh, really rather hear about your house being watched. No, 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 wait. Uh, This comes first. Sid Forrest. Marion met him in Saratoga, I think. He'd won a racehorse in a poker game, and they spent their honeymoon watching it lose from then on. That will give you the general idea about him. It will. Oh, I've done my best to be sympathetic. Sent Mary and money every once in a while. I stood up against some of the other members of the family for them, and I really had hopes of being justified when Sid went to Guiana, French Guiana, a little town called Jean Cash, it was. When was this? You mean he left your sister? No such luck. He left a couple of years ago to make something of himself in mining. Well, I don't think he did so well on money, but at least it's a try, and Marion assures me he's coming back quite a different man. Mm-hmm. But you're not so sure that he's as reformed as she claims. This house-watching before he gets here. Exactly. Marion herself is arriving later on tonight. And you call me instead of the police because if your brother-in-law is mixed up in something irregular again, you don't want publicity or the law around, huh? <laughs> now I know I hired the right man. <laughs> well, don't be too sure yet. You still haven't said a word about who's watching you. Why are you so afraid? Oh, oh, here. Uh, that part's the easiest. Huh? What? Uh, the man who watches. He's out there every night. At least the, the past three nights. Quiet now. I'll turn out the lights. Oh, I'll get them. Thank you. Who he is, that's your job. I tried to speak to him once, but he just walked past me. Oh, what's this? Side porch, patio? Shh, shh, shh. Out this way. No, 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 wait, wait. There. Where? Under the street light. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is a man there, all right. Well, he's not doing anything. Oh, no, he never does. The first night, I'd gone out for a moment and left the house open. When I came back, I saw him running away from the porch, but not a thing had been touched. He's moving around in front. Come on. Mr. Scott, how do you know there's any connection between that man and your brother-in-law? Well, I know it seems far-fetched, but people in this climate don't usually wear white linen suits like that, do they? But down in French Guiana... There, wait a minute. Coming down the walk now. Uh Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Valentine, what do you think? I don't think anything. I'm stupid. I'm just a guy who likes to ask questions. George, be careful. Okay. Excuse me, friends. You got a light? What? Light. Here, have a cigarette. Oh, no. No, thank you. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Slow down, Buster. Get away from me. Not tonight. There. That's better. I, I didn't, didn't do anything. Did you get him? Now, hang on to him. Take it easy now. He's not going anyplace. Who are you? I, I'm sorry. Oh, like that, huh? Please, let me go. The lady asked you a question. I'm sorry, I said... Why? You said yourself you didn't do anything. No, no, let me go. What are you doing here, watching this house? I don't know. I haven't been. Oh, Buster, you're wasting our time. No, get away from me. Please don't. Come on, come on. Empty the pockets. Here, Scott, grab that. I've got it. There's nothing in his coat. Just a scrap of paper. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, a calling card. 
An old beat-up calling card. Yeah, the paper has your address printed on it, Mr. Scott. Huh? Let me see. Address and that's all. Oh, you're, you're hurting my arm. I won't try to get away. Okay, now you're getting smart. What's on the calling card, Mr. Scott? Um, uh, Mr. Jack McDonald, Rue Dalvaso, Jean Cash, French Guinea. All right, is that you, Jack McDonald? No. No, please, I don't know. Buster, you said that once too many times. George, wait. Look at him. He looks sick. Okay, now, for the last time, who are you? I'm sorry, I... I just don't know. Now, I wonder what's the matter with Junior. Is he scared of George, or did he take stupid pills for lunch? Well, whatever's the cause, we'll find out in just a moment. Now let's get back to George Valentine and the boy who lost his memory. Loss of memory? I don't believe it. Take it easy, take it easy. I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, any luck with the cable, Graham Brooksy? No, not yet, but a man at Western Union looked up the address for me. He says something called McDonald Brothers Limited practically owns the town of Jean Catch, so we'll get the answer all right. Jean Cash in French Guiana. H- have you ever heard of it? No. No, I don't think so. Just what do you remember, friend? That address in my pocket, it, it seemed to mean something. Where did you get it? I I remember walking up here from the waterfront. Waterfront? I, I mean, three days ago. I remember the past three days, all right. There was something about a fight, I think. But I don't know, I don't know. All right, relax, relax. We're just trying to help you. So maybe you got in a fight and got knocked on the head, huh? Maybe, yes. For instance, you've got a suit on, but just a T-shirt underneath. Uh, wh- wh- what do you mean, Valentine? Greasy hands, George. Yeah, all cracked and bruised. I'm sorry, sorry. So maybe you work around the waterfront. Does that check? Well, well, sure. Only this kind of suit. Huh, John Cash, down in Vienna. The waterfront is John Cash. Or he works aboard a ship for the... Yeah, hold it. I'll get it, George. Hello? I'm causing a lot of trouble. Yes. Stay here, will you? Western Union, Angel. Any luck? Huh? Wait a minute, George. All right. Thanks very much. It's one lead gone down the drain. What do you mean? He's not the man whose card he had. The big shot down in Guyana. Jack McDonald. Why not? Mr. McDonald committed suicide over six weeks ago. George, anything new? Oh, I'm doing about as well as you did, Angel. What, what's that? A friend of mine on a newspaper is checking ship arrivals. Our mental lapse here says he never heard of your brother-in-law, Sid Forrest. Well, I don't know that I have. But maybe Sid will remember him, Check. Oh, you, you mean just keep this man until Sid gets here and... But wait, Valentine, I don't even know the name of Sid's ship. I know. I just asked your sister. Huh? Yes, Marion should be calling from the airport, but... What'd you say? She's out in the hall right now. That's what I came to tell you. Brooksy, stay here with Mr. Rex, will you? Sure, George. Marion, here? For heaven's sakes, why didn't she call? What in the name Franklin, of... Franklin, it... darling. Hello, Marion. You distinctly wrote that I should pick you up at the airport oh, when you got in Oh, don't be I... so stuffy. Where will I slide out from under this hat? Mm. There. Huh. Mr. Amber met me and dropped me off here. Did I upset all your darling little plans? Now stop it. <laughs> Ambler? Who's Ambler? Friend of mine. He's handled some of my business things. Can't your little sister have a few friends if she... Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine. You've got somebody waiting on the phone, haven't you? Yes, if you don't mind. Oh, my purse. I wrote that name down somewhere. I sent Sydney your address by radio, Franklin, just a few days ago. A uh, golden something, I know. A, a Hello, freighter. Hello, still there? Well, try the list of freighters. Uh, golden something or other. I thought I had it, but... I... Franklin, what's going on? Who's Mr. Valentine? No, 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 no. Nothing to worry about. Just checking when Sydney will be in, that's all. That's oh, oh, they never seem to know, I guess. He warned me about freighter schedules. Golden Drake, is that the one? Yes, yes, that's right. Golden Drake. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Joe. What? What's the matter? When did you hear from your husband, Mrs. Forrest? Well, he sent me an airmail a couple of weeks ago. What are you driving at, Valentine? Well, that's the right ship, all right. Only one to touch a Jean Cash the past month. Uh, only the Golden Drake is already in. It docked here three days ago. What? I don't understand. Sidney wrote... Where is he? Franklin, hasn't Sidney gotten in touch with you? Just a minute, please. 
Mr. Scott, you told me you'd never met your brother-in-law, right? Well, yes. But... Or seen him, or seen his picture? <laughs> Please, both of you. No, no, I... no, no, I haven't. Uh, just a moment. <laughs> What's happened? A man in a linen suit who's been a Jean Cash, who acts as though he really does have amnesia, who's written down your address and seems to feel he should be here at this house. Oh, for heaven's sakes, of course. It's obvious. <laughs> for the last time, what are you talking about? <laughs> Come on, Mrs. Forrest. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Hey, it never even occurred to me. Sydney, of course, right in here, Marion. Sydney's already here. He's. He's. Where? Hello, ma'am. Isn't that man. Him? Huh? Don't be silly. I've never seen him before in my life. Mr. Valentine, where is Sydney? Will you please tell me what's happened to him? I don't know, Mrs. Forrest. I wish I did. Your husband seems to have disappeared. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a minute. to George Valentine. You're hired because Mr. Scott is worried about a man watching his house, a man who doesn't know who he is or why he is there. He's carrying the card of Jack McDonald. But Mr. McDonald committed suicide in South America nearly two months ago. Is he Mr. Scott's brother-in-law, Sidney Forrest? Well, now Mrs. Forrest is here, and she should know, and she says he isn't. So if your name is George Valentine, you decide the only way to solve this problem is to find Sid Forrest. And so you first try the ship that supposedly brought him in three days ago. A golden drake. It's not much, is it? Mm, looks more like a tin duck. Is this where yeah, we're going to... come on, let's go aboard. What kind of a flag is that? Come on, hurry up, Brooksy, before they swing that boom again. Oh, <laughs> Flag? I don't know. Panama, I think. Something like that. Valentine! Lieutenant Johnson! What are, what are you, you doing, doing here? here? All right, all right. One at a time. My friends, you stand aboard a pirate ship. What did you say? An illegal, irregular, should have been sunk scow. No, no. Is that nice, Lieutenant? You shut up. Come on, Johnson. What's it all about? My friends meet Bluebeard himself. Captain Task, folks. Lieutenant, here's a little sore. That's all. that will wear off. Wear off? Oh, no, it won't. Your ship's been in port three days, and he waits until half an hour ago to report a man overboard. I told you I had a cargo to worry about. I've been tied up by you birds before, and when you got perishables aboard, you can't sit around hold waiting it, hold for it, red. Please, thing. please. What man overboard? Oh, passenger, that's all. I had a passenger this trip. Man named Sidney Forrest. Sid Forrest? Well, there's nothing to raise the blow about. Committed suicide, that's all. Overboard suicide. <laughs> See, this is my own ship. I get my cargo ashore fast enough, maybe I can barely pay off the bank. The guy's already dead, you can't help nothing by speeding up matters. Who says you're qualified to decide his death was a suicide? Oh, it was suicide, all right. Only now, with this stuff you tell me about an amnesia case... Okay, then let's start from the beginning. What happened? Tess barely saw Forrest, apparently. He stayed in his cabin all the time, right? Yeah, just about. All the way from Jean Cash, that's where he came aboard. Yes, we know. Well, Forrest in the ocean didn't get along too well, so he locked himself in. But he was a sick-looking guy to start out with. I wasn't really too surprised when I saw the note. Note? What note? Wait a minute. Don't get ahead of yourself. There was a storm a couple of nights before they hit port. Yeah, that's right. I was on the bridge... Deck watch gave a yell, said he saw a splash. I could see a man in the water. Got the ship turned, got out the lights, but we couldn't find him again. Too rough to drop a boat, so that was it. All right, go on. Jose, the steward, he'd seen this thing, too. He was slipping a radiogram under Mr. Forrest's door a little later. I was down checking the crew to see who was missing. Anyway, Jose couldn't get an answer to a knock, so I broke in Forrest's cabin and found out he was missing. Come on in here, I'll show you. Is this his cabin? Yeah. I didn't touch anything. As soon as I got in port, I locked her up tight in a drum. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, this is the radiogram. His wife mentioned it, remember, Brooksy? Yes. One giving her brother's address, Mr. Scott's. Here. 
This is a note you want to see. To whom it may concern, huh? Sitting just like that on the desk, it was. Same place. I knew better than to even open that before I got into port and had witnesses. Oh, you're the soul of cooperation, all right. Yeah. Typical suicide note, all right? His health, he said. Like I told you, the guy was... Sure, sure, sure. Nothing wrong with a note. Tony, it's two suicides in only a couple of months. Yeah. And who says Sidney Forrest wrote that note? And, Captain, I want to know how many members of your crew are ashore and what they look like. Huh? Well, none of them yet. Deckhands, at least. From the engine room? Oh, sure. Engine crew's been ashore three days now. Engine Why? crew. Remember his hands, George? Yeah, that's right. Captain, you're going with Miss Brooks to try and identify him. Hey, wait a minute, Valentine. Where are you going? Ambler. I think that was his name. A financial friend of Forrest's wife. Yeah, Johnson, I think it's about time we started checking everybody's story. <laughs> Yes. Yes, I met her at the plane. Oh, good heavens, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Okay, Mr. Ambler. I have known Mrs. Forrest for some time. Helped with her investments. In fact, that's what I'm doing now. She asked me to. I have to run down to that boat, too. Uh-huh. Well, I checked with the government authorities. Forrest sent quite a bunch of stuff up here by registered mail. Mm-hmm, that's right. Mailed things on ahead. But there are papers with his personal baggage to be gone over. On the ship, yeah. Yes. Well, uh... Shall we be going, then? You know, I'm, I'm supposed to be in Seattle. I, I know this is very upsetting for Mrs. Forrest, but I can't let my own business slide. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Ambler. Uh, these securities, bonds, property deeds. Did you know Mr. Forrest was supposed to be a failure? Who told you that? His brother-in-law, Mr. Scott. But Sid Forrest really did all right for himself down in Jean Cash, didn't he? Well, I... I don't really know the amount. It'll take me several months to dispose of everything for his wife, but... Uh, well, yes. He apparently struck it pretty rich. Uh-huh. Say, uh, look, you run onto the ship by yourself, huh? I've got something else to do. John Doe, John Doe. Is that any kind of a name? There's no law against it. I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. But you worked on the ship under that name. The captain definitely identified him, George. He signed on as an oiler at the last minute at Jean Cash. Uh-huh. The chief engineer gave me that name. It happens all the time. Well, what's the matter with that? Where's your amnesia, friend? Well, I meant... Oh, skip it. I guess we fed you that idea when all you were trying to do was clam up. I don't know. You don't know. First, you prowl around watching a man's house. That's trespass, vagrancy, and a few other things. Then you sucker people into thinking that... Take it easy, Johnson. Take it easy. Yeah. You cabled a full description and query to Jean Cash, didn't you? What? So we wait for an answer, that's all. Only in the meantime, let's see. Sid Forrest locked himself in his cabin. Now, why luck? I don't know what you're talking about. To avoid somebody who was on the same ship? That'd be one obvious answer. Of course, George. Only maybe he didn't avoid him, huh? But the suicide note's genuine. It checks with Forrest's letters and things. You know, I'm interested in Sid Forrest's money. Forrest wasn't a very nice guy. And as I remember it, the town of Jean Cash was supposed to be owned by the McDonald outfit. What are you driving at, George? Oh, no, no, I'm not sure. The cable will tell us. You remember about uh, Jack McDonald, though, Johnson? Guy who committed suicide down there? Yeah, that's right. Why don't you leave me alone? Jack McDonald, who had all the money in Jean Cash. McDonald Brothers Limited. That was the name of the company, wasn't it? I haven't done anything. Okay, never mind. There's the answer right now. Yeah, hello? Right, Sergeant. Let's have it. Yeah. All right, all right. My name is McDonald, but what of it? He was my brother, Jack McDonald. Sid Forrest swindled him out of the company. Was that why your brother committed suicide? Because of Forrest? Of course. Why else do you think of that? So you came after Forrest to kill him, didn't you? How do you expect me to answer a thing like... Okay, Sergeant, thanks. All right, McDonald. Johnson will have the answer. Johnson will what? That wasn't any cable. It was a sergeant down on the ship. He found a thousand bucks. thousand dollars? What? Underneath the rug in the captain's cabin. And incidentally, Jose the steward remembers not only seeing the limp form of a man hit the water, but also admits it was somebody else standing at the rail who ducked out of sight. Just in case you're interested. So Forrest was murdered. This thing is a vicious circle. And now, what was our friend here saying about following Forrest for the purpose of avenging his brother? Now, wait a minute, Johnson. McDonald here was still looking for Forrest after he was dead. He couldn't have been the one, motive or no motive. Okay, back to the ship we go. (laughs) 
This case is upside down, I tell you. The further we get, the more complicated it is. I told Valentine, said Forrest wasn't any good lieutenant. Uh, Doesn't surprise me that a man would be after him for the sake of revenge. Never mind, Mr. Scott, please. So they got that steward in here, Johnson? He's down below. The sergeant didn't want the captain to murder him for shooting his mouth off. I just wondered if this cabin was empty, that's all. Sure, sure. Why? Well, let's put McDonald in here. Well, I'll do whatever you want, but... Good idea. Go on, go on, get in there. Uh, all right. Okay, now, Johnson, before you go off half-cocked on this case, let's try to add it up, huh? I didn't bring my slide rule. Well, it's always simpler to bet on a hunch than to get wound up figuring systems, isn't it? Only you don't win so often. Uh, you do if you got a few clues in your pocket. George, whoever murdered Forrest had to be someone on this ship, right? Is that what you mean by adding it up? Of course, that's obvious. It certainly couldn't have been anybody ashore, could it? It could have been paid for by somebody ashore. What? This Captain Task will do anything for money. And somebody's been paying him at least a thousand bucks worth. Well, you don't even know that this this steward's testimony is true. Hold on a second, will you? Whoa. Hello there, Valentine. Say, your name's Ambler, isn't it? That's right. I got a few questions about money I'd like to ask uh, you. Oh, wait, please, Johnson. Well, wait, uh, what, what's the matter? Something new? Mr. Ambler, uh, would you wait inside a minute in this cabin? Well, well yes, of course. Uh, but don't make it too long. Well, Valentine? I was going to say that Mr. Forrest's money gives a motive to his wife. Now, see here. Or to her brother, like you, Mr. Scott. Cut it out, will you, all of you? Keep your eye on the clues, Johnson, and you don't have to get complicated at all. What? Yeah, listen. Don't you understand? It's all over. No. Who even says there's been a murder? George! Look up there. Put that down. Unless you don't get out of the way fast enough. McDonald! Hey, what's going on in here? Put that down. What in the name of you crazy Stop it. Leave me alone. Cut it out, McDonald. All right, you asked for it. What in the name of hell? That's going... That man's insane. He grabbed me and... Mr. Scott, I told you it was all over, didn't I? Meet Mr. Ambler. Sure, your brother-in-law. Only I guess his real name's Sidney Forrest. And he's still very much alive. But, George, how can he be Mr. Forrest? McDonald confirms it, doesn't he, Angel? So will Mrs. Forrest when we pin it down. But there was a murder or a suicide or... Well, there were witnesses. <laughs> Not if everybody's alive and accounted for. Don't you get it, Angel? The captain was paid to help stage a man overboard disappearance, right? Sure, somebody saw something. Probably a bundle of clothes hitting the water, that's all. And who threw them? Probably Forrest himself. Oh. Then the captain hit him out in a different cabin and later on smuggled him ashore. All those other shenanigans have just been one frantic man's attempt to escape from another. And complications don't worry you because you've got a crystal ball. Oh, I told you, I've got a clue. Stick around a minute, Angel. It's simple. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a minute. I guess McDonald is over it now, Mr. Scott. But he probably would have killed your brother-in-law if you hadn't called George and interfered. <laughs> Wouldn't have been much loss. Well, I guess Forrest thought he had McDonald off his trail when he staged his own disappearance from the ship. Then somehow he found out about McDonald watching your house, waiting for him. So Forrest thought if he confirmed it as a suicide, then McDonald would believe he was dead and go back to South America. That's the idea. And that was the clue. The suicide note was in his own handwriting, but it was written after his supposed death. Uh, how do you know that? Well, a radiogram from your sister was delivered to Forrest's cabin afterwards, remember? It told him the address of your house. How do you think McDonald learned about you or that address unless he broke into that cabin sometime later and saw that radiogram? Well, yes, that makes sense. And yet sense, the suicide but... note was supposedly found sitting in plain sight and left there until today sealed. Well, if McDonald pried into the radiogram, why didn't he open the suicide note too? See what I mean? Therefore, the note wasn't there or probably even written until later. But, Valentine, at least you'll admit it was luck that Forrest turned out so conveniently to be posing as Mr. Ambler. Sure, I'll grant you. But if I were going to take on another identity in order to escape someone, I think I'd pose as somebody who could legitimately handle my own money, don't you? <laughs> With your money, it wouldn't be a job worth having. Uh-huh. All right, then, Angel, come on. You buy dinner for the three of oh. you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Uh, about my sister. Well, what about her? She wasn't really in on it. Her husband gave her a phony story. Oh, after he met her at the airport, she went along with calling him Mr. Ambler once, but... No worry. When she finds out everything he did... But she'll be through with him, and this time for good. Sure, sure. I'll give you another reason. From now on, Sid Forrest is going to be so busy digging himself out of trouble with Johnson and the government of French Guinea and McDonald and his lawyers and all the other yes, things... Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, come on, I guess I'll buy the dinner. You have just heard The Man from French Guiana, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey has starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Are you all set for another visit with Valentine? I hope so. Because, as always, we have what I think is a real peachy little bit of mayhem in store for you. It's a little thing called Sucker Stunt, which will give you a rough idea as what is about to take place. In case you want the gaps filled in, why don't you forget about me and watch how George handles the situation on Let George Do It. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, I'll be back around 10.30 and then we'll get the guy. What? Go on. Well, that's all it says, George. Just a note shoved under the door. I found it when I opened up. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'll be back around 10.30 and then we'll get the guy. There's no time or signature. Hello. What's the matter? Hey, you waited for me, didn't you? Oh, I'm Tim McGean. Is that supposed to mean something? Well, sure, I'm the guy who... Yeah, I know, I know. You wrote this note. But you didn't sign it. I what? How do you like that? I'm so wound up, I don't know what I'm doing. Sure, Tim again, that's my name. Sit down, you look worn out. Been up all night? Uh, working. Here, let me unload. Huh? I'm a photographer, see? Yeah, so I notice. Work up the north side of town. You know, weekly newspaper, that kind of stuff. I'm doing all right, see? I could support her myself. That's what gets me. That's what I don't understand. Her? I thought it was a guy you were out to get. Oh, well, sure. His name is Florio. Uh... I think you'd better start at the beginning. What happened? Did somebody steal your girl? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. It's my kid's sister, see? She's only 18, lives with an aunt, but I feel sort of responsible. But you know how girls that age are. She won't listen to anything. She mixed up with this guy? I'm afraid she'll marry him. This address is down What's here. What's wrong so... with him? Why do you need me? Look, Mr. Valentine, I'm just an ordinary dull jerk. My sister won't listen to me. But I want you to see this guy. All this romantic European stuff, there's something fishy with it. Look, I still don't get it. What's fishy about Look, he's it? never told her what his business is. And he won't tell her. He's a good 20 years older than her. I, I phoned him once. You know, trying to meet him, have a beer or something. But you know what he said? It was none of my business. I had to stay away from him or I'd get a nosebleed. Ah, nice guy. Okay, Tim, you got his address. Let's go take a look at Florio's nose. Uh, just for size. <laughs> You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a minute. 
Now back to George Valentine and let George do it. Are you married? Oh, I used to be, but she wasn't much. It was no good. We sort of separated. Maybe that's it. I've been a sucker Wait a myself. Hold. You uh, you said four twelve, didn't you? Florios, we buy and sell. Looks more like a bookie joint. Jewelry, leather goods, exchange, musical instruments. Well, that must be him right there in the window. That dark boy with the light teeth. <laughs> Busy as a beaver. Okay, I'll go inside and take a look. No, but what are you going to say? You'll spoil everything if you, if you tell him. Don't you worry, don't worry. I'll think of something. Look, if you can strike up a conversation, make him spend a little time, maybe you get... Wait a minute, here. Here, take this. Huh? Sell it to him. Your camera? Yeah, sure. It's got a couple scratches. Anyway, I got another. I get him wholesale. Well, from the looks of the place, you'll probably get clipped. <laughs> That's what I mean. It'd be worth the price even to have that much on him. Here, ask for 175 That's what it was, wholesale. Go ahead. Uh, well, it's another sucker stunt, but okay. I'll wait for you. Good morning. Hello. You, Florio? You the boss? Also the cook and bottle washer, yeah. You have business? Uh, yeah. Of course, Mr. Valentine. It's a pleasure. Oh, you know me? Oh, yes. I have been in this neighborhood 15 years. But is it the camera? Yeah. Sell or loan? Well, see what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Don't think I've ever stopped in your shop here before. Pretty good business? Pretty good taxes. How is your business, Mr. Valentine? You must get a great many strange cases. Oh, I do. Well, a Jefferson Mini, eh? Two-nine lens. Yeah, good condition. Practically new. Oh, it seems a shame to sell. Uh, do you have a little time? Why? Oh, not about the camera... I just thought you might have lunch. You see, if <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, my wife is a great admirer of yours. Your uh, wife, Florio? My boss. My bed is three quarters. Not beautiful, but <laughs> then so am I. And such a wonderful uh, Florio, cook, let me see huh? that camera a second, will you? Oh, the scratches. I didn't even notice. No, neither did I. Nice compact camera, though. Mm -hmm. Fits in my pocket without its even being noticed. Yes, why sell it? But if you wish, I give you a loan. But this is not important. It is lunch with me and my wife and children. I'd love to, and... Floria, but uh, some other time, okay? Uh-huh. Right now, i got to straighten out a sucker. Hey, but what did he say? What did he Here's the money. Twenty-five bucks. Twenty-five? What's the matter? Not enough? Oh, Sure, but... All right, come on back to the office. I want you to sign a receipt. But, Mr. Valentine, I got work to Look, do today. Look, if a guy's I... crooked, you want him nailed legally. Well, come on, come on, let's get going. Mr. Valentine, what is this? You've been driving almost three hours now. Mr. Valentine doesn't like to talk while he drives. But even when you went back up to the office, you didn't explain... I had some you... phone calls to make, that's all. I think you telephoned your sister, Tim. Oh, is that nice, Angel? Hmm? He knows he hasn't got a sister. Now, look. Just like he knows that the first time he saw Florio was probably when he walked by the shop this morning. Took a look at Florio so he could describe him to me. Look, I, I don't understand you at all. I don't know. Okay. If I'd known that you weren't going to believe anything I said, I'd have gone someplace else. Holy smoke, look at the time. I got work to do. What do you think you're taking me anyway? My wife will be worried if I don't phone her. Oh, I thought you said you were separated from your wife, that she was no good. Well, well, well yeah. How could you phone her if she doesn't have a number? What? I checked that. While George was talking to the police. To the police? Well, well, sure, sure. I really got a wife, but she don't live in a city. Uh, we don't even speak. What is this, Apple Junction? Don't you know? No, no. Never been out this way before. Oh, May I read him the early morning newspaper, George? It's just a little item, not very important. Um, 
Mr. Ben Roberts, a salesman for the fruit grower's equipment company, said that he picked up the hitchhiker about 100 miles north of Apple Junction shortly after midnight and that the man held him up and left him after traveling south only a few miles. The man was described as ordinary in appearance, about 35 years old, about 5 feet 9 inches in height, wearing overcoat and hat. Well, I, I guess that could be almost anybody, couldn't it? Hmm. Uh, taken from Mr. Roberts was $112 in cash, including a $50 bill, a good luck Canadian dollar, and a brand new camera, Jefferson Miniature, with an F-29 lens. Hey, that's a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Doesn't say anything about scratches, does it, Angel? Where the camera serial number should have been? No, George. Now listen, both of you... Oh, Tim, it's as old as the hills, that gag. You want to fence a stolen item, but you see a newspaper story about it, so you want to be careful. You get somebody like me who's known in the neighborhood to make the sale for you. After I'd handed you the money, you'd have made up another bright story and disappeared. That's not true. I didn't say it was. I haven't accused you of anything. But, brother, you use the word sucker a little too loosely. Oh, I know I, I stick my neck out putting an ad like mine in the paper. And all too often, bright boys like you try to take advantage George, of George, turn right. There's the sheriff's office. Yeah. No, let me out. Please let me out. I'll, I'll explain everything. For once, Buster, I'm going to make a sucker out of the guy who tried to make me a sucker. No, please. Please keep going. I, I didn't do it. i never even been this town before, honest. Well, well, look who's here. If it ain't Tim again. Been away? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, sucker. Now I start enjoying myself. <laughs> Well, Tim here's never really been any trouble before, Mr. Valentine, but he sure fits the description. Yeah, I'll say he does. Oh, be quiet, will you? What are you doing here anyway, Ames? He's the hired hand out of my wife's place, Mr. Valentine. Nobody believes him. I sent for him just a few minutes ago. Well, no day off. I guess I can do anything I want, can I? Ben. Oh, Ben. Uh, right here, Sheriff. Just admiring the calendars in your office. Better than the ones in the barber shop. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, lady. Ben Roberts, Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Roberts, the uh, one who was robbed at midnight last night? First time in 17 years on this road. Let me tell you, Mac, I've picked up hitchhikers all my life, and not a single one of them has ever held me up. Skip it. Is this the guy, Ben? Of course not. Of course I'm not. Is he? Well, it was night. Uh, I don't want to just come right Here's out. Here's the camera. He scratched off the serial number. He hasn't been searched yet for the money, but... I'll do it right now. Let go on me. Get your hands off. Yeah, here's his wallet. It's your pen, ain't it, Ben? Me? Sure, with a trick flashlight. You showed it to me once, remember? Yeah. Look, I found it, I tell you. I found it someplace yesterday. I, I oh, don't stop know... stop trying so hard, Tim. Here's a $50 bill in the wallet. You don't see them very often. George, look, a Canadian dollar. Oh, cut it out. I don't have to see all that stuff. You don't have to be a nice guy, Mr. Roberts. Yeah. Who's kidding who? I recognize him. Sorry, sucker. Okay, Sheriff, that's it. So long, Tim. I'll get even with you, Valentine. Hold on a minute, Valentine. Mm. You're not leaving. While you were out driving with this bird, I got another case. What do you mean? Well, apparently sometime around midnight last night, about 50 miles south of here... That's where Tim McGeehan's wife lived. Well, that's when the doctor says she was murdered. What's that? What'd you say? My wife? Oh, no, she can't be. And at the same time, Tim was committing a robbery a hundred miles north of town. That's what I mean, Valentine. I really need your help. Tim's the only good suspect. But since you proved he couldn't do it, I mean, well... Now you've given him a perfect alibi. Okay, okay, Sheriff. Don't rub it in. And all I wanted was to keep from being played for a sucker. Oh, brother. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a minute. And now, back to George Valentine. 
If your name is George Valentine, you don't enjoy being played for a sucker. And so when Tim McGean comes into your office with a weak-kneed story, you waste no time in turning the tables on him. You take him out to Apple Junction, where you prove that he committed the hitchhike robbery of a salesman north of town. Oh, no, you're no sucker. Not much. Because now you find that at exactly the same time, Tim's wife was being murdered south of town. Ben, you you could have made a mistake, couldn't you? Well, I might have, George. Uh, that's your name, isn't it, George? We had a sales manager once whose name you was... Oh, I mean, uh, when you identified that guy, he's strictly a medium-sized, medium-everything character. You can say that again. Well, uh, you you hesitated. Yeah, I remember you hesitated. Uh, that's right, George. So I did. The man hates that point of finger. Another man has say, put him in jail. Yeah, I know how you feel. But, uh... Maybe you were wrong. Well, huh? now, a man's a fool if he don't say he's wrong once in a while. At least that's what the milkman said to the prize fighter's wife. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, it was late at night. Maybe you were out with some of the boys earlier. Uh, don't remember too well. Tell you a funny thing about me, George. I like a good time as well as the next fella, but not when I'm working. See that? You don't get solid gold watches in my outfit for just flirting with waitresses. No, sir. Last night, I might have been tired, but I was wide awake and alert. Anyway, how do you explain all that stuff of mine? He had it to me. Okay, Ben, okay, Skipper. His uh, wife was quite a dish, I understand. Search me. But she owned an orchard, the sheriff says. Yeah, that's what bothers me most. Tim McGean's the only one to benefit from her death. And he's got a perfect alibi. <laughs> Don't take it so hard, Valentine. We haven't even got a fingerprint crew from the city out there yet. Apparently it wasn't just a cold-blooded murder. No, no. She was strangled and slugged over the head. Crime of passion. It's all it could be where a woman like Doris McGeehan was concerned. So if it wasn't done for a money motive, then I don't see why you think it had to be Tim McGeehan. Angel, I'm going to throw a curve back at that guy if it's the last thing I do. Come on, let's go see where it happened. Okay. Hey, you, Ames. Yeah? Come on with us. Ames? Yeah, McGinn's hired hand. He can show us around. Nice orchard. Not a bad-looking little place. Yeah, careful of the loose board there. Hey, get off the porch. Who is it? Hello, Joe. My deputy. Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Oh, come in, folks. You weren't here yesterday, Mr. Ames? Oh, no, ma'am, not me. Day off. I always go fishing on my day off. Spend the night in the hills. Here, yeah, Mr. Valentine. Here's where the body was. Uh-huh. Who found it? Joe here. Come out to ask a couple questions about Tim after you phoned saying you had him. Wow. Well, it certainly was a fight here, wasn't there? You'll see. Table knocked over and rug kicked up. Yeah, and the front door was open just the way it is now. George, where are you going? Back door. Through here, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Valentine. Yeah. Locked. Hey, what are you doing? I want to shut the front door, that's all. Uh-huh. Latch was on this one, too, wasn't it? What are you driving at? Oh, simple type crime, Sheriff. Uh, Ames, uh, where did you say you were last night? Yeah, well, well up in the hills, I told sure, you. Sure, I know, but, uh... Where are the fish you caught? Well, I only got one. I ate it. Now, looky here. Notice the two glasses there on the table, Sheriff? Yeah? You say Mrs. McGeehan had no particular friends well, or anybody? Well, there's a couple of fellas, but it only took about two seconds to cross them off fast. One was up in San Francisco, the other was a party. Never mind. Of the... I think I know how to wrap this crime up for you fast. And I'll enjoy doing it, too. George, what are you talking about? We're not far from the highway, Valentine. Almost any tranche in her bum could have wanted to... All right, look at the evidence, Sheriff. Mrs. McGean was alone, right? Mm-hmm. Then someone came, a man, but he couldn't have just broken in because both doors were locked. Well, that's true, but If he'd then... been a stranger, there's a telephone. She got a call for help. Besides, whoever it was, she gave him a drink. Well, you got to break Tim McGean's alibi. He hated her, I tell you. They fought lots of times. I've seen him. Ames, I know it'd be nice if we could hang it onto him, but we can't. So who's left but you? Well, now, wait a minute, Sheriff. He paid no attention to her, only worked for well, her. Well, sure, I... was a simple crime. Just because you know him, stop shutting your eyes to the obvious. Well, let go, let go of me. I didn't Ames, do it. Ames, come back well, I didn't. I'm not going to get railroaded. Look out, George. Oh, well, no, you don't. Bust it. Holy smoke. He's such a nice guy. All right, you got your murderer, Sheriff. Lock him up.
Valentine, I know you're sore at me. All right, if I use your one chair, Tim? Oh, sure, sure. Not a very fancy sell, I'm afraid. Tim, now listen to me. I was sore at you, sure. That camera deal, you played me for a sucker. Well, I, I never pulled a robbery before. For a while, I thought maybe it sucked me into helping you with a gratuitous alibi. Mr. Valentine. All right, forget it. Relax, would you? Sheriff will be here in a minute. He's got Ames, all right. What? Yeah, so I uh, I thought I'd better be a nice guy and warn you what the penalty is for armed holdup. Robbing a man of several hundred bucks worth of stuff. But what did you say about Ames? You'd better worry about yourself for a change, Tim. What? Of course, first offense could be heavy. You might be out in a couple of years, but... Uh... Look, what are you driving at? I, I know what a dumb thing I did. Oh, no, no, maybe it was smart. This man, Ben Roberts, got held up last night up north and reported it as soon as he got into town. The early morning papers printed the story. Well, that was quite a break. Good piece of luck. A piece of what? Look, you're getting me all and mixed up. You didn't up come and... to see me until after the banks had opened. Ten thirty, remember? So you'd have had a chance to go get some money, pick up a Canadian dollar and a new camera. After all, the newspaper told you what kind to buy. No, that's not true. I don't know what you're talking about. And then, wh what's that you said about Ames being? Let go of me, will you? Let go of me! Cut it out, Ames. Get in there. Come Sheriff, on. listen. Get me a lawyer. Get the lawyer's not going to do you any get, good. Get me a lawyer. Well, I'll be a... So that's it. He did it. Ames did it. He killed Doris. Now you see what I mean about thinking of yourself? The penalty for robbery, Tim, could easily be five years. You sent for me, George? Mm. Oh, yeah, Ben. Stick around. Uh, you too, Sheriff. I can't get over it. Ames. He never even noticed Doris. Just a hired hand. I, I ran. I didn't even think of looking for him. What did you say? I, I, I mean... Five years, Tim. So how about it? I understand what kind of a spot you were in. The only big suspect for her death... She played around and you hated her, even if you didn't live there anymore. Mr. Valentine, I don't know what... I gave you a start a minute ago, huh? You read about Ben's robbery in the newspaper. You knew nobody would ever believe you unless you had a foolproof alibi. You figured it was better to take a lesser rap in order to make sure of dodging the gas chamber. Hey, hey, what's all this, George? Oh, well, you gave me the idea, Ben. You wouldn't have described the hitchhiker in such general terms unless you really hadn't got too good a look at him. But he had my camera. Well, he was running. He was in the city. He saw a list of what was stolen in the newspaper. He realized he'd fit the vague description. So, he went around and bought the stuff, filed the serial number off the camera so you couldn't check it, and also so I'd be sure to see through his story and nail him. In fact, he hired me to nail him. Holy smoke. Oh, uh, Sheriff, ask the other guy to step in here, will you please? Sure. You, come in here. That's all right. Just stand there in the door. Uh-huh. Medium-sized... About 35. Wearing hat and overcoat. What about it, Ben? Well, I mean, could that guy be the one who held me up? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Who is he? Cop. I dressed up. Okay, thanks, Joe. <laughs> don't that beat all? You know, I'll grant you, it is pretty hard to identify a man. Never when... mind, never mind. I'll tell the truth. Well, now you're getting smart, Tim. Only what happened that made you so sure you had to pull all this? Yes, what did you mean a second ago when you said you ran? You didn't even think of looking for Ames. Well, I, I was there after it happened at Doris. All right, go on. They'll need your testimony. Well, I went down to see Doris last night. I was good and sore. She'd been playing around with guys on the QT. Even if we are separated, it doesn't mean that you can... Well, anyway, my fingerprints are probably all over the house. When I got there, the door was open. She was lying there, dead. I ran, hopped a truck to the city, but I had to make up something, didn't I? And a robbery north of town was the golden opportunity, sure. Brooks, you get all that time? I've got it all, George. What? Sure as that does it. You can turn Ames loose now. I've broken the sucker's alibi. Why, you dirty... Oh, no. George! Cut it out. Cut it out. All right, now take it easy. I didn't say you killed your wife, did I? <laughs> well, what's the matter? There's a fair chance he didn't. He just took advantage of a lucky break, that's all, the holdup. What are you driving at, Valentine? Hasn't it occurred to any of you that the holdup itself might be phony? What's all this? Yeah, that Ben here is just about the type guy who might have been mixed up with Doris McGee on the QT, the big traveling salesman. Oh, 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 George, you're crazy. That last night he could have come into town from the south instead of the north after throwing away his camera and money and a Canadian dollar. Oh, Buster, it sure must have scared you today when the robber showed up. And of all people, her husband. You're going to let him talk like that, Sheriff? I never even met this Doris. 
When we searched you today, Tim, you had Ben's fountain pen, the one with the trick flashlight, remember? But if he took it off me last night when he held me up, uh, I mean... Careful, Ben, careful. Don't get tangled up now. If anybody had stolen it from you, they'd have taken it out of your pocket, right? And if so, why didn't they take that solid gold watch you're so proud of? George, that's right. Hey. Of course, Tim claimed he'd found the pen someplace. Sure, uh, that's So it uh, couldn't have been stolen anyway, huh? Wait a minute. Let me think. Never occurred to me. Found it yesterday, you said, Tim. Come on. Now, I remember. Sometime yesterday, a last Don't night. Don't listen to him. Uh, how would he know? I'm he... trying to remember. Shut up. Where'd you find it? Where, Tim? Someplace around your wife's farm, maybe. Last night, maybe. Wait. Wait, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, sure, the pen. I picked it up. Sure. I know where. Sure. Sure. Mr. Roberts. No. Look out. Get out of my way. I'll kill you too. Damn it, sir. That doesn't go. George. George, I know Ben Roberts is the murderer, but the only trouble is... Look at Tim McGean's face. Like the cat that ate the mouse. Of course, he did make a sucker out of you, but... Brooksy, stick around. In about two seconds, I'll settle once and for all who's the sucker in this case. listening to Let George Do It. You will hear the conclusion of our adventure in just a minute. Mr. Valentine, he confessed, so what's the difference? Uh, tell me now. Where did you find his pen, Tim? Well, you don't need it as evidence. I'll remember eventually, but last night I was so scared and upset... That you don't remember at all. Well, it must have been around a farm someplace. Uh Uh-huh. You just pretended you knew so that he'd... Well, um... it did the trick. Boy, that guy's a real sucker. (laughs) You're pretty good at taking people in, too. Well... But it's so stupid. If you'd come to George in the first place and told him the truth instead of going out to buy that camera and pretending... Robert's phony hold-up story might never have been broken. Ah, he's right, Angel. The way it worked out. So, now I'm all clear. I pick up my $50 bill and camera from the sheriff and walk out. I gamble my whole savings and maybe five years in prison, and now I'm free and don't even cost me a cent. Hmm. Whole savings account, huh? Well, here, uh, look at this. Camera's worth over 200 retail, isn't it? Well, sure, I can get at least... Hey, wait a minute. No, give me that. Oh, no. Here's the receipt you signed. I bought that camera for 25 bucks. Get the picture? <laughs> so long, sucker. You have just heard Sucker Stunt, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey has starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Just in case that voice you just heard didn't mean anything to you, that was George Valentine, with his usual commercial for Let George Do It. Now, before you listen to any more, you better make sure you have your winter woolies handy, because this is indeed a chilling tale. It's called The Marauder, and it's all about a guy who wants to bump off a cat. 
No, I don't mean his wife. I said cat, as in lion, tiger, panther, puma, or alley. Now this may sound pretty silly, but just hold base a while. Then make up your mind. Dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Rafe Saxon. I'm a writer, a very foolish writer, because like all of my breed, I've had a lifelong desire to spend a winter in the woods, to get away from the tensions and fears and neuroses of the city, to live simply with simple, normal people. Well, here I am, a tiny deserted resort in the Lobo Range, and of course, it's all an illusion. I'm surrounded by more tension and fear than I ever knew before. And a friend of mine, the owner of the place, Hans Bjorkman, has become neurotic to the point of insanity. To the point where I can't control him. To the point where all he thinks of is the marauder, the invader, the pirate and cutthroat of the animal kingdom. Mr. Valentine, this man is obsessed by the idea of murdering a mountain lion. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It. Well, if we can only get out of this wind. Yeah, I got a big fire in the fireplace, lady. <laughs> Hey, where'd you leave the car? About five miles back, that hill beyond the Aspen Grove. Oh. Yeah, the road was like glass. It was frozen practically solid. <laughs> hey, couldn't climb it, I know. Up one step and down two. <laughs> it's a funny winter this year. Hardly any snow, just ice cubes and hailstones. And here we go. Doors around the porch. Oh, thank heaven. Hey, I don't think your friend Saxon's back yet. I've been out communicating with nature. <laughs> he's crazy like an Eskimo. Guess he's going to write a book about the South Pole. Hey, is your name Hans Bjorkman? <laughs> uh, me? Oh, heck no, no. He's crazy, too. Everybody is except me. I'm just uh, peculiar. <laughs> hey, here, better wipe your feet. Listen. Hey, George, it's a woman. Something's the matter with it. Uh, what's it sound like to you, city boy? Well, it doesn't sound like a baby crying. What was it? Cat? Cat? Yeah, that's it. Cat, puma, cougar, panther, nuisance. Take your pick. Mountain lion. Mm. Oh. That's a bad winter for everybody, I guess. Hey. Sounds hungry, don't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, so am I. Come on, let's get inside. Only shut that door quick so Bjorkman don't hear it. You mean hear that wail? Why not? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know, mister. Something's going on I don't get the hang of. But on old Hans, here's that long tail out there. He just sort of slides back in his rocker. Yeah, well, search me. I just poke cows for a living. Does Hans own some cattle? No, no, no. A few head and some chickens, that's all. Uh, pairs of them, all in pairs like Noah sitting up in his ark. Uh, but I don't work here, if that's what you mean. I'm waiting for a job for the summer, that's all. Bears hibernate. Why shouldn't we? My name's Peanut. Peanut? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm an uh, indoor-style cowboy. <laughs> I worked two months, make enough playing bunkhouse pinochle to loaf the other ten. <laughs> yeah. uh, why not? I like to mosey around, keep people happy, make them laugh. <laughs> and old Hans, he's he's been good to me a couple of times, so... So, here you are, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew why. Wish I was smart enough to know how to help the old billy goat. Uh, he's old country and always hard to get close to, sort of proud. He uh, built this place here with his own hands. And give me the shirt off his back, but... Gene Apple, anyway. is that them? Uh, what? Did Mr. Valentine... Oh, yeah, yeah, they're here. <laughs> Come on down, Fatty. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been getting your rooms ready, Miss Brooks. Uh, there's some hot chocolate for you on the stove. What? Oh, thanks. Uh, who's that? Tell Hans I'll be right there. Oh, we're fine, thanks. That is wife? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good kid if you don't go for too much brain. <laughs> You see, Hans just disappeared a couple of years ago and brought her back, and uh, here she is. Yeah, she works her head off, too, when she's not worrying about him. Everybody seems to worry about Hans. Yeah. It's over her head, too, I guess. I try to kid her out of it. She don't know what upsets him. Well, nobody knows, except the cat. Oh, here I am. Oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't downstairs when you came in. 
Hello. I'm Olga. Hello. Uh, how do you do? <laughs> well, what, what's the matter? Isn't my hair straight? <laughs> you see what I mean? Everybody's crazy. She says a thing like that and don't even look in the mirror to find out. <laughs> oh, be quiet. Your hair is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid Pinocchio gave us the wrong impression, that's all. He called you fatty. Oh, him. Well, she is. <laughs> well, come on, let's get that chocolate. I chocolate. guess we didn't expect you to be so young, that's all. What? Oh, gosh, I'm 26 already. <laughs> come in, come in. Well, I'm only kissing your wife, that's all. You don't have to point a gun at me. Huh? Oh. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> oh, there, there's nothing to listen to out there except the wind, darling. Of course. Hello, my dear. Well, these, these are Miss Brooks and Mr. Valentine, the friends of Mr. Saxon. How do you do? It's such a pleasure. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Bjorkman. And I am the host, and I am late, and I let in the cold. There is no excuse. Have you poured me brandy, my dear? How are you, Mr. Valentine? My little place is so hard to get to, I'm afraid. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Well, that's uh, quite a gun you've got there. Yeah, yeah, he uses it to put holes in the broad side of his barn, don't you, Hans? <laughs> you are interested in guns? Good, good. Pinnacle and Saxon, they are boys. They don't understand. My rifle from the mail order house. Here, I show you. When a man has a house and his land, he has a gun. Uh, yeah, well, just don't wave it around. Like Wait that. a minute. Uh. Oh, there, there wasn't anything, dear. Shh. Well, if you're listening for that lion... I didn't hear anything, Valentine. No, Hans. Oh, for heaven's sake... Be quiet! Pinochle, all I was going to say was that I did hear it. Sounded like it came from about the same place as the last time. Mr. Valentine... Be quiet, I said! Excuse me, please. I will see you later. Yeah. Yeah, he is out there. We could hear Mr. Valentine and I... Excuse me. Well, hello, everybody. Mr. Saxon. Are you Valentine? Yeah, hello. How do you like my nervous host here? Put it down, Hans. Put it down. No hunting today. There's nothing out there. You have been outside, Rafe. You must have heard it. No, no, no. Just a little wind in the tree. Hans! Look out, you crazy! Give me that gun. I saw him, I tell you. I saw him. Give me that. He left the barn. You couldn't hit anything at that range. Let go of me, I tell you. Let go! Yeah. It is my house. It is my gun. It is up to me to kill the Naroda. So, stay here, all of you. This time I will get him. Oh, brother. He shot past you in the doorway, Mr. Saxon. Maybe it scared you a little, but that's nothing to do. You've seen how he acts. Every day and night for the past week, he's been out trying to find that brute. He doesn't even take time to eat. Well, what's wrong with that? This is his place. He's got a few head of stock to worry about. A hungry lion is dangerous. Why shouldn't he try to kill it? Why should you all pretend you don't even hear it? No, no, listen to me. It's a long story. It isn't what he does, it's how he does it. It's not normal, it's yeah, not... Yeah, yeah, it's too long a story for me to listen to. What? Uh, Mr. Valentine. I'd rather see what happens myself, thanks. Me? I'm going to go out and help Hans run down his marauder. Look, Hans, it's been an hour since I we started. I know. Another circle we go in here. Yeah? Haven't even seen a track yet, have you? Ground is so hard. Look at the sky. It will snow maybe later on. Sure, sure, and by then my feet will be frozen. Hey, Hans, how many chickens or whatever you've got is this thing actually... I have good, strong feelings. Nothing has been touched so far. But he is hungry. You can tell. Can you? You're not much of a hunter. I have worked all my life to build what I have. There's been no time for hunting, but I will find him. I will kill him. Ever think of traps or setting out poison? I will kill him myself. I will kill him and see him die. Well, how about calling in one of the state hunters to get him? I will kill him myself and see him die. You will, huh? He has no place in the world. He's a thief. This place is mine. All my life I've worked on it. But at night, he comes. With his flat yellow eyes. Oh, yeah, I have seen him several times besides this afternoon, snarling, hungry, long as a man. Crouching in the frozen grass. 
A thief, I tell you, with no business to come stealing a thief. All right, all right, all right, calm down. Why should I laugh and stand by when everything I own is threatened? Can't stop it, will you? (laughs) Man's castle is never secure, is it? Uh Is that? Uh, Look at The kitchen door is open. We will not find him tonight. I mean, you can work all your life for certain things and never be sure of hanging on to them. Like her. What did you say? Yeah, standing there in the doorway. Worried about you, I guess. Your young wife. Oh. All right, Olga, we are coming. Uh Uh-huh. She's very beautiful, isn't she, Hans? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure, sure, that's a compliment to you. Hans, did you ever hear of a man getting unreasonably mad at something... When that something isn't the real cause of his anger? I am tired. Please, you you make so many... Taking it out on something, I mean, like the wrong marauder? What? Taking it out in hatred of a mountain lion. I don't understand. Now, come on, come on, Hans, tell me. Whether you admit it to yourself or not, which one of those guys in there are you worried about? Buddy? With Olga. You know which one it is you'd like to call a thief, a marauder? A sneak who comes into a man's home to steal his money? No, stop it! Now take it easy. You can't say things like that! Oh, oh, forgive me. She, Olga, is my wife. You do not understand. She is mine. Forgive me. Oh. Yeah, sure, Buster. I'll forgive you. Only which man is it? Which one do you really want to murder? Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now, back to George Valentine. Marauder, a hungry, dangerous mountain lion. Or is it a man? If your name is George Valentine, you're ready to agree with Rafe Saxon, the man who sent for you, when he said this place, this deserted resort in the frozen Lobo Range, is filled with tension and fear. And you'll also agree that the owner, Hans Bjorkman, is obsessed with the idea of murder. Only murder of what? Or of whom? Now, this isn't the kind of place where one sleeps well at night. Even Claire Brooks. Particularly when... George. George. Yeah, sure, I'm awake. Come on in. Did you hear that? Yeah, shh. It was a rifle shot. Way off. Uh Uh-huh. And the wind's died down. Could have been several miles. Not in that direction, I think. Well, it's so dark. There's no moon. Huh? Mr. Valentine? Well, hello, Mrs. Bjorkman. Wake you up, too? I heard a shot. Where's your husband? Where do you think? The shot woke me up and he was gone from bed. But here, his gun was gone, too. But I found this on the pillow. I know, huh? Oh, here, let me see. Olga, my dear, don't worry. I will be back soon. This time, I know where to go. This time, I will kill him and watch him die. Signed, Hans. George. Yes, Mr. Valentine. How could he know? What could he know now that... Oh, well, I don't understand, but... Listen. He could know what he wouldn't tell me. He could know which one it is that he wants... The lion. Same direction. You got a flashlight, Olga? What? George, wait. I'm going with you. There's a lantern. Wait for me, too. Hey, come on. Step on it. Call Pinochle and Saxon, too. Listen. George, it was a door slammed. The other side of the house. Mr. Saxon isn't in his room, either. One of them just took off the front way. Come on, they're both gone. We'll catch up with George, them. how can you tell what direction? Oh, well, they'd go to find him, too. 
It has to be Hans. He has the only gun for miles and miles, and... Well, if he has found the lion at last... I got a pretty good bearing, I think. Besides, it's snowing a little. Come on, move, friends. We gotta beat an awful lot of brush in an awful hurry. With that ladder. George, wait. Saxon, I... Have you seen Hans? I Have you... know, I know. I heard it. I'm looking, too. I saw your lantern half an hour ago, moving through the trees. And then I lost it. I think you're headed in the no, wrong... No, not, friend. You are. What? Well, I don't know. I was working late in my riding, and in the room, the crazy hoot owl, I, I thought he was in bed. I came tearing sure, out... Sure, to... sure. Just give me your flashlight. Follow us with the lantern. All right, Mr. Valentine. He must have really gone off his head this time. Hans! Hans, can you hear me? Oh, save your press, Saxon. It's still across the field and down toward the little lake, I think. You can see way back on a line with the lights from the house. Ah, snow in the face. Miserable, insane thing to be doing. <laughs> Olga's a wonderful woman. I didn't You're say wrong. anything about Olga. Well, she loves Hans. I know he's older than she is, but she does. Works her head off to make him happy. I told you I didn't say anything about her. But she's beautiful, all right. But then nature's rough. It's always paid off. But you can't protect a home forever when the ages are that far apart. You know the stuff Hans talks about. What should be done to marauders who try to break up the pairs. Yeah. To the strays, the lone ones who try to break up... Hey, Pete, I'll let you. Where are you? By the shore of the lake. Chased out of the house before you did, I guess. But the lights burned out. Here, get over here quick. Here, here, here give me that place. So what is it? George, what's happening? Well, I stumbled. I dropped my light. Look. Look at my hand. What? Yeah, I stumbled on something. Don't you get it? Hans got him. Don't you get it? The marauder. Look! Holy smoke. Look at the size of that mountain lion. So there really was one. Right through the eyes. Hey, hey, look here. He drilled him right yeah, through the eyes. Yeah, sure. Head. Close range. No wonder. Yeah. But look at the paw. The leg practically blown off. Hans must have had the muzzle practically you next to... You want this, George? Yeah, give me that land. I, I can see something over here. Hans. Hans. Yeah, he's uh, he's dead, Mister Valentine. Uh, look, only a few feet away, too. Now the cat must have jumped him. Uh, they will sometimes, you know, hungry, skinny ones like that. That's why he fired so close, George. But not in time. Uh, not in time to keep himself from bleeding to death, you mean? Look at those claw marks. All on right, his... I got eyes. Uh, now, nah, take it easy, city boy. Uh, but we better get him back to the house anyway, don't you think? Snow's getting worse. Sure, sure, it's a bad winter for everybody. Lion and all. Yeah. Here, take this handkerchief. Get some water on it, will you? Oh, sure, sure. Well, there's nothing we could have done, Valentine. It's like Pinochle says. Hans just slid back too far on his rocker. Nature caught up with oh, him. Oh, shut up. George. I'm all right. I'm all right. Just give me his gun there, will you, Saxon? Oh, here. He's still hanging on to it. Huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, here. Uh, here, Valentine. You said you wanted this handkerchief wet. But there's almost enough snow on the ground. To cover things up. I know. Huh? Marauder. <laughs> Poor old crazy Hans. Valentine, what in the name I don't of... know, Buster, I don't know. But stand very still, both of you. Only three shells have been fired, but it's hard to keep you both covered in a place like this. Mr. Valentine. Olga, stay where you are. Your husband was murdered. What? George, what are you talking about? Pinochle, where'd you find the water? Huh? Valentine, if you don't know claw marks when you see Be them... Be quiet, will you? Pinochle, the water, answer me, where? But why in the lake, naturally? Why isn't it frozen like everything else in this godforsaken country? Well, uh, the branches freeze and fall, that's all. They break the ice. They... I'm not that much of a city boy. Well, how should I know? Olga, what... come here. Hold this gun on him. Whatever you say. Yeah. Hang on to my hand, Brooks. Yeah, be careful, Hey, look George. out. That lake's over your head, there. Oh, you know about that, huh? Sure. Here's where the ice is broken. Well, that's just what I got. Now, listen, Pinochle. Three shells missing. 
And that's right. We heard a total of three shots, remember, Brooksy? Over an hour ago, back at the house. That's right, George, but I... the lion screamed after the third shot. You heard it. That's how it happened. Yes. Yes, I... Keep that gun straight. It's hard enough to even see people in this crazy place. But wait a minute. Hans killed the lion with a clean shot through the eyes. Close range, right through his brain. How could he have screamed after? He couldn't. So it doesn't make sense that Hans and the lion killed each other now, does it? Hey, wait a minute. Look here. Marks around the tree. What? Uh, Let me see. A chain or something. Sure, sure, that's it. Hey, get a loose branch there. Hang on again, Brooksy. What are you doing? Another real close shot smashed the lion's leg, didn't it? Or was it already smashed and the shot was just to cover up the marks there might be? I don't know yet, I'm just guessing. But I know one of you guys had nearly an hour alone out here after the shots to set the scene any way you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, there is something. What is it, George? Something that might have been anchored to the tree originally. Something Hans would never use. But if somebody else did, then it would prove Hans wasn't jumped by that lion. He was... Oh, listen to him. Listen to him. Riddles. (laughs) He doesn't make... A chain. And a trap, Angel. A steel trap on the end of it. The trap the lion was in ever since yesterday. Since he'd been screaming from the same place. Yeah, look, even bits of fur still on it. So it was murder. Why would anyone throw a trap in the lake? I'll take it from here, Saxon. Just help me out. Are you crazy? If it wasn't murder, it couldn't have been. There's a gun on you, friend. And I guess you're it, aren't you? Saxon wouldn't have got me here in the first place if he was going to pull one like this. Uh, get away from me, you old coward! Look out, George! Hey, you you get away! He's running! Stop it, Olga. It doesn't do any good for you to kill him. He's gone. He's gone, Valentine. The marauder's gone. He beat us here to the house, all right. You can cut the telephone wires. Yeah, yeah. Leave daylight in a few minutes. Well, I'll start out. But where? He could be hiding almost anywhere outside. Oh, they'll get him. Don't worry, Saxon. Hasn't even got a gun. And if you ask me, he's running. (laughs) Marauder. Strike and run. I guess he did want to break up the family, didn't he? Kill Hans and then try to get Olga. Pinochle must have had that trap out before you even came here yesterday, Valentine. Yeah, that's right. And then he had to go through with it. But, George, how could you have guessed what not even Hans guessed, that Pinochle was really getting ready to murder him? Wording of that note to Olga, remember? Oh. Hans went out after the lion. Said he knew just where to go, just where to get him. Well, how could he have been so sure? Unless somebody had come to him in the night and told him where it was. Pinochle. And he led him out there until they came to where the lion was, screaming in the trap. Yeah. And... Then Pinochle had all the time in the world to... Sure, sure, kill them both. The rest was easy. And it would have worked. Nobody would have investigated. The snow would have covered everything. And the human thief, the worst marauder, might have eventually persuaded Olga to... What's the matter, George? George! smoke. I just figured out why Pinochle stopped by here at the house, that's all. Why? He's running, all right. The keys to my car are gone. to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Come on, chin up, Angel. We parked around this bend, remember? Look, the snow didn't cover all his tracks. You can see where he came. He was running. George, I'm still trying to figure that business of the shot in the screen. Yeah. I mean, no matter how you add it... Doesn't make sense. I know, Brooks. Pinocchio laughed. City boy, he said. Well, that was what started me going, because I thought it was impossible. But I just realized even when we knew about the murder, it was still impossible. Look... Look, the car, it's still down there. He didn't take it. Oh, Lord, no, those tracks. It's nothing. Where are you going?
going? The Marauder, Angel. Well, look at those tracks. Look why Pinochle was running. Something else I should have caught. Lion was in the trap all day yesterday, but Hans saw a lion and fired at it down by the barn around dusk. We just thought he was seeing things. But it was another lion screaming. There he is! There he is! Dead. He couldn't even make it to the car. Oh, no, easy. Don't look at him, Brooksy. Oh, George. It's all right, Angel. It's all right. (laughs) Dangerous thing to be a marauder, isn't it? To murder a husband or a wife. Nature's the same all over, I guess. Everything in pairs. Pinochle was killed by the lion's mate. You have just heard The Marauder, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, did you ever dream that one day you might parlay a few dollars into a couple of thousand? We all have. And we've all reached the same conclusion. It just isn't possible. But don't you be too sure. Because right here and now on our Let George Do It adventure, you're going to hear how one penny was snowballed into a million bucks. It's called, and rightly so, the high price of a penny. And if it doesn't make you think twice before you'll squander that penny the next time you pass a weighing machine... Well, I'll... I'll, uh... I'll just ask you to forget I even mentioned it. Dear Mr. Valentine, how high is the price of a penny? Well, how high is up? I doubt if you can figure it. In fact, I doubt if you'll be much of any good in the present case. (laughs) And if you think I talk in riddles, you're right. However, Mr. Valentine, I'll waste my time by telling you the facts. I'm a prematurely retired lawyer and tax consultant. Neighbors of mine out here in the Fish Lake country, name is Mom, elderly man and wife, they spent a penny once, a number of years ago, on a lollipop. Let me tell you, the price of that penny is going to be more than a million dollars. In plain words, those nice people are going to be taken. But just to really mix you up, I think you and I can stop the swindle with a diamond bracelet. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Telephone the moms. Tell them you're friends of mine and would like like to to come come visit visit the country. country. I'll lay the groundwork. They know there isn't room for you to stay in my place anyway. Maybe you can't do any good, but at least you can wear down your teeth for a change, biting on the penny. Sincerely, Amos W. Fell. Mm, spoken like a lawyer. He certainly has a lot of faith in you, doesn't he? Million dollar penny, diamond bracelet, lollipops. <laughs> faith in your curiosity. <laughs> well, come on, come on, Brooksy. Hand me the phone. Look, Mr. Valentine, they're not home, I said. Well, when will the moms be home? When they get tired of being where they are now. And don't ask me where that is, because I don't know. 
playing 500 maybe or helping somebody pickle some peaches. I don't know. They get all kinds of fascinating ways to spend their time. Well, who's this speaking? One of the servants? Mister, just call back later, will you? But I'm a friend of Mr. Amos Feld, and I wanted and to talk to you. And the housekeeper isn't here either, in case you're thinking of beating Feld's time with her. Sure, sure, Mr. Valentine. I'll be a good boy. I'll write it all down. You're too kind. Yeah, and don't be insulted. I'm right in the middle of a poker game, and my luck isn't good. My name is Clifford. I'm the mom's nephew. Come to live here for a while, so don't worry. They'll get your message all right. Clifford, huh? Yeah, yeah. Good night. Keep them rolling. Well, let's see. Maybe there is a penny. A bad penny. Name of Clifford? Yeah. Come on. We're not going to wait for an invitation. You're listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and our Let George Do It adventure. place is around here somewhere. Road to the right, I think, Mr. How about Mr. Amos Fell? He has a small cabin or something. Gosh, I don't know. It's kind of late. My mother will be mad. Well, Fish Lake, you must know where that is. Kid your age in the summertime. Well, sure, mister. That's where I was today. I'm so late walking home. I got a bed on with another kid, see? And using only worms, I got three of the best looking... (laughs) Yeah? Trout? Well, where are they? Well, anyway, it's the road to the right. First turn to your left. It's pretty far. I hope you had better luck than I did, but I'll bet you don't. Here's a turn, George. Yeah, so dark you can't see the signs. Everybody wishing us bad luck. I doubt if you can do much good, says Mr. Fell. And that boy, there was something funny about the... George! Stop. What was it? Not on the brush there. I don't know. It looked like lightning. Somebody with a flashlight, maybe. There. Again. I'll find out quick enough. George, be careful. There is Easy. Yeah, take your own advice. Those rocks are loose. Hey there. Stand still. You're messing up the scenery. The birdie don't like it. What you? in the... Oh. Hey. All right. All right, pass on, pass out. I don't care. Flash bulb, that's what it was. At this time of night, for heaven's sake, taking pictures it of ain't what? for nature, study lady. Stand away from the fender there, will you? The fender? George. Yeah. Used to be a fender. Brother, what a wreck that must have been. My car must have rolled all the way down from the curb. I know, it's horrible, but stand back. That's it. You've got to get it from this angle. Car didn't roll, lady. It bounced. What about the people? There's there's blood in there. It's a bad corner. Over it went. That black top rolled slippery in the evening. Oh, they hauled them out hours ago. Hauled them out dead. Oh, no. George, it's such a big car. Should be. Belongs to the Morms. What? What did you say? Man and his wife live up the road, sole occupants of the car. Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Morm, real nice and real rich. Only long about sunset, they clipped their last coupon. But listen, Buster, we were on our way to see the Morms. We... Say, who's been there? Who investigated? Highway Patrol and the city police both. Now, if you'll let me finish up, get pictures of the skid mark. Well, what did they say? What did they find? He was driving. That's what they said. Mrs. Mom killed instantly, sitting beside him. You know how it is. Steering wheel gave him a break for an hour or so, I guess. What do you mean? Found his body where he crawled back up toward the road to flag a car for help, I guess. Only trouble is there aren't any cars on this road, so he just died there. But why? An accident, my friend. No other traffic. They just slipped going around the corner. Ask the police if you don't believe me. Phone in the next house down the road half a mile. Slow down, will you, Buster? Why'd they leave you behind to take pictures if they were so sure it was just an accident? I'm losing my sleep for the insurance company. They want pictures to close their report, and they'll want to know what I see nosing around. And you know what it is? Nothing. Not nothing. Now you're happy? No. Come on, Brooksy. This was no accident. (laughs) 
If it's murder you're thinking of, you won't do any good around here. Waste your time being wrong, that's all. It's an accident. I'm coming. Yes. Uh, I just wondered if we could use your telephone for a minute. There was a wreck half a mile up the road some time ago, and I wanted to... <laughs> Valentine. That's who you are. George Valentine. Mr. Fell? Yes, come in, come in, come in. How convenient I live so close, huh? Well, we didn't expect... To enjoy my meager hospitality? Place is much. Tired for bad health, you know. So I confine my extravagance to doctor bills. But I'm happy. Sit down, sit down. You're happy, huh? Yeah, I know. Bad taste. I heard about the accident. Shame, wasn't it? However, that's the way it goes. Nothing we can do. It's all over now. What was it in the first place, Mr. Fell? Hmm? Oh, you mean... The double talk in your letter. Bad pennies and bracelets. And you kept saying there was nothing we could do even then. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm a skeptic, Miss... Um... Brooks. Oh, yes, of course. You were worried about this guy Clifford. This nephew of the moms. Was that it, Mr. Fell? Worthless tramp. Of course, that was it. He was the one the moms bought a lollipop for 15 or 20 years ago. And he's been trying to get something better out of them ever since. He's one of those young men watches every angle. You know what I mean. Counts every penny. He came to live with them. They were suckers, I told you. Well, Mr. Mom made a lot of money. And the boy was his relative. But he even took in the missus, too. I tried to warn them, but they wouldn't listen. And I could stop the swindle with a diamond bracelet, you said. It's all over. What difference does it make? Yes, yes, that's what I wanted you for. Kid never earned a penny in his life. But bought a bracelet for Mrs. Mom. And was she impressed? I tell you, he's the kind who plays every angle. But uh, how did he pay for That's it? That's what I meant, Miss Brooks. Diamonds. But how did he pay for them? Fair size one, too. Well, I checked into him a little. He's tangled with the law once or twice. I had an idea you might be able to find his little gift wasn't exactly legal where he got them or... Uh... <laughs> What's the matter? What was my angle... Is that what you're thinking? Well, their housekeeper is a friend of yours, isn't she? <laughs> you haven't got a job anymore, so you don't have to be wrong. She is, and so what? My angle was trying to make the blinders off some nice people, that's all. Mr. Fell, I want to check what the police had to do. Don't be a detective, will you? Mr. Mom's sole heir after his wife was Clifford. What? And her sole heir was Clifford, too. Don't you understand? They're both dead now. What can you do? The bad penny is going to collect his million dollars. The penny is already cashed in. I know it looks fishy, but... Look, time. Lieutenant Riley. The best accident men on the force say there's not one chance in a million that it was anything but an accident. This Clifford may have figured his chances, and there are some other angles we don't know no, about. No, 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 no. The doctors and lab men were in on it, too. Injuries sustained in the accident were what killed them both. First her in the front seat, they figure. Then him when he tried to make it up to the highway for help. What made their car go over? A normal skid at normal speed. Now, look. You can't tamper with a car to make it go over at a certain point, can you? No, but you... You can't scare somebody off the road without making them jam their wheels sharp so it'll show, can you? I tell you, Valentine, it was absolutely nothing. I know, I know, an accident. My client says there's no more job for me. You say go home and forget it. So maybe I can't do any good out here. Or can I? George. Oh, I don't know. See, a hunch is a hunch is a hunch. You going to go around and see Clifford before Oh, you... that's the trouble. Why? On what excuse now? He's got his money, or he will have it as soon as the probate and tax boys get through with it. No, I'm afraid he'd just throw us right out on our rear... Hey. Huh? That photographer, what did he say his name was? Clem? Yes, but I don't understand... You weren't watching the road, Angel. What? Well, his car's gone. He's not... Oh, George! Yeah, his car's gone, but he's not... It must have just happened, Roxy. He's... No. No, he's dead already. Oh. The photographer who took pictures of the scene of the accident has been accidentally murdered.
You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine. You're bound to be wrong, says everyone, from your client, Mr. Fell, to Lieutenant Riley. And maybe they're right, because Mr. and Mrs. Mom are dead, the result of an automobile accident. Well, if your name is George Valentine, you don't like it much, but how can you argue? The mere fact that Mr. Mom was worth more than a million dollars, does that make him the victim of murder? No, no, a million times no. Only now the other man who sang that same refrain, the photographer, Clem, has been found dead. And this time at police headquarters, there's no argument when you say that it's murder. Looked like he'd been hit from behind, Riley, by a rock or something. His camera, that's what it was. My sergeant found it thrown in the brush a few feet up the road. Uh Uh-huh. Somebody grabbed the camera. There was a fight. What about the car? His car was gone. Up the road, Angel. They found that, too. Oh, they did? Abandoned. Whoever it was took the car to get away fast. Yeah, they must have seen us coming. Only, Riley, why do you suppose... Oh, no, no, you don't. Oh, don't ask me why he was killed. Obviously, he must have been taking pictures of something that was... We looked around there and we didn't see anything. Any film in his camera? Of course not. Or in his car either. It was all cleaned out. Well, Riley, I've noticed that sometimes a photographer working fast shoves exposed packs in his hip pocket. Yes, yes, I've noticed that too, and I've already checked, and he did. But you know what it was? Huh? A couple of films with specks on them, overexposed. Mm-hmm. Still, he was killed because he was taking pictures. Miss Brooks, whoever was watching the photographer, whoever killed him also must have killed whatever scrap of evidence there was to prove the mom's death wasn't an accident. So now you see where we are, huh? <laughs> Nowhere. Okay, okay, then, Riley, let's start all over again. In fact, I'm going to start from scratch with the penny. Clifford, I want to see that bracelet you gave your aunt. All right. Isn't much. Must be someplace around here, my answer. I don't understand. She wore it most of the time. Oh, don't worry. It's someplace here, Mrs. Booth. Tell me, where'd you get the money for it in the first place, Clifford? Oh, I'm here and there. What's the deal? Nothing. Just wanted. You uh, might try the other dresser. Yeah, yeah. Got a dozen diamonds, Mr. Valentine. Nicest thing anybody ever gave me, she said. How to get on a woman's good side. Or into a woman's will. But I bought it legitimately, despite what Fell thinks. Uh Uh-huh. I'll tell you what the secret was. Picked it up on a race sale. Every diamond in it was a second and had a flaw, a chip of some kind. (laughs) Cost me exactly $600. Flaw? But she never knew that. You never told her that. Why should I? (laughs) <laughs> she couldn't see the difference. Oh, Clifford, you're a great boy. Indian gifts real close to the chest. George. Yeah, Brooksy? Lieutenant Riley called. He said no. What? Look, what's all this? Clifford, you better keep looking for that bracelet. Miss Brooks means that they didn't find it on her body. Your aunt wasn't wearing it when she died. Well, I'm sure it's just mislaid. But it's... you just uh, can't find it. Yeah, I know. Well, maybe I'll find it myself. <laughs> Let me see those negatives, Riley. Hey, hold the flashlight. Yeah, here we are. Films with specks on them. George, it'll be dawn pretty soon. You'll see better. Overexposed, I said. Uh, I'll grant you I'm no expert. I see them all right, Angel. Easy enough mistake, Riley. Only it bothered me that a professional photographer would make a mistake with a couple of his pictures and still put them in his pocket. Hmm? Wait a second. These negatives. But those are white. Transparent. Well, that's what I meant, that he'd end up with a black print. Except for a couple of specks. Two. One there, one there. Hey, this is a little blur in the corner. It must be this skid here. Yeah, yeah, now we're oriented. It's a picture of the road, it is, isn't it? That's right, Angel, looking straight down on it. Ah, uh, then the speck should be right about... Hey, there's nothing here oh, now. Wait a minute, knife mark. There was something, see it? And huh? the tar here? Huh? The other one, just a foot over there. 
Some later car tracks have mashed it down a little, but... The diamonds, George, what else would he have taken a picture of? The two specks? Only they're so far apart. Well, the bracelet might have been broken. We know she generally wore it. Well, there's nothing here now. That's a cinch. Either the photographer dug them out of the road, or whoever caught them here being curious did it. Hey, uh, hey, Sergeant. Yeah, Lieutenant. Get those men closer in here. Have them beat every bush. Not much luck, Lieutenant, unless you call this luck. What are you talking about, Sergeant? It's a long way from water, but their beauty's all right. What? Three fish. What? Hey, give me those. Uh Aha, that does it. We got enough riddles, and you come up with... With fish. Fish, sure, of course. Three of them. Huh? Remember, Brooksy? The kid said, I caught three beauties today. Only we thought he was just telling a tall story, because where were they? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing makes sense now, Riley. Diamonds and all. Only come on, move fast. There's a kid we gotta find before the murderer figures it out and finds it first. Hey, there he is, fishing. Hey, you. He's, he'll scare more. Oh, it's you. Yeah, yeah, it's me, kid. What in the heck? That's is... nothing. Just somebody shooting. Game Warren will get him. Only. Mister, what do you want with you? Get down. Up on the ridge. Keep him up on the ridge. Go on, Riley. We're all right. Get him. Sure, Mr. Valentine. I'll, I'll tell you anything. Okay, kid. Let's see the diamonds. I didn't know they were them. I would have told you. Sure, somebody. sure, sure. You didn't know who they belonged to. Six, seven, eight, nine of them, huh? They were just scattered there by the side of the road. Not any of them down the grade where the wreck was? Oh, no, sir. I didn't think there was any connection with that. There was a clasp, a catch thing. Here, see? It was caught in one of them low bushes by the road. The diamonds were just scattered along from there. Yeah. Hey, did you find anything, Riley? Oh, three empty shells. But whoever it was shot at the kid's gone now. By the time we climb out of the brush here... By the time we do, you can make an arrest, Riley. Mr. Valentine, before you say anything to Clifford here... I think you ought to know that he couldn't have killed his aunt and his uncle. He was playing cards at the time of their death. Well, I was playing cards with him. What's all this? And so were some other men. Oh, Valentine. Here we go again. The whole case hangs on the mom's death not being an accident. On all this other stuff being a cover-up for the fact that it wasn't. Riley, take it easy, will you? It was an accident, all right. There's no argument. You and the experts persuaded me a long time ago. What's that? And, Mr. Fell, you told me a lot of other things, I believe, too. That Clifford here do anything for a few pennies. Get as much money from his aunt and uncle as possible. But how in the world... The whole case hangs on a few low-grade diamonds, Riley. That's why the photographer was killed. That's why Clifford tried to get at the kid. Only we beat him to it. And that's why you're a sucker staying around to listen to this, Clifford. Go on, Mr. Valentine. Sure, sure. You're just counting on one thing, that we'll never figure why that cheap bracelet is so important. Well, I know why. Double inheritance tax. What? Yes, What's that? That's right. Every penny counts. Every hundred thousand dollars. It's the location of the bracelet that tips it, isn't it, Clifford? Is it? It's who died first, your uncle or your aunt. But we know that she did, remember? She was in the front seat, and he tried to get up to the road for help. Finally, that accident wasn't discovered for several hours. Huh? Well, suppose it was discovered first by the ambitious miser here. Suppose he was all happy about seeing him dead. Until he noticed a terrible thing. The uncle was in the car. The uncle died first. Hey, and it was Mr. Mom's money. So legally his wife would inherit. And then it would be passed on to Clifford. Now you're getting it, Riley. No matter how close their deaths were, a few minutes or an hour, both wills would have to come into play when the estate would be settled. And that means two taxes. You know what the tax is on a million-dollar inheritance? You weren't out just to save pennies, were you, Clifford? Because what you found was your aunt up by the side of the road. Now, wait a minute. How else could her bracelet have got caught and broken on a bush unless she was the one who died last, who struggled up that embankment for help? So it's pretty simple, isn't it? All you did was change the bodies around. So we think she died first and Clifford would inherit from his uncle... 
And we would think... It was a body switch, Riley. A little investment in this future, that's all. Only the interest got compounded, didn't it, Clifford? You overlooked a bracelet. And then a photographer didn't and began to get curious. He might have even figured it out. And when you counted the diamonds he'd found mashed into the road, there weren't enough. So you had to run frantically someplace else, someplace we almost led you. To the kid who picked him up and couldn't see any harm in keeping him. Yeah. Yeah, a gun makes a lot of difference, don't it? Go on, talk away, Mr. Valentine. Talk to yourself for a change. You won't get away with this. Let him go, Riley. But he's got a car. I said let him go. As if there were any argument. Much obliged, friend. Keep him rolling. Valentine of all us. Hold off, will you? <laughs> Keep him rolling, he says. There's a lad. <laughs> I can see him from the window here. He won't get it very far in that car. What's that? He's got a flat tire, Riley. Yeah. <laughs> Nine diamonds from the boy, two mashed into the road. That makes 11. But there were 12 in the bracelet. The high price of a penny. The extra diamond. He's got a flat tire. He found it. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. I grant you that a diamond is sharp enough, but one from that bracelet would be so small it just couldn't have... <laughs> but it did. You saw it happen. You saw them catch him. Yes, Miss Brooks. It was the stone, all right. Well, but... no, it, uh, it would have been neat, Mr. Fell. Uh, retribution and all that stuff, but... You see, Clifford had a flat tire because I let the air out of him. Huh? Oh, no, now, look. When did you have a chance oh, to... Oh, a whole lot earlier. You see, I took the precaution, that's all. But how did you know then that it was he who... Oh, I played safe and let the air out of your tires, too. Oh. Mr. Fell, we're skeptical of clients who keep insisting we're bound to be wrong. Oh. Uh, uh, I didn't want to say it, Mr. Valentine, but now I'll have to. This business of double inheritance tax. Oh, sure, I know. It's your field, not mine. Uh, but... There was a recent ruling. You made the same mistake Clifford did. I mean, about saving all that inheritance tax. What? Oh, it's a perfectly logical mistake. You and he would have been absolutely correct until recently. Courts decided in a case like that that the same money can't be taxed twice. Oh. Then, then Clifford didn't have to move the bodies or kill the photographer. That's right. And it's only because I was wrong that I was able to put myself in Clifford's place and figure out his motive. That's right. But what difference does it make? Lieutenant Riley caught Clifford and he confessed and... Now, one thing sure. George, you and I are going to have this dance and forget all... <laughs> oh. No music. <laughs> Angel, this seems to be the kind of case where everybody's bound to be wrong. You have just heard The High Price of a Penny, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details.
You know, for the last two days, I've been beating my typewriter trying to think of a way to let you in on our adventure without spoiling the plot. But after using up several reams of paper, I find that it just isn't possible. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to tell you a thing, except that this is Let George Do It. And if you like to root for the underdog, you better start pulling for old George. Dear Mr. Valentine, that ad of yours gets me. No job too tough for you to handle. <laughs> well, I don't believe it. I got a tiger I'll bet you can't handle. Yeah, you read it right, a tiger. So unless you're just whistling in the wind, stick her on your office tonight. Meet me around 7.30. I got a wife and kids to worry about, so don't fail me. Signed, Jerry Briskin. Signed, Jerry Briskin. 7.30. No, around 7.30. Uh-huh. How many stripes on a tiger? 40, George. He's only 40 minutes late. That's not so bad. Probably hired Frank Buck instead. We make a lot of sense, too, don't we? Huh? Want to play gin rummy? Oh, why is it, Brooksy? We never get letters that tell anything. He's got a case. Why doesn't he say so? Change his mind, maybe. Who knows? Jerry Briskin. Want to bet he never even shows up tonight? Um, $5. I'll bet $5. Give me that phone. Hello? Valentine, is Briskin. You're late. I just want to make sure you're still in the office. I got held up. Couldn't get any of your building because of the crowds. Slow down, will you? What? What crowds? Hey, look, just sit tight, will you? I'll be right there. Honest, I will. Sure, sure. Bring your tiger, too. But what's this oh, about... Oh, just a crowd. I don't know. Something going on. Police and everything. But I'll come around the back way. Hey, look, Briskin, you... Well, you owe me five dollars, don't you? Not yet, I don't. What are you going to do? Jump out the window to avoid paying me? George, what's going on? I don't know. The street seems to be roped off down there. There are no fire engines. Yes, or... there is. One small one. See it? Yeah. And they got a searchlight pointed at the door. What in the name of... Booksy, Booksy, look. Around there to the right. It's a woman on the ledge. She's the one who screamed, George. That's not all she's doing. Hey, look at the way she wobbles. They've got her in the searchlight. She's going to... Here, maybe she can hear us from here. Hey. Hey, lady. Still 10 or 15 feet away. Lady, can you hear me? I'm over here. Hey, look, this way, will you? Oh, did George, she sees you. She stopped moving. Shh. Yeah, hello there. Now, look, uh, keep your eyes on me, lady. Don't mind all that noise down there. Now, keep your eyes on me and just keep moving toward me. No. It's all right, it's all right. The ledge is wide enough for you to get here. No, no, no. George, she wants to jump. She wants to kill herself. Look, look, lady. Nothing can be as bad as this cold wind up here. Now, come on. Easy does it. Don't come near me. Oh, George, what can we do? I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm not scared. Oh, Brother Looney is a coot. Oh, listen, people are coming out in the hall. Yeah, and it's liable to scare her, too. What are you talking about? I've walked all the way around the building. Do you know that? I bet you would be afraid to do that, wouldn't you? No. No, I don't think so. George, what are you doing? Get back in here. I don't get dizzy very easy. But I'm probably not as clever as you are. Oh, George, please. Are you coming to walk with me? Yeah. Yeah, sure, that's it. A little stroll in the park. I've never been dizzy. There's nothing to this, see? Look out, lady. Don't have to hold me. My, you're good looking, too, aren't you? Only, only... No, it's all right, lady. Those are just firemen to the rescue in my office, that's all. Come on now. Easy does it. Yes. Just another step. Only I feel so... Hey, look. I, I got you. Oh, lady, what a time to faint. Hurry up, George. Here, I, I can help you. I got her all right. That's it, boys. Get it. Get that picture. Photographers. Hey, clear out of here, you guys. This all is right, no time to... a little higher, will you? That's it. Huh? Where have I heard your voice before? Come on, Buster, give me a hand. My with name this. is Briskin here. Now remember, boys, when you write captions, call her the Tigers of the Trapeze, world's greatest aerialist. World's great. Hey, what in the name of I heaven? I told you I wasn't scared. Were you, darling? Huh? No, no, don't drop me. Hold me tighter. That's it. <laughs> the lady fainted. <laughs> Publicity. So that's it. Why, you That's dirty... it, that's it. Get it, boys. Get him to get the expression on his face. Ha! Ah! Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> and thank you, Phyllis Fosdick. You 
are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and our Let George Do It adventure. Oh, now let me go, Valentine. Let go, I said. You got plenty of money. hundred ain't enough for you. Okay, we'll make it two. It's worth it. Press agent, 5,000 bucks. Couldn't stop me Look, from stop doing... stop it, I said. I got a wife and kids. Oh, you shut up. It's a job, that's all. I got rid of them all, George. She went down to buy all the photographers a drink. Oh, she did. Bully for her. Now, look, Valentine, you can't sue her. You just get laughed at. Buster for two okay, cents. Okay, okay, so you look a little silly in a few front pages. It's publicity, ain't it? And for you, too. She's pulled that stunt in every city she's played. You mean you pick a sucker in every no, town? No, no, and then... no. They're walking around the building, it's all. You were something extra. Oh, come on. How could I resist that silly ad of yours? <laughs> hey, how about the faint she pulled, huh? Oh, I tell you, she's a great little artist. Briskin, that silly face of yours. All right, is about all right. To be... Pay you two fifty. Will you cut it out? Ah. Wow. Brooksy, I thought you said you got rid of everybody. I am here. Yeah. But I wait. No, let me go. Go on, friend. Beat it. I wait to see you. You hold her. Huh? I follow. I am here. I see everything. Who are you? A man going crazy. Beat it, you big moose. The party's over. Go on, get out of hold here. It, get hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, hello. Your name's Fedor, isn't it? Yeah. Leave us alone. I see how this man hold her. What in the name of heaven? Wait a minute, Fedor's a husband, I think. Third or fourth, and it's living fast. Well, 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 husband. Another tiger, I suppose. Well, uh, look, Fedor, just shut the door quietly, and don't get your tail pinched as you leave. George! Mm. Oh, uh, upset about something, aren't you, Fedor? I traveled 200 miles to get here. Who are you? You said that before. Never mind who I... Ah, jealous, is that it? Didn't like the way I held it. I can see. I have heard the talk. Who are you? It was you? his idea, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This guy, this this uh, Jerry Briskin. He and your wife are just like that. Who? <laughs> Probably her lover, for all I know. So long, everybody. No, wait, wait. Fido, I'm, I'm very pleased to meet you. I mean, well, I, I got a wife and kids, you understand? I'm your wife's new press agent, that's all. Keep talking, sucker. I do not understand. Neither do I, big man, but then I only met your wife tonight when he brought her here. So, you you know how these things are. Talk it over with him. Uh, him? But it's... I'm good. sorry, Valentine, this guy had an accident once. If, if Fado, my name is Briskin, our new press agent. That's uh, all I... Look out! Uh, oh. George! Hey, hey, cut it out. Wait a minute. Cut it out. You crazy big bad fool. What's the idea? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Leave me alone. Leave you alone? What about me? Here's the one. You said he is the one, he and my wife. Oh, well, it wasn't true. He just made it up. I don't know anything about your wife or about this guy who deserved to get kicked around a little, so who cares? Or for that matter, about any of this cockeyed business. I am sorry, I said. I am so tired, I travel all day. I make fool of myself, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, uh, good night. Valentine Fate is her husband, Estella's husband. That's her name, Estella. Only had an accident a couple of months ago. This is as I understand it. Yeah. I am strongest man in circus. Uh-huh. Only you got dropped on the head. Oh, be careful, George. Look, he's been in a hospital. Hasn't been with a circus. Look, look, look. I don't care who's been where. Now, get out. Get out, both of you. Please. Please, uh... I love her. She's my wife. All right, sure, that's great, that's fine. Every man to his own mistake. On the telephone, she said she's too busy to see me. She's my wife. Well, take it up with Dorothy Dix. And now you say that Fado, this Fado, man... Fado, we've been through that. He told you it wasn't true. It's not me, I'm a press agent, not her partner. Her partner? So? Oh, now look, both of you, will you quiet. please? She work with partner now. Is that true? There is partner. Look, will you just leave me out of it, Fedor? I work for a living. No, tell me. Get your hands off him. What do I have to do? Point a gun at you two to get you out of here? Okay, Valentine, we'll leave. I'll go first. No. 
No, not yet. Okay, if you guys think I'm kidding. No, 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 please. You, you, you don't have to threaten. I'm sorry. It is lonely in hospital. I, I'm all confused. I need help. The man's bored with your story, Fader. So long, Valentina. I'll send you a check in the morning. Wait, I say. Mr. Valentine. You don't have to get behind your desk like that. I don't, huh? I don't know what to do, but it would be easier with gun. Oh, watch him, watch him. Hey, hey, get away. Right off, cut it out, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easier with gun. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Put that gun back here before I... Holy, holy smoke. There is a lover, you know, and fate has got your gun. Now look what you started. Look what I started. What did you say? Well, somebody's liable to get murdered. Well, brother, I should have finished this part of it earlier, shouldn't I? <laughs> All right, Brooksy, don't look at me like that. First a sucker, then a sour puss. I know, I know. I just don't like being thrown into the middle of a three-ring circus, that's all. Not with all the animals running loose. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. A press agent named Jerry Briskin gets you mixed up with a woman named Estella, tigress of the trapeze, world's greatest aerialist. Yes, if you happen to be George Valentine, and sometimes you wish you weren't, you're picked for a sucker in a publicity stunt. The only trouble is you can't get out of it because the tigress has a mate, and he has your gun. Well, it isn't the price of a gun that bothers you. It's the thought that you may never get it back because sooner or later it may be tied up as Exhibit A in a murder case. And so you decide you'd better find out about the corpse elect. Who it might be, for instance. All right, this way, ladies and gents. See the girly girly show? A partner, huh? Ask Estella herself. She'll tell you who her boyfriend is. Today's boyfriend. Quite a man-eating tiger, that girl. She's doing her act over in the main tent, huh? Yeah, great performer, lady. Great. What's the name of this part? Uh, uh Stella, she's got nerves like iron. <laughs> a picture of her walking around the outside of a building in the newspaper. You seen it? What's the matter, Mike? You got nausea or something? It makes him dizzy just to think about it. Just tell us where we can find this partner of hers. Well, he's busy catching her naturally. That's the act. That's always been a rack. Three flips and she lands in his arms. A lucky stiff king for a day. Hey, right this way, gent. See him shimmy and shake. His name's Ferrelli. Flying Ferrelli. <laughs> Flying for Ellie? Bah, couldn't fly a kite. Sixty dollar a week bum, but big and good looking. All her assistants have been bums. She's the act, top number in the business. But I could tell you a lot better if I could look in your tea leaves. Oh, you're doing fine, thanks. Circus must be a small world. There's something in store for you, dearie. What could it be? Just give me a chance to read your... Well, ain't that pretty? Yeah, lettuce leaf, nice and green. And so easy to read, too. Mister, Theodore, he was one of her assistants once. Big, stupid thing. Always jealous like that. But a bark don't mean a bite. Her husbands don't last long, huh? Well, nothing happens to them, if that's what you mean. Fedor's the only one got dropped on his head. Yeah, and about that time, she was getting sick of my bet. George, what are you driving at? Oh, it was an accident to Fedor, all right. 
You don't catch me gossiping about my dearest friends. No, I'm sure. You uh, worried about something happening? Why don't you wait outside the big tent for Stella herself? Or go over there in that palace she calls a dressing trailer. I can tell from the music she'll be on in a minute. I'm not that worried, thanks. Oh, don't want to get uh, mixed up yourself, huh? Ha, 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 she won't even see Fedor now. All through with him. So he won't come out here hanging around too close. I know he won't. Okay, thanks, lady. You fill me in. How do you know it? What's to stop him? Who reads the tea leaves? You or me? Neither one of us. The cops I already sent for. That's quite an act she's got. Yeah. Even wears a tiger skin. Yeah. Not much of it. Uh, George, what did you mean back there asking people about Fedor as though you thought he's accident? Nothing. Nothing, Angel. I won't question his accident. And I think he's ugly, too. But when you throw away all the trimmings, this is nothing but a love triangle. Check. Well, nobody will thank us for interfering. Yeah, not even Briskin. And he's on the outside. But you know, sometimes in a triangle, Brooksy, the guy who looks like a villain is really the one who's liable to come out on the short end. Oh, here we are. Come on. Well, she's not even through taking vows yet. Look at her. Blowing kisses Never like... Never mind. A... We'll do without... Uh-oh. Here he comes. Oh, the other part of the triangle. Yeah. He doesn't stay for the applause, I guess. Uh-huh. Kind of in a hurry, too. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Ferrelli. Hey, sorry, no time now. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, sorry. But I want to talk I'm to sorry. you. I'm sorry. What on earth... Now he's running, George. Got out fast, didn't he? Looked like he'd seen a ghost. Say, maybe there is something brewing George, out here. George, can... look out! Oh, no. Ooh. Ooh. So I get the gun back after all. Over the head. It was Fedor, George. Oh. You were in the way and he I went... heard you, I heard you. I'm so happy you can hear. You can join the party. Who let you in, Lieutenant Johnson? I let myself in. George, Fedor didn't drop the gun. He he just hit you and kept on running. He was chasing Ferrell. Huh? You send for cops to find a big homicidal nut running around loose. So who has to do the work? Me, naturally. Hey, hey, one at a time, will you? What do you mean? You got him? Yeah, yeah, just this second. One of the boys reported. What happened? George, what happened was murder. Murder? Well, I had to take care of you first, naturally, and so I stayed with you. And you were here in the infirmary when I saw Lieutenant Johnson, maybe half hour later. Sure, sure, but... Ah. Oh, he caught him, huh? Simple as that. Fedor shoved me out of the way and went after Ferrelli and got him. And now you've caught Fedor. George, it's not that simple. I mean, it's Estella who's been murdered. Right here, sir. Through the gate. What's over there? Elephant, sir. Oh. Where's Estella's body? It's not out here in the dark. Back it's... in the trailer, George. Your dressing room. Hold it. I'll tell you later. Well, well, look who's here. The moose. Uh, Fedor's not saying much, sir. He can't. Neither one of them can. Neither one of them? Sure. Ferrelli, too. Apparently, he came scanning over the wall in the dark and Fedor after him. All right, come on. Come on. Get on your feet. Yeah. Hey. Give me your flesh. This on. is very interesting, Valentine. Estella was struck over the head with a blunt instrument five minutes after you were. Boy always brings her coffee right after her act, and there she was. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Look at these two guys. Ooh, pretty bloody. That's how we found them. The guard heard the shot. Grazed Fedor's leg. They were fighting over the gun. They were fighting, period. Husband and lover. Sure, sure, fighting. Still at it a few minutes ago. Well, what's the matter, Valentine? Don't you get it? Yeah. Yeah, I get it all right, Johnson. And it isn't simple at all. Fedor was chasing Ferrelli five minutes before Estella died. Now, later on, we find they've practically been killing each other. So how could either one of them have killed Estella? Hold on, hold on a minute, that way, please. 
Oh, oh, please, boys. No pictures, I said. No pictures. It isn't good for the circus. What's the matter, Briskin? For once, you don't want publicity for the tiger? Look, stop it, will you? I got a wife and kids. Get your pictures later, boys. Let's get in here. Okay. Uh, sure. Quite a night, huh, Valentine? You should know. You started it. This where she was found, Johnson? Yeah. Okay, Sergeant, you can let those punching bags sit down. Now, wait a minute, somebody. I'd like to say something. Well, it speaks. Make it snappy, Ferrelli. He... He wasn't with me all the time. Huh? What's that? No, you see, I spotted him in the big tent at the end of the show. You see, one of the clowns, he told me that uh, Fedor just found out about who I was and everything. Anyway, I see him come after me. I know what kind of a guy he was from his tale, but he don't catch me. I mean, when I run, but it was not until 10 or 15 minutes later that he caught up with so me. So you weren't together when she was killed. Now we're getting someplace. You're a real nice guy, aren't you, Ferrelli? Huh? Now you listen to me. You ran and then you skinned over a high fence to hide in that elephant enclosure. In the dark. And in the dark, he wasn't following you. But somehow, later on, he just managed to find you anyway. Lucky, maybe. Oh, uh, well... I mean, he must have a... Well, you see Oh, no, 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 not that simple. A couple of nice guys. You want to try to hang it on him now, Fader? I do not understand. Hey, this room been gone over yet? For fingerprints, sure. No prints. That's not what I meant, Johnson. The drawer and this bureau sticks. Let me see. I can do it, all right. All please. right, so it sticks. It's been shoved in too far. That's what I mean. Been slammed in. Somebody in a hurry, wondering what's inside. Nothing. Jewelry. Where's jewelry? What's that? Jewelry. Bracelets around the neck and things. I'm her husband. I know that. Everybody knows that. Jewelry, huh? Pretty wealthy, wasn't she? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, you guys. The stuff is in there. Whoever killed him must have taken it. I mean, that's why she was killed. Holy smoke, that spreads his case wide open. A robbery killing? I don't believe it. Oh, why not? Means lots of people could have done it. If these two guys were really fighting at the time, well, anyway... you've got a wife and kids to worry about. What? Huh? What's the matter, Briskin? I make you nervous? Press agent. But you really admired that Estella, didn't you? Well, she... What? Now, oh, wait a oh, minute. Oh, skip it. If this wasn't a robbery killing, then it was a real cold-blooded murder. Gloves so there'd be no fingerprints. Something stolen to make it look like robbery. But then it ruled out the hotheads over here, too. Neither one of them was in a mood to be cold-blooded, even if they hadn't been together at the time. A while ago, I said it was a triangle, and I still stick with it. All right, Fado, your wife was going to throw you over, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she was very wealthy, a lot more than just jewelry. Yeah, but i never seen any of it. Ferrelli, you were the current boyfriend. But if you had half a brain, you could see the handwriting on the wall. Even if you became the next husband, you wouldn't have lasted very long either. Nobody does. And you wouldn't have seen any of the fortune either. You can say that again. Valentine, what in the I'm name of... I'm trying to play a different tune on the triangle, that's all, Johnson. Okay, Ferrelli, let's get back to how Fedor found you in the dark. Why you tried hiding from this monster in a place where nobody could even hear you call for help. But I don't know he was so close. I don't know he could just see me go over the fence. Then how did he know you did? How did he know where to find you? But I did see him. I was right behind him. Oh, no, he gone oh, well, away. No, come on, come on, make up your minds, boys. No, no, listen to me. The Triangle Club. The two sides of it nobody ever suspects. You two deliberately messed each other up to make everything stick. Two sides. But I hate him. He tried to kill me. Husband and lover against the wife. There's one for you, Johnson. You better find out fast who inherits that dough those guys couldn't have got their hands on any other way. We didn't. That's a stupid guy. He don't mean what he... He's a dumb man. You faker, you big critic. Shut up. Stupid. Get your hands off me. That's it, boys. Go at it again. Sure, he's so dumb, he said you did it. I did not. He did. Shut up, loudmouth. He said you did the actual killing. He did it himself. Why? Oh, hey, look out. Get him off. Help. 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 Well, throw up a chair, Johnson. We got a ringside seat. So, we'll just wait for a decision. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Then it was really 
Fedor who killed Estella. Yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy, what a fight. If only I'd had a camera. Oh, both of them were guilty, Angel. They cooked it up together. Well, might not have happened if Mr. Briskin here... Had... Oh, yes, it would have. The publicity stunt didn't have anything to do with it. Sure, just a neat twist that they'd figured on a triangle, guys. And it might have worked. They might have got away with it if our friend here hadn't picked me for a sucker. Got us mixed up in it. Sure, that's right. So you're not so anymore, are you? Holy smoke, it's a job, that's all. I got a wife and kids. Oh, this... Buster, you're a broken record. My wife and kids, my wife and kids, my wife and George kids. George Valentine, you stop it. Huh? Well, it's just a shame you don't say anything intelligent like that once in a while. What's <laughs> the matter, darling? Your cat got your tongue? You have just heard Tune on a Triangle, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, when you were a kid, did you like to go sheing? Now, by that, I don't mean chasing the girl next door around the block, but rather the manly art of climbing the nearest snow-capped hill and then returning down said hill on a pair of shees. Of course, you probably know them as skis. Oh, but that's become a peasant term. Now, if you were to use that outmoded expression around the Sun Valley set, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. On the other hand, George Valentine had never heard of sheing, as you will find out in our Let George Do It adventure. It's called Red Spots in the Snow. And you can take it from me. It wasn't borscht. My dear Mr. Valentine, I have never been a violent man. So when I'm threatened, I need a professional to, uh, well, frankly, to act as my bodyguard. I don't expect you to follow me around ostentatiously with drawn revolver, but I will expect continuous protection night and day. You will fly to Snow, Snow Valley, Valley Lodge, Lodge where, where you will be my guest. Oh, George, did you hear that? Snow Valley. Yes, I heard it, Brooks. Snow Valley's fabulous. The latest, most up-to-date resort in the whole country. I've read the circulars, too. Oh, you? we could have a wonderful time yeah, Well, you'd better finish the letter before you start packing. Oh, where you will be my guest. Uh-huh. I don't think you will find your duties too arduous. There's skating, skiing, dancing, and entertainment. Oh, George, it sounds heavenly. Yes, it does. Who's it from? Oh, uh, it's signed uh, Herbert Judson. Oh. George, do you think it could Only be... Only one Herbert Judson, I guess. Oh, who'd threaten a famous picture director like Herbert Judson? <laughs> Probably not over half the population of Hollywood. Well, he's handsome, he's famous, he's clever. And quite a lady killer. I was reading about his latest heartthrob in one of the gossip columns. Well, then you don't want to take the case. Oh, I didn't say that. If you'd like a vacation... Oh, come to think of it, I'm not invited. The minute Judson sets eyes on you, I'm sure you will be. Oh, thank you. That was a compliment, wasn't it, George? Uh, no comment. Well, write him, we'll be there. I'll telegraph him. Hey, I'm not made of money. Collect. Oh, George, it'll be wonderful. Skating in the moonlight, dancing under soft lights. Yeah, and Herbert Judson in person. All right, go home and pack, Angel, and don't forget... Plenty of woolies. You are.
are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and Let George Do It. Good of you to take the morning plane, Valentine. And to bring Miss Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Judge. Mm. After lunch, we'll go out and try the she run. She? That's the right way to pronounce SKI, George. Ah, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry I wasn't here to welcome you when you arrived. Special events on the she run this morning. Oh, well, that's okay. We spent the time looking at the photograph albums in the lobby. You're on almost every page, Mr. Judson. Oh, yes. The publicity men here, you know, always snapping off the record pictures of well known people on the she run. Well, if I may be permitted a pun, there was one she in particular who was posing with you and a good many of the pictures. <laughs> Well, all the girls like to have their pictures taken with me. Well, this one was very pretty, in spite of the fact that her dark glasses almost covered her face. Did you ever think of going in for pictures, Miss Brooks? Me? Oh, heavens, no. Oh, really? Extremely photogenic, you know. I can get you uh, a screen test. <clears throat> Incidentally, Mr. Judson... Now, don't worry about your fee, Valentine. It'll be over and above your hotel expenses. Everything's on me. Yeah, well, while we're waiting for lunch, perhaps you'd tell us just how you were threatened. I found this note under the door of my room. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, words cut out of the newspaper. Better keep your promises if you expect to remain healthy. Is that all? It's enough, isn't it? Uh -huh. What promises does it allude to? I haven't the faintest idea. I was sure a clever man like you would find a lot of clues in this. Well, I'm not a movie detective, Mr. Judson. Just a troubleshooter who occasionally gets a good idea. Well, uh, whatever the danger is, I'm sure you can cope with it. Mere fact that you're here is very comforting. Ah, <laughs> here's little Mary with the succulent viands. You know, Pierre used to be chef at the Saint Moritz. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? Yes, Mary, this is Mr. Valentine. Well, the desk clerk said that this note was left for you. This might deliver it once, so he sent it in. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, will you excuse me? Why, certainly. I wonder who's sending me. Uh -huh. Look at this. What is it, George? Just like yours, Mr. Judson. Words cut out of a newspaper. With your advertisement at the top, George. Uh, if this is you, you're wasting your time. A man must pay for his sins, and you can't stop it. Better leave here at once. I won't warn you twice. Well, whoever's sending these threats isn't wasting any time, is he? Say, tell me, have you had any disagreements with anyone here? Why, no. No, nothing of any importance. I had a little argument with Jacques, the she instructor. Maybe you'd better tell me about it. I might find it more important than you think. No, it really isn't anything. Little Mary, the, the waitress here, is quite a she expert. The help you see are allowed to use the hill back of the lodge. Jacques and Mary are great friends. Or at least they were until the girl who sings arrived. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going too fast. The girl who sings? Uh, her name is Jill Drew. She sings during cocktail hour. Hasn't anything to do with the argument I had with Jacques. I mention her because, uh, well, Jacques is infatuated with her and Mary is crazy about Jacques. Quite a little triangle. Well, uh, this trouble you had with Jacques... Well, Mary's quite pretty, as you may have noticed. I uh, have always been on the lookout for photogenic faces. I asked her how she would like to have a screen test. Jacques didn't seem to like the idea. But now that his interests are elsewhere, I'm sure he doesn't care. I'd like to meet this Jacques. Oh, you'll meet him, yes. We'll go up the mountain right after lunch. Well, Miss Brooks, you manage your she's wonderfully. Well, they don't bother me, but that chairlift frightens me. Now, it's really very simple. You just climb aboard one of the chairs as it swings round. You mean those little chairs hanging like a swing are all you have? Well, surely you've been on a she lift before. <laughs> they didn't have one on the little slope back of the schoolhouse where I learned. <laughs> well, you won't have any trouble. As soon as you get on, you rest your feet on the footboard, and then you pull the bar down in front of you, and you're locked in. Well, the wire that it swings on, suppose it should break. Now, that wire is good and strong. <laughs> but it goes up so high, and 
When it stops, you're dangling there. Oh, and this is the girl who couldn't get to Snow Valley fast enough. <laughs> you know, for myself, I've always thought this was a silly sport. 20 minutes to go up, 20 seconds to come down. Well, I thought I could just play around down here. Well, you don't have to come down the sheet trail if you don't want to. Jacques gives his lessons on that plateau up there at the top. See that space between the trees where the lift goes over the hills? You can watch, Mr. Judson, Angel. Yes, and when you're ready to return to the lodge, you can ride back on the chairlift if you want to. Now, let's see. I'd better take the first chair. Mix, uh, Miss Brooks, you take the next, and Valentine the rear guard. Okay. Well, all right, here goes nothing. I'll show you how it's done. You see how slowly the chairs move? You just jump on and put your shoes on the footrest. Pull down the bar, and there you are. See you at the top. Okay, you're next, Angel. I'll help you. On you go. We're awfully high up, George. Yeah, it's a beautiful view, though. I'm afraid to look. I get dizzy. Surely you're not frightened now. We're almost there. And did you ever see a clearer day? Yeah, it is pretty, but those treetops down there look awfully sharp. Oh, don't look down. Look ahead toward that opening between the trees. When we get through there, we'll be only a few feet off the ground. And just beyond, you'll be able to get off. Hey, look back and see how far we've come, Angel. I wish I were an angel. With wings. What's that? Someone in the woods must be hunting. I didn't know they allowed it. They must have hit something, George. Look down there. Red spots in the snow. Hey, that's blood. Hey, good night. Look, Angel. Judson slumped over the bar. He's been shot. Mr. Judson? Someone in the woods there to the left. Hey, Brooksy, look down there. What? Yeah, going down the far side of the hill out of the woods. Someone skiing awfully fast. Yes, and not on the regular ski run. That must be the person who shot Mr. Judson, a blue sweater with a yellow band. Too far off to see what he looks like. Oh, I wish this plane contraption had moved faster. I'll phone down the minute we get to the top and see if we can head him off. Hey, hey, you up there. Help Mr. Judson off. He's been hurt. Yes, sir. What happened? Someone shot him from the woods. All right, I'll get him off the chair. Well, someone will have to help me, too. Just a minute, lady. Where do I get him on the ground? <laughs> well, wait now. Don't try to jump off. Don't. There. There you are, man. Oh, Thanks. George, he seems to be hurt badly. Yeah, okay, I'll be there in a second. All right, give me a hand. There you are, sir. Okay. All right, let's have a look at him. Now, phone for the police. Tell them to hold anyone wearing a blue sweater with a yellow band around it. Yes, sir. Shall I send for a doctor, too? Too late for that. Mr. Judson is dead. Please, please, folks, keep back. Will you, everyone, keep back? Don't touch him until the police arrive. They'll be here shortly, sir. Did you phone the lodge about the blue sweater with the yellow band? Oh, no, sir. I for, I'm afraid I forgot oh, it. Oh, fine help you are, Buster. You know anyone who has an outfit like that? No, sir. Jacques might know. Well, where is he? Get him. Well, he left a little while ago, just before you arrived. He left? I thought his job was here. Well, he said he had to pick up some supplies in town and he'd be right back. Hey, Brooksy. Yes, George. Looks as if we have to ski down the hill back there. Are you game? Well, I've never tried a long hill like... Well, whatever you say. All right, come on then. Now, look, don't let anyone touch the body. No, sir. Hey, you're going the wrong way. The ski run... We're taking the same route the killer took. Come on, Angel, don't break your neck. Oh, George, I'm so glad you care. Oh, you bet I care. Oh, George. All right, I'll need you to help me when we get down. Lots of things that have oh, to be... Oh, George. Come on, hold your hat. Here we go. What's it like flying, isn't it, George? Yeah, pretty fast. George, look out, that snowbank. Huh? Be careful. Oh, hey, oh, uh, oh. Oh, oh. Hey, Brooksy, help me out of this, will you? Are you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Half the snow on the country went down my neck. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> but it was certainly bumpy. Yeah. Man must have been an expert. Yeah, but he slipped up. Nice of him to leave a trail in the snow for us to follow. Yeah, that's right. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? He's way ahead by now. I know, but we can tell the way he went. Duck down. Get behind that snowbank. We've caught up with our friend, the killer. <laughs> Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back. 
back to George Valentine. You are invited to Snow Valley Lodge to act as guardian for the well-known Hollywood director, Herbert Judson. And now Judson is dead, shot while riding on the ski lift just in front of you and Claire Brooks. And now that you've followed the suspected killer's trail, you find yourself hiding behind a snowbank, trying to avoid being a target. Well, if your name is George Valentine, that's only going to make you more anxious to catch the person who's been doing the shooting. <laughs> Okay, Angel, according to my calculations, that's the last shot in his gun. Be careful, George. Okay, I'll take a look. There's no sign of anyone. From here on, he followed the road, and there isn't any more trail. Yes, the road's too cut up by automobile chains. Well, let's get to the hotel. I want to check a few things before the police begin their inquiry. You check the drying room and ask about blue sweaters and yellow stripes. I'll phone Hollywood and get the latest dope on Judson. Any pay dirt, Brooksy? None. The man in the drying room says there are several people who have sweaters like that, but none of them wore them this morning. Was Jacques one of them? No. Jacques always wears black. Did you talk to Hollywood? Yeah, yeah, I did. Signet Studios was very much upset at the news, naturally. Everyone seemed to like Judson. Due back at the studio next week to make a picture. No recent scandals, no big romance since last year. But one of the newspaper boys said that his death would cause a lot of weeping and wailing among aspiring actresses. Popular, huh? Well, he was always promising to get girls into pictures, never making good. Hey, didn't he ask you if you wanted a screen test? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> George, that note he received warned him he'd better keep his promises. Do you suppose one of the girls... I can't imagine why failure to get a screen test is motive enough for murder. But we mustn't pass up anything. Okay, promise Mary a test. Let's see her. George, do you remember these photo albums we looked at before lunch? Yeah, sure. Judson and his she's. Well, maybe one of them had a dark sweater with a light stripe. <laughs> oh. Brooksy, what would I do without you? Well, I hope you couldn't, George. If I thought... Here they are. Ah. Anything wrong? Yeah. Someone tore out all the pages from the front of this book. Do you suppose it might have been someone who had a dark sweater with a light stripe? I wouldn't be surprised. Come on, let's find Mary. I beg your pardon. I'm looking for a waitress named Mary. Have you, well, uh... You wouldn't find her here now. She's off in the afternoon. Oh, I see. Now, you're Jill Drew, the singer, aren't you? Yes. My name is Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. Oh, hello. How do you do? You uh, heard about Mr. Judson, I suppose? Yes. Well, I'm asking a few questions before the police arrive. Would you mind telling me if you were one of the girls Mr. Judson promised a screen test to? I hardly knew Mr. Judson. By any chance, do you have a ski outfit? A blue sweater with a yellow stripe? No, I don't ski. I'm engaged to sing and play the piano. Where would I find time to ski? Now, if you don't mind, I have to practice. Yeah, the uh, show must go on, I see. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. I knocked them over to the floor. Sounds like a junk cart. Here, I'll pick them up. They're beautiful bracelets you have, Miss Drew. Rather heavy, aren't they, when you're playing the piano? Oh, I never wear them when I play. But I don't like to leave them in my room. It's marvelous what they can do with costume jewelry these days. My dear young lady, those are real. They're from Elwood's in Beverly Hills. Oh, singing for your supper must be profitable. Oh, I have admirers. I don't doubt it. Now, if you don't mind... Oh, sure. Else? Sorry to have interrupted your practicing. If you're looking for Mary, you might find her in her room. And where is that? In the annex, back of the main lodge. If she isn't there, she may be skiing on the hill, back of the annex. She's very proficient. Mary, you've been crying. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Poor Mr. Judson. You liked him a lot, didn't you? Oh, he was always so kind and generous. Next week he was going to take me back to Hollywood with him for a picture test. Well, look, Mary, murder is a serious matter. You're in the dining room a lot. Did you ever hear Mr. Judson in an argument with Jacques? What? No, Mr. Valentine. But Jacques would never... Mary, there will be an inquest. You'll be asked questions and you'll get yourself into a lot of trouble if you hide anything. Mr. Judson admitted he and Jack had an argument about you. Well, he only warned Mr. Judson not to make any promises he couldn't keep. And Mr. Judson was going to give me Jacques the test... Jack threatened Mr. Judson? Oh, no, Mr. Valentine. It wasn't a threat. 
Just a friendly warning. Don't you think you'd better tell us all about it? Well, Jacques and I... Well, he used to be kind of attentive until Miss Drew came. I... I wanted to make him jealous, so I told him about Mr. Judson promising me a chance in pictures. And he warned Mr. Judson not to make any promises he couldn't keep. That was all. Where can I find Jacques when he isn't teaching? Well, if he isn't with Miss Drew, he's usually in his cabin. And that is? Back at the lodge. Jacques doesn't live in the lodge. He has a cabin of his own. It's number 26. Okay, thanks. I'll see you later. Seem to be at home. Maybe the door is open. We can try. A man who leaves his door open can't have anything to hide. Usually. Yeah, it has a nice cabin, fireplace, and everything. Yeah, yeah, quite cozy. Oh, I'd like to have time to look at all the pictures he has on the walls. Well, go ahead and look. We'll see what else there is. These must be his pupils. Mm. Oh, publicity stills. Yeah, let's see now. The table in there. Scrap basket. Hmm. What is it, George? This newspaper. I have the slightest doubt that both Judson's message and mine were cut right out of this. But George, if he wanted to hide it, why didn't he burn it? I was thinking the same thing, Angel. I'll keep it anyway. Now let's have a look at the pictures. <laughs> well, Jacques seems to have had his picture taken with every well-known star in Hollywood. To Jacques, who helped me stay on my feet, Grant Cooper... To Jacques, the best there is, Norma Lewis. And here he is with Mr. Judson and Jill Drew. In memory of a happy vacation. George, isn't this like one of the pictures from the book? Uh-huh. Only she isn't wearing the dark glasses here. Mm, she was prettier then. She wasn't posing when we saw her. Well, her sweater has a stripe. Only it's a light sweater with a dark stripe instead of the other way around. Thought she couldn't ski. Doesn't mean you can ski just because you're photographed with them on. George, do you smell something burning? Mm. Yeah, it smells like cloth. Hey, it is. You're in the fireplace. I wonder we couldn't locate the missing suit. Where are you going? Well, to get some water to throw in the fire. Hasn't been in the fire very long. I'll get it out with a poker. There we are. Now, oh, it's a shame to spoil this Don't rug, Don't burn but... your hands. I'm getting the water. No, I got it, Angel. Just have to stamp on it a bit more. Look out, George. Huh? Oh, good. Well, what do you know? Blue sweater and yellow stripe, all right. I'm glad we found it before it had time to burn completely. Let's see if there's anything in the pocket. Nothing but what's left of this handkerchief. Hey, his initial, too. Well, that sort of settles it, doesn't it, George? Yeah, perhaps. We'll hold it for the sheriff when he arrives. What are you doing in my room? Oh, uh, <clears throat> hello there. I suppose you're Jacques. Didn't think you'd be back so soon. Effortless, did You did not? I ought to turn you over to the police. Well, for the moment, I represent the police. You're lying. Now, listen, Buster, maybe you don't know that you're the number one suspect for a murder. What's that? <laughs> Good imitation of a man indicating surprise. You think I killed Mr. Judson? Now, look, your ski suit... Oh, that isn't mine. I never had one like that. Your handkerchief was in the pocket. Oh, that isn't mine either. It's... It's none of your business. Now, will you get out of here? Look, or look out, I... George. Oh, another bit of evidence, huh? All right, put that gun down, Buster. Drop it, I say. Drop it, Buster. It isn't loaded. What? Ah, don't you remember? You used up all the bullets shooting at us. Okay, pick it up carefully, Brooksy, yeah. while I hold our friend here. All the shots have been fired, George. Yeah, I thought so. Come on, Buster. We're going to find the sheriff. Sorry to disturb you again, Miss Drew, but have the police arrived? I haven't seen them, Mr. Valentine. Come along, Jacques. Jill, I... I... Mr. Valentine, where are you taking Jacques? We're on our way to the police, Mary. This fool is trying to say that I killed Judson. We found the gun and the ski suit in his room. He tried to burn it. We got there in time. Jacques says the suit is too small for him, and I'm inclined to agree with him. But it wasn't Jacques. He didn't do it. I, I know it. Mary, be quiet. He didn't do it because... Because... I did it. Huh? It does look like a girl's sweater, George. And what's left of the handkerchief looks like a woman's. Mary, are you trying to protect Jock? 
No, no, I... She might have done it, George. She knows how to ski, and the sweater could fit her. Okay, motive, Angel. Mr. Judson promised her a test in pictures. He hadn't kept his promise. Well, it's not a very good motive for shooting a man, as I remarked before. Would you say so, Miss Drew? Please, can't you discuss this somewhere else? I have oh, to... Oh, yeah, rehearse. sure, I know, I know. You have to rehearse. We'll only be a minute. And you might be interested in this. Do you think failure to give a girl a screen test is good and sufficient reason to... Mr. Judson made fun of me because Jacques had fallen in love with Miss Drew. Please, leave me out of this. You say you shot him, Mary, huh? Yes. And then came down the other side of the mountain and reached the hotel in time to go to work? That's it, George. And then planted the suit and the newspaper and Jacques's gun back in his room? She tried to burn the suit. Jacques's cabin was the only one with a fireplace, and it was only natural that she should return the gun. But she happens to love Jacques is even willing to confess to a crime she didn't commit to save his life. Why would she leave the stuff in his room for the police to find? Well, maybe she was jealous and then changed her mind when she saw he was suspected. Girls in love often do strange things. Oh, yeah, they certainly do. Well, it's an interesting theory, Brooksy. Only if you remember, when we started up the ski lift, Mary was still at the bottom. We just left her in the dining room. She couldn't possibly have reached the top before we did. Yeah, you're a sweet kid, Mary, trying to save the man you love. But it isn't a good idea to get mixed up with the law. Then you think it really was, Jack? Oh, no. No, I agree with you that it was a woman, all right. A woman's sweater, a woman's handkerchief. And do you remember the initial on the handkerchief? Yes. J for Jack. Why not J for Jill? Don't go away, Miss Drew. Oh, this is ridiculous. Is it? We saw your photograph in a blue sweater and a yellow band. You destroyed the pictures in the album, but you forgot the one in Jacques' room. But she had on a light sweater with a dark band. The strange peculiarities of photography, Angel. Unless you're using panchromatic film, blue comes out light and yellow comes out dark. And I think when I check with Elwoods and Beverly Hills about those bangles, we'll find that Judson bought them. Yeah, I think we'll find out that they were presents from him before he got tired of her and started sheing elsewhere. All right. All right, I did it. I didn't mean to kill him. I just wanted to frighten him. But he deserved to die. He was a pig. He was always promising women the world and giving them nothing. He even promised to marry me. Then he met this little nobody and treated me like the dirt under his feet. I tried to make him jealous by pretending I cared for Jacques. Uh -huh. Brooksy, I'll turn this little lady over to the sheriff. Phone the jeweler in Beverly Hills. And then I'll meet you back in the lobby. <laughs> Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Well, I was right, Angel. Judson bought those presents and braces for Jill. But, George, did she tear the pictures out of the book so we wouldn't know she could ski? That's right. I don't think she meant to implicate Jacques, but his cabin was the only one near hers that had a fireplace. So when she went there to return his gun, she thought of burning the sweater, which she knew we'd seen from the chairlift. Well, how did you know Jacques didn't do it? Well, he didn't know the gun didn't have any bullets in it, for one thing. And now Mary and Jacques can live happily ever after. <laughs> Can anyone really live happily ever after? Oh, George, you're so cynical. If you don't look out, some girl will take a shot at you for a warning. Not from a ski lift, Angel. The only girl who take a shot at me doesn't like dangling from the sky. You have just heard Red Spots in the Snow, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Davis Kent wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you'll again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, 
Well, greetings as usual, friend. Now, before we get down to cases, I want to ask you a question. What, in your opinion, is the dirtiest trick man can play on his fellow man? Now, don't say stealing candy from a baby, because that'll send you right back to the bush leagues. No, I'll tell you what I'll do. I promise you that if you'll listen to our Let George Do It adventure, you'll get some of the nastiest ideas on how to loss up your neighbor that you've ever heard of. Is that a deal? Okay, suppose I let George Valentine take it from here. Dear Mr. Valentine, first letter I ever written in 17 years, since the last time I filed a gold claim in Nogales. Name's Tioga Tom, only honest man left in the West. If you ever heard of the castle I live in out by the desert, then you know what these railroad tickets are for. To so come see me. But you don't know anything else, understand? Trouble, you fellas, you jump on conclusions. Think nobody else is smart but you. If you think I need help, then you're crazier than the people in Cactus Junction. And I ain't spit in their direction since WPA. But I do need a mite of assistance regarding the arrest of a culprit. I'm a man everybody tries to pester, on account of how rich they think I struck it. But me, I like my privacy and I aim to maintain it. P.S. The culprit I make reference to is the one who stole or made disappear or killed my dog. Only botheration is, it was my C&I dog. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Like a chicken leg, dearie, I brought a whole fryer along with some hard-boiled eggs. You know how trains are. Oops! Excuse me while I just get my valise on the rack here. It's all right. I'll move my coat, only this... Yes, is... you came all the way through from the city, huh, dearie? Claire Brooks, it says on the baggage thing. Oh, my, that's a nice name. I had a boarder named Brooks once, but he died with his kidneys, poor darling. How you like our town, Cactus Junction? It ain't much, uh, look, is it? Please, excuse me, but really, this seat is... Too... There we are. I guess there's no room for my hat, though. Have to jab it in across the aisle. Mind me to keep my eye on it. You never know. So now, let's Hurry eat. Up, well, I'm awfully sorry, madam, but I'm trying Go to tell on, you... Go on, dearie. There's plenty of chicken for both of us. Oh, but I had the most awful time wringing its neck. Oh, you should have seen me. I chased him all around the oh, yard. Oh, no. I, I said, will you please not sit down here? The seat is taken. Oh, George. George. Yeah, here I am, Angel. Well... If I'd known you was that tight. Oh, that's all right, lady. Sit still, sit still. But, George... Going out for a smoke. Have a nice time, Brooksy. Oh, George! Isn't he sweet, after all? Now, my name's Carmichael, dearie, and let me tell you about this Good. chicken. Good! Here we go, Jack. Well, here we go, Mr. Valentine. Last stop before Emory Switch. Emory Switch. That's where we get off, huh, conductor, for Tom's? Yep. Two, three-mile walk, I guess, up the hill. But there's a moon tonight. Rode around the back way, but of course it's its father. Uh huh. Kind of a lonely spot for a blind man, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, desert rat with money. <laughs> Probably never let a doctor touch him in his life. Seen him out there once, just a couple of weeks ago, was fumbling along, hanging on to his dog. And... Doesn't like people, huh? No, there's an old Oriental been with him for years, if that's what you mean. Ho Sing, cook and bottle washer. Richer and Croesus, Tom is. A whole fortune might have paid in his castle, they say. <laughs> Eh, uh, I can't feel too sorry for him. Tioga Tom, last honest man in the West. <laughs> says him. Well, you'll be the first visitor up there for a long time, I guess. Maybe you can get your hands on some of that gold. Underway now. Hey, uh, save me enough. Hey, wait, wait for me. I ain't stopping. Oh, conductor, there seems to be a guy out here. Who wants to make it, will he? Always somebody too late for a train. Huh? Ridiculous. Shows a man's got no efficiency. I'm never late. Wait, will you? Wait. Come on, let's give him a hand. I'm drinking, Jim. Can't even run straight, you see. Help me, fellas, will you? Please? Here, let me reach. Him. Now, now, here, I can reach him. Oh, gee, thanks. Oh, 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 oh,
don't know why we bother. He's liable to fall. Get out of the way, friend. I'll get him. Here we go, boys. Here we are. Oh, oh gee. Oh, thanks. So, sorry to be in trouble. I was in the bar. Everybody is so nice. They couldn't get away. Okay, okay, friend. You made it all right. Oh, yeah. Wait a uh, Here's your uh, hat over here. My name's uh, Loosefoot. Want a drink? What? Uh, Loosefoot. Uh, it's a name. Somebody just give it to me, I guess. I don't remember. Uh, come on, come on. Have Wait a, a minute. Scepter, it's a ticket, huh? too. Hey, look, you. it fell off your head. Take it. Here, give me that. Uh, uh, well, it's sure nice of you, hey, pal. Emery uh, Switch, it's a... Uh, didn't it? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I, I'm a necktie salesman. Got a few samples for the Switchman who works there. That's all. Well, thanks again. And, and, and you, too. I... Uh, where'd the other guy go? Back in the car, I guess. Oh, well, uh, thank him for giving me a hand, will you? I mean, thanks. I sure... Appreciate yeah, it. sure. Uh, Only didn't you notice, Liz Brain? What that other guy tried to give you was a shove. <laughs> I didn't shove him, Mr. Valentine. I just didn't help him much. I didn't want him on the train. Part of it. Well, Mr. Flannery, I don't know. I'm just curious. Perfect right. Perfect. His name's Loosefoot. You know him? Who doesn't? I've done business in Cactus Junction. Lawyer. Coming this time from the city, though. As far as Emery Switch, huh? You too, maybe, huh? And why not? Now, Loosefoot's the kind of a person who's always in the way. Son of an old partner of Tioga Tom's, or claims to be. Always claiming to have a claim on him. Oh? And why are you going? What's your claim, Mr. Flannery? Never ask a lawyer a direct question, young man. <laughs> Spoken like an ambulance, Jason. Or presume on a man's guilt before it happens. Now, I haven't really seen Tom since before he lost his eyesight. As many's the time I've handled his legal affairs. Oh, wait and... a minute, what do you mean, guilt before it happens? What happens? What's going on tonight? You and Loosefoot. That makes three of us headed for the same place to visit a guy nobody ever visits. And all on the same night. Why? Oh, you too, eh? <laughs> well, well. What's your angle? You need counsel say so. You don't leave me alone. Why should I say why? <laughs> I tell you this, though. There's four, not three. Huh? His common-law wife for six months back in 1917. Or she says she was, but that's her claim. Not a bad one. You mean Tioga Tom? That big overdeveloped appetite out there in the coach. Notice her eating fried chicken. A woman, Mr. Valentine, who'd wring your neck for a favor, but charged to tell you the time. The widow Carmichael. My lands, yes. That's where I live in Cactus Junction. Just to be near the poor dear. Thirty-three years I've waited. The one true love of my life. All right, so you're going to see him too, but would you... Four of us? Four of us? My, I think it's just friendly. That's what I think. Only even with my shoes on, it counts to five to me. Ain't that so, Cousin Henry? Huh? Who's cousin? Well, I guess it does, widow. Oh, George, he's some sort of a cousin of Tioga Tom's. Uh, mother's side, it was. Never very close, but blood's always thicker than water. That's the way I was raised. If you can't miss Brooks, here it's six of us, ain't it? Tioga, uh, he never liked crowds. Family trade. I told them we were going up to do a magazine story on him. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But the rest of you, Mrs. Carmichael, will you please... I don't hold no secrets. I'm sure you don't. I ain't afraid to speak up. Remember, blood stickin' strangers, too, widow. And to whom is bereavement a secret? What? what? Oh, but he'll be well again. I know he will. I brought along my nursing things. It's my opportunity as well as my duty. It's the telegrams, Mr. Valentine. We all got them. Even that loose foot up in the bar car. Where Tom's nearest. Bless his adorable old soul. Now, 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 widow. The telegrams? But I don't know got why... Got this he... evening, miss. From uh, Po Singh, that kid in up the castle. Here, read for yourself. Oh, thanks. Boss, very bad. Fall down, very bad. Come quick, please. Signed, Po Singh. Boss, very bad. 
A blind man, and he's already had some kind of a fall. Emory switch. Ten minutes stop. Emory switch. Come on, Brooksy. I got to get to a phone. Trap? What trap? What is it? Quiet, Angel. Oh, some kind of trap. I know, Tabby. All it's saying, me mix oh, up. Oh, for the love of... Look, Po Singh, I told you this is Mr. Valentine. I'm on my way out, but I want to find out what happened since Tom wrote me. Now, if you need a doctor or no, something... No, 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 no. Boss, he say doctor just for horses and descending he bills. Boss dying, that's all. What? Come quick, that's all. Boss dying. <laughs> dying? Come on, Brooksy. Let's get our stuff off the train and get up there. I don't know what's going on. But George, day before yesterday, a blind man's dog was stolen or killed, and then he has an accident. I know, I know. A rugged character who probably kept moving around, dog or no dog. Sure, somebody's up to something. This bunch of people. Haven't you realized what they are? Yeah, they all got telegrams. You know what I mean. They're the only people in the world, apparently, who have any sort of claim against Tioga Tom. They're nothing but vultures. Well, I'll go you one better, Angel. Say ghouls. Because you want to bet a guy like Tom has never made out a will? So if he did die, they'd all want to be handy to stake out those claims. Start grabbing for his gold. Yeah, they go, George. All walking out together. Yeah. About three miles up the hill, somebody said. Only suppose you and I just walk fast and beat him, huh? Let's get to Tom first. All right. Loose foot in the widow. Look, there's certainly a pair. Cousin Henry, he's as slow as they are. Characters, I tell you. But there's one who's not so slow. Hey, he's not with him. Who, oh, Mr. Flannery? Yeah. Still in the compartment. Let's drag him along with us. I want to ask him about what he did with that seeing-eyed dog. Ask him. George, what makes you oh, think I'm just he's... guessing. I'll tell you later, Angel. Hey, Flannery, let's go. We're... George. Mr. Flannery's dead. Yeah. Murdered. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. Tioga Tom, the legendary man in the castle overlooking the desert. He thought he didn't need help, but that was yesterday when all that worried him was the disappearance of his seeing eye dog. Once his protection was gone, something happened to Tom, an accident. And his only friend, Po Sing, says that he is dying, says, Come quick. The vultures, the only relatives or ones with claims against Tom, they're gathering too. But if your name is George Valentine, you can't hurry to the castle quite as quickly as you'd like, because one of the vultures is dead. Yes, Mr. Flannery has been murdered. Holy brother of Macintosh, what are we going to All do? All right, take it easy, Conductor, take Some it easy. Some sort of a sharp weapon, George. Yeah, a little tiny wound in his throat. Yeah, but I got a train to worry about, and them people all scattered now. I better get on the telegraph. George, you said you had a hunch Mr. Flannery was the one who did something to the dog. Why? Oh, any of these people could have got at that dog. You know, Angel, it happened yesterday. It's only 15, 20 miles from Cactus Junction out to the castle. So they could have gone back and forth. Well, what's on your mind? But Mr. Flannery told you he'd come all the way from the city, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Neat, sharp little guy, man with efficiency. How about that, did he? Well, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I'm so rattled that I, I can't tell. I There's didn't... mud, well, clay on the bottom of his shoes and the instep. See it? I noticed when he crossed his leg and carefully creased his trousers. Uh, Mr. Valentine, wait till the sheriff... Have you been in the city the day before? How'd mud get there? I'm the kind of guy who'd have a shine before breakfast. Hey, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I got the stubs here. I... Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm, Flannery, compartment... But you're right. He just got on at Cactus Junction, just like the others. Uh-huh. So then maybe I'm wrong about the dog. Oh, George, now you're confusing me even worse. Well, why was he murdered? Who murdered him? Maybe somebody else did something, and he was up here snooping around and saw it. Quite an operator, you know that. that to be his style. See something and just keep quiet. Hey, Al, you see him? No. Oh. See a little woman, a little wobbly guy, and a stiff-jointed slowpoke? I know, sure, I know. No, I didn't see him. I couldn't catch up. Already left the road, I guess. 
took the trail up the hill. Oh, brother. This road run around the backside of the castle. Sure, about five miles up there. There's a place you Okay, can... stay and help the conductor, will you? Let me have your truck. Yeah. Well, he's got to get us off on the side and then All right, all right. You guys the... worry about the train and the body. Come on, Brooksy. The ghouls are on foot. We can beat them. Yeah, sure, Only George. get that sheriff here fast. One murder's enough for tonight. Particularly if the second one should be me. Fits the description. Yeah. This door, I guess. Yeah. Don't see anybody inside there. At least we're ahead of the others. Yeah. Uphill, it'll take him another half hour. Only George, the murderer, if he's one of them, wouldn't stay with the others. Wouldn't he run away? Oh, maybe whatever this is all about isn't finished yet. Here we are, Angel. Well, guess we walk right in. Oh, it's a kitchen. Living room in here, apparently. Yeah. Hello. Anybody here? Hey, Tom, where are you? The place is so empty, but it's clean. That must be his room. It's the only one that... Yeah, could... Maybe he's asleep. But... George. Hey, a man dying, but his bed's empty. He's gone. Yeah, yeah, he's gone. Huh, what? Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Valentine. Hello. Hello, Miss. You're posing, but... Where's your... Tom, gone. <laughs> he is gone. Now, look, friend, what is this? A man who takes a bad fall and is dying doesn't just disappear like that? Oh, Mr. Tom, say, Mr. Tom, gone. Now, excuse me, hey, please. wait a minute. Where are you going? I get a cleaver knife. A what? Me, a cleaver. You sorry? Mr. Tom, say you must stay. Oh, he does, huh? The boss. Old Honest Tom says we should stay, huh? Suppose we don't. You going to use that thing? More better, I think you stay... Oh, sure. Okay. No, stay out. Oh, brother. Valentine the sucker. Valentine George, the sucker. George, there's a fence down here the front way, too. Supposed to be a gate half a mile from the house. Yeah, and this was a path when we started out on it. Where the deuce did we lose it? Valentine the pathfinder, the boy Oh, scout. George, you don't know yet. Hey, look out. Oh, easy there. Ooh. They seem to be down in a gully. What? Yeah. The trail must be up there, George. To a bridge right up over us. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wasn't what I was looking at. Sawdust. Hmm? Yeah, sawdust. Scattered. All around here, too. Farther under the bridge. Seems to be just a little footbridge. Pretty far up there, though, isn't it? Yeah. Sawdust has been here for a day or two. Wet. Fell here, and there's some on top of the cross piece, too. Yeah, I see it. Somebody said trap. Something up there has been freshly sawed, Angel. And anybody coming up the trail from the front gate would have to go across that bridge, wouldn't they? And it's so dark, they couldn't yeah, see. Yeah, come on. Get up there before somebody tries to walk across it. Hey. Oh, but... Look out! Where are you going? What? Bump into a man just sitting peaceful like that. Hey there. Woman's voice, wasn't it? Well, yes, couldn't you see it? Tom, Tioga, Tom, wouldn't you know? You wouldn't know anything. Who is it, Valentine? Yeah, I'm standing right here in front of you. You're sitting on a rock waiting for something to happen? Detectives all are stinking. Trouble with you, fella. But sitting nice and healthy, yeah, the poor guy who had the bad tumble. Only honest man left in the West. And he gets his hired boy to send out telegrams saying he's dying. <laughs> had a tumble. Broke ten ribs back in 1922. Never told a lie in my life. So that's the way you stretch it. Poor dying Tom. Been dying since the day I was born. So have you. So now you're sitting here waiting to hear wood break, huh? Poe Singh brings you out where you can, waiting to hear people tumble through that little trap you set up there. Pester me, every one of them. I told you that... I'm afraid we don't believe anything you told us. Told you I like my privacy. I ain't to maintain it. Bunch of vultures, all pester me looking for my gold. So you hire me... See an eye dog disappeared. Don't you think somebody's up to something? You jump on conclusions. Say, I had that bridge sword. But one of them did it. Like one of them did a murder, I suppose. Ain't interested in murder. Gonna die myself sometime. That's enough to worry about. Just trying to slow up the process, that's all. To steal my dog and then saw my bridge. Who do you think uses that bridge? I do. Even without my dog, I can find my way around this place, but I found him out. Yes, sir. Tom isn't gonna go down with it. Huh? Go on, one chosen. Hold your tongue. Ain't you got ears? George, yes, somebody's coming. 
I'm going to get up on that bridge before... No, this way. Hey! Hey, where am I? Who is that over there? Where's the trail? I can't see. <laughs> My loving vultures. Tell everybody their friends of mine can't even find their way around. Hello, Henry. Your voice, ain't it? Tom. <laughs> Fitter and a fitter. What in the name of... Never mind. Where's the rest of them? Loosefoot and the lady. Oh, coming, I guess. We move kind of separate. Only that telegram, Tom. What kind of a stunt... Yeah. Let me take your arm. Help me no. up. Quiet, boy. Hello, Henry Loosefoot. Mrs. Carmichael. Another county you heard from. Could hear that one across three counties. Yeah, there she is. Over on the other side. She's headed for the bridge. Come on. But, Tom, Hurry up and can't... get her. I'll be all right. George, we can't get up there in time. We're on the wrong side. She's coming this way. Mrs. Carmichael, stop. Who is that? Where are you? Stay where you are. Don't come across that bridge. What did you say? Oh, the bridge. Yes, I see it. All right. Uh, stop. Don't walk on it. Oh, it's you, dearie. I'm coming. Stop, George, I said. You... Stop, will you? Well, I can't stop till I get there, can Oh, I? Lord, she'll fall. Oh. Stop. My heavens, what's all the fuss? Oh, we... Out of the we way, got... Angel. Let me see something. What's the matter with him? Oh, dearie, what a climb. And the wind blowing my hat off all the time. What are you trying to see, George? The gird is sawed half through, all right. But a board's been freshly nailed across to support it. George, but I But who don't... could have nailed a board across? Tom and Poe Singh are the only ones up here. So Tom was telling the truth. Someone else sawed it, then Tom had it fixed. Wait a minute. Mrs. Carmichael, where's your hat been? What? Yeah. When Flannery was murdered, little tiny wound... He was stabbed with something sharp. Well, how in blazes should I know where the pin is? George, she pinned her hat to the seat opposite us, the seat across the aisle. I remember it. Did I? Couldn't find it when I left the train. And the only person who would have noticed it or thought of using it was the one who sat down there. Cousin Henry. Yes, Cousin Henry. And George, he's down there with Tom. Wait a minute. What about Loosefoot? Where's he? Ran on ahead, I guess. He was the fastest. And the trail's easy mount. So we haven't seen him because he's probably already crossed this bridge. Probably clear up at the house by now. But George, Tom is down there with sure, Henry. Sure, sure, with Henry. Don't you see, Angel? Tom wanted to know who killed his dog and sawed the bridge. That was the reason for the phony telegrams, this whole shindig. It was to get all the vultures up here and see which one of them wouldn't walk across the bridge. Henry. And five minutes ago, Tom discovered who was guilty. Well, uh, hurry up. Yeah, yeah, but quietly. Because now it's all backwards. Now the question is what Tom intends to do to Henry. There. There they are. And they're not moving toward the house, not moving at all. Tom's got a gun, George. He's hanging onto Henry's arm. Even a blind man could shoot somebody as long as he yeah, had a... Yeah, come on, around this way. Push out. Uh... Well, come back, did you? Get down here, Mr. Valentine. This crazy... Shut up, dog killer. You'll get your chance to grovel. He's a murderer, too, you say, huh? Don't answer, Angel. Around the rock here. Yeah, that's right. Now, come on. He's crazy. You're both crazy. Everybody comes pestering. Well, it's going to stop once for all. Sure, he killed Flannery. Flannery's another pest. Snooping around the same day he was. Let go of me. Let go of me. Get your hand oh, off my... Oh, no, you don't. You move. The gun goes off. Okay, Tom. I'm here now, right beside you. You can hand me that gun. Uh -huh. George, you let go. He just let go. Oh, you, you... Look out. I'll get him. Give me that gun, I said. Where are you? Where is no, he? No, no, you don't. Detectives... Knocking my gun The sheriff will get him, don't worry. I just got an idea it might be good to save you from dying for a while, Tom. <laughs> Man's dying from the day he's born. Oh, sure. Honest Tom. Rugged independent. I know I hate that guy, but shooting him while escaping might not go down so well with a jury. Uh, just shooting wild? Uh, I couldn't actually... Well, would have been just blind luck if I hit him, I mean... Oh, sure, sure, Tom. Be careful what you say. Don't want to tell a lie. Only honest man left in the West. Yep, that's me. Don't want to admit you might be a dead shot. Don't want to say right out to your blind. Even though that's how you suckered these people into coming after you. <laughs> but George, he said... <laughs> Ain't a lie if a man always talks like he had to hear people to recognize him, is it? Ain't a lie to stumble around the few times you've seen, is it? Buster, you take the cake. <laughs> honest as the day is short... Sure, we all jumped at conclusions, all right. Because I guess there's no law against a man with good eyesight owning a seeing-eye dog. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Music. Don't 
don't like it. People don't like them. Well, you can leave for the castle pretty soon, Tom. Taking down your cousin Henry's confession now. Worthless bunch of vultures. Won't be pestered anymore. Sure, sure, Tom. You've got your privacy. You know, we did stop you from doing the one thing that really would have been wrong. Do I appreciate it? Obligations ain't for me, young lady. Well, the reason people pester you is because of your gold. And I thought maybe you'd tell us what... <laughs> tell you a secret. Sure, I got barbed wire and faces... But I never actually said I have gold, did I? What? Oh, for the luck! Oh, George, come on, let's get out of here. Jump on conclusions, like everybody else! Oh, that awful man! George, I want to go out someplace and go dancing and forget about it. Okay, spend my gold. Well, at least I know you haven't got any. <laughs> I'll tell you something that'll worry you for years, you notice? Tom didn't say he didn't have any, either. You have just heard Nothing But The Truth, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, friend. Time again for Let George Do It. Oh, which reminds me. How would you like to sit in on a nice little card game? I happen to know four charming fellows who are just dying for a fifth. On the other hand, though, maybe you'd better forget about it. Because these boys would not only take your bankroll, they'd just as soon take your life. But it's a pretty good game at that. So while we're waiting for George Valentine to show, let's take a look in on this happy foursome. Well, it's ten o'clock already, gentlemen. Shouldn't we... <laughs> I mean, my watch says ten. Chester has the cards and... Sure, what are we waiting for? We're going to do it, let's get... No! Back. No. Ames, Falto, this is crazy. It's insane. It was your idea, wasn't it, Norton? Yes, but a man's guilt is no more to be bandied about. Oh, well, get off the words. There's the good name of the man to be thought of afterwards. Let's get it over with now. Now! It's all right. Need a piece of paper. Envelope here in your jacket. Do you mind? Of course I do, if it's got my name on it. Valentine. George oh. Valentine. What? Oh, your wife's letter from somebody named Valentine. Uh, if I'd know her friends. Here, here's a blank sheet. Club stationery. Uh, couldn't we get on with the dear Mrs. Ames? I am so sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Naturally, I will do whatever I can to help Sincerely, George Valentine. You mean a concern? How do you oh, like heaven's sake? Stop the stalling, both of you. Will you get All right. Started? I draw one. Go on, draw a card. Me? Go on, Salto. All right. Nine of diamonds. Yeah. Norton. <laughs> Nine of clubs. Nine again. Give me one of those. 
Jack. Diamonds. All right, Chester. Chester. Huh? Your turn. Draw. Oh, I, I'm all right. Draw. Oh, yes. King. <laughs> king of hearts. Look, Chester drew the king of hearts. Shut up. You understand, Chester. My card. Yes. Yes, the paper. Here, here. You can use the pen. Uh, I'm all right. <clears throat> I, Jeffrey Chester, hereby confess one year ago to this date it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. It is after ten o'clock now, Chester. I'd like to have a drink or two. I'll, I'll have to run down to my boarding house. There's a bill I should pay. Uh, the watchman's spare gun is in the locker room, and it would look better if you did it at the same place that... Leave him alone, Salto. I'm all right. I could run downtown first, then come back, have the drinks, if I could borrow your car, Mr. Ames. Sure, Chester. Let's go over and get you my car. Sure. Thank you. You can mail my confession of guilt to the police. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and let George do it. Where are you, Sylvia? It's a big idea, that letter in my coat pocket. Miss Valentine, who is he? Honey? Oh, there you are. So sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Of all the meddling... Please. Well... This huh? is Mr. Valentine. Miss Brooks, my husband, Mr. Ames. Oh, how, how do you do, Mr. Ames? Huh. My foot in my mouth. Just who are you? Did you have a nice time, darling? Where have you been? Huh? Oh, over to the club. Yeah, they let me in. Just playing a little cards, that's all. Look, Mr. Ames, I had a letter from your wife. My wife is leaving me. What difference does it make? Go on, get out. She's hired snoopers before, my friend. What? And you can't. Oh, shut up. Listen to me. You were beaten up the other night. Get them out of here. Get yourself out of no, here. Oh, no, you won't. Stop it. No, listen. What's the matter with you, friend? Victor, that was your car, wasn't it? Driving away? Yes. Yes, I loaned it if somebody needs it for a while tonight. He's got some things to do. Mr. Ames, I know I'm butting in, but your wife has been worried. And Please. I'm here. I'm going back over to the club. There's nothing anybody can do now except to make things worse. What? Darling! Send him home, Sylvia. I'll take care of myself. Oh. I put your letter in his pocket on purpose, Mr. Valentine. He'll never listen to me or believe me. It was certainly an understatement when you said he was upset. Yes. But you haven't said why yet. Now, just what's going on tonight, Mrs. Ames? Where's your husband really been? I don't know. Playing cards, I guess. He doesn't generally, but no harm could come out of that, could it? Maybe not. You said he'd been beaten up. Oh, yes, I know he's in danger. Well, go on, go on. Your husband's a lawyer, isn't he? He was until a year ago. His practice disappeared on him. What do you mean? Suspicion, distrust, whispers... This is a small town, Mr. Valentine. A very nice town. My husband used to be a very nice person. What happened? Have you ever heard of the Dorothy Fullman murder case? Well, yes, yes, I think so, only I don't remember the It was detail. never solved. She was murdered, beaten up. It was horrible. They never even found the weapon. Police, experts, everyone's been over it a million times. It was a whole year ago. They'll never get a confession from anyone. Mrs. Ames, was your husband... My husband was very nearly tried for that murder. Oh, I see. 
But then if he weren't tried, then... There uh, are people in this town who believe, who really believe that he killed her. Who will always believe it. There wasn't any actual evidence. But the circumstances... Horrible, sordid, awful. Mrs. Ames, just tell me one thing, will you? Do, uh... Do you think your husband killed this Dorothy Fullman? Mr. Valentine... I don't want anything worse to happen. I... That's all. I say, excuse me. Mm. You're Mr. Valentine, Arthur? George Valentine? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was looking for the club dorm. Uh, my name is Norton. This is quite a pleasure. I've heard of you. Uh, seen your name here and there. Oh, is that so? Uh, see here. Uh, join me on the veranda for a cup of coffee, will you? Hospitality of our little club isn't no, I'm hard, sorry, but... Mr. Norton. I'm looking for a man named Ames. Oh, yes. Victor Ames, splendid chap. Haven't seen him in some time. Might be here later. Uh, we can wait together. I said I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. <laughs> well, I certainly don't intend to be pushy. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, perhaps I should be a bit more honest and say there's a little matter I'd like your advice on. I'd still go looking for Mr. Ames. Even if I said the little matter concerned, Mr. Ames? <laughs> you twist my arm. <laughs> then we can do better than the veranda, I think. People there. There's a lounge in the locker room. All right. Through here? Uh, to your left. Generally closed at night. But, uh, there we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what's the story? <sighs> Nothing so very important, but uh, sit down, sit down. How do you know who I was out there? Well, Ames had mentioned your coming. You said you haven't seen him lately. Try again. <sighs> really, Mr. Valentine. Shh, shh, shh. Who's that? Hey, anybody in here? Walking up. Blue shirt. Private police? Uh, just a moment. Yes, yes, he is. Uh, Mr. Valentine, let go of me. Well, what are you doing here? Uh, what do you mean? Stop it. Who are you? Hey, hey, what is it? Jimmy, Jimmy, I, I found this man. Break it up, break it up. Break uh, what up, Chuck? I found him in here. I, I left my wallet in, in wallet my locker. All, the... all right, you... all right. Oh, it's you, Mr. Norton. He was snooping, Jimmy. Now my wallet's gone. He took it. He must have. Oh, brother. If what this am is... I supposed to do? Search him. Oh, but he won't have it, really. Uh, that, that's not the way they work. Uh, but uh, he's trespassing. You can lock him up for that. I'll see the steward for first charges. I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. But I said I'm sorry. You're not going to prefer anything. Good night. Jimmy, my father was the founder of this club. When I issue an order to one of the paid employees, I expect yeah, that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Issue away. Only someplace else, huh? I'll handle this end. Good night, Mr. Norton. Jimmy, I have never in my life been to... Good night. Yes. Good night. <laughs> well, that was something. Okay, bud. Hand it over. What? Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't mean you believe that old school ties gag about... And still you put him out? The wallet, bud. Oh, sure. Mine. Here. Credentials. The works. Good enough. Oh. Well, I didn't exactly figure. Valentine, eh? Yeah, that's right. Only look, Buster. Why? Why'd you treat him like that? Will him like lettuce before you even know what he had because to say? Because I have no use for the high and mighty Mr. Norton. And don't worry, I won't get in trouble either. <laughs> he may be down know it, but he's being eased out the side door of this club anyway. All four of them are. All four? Will you clear that up? You ever hear the Dorothy Fullman murder? Well, that nice, dignified man there, that Norton. For my money, he's the one that killed her. All right, so you've got your opinions, Jimmy. It's just an opinion. I'll stick to it, Mr. Valentine. But there wasn't any concrete evidence against either him or Victor Ames. And what did you mean, all four of them? And why did Norton want to stall me like that? That's all he was trying to do, keep me away from something. You're the detective, mister. Uh, oh, uh, excuse me. Huh? <laughs> yeah, hello, Mr. Chester. Oh, Jimmy, just standing here having a couple of drinks. I, I was downtown. 
Yes, that's done. Looks like you had enough. Oh, no, no, no. I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm all right. Sure, sure, Mr. Chester. See him? Hmm. Oh, that guy? He's one of them. Say it faster, will you? One of the four. Dorothy Fullman was murdered in her house just over the bluffs across the golf course. Yeah. They never got enough evidence. They never will. But the police did prove that it couldn't be anybody else. It had to be one of the four men mixed up with it. Who are they? Mr. Norton. Ames, big fool, always in trouble. Another man named Salto. He asked me he couldn't have got to first base with it. And Chester there. Oh, I get it. Not much left of Chester, is there? All of them have changed. But he don't even know what he's doing anymore. <laughs> Nobody will confess, no evidence. Oh, Jimmy! Jimmy, come here! Now, excuse me, Stuart, back to business. No, no, I'm right behind you. Huh? That's Victor Rains with him, isn't it? With the Stuart, sure it is. Valentine! Yeah, we catch up again, friend. It's a busy night. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, Jimmy, there's trouble in here. What? The card room, the one with the back entrance. I put those cards in there myself just this evening. Valentine, I've got to see no, you alone. Hold it, will you? Go on, Stuart. Uh, this deck of cards. Uh, some men have been playing in there, apparently, or drawing high man or something. Well, what is it? What's the matter? Uh, well, sir, it's uh, more puzzling than anything else. At a club like this, uh, someone was being dishonest. A rather hasty job, but uh, here you see, this deck has been marked... You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. Nine of Diamonds. Nine of clubs. Jack, diamonds. Your turn, Chester. Draw. Yes, I'm king of hearts. I hereby confess one year ago it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. If your name is George Valentine, all you know is that Dorothy Fullman murder case has never been solved. That there were four suspects, but the police have despaired of ever finding out who her murderer was. Yes, all you know is that Mrs. Ames was worried about the strange behavior of her husband. And more recently, that four men have been playing cards in the back card room of the local club. And that the steward says the deck of cards is marked. No! No, they can't be. Give me Hey, those. hey, take it easy, Mr. Ames. Let's see, Stuart. They're not marked. What's bothering you so much, Mr. Ames? Kind of a crude job. Yes, Jimmy. Little ticks on the edges, like this. But the person who did it could tell the cards, all right. Get out of here, both of you, Jimmy Stewart. Hey, hey, slow down, Buster. Look, I've got to see you, Valentine. I've got to see you alone. Have you been sampling some of that stuff Chester uses, Mr. Ames? What's so important about Chester? Chester. Hey, uh, where are you going, Miss Ames? He was downtown. He's back now. Oh, Buster, will the you bar, please? He's here in the bar. He's having those last two drinks. Well, there you are. Oh, hello, Angela. Oh, Mr. Ames, I saw your wife to the station. She said to tell you. Yes, yes, uh, of course. Where is he? What? The little guy, Brooksy. He was in here a few minutes ago. He was having a couple of drinks. Yeah, he's gone now. Well, I did see somebody leaving just when I came in. He looked like he could use a little sleep. It's five minutes to twelve. Time for you to clear it up, friend. Where's Chester going? What's happening tonight? Could have been any one of us. I mean, the cards marking them. But I didn't try to save my own skin. I would have gone through it if I'd been high man. What on earth? I'm trying to remember. The watchman's spare gun, that was it. Quit pulling, Buster. What? Yeah, the closet, the back hall. Come on, hurry, will you? The watchman's gun, that was it. Only the cupboard was bare. He's taken it already. Chester. There's certainly no gun in here. We drew. High man. He had the king of hearts. Little Chester, the weakest one in the whole bunch. Didn't even seem to react. What do you look? I, you... I, I know I'm talking wildly. I'll explain later. We've got to find him first. Hurry. Oh, we're with you, all right. But who's he going to use this gun on? Who's he? Oh. Isn't it perfectly obvious, Mr. Valentine? 
on himself. Just like Jimmy said, house over by the bluffs across the golf course. It's certainly deserted looking for sale, for lease. Chester must be here. It's where he'd come. It's Dorothy Fullman's house, huh? Where she was killed? Yes, in the living room. I found her body there. Beaten to death. Doors open, you see? Chester? Chester! Well, he's not here. The fall guy. Well, we're a long way on the outside of that old crime now, aren't we? Perhaps we beat him here, missed him in the dark... Chester! What do you mean, George? Ames here knows what I mean. This is where it happened. It wasn't a pleasant crime. And inside a man, a terrible thing like that can get bigger in a year. Huh? Mr. Valentine, I didn't kill her. Sure, sure, that's what they all say. But Buster, I'm just finally beginning to realize what a hopeless, crazy thing is happening tonight. Uh, wait a minute, George, listen. Upstairs. Come on. Chester? Where are you, Chester? It's me, Victor Ames! Salto. Salto, what are you doing here? Mr. Valentine's all right, Salto. He knows the whole story now. But I didn't mark any cards. It wasn't me. Then what are you doing here, Salto? Hiding. Leave him waiting. alone, Ames. Leave him alone. And never mind who marked the cards. But what do you think, Brooksy? Four men actually drawing to see which one would be a four guy. Which one would confess to a murder? I don't believe it. Oh, yes, it's very easy for the two of you to talk like that. I told them it was a ridiculous... Same as Russian roulette. Spin the cartridge wheel. See who gets the bullet. Yeah, they couldn't stand to be pointed at. The suspicion, the shadow of guilt. The crime that would never be solved otherwise. Yes, I told them that, but Ames and Norton kept You were willing that. enough, Salter. You didn't have any solution, any way to keep yourself from going insane. Maybe you can't believe it, Miss Brooks. Why should you? You don't have a private hell to live in. I don't think that's exactly what she meant, Ames. Sure, I know it's not like in books where people just forget about murder. But to try to dig yourself out of a swamp by drawing, taking one chance in four of being tapped for guilt, just to lay all the ghosts for the others. If we did it, so what? We did it. We've nearly killed each other trying to make each other confess anyway. I was thinking about the second part of the bargain. Suicide for the elected guilty one. Yeah, to make sure the police would accept that confession. Mr. Ames, you might have gone through with it. You're that kind. But I just don't believe that most men Check, would... Angel. All right, how about it, Saldo? That's why you're here, isn't it? To see if Chester would go through with something that you wouldn't do yourself. That I... I'm sorry, Victor. I wouldn't have. I couldn't have. I went along with it. Of course I did. If I'd been high card, I don't know what I would have done, but... Okay, there's one down. Wet feet. By this time, Chester must be aboard the nearest freight train headed for parts unknown. Chester? He signed the confession. But he wouldn't do it. I know he'd been At drinking, the last but... moment, it's a little hard to pull the trigger. Is that so? You're so sure, aren't you? Huh? Moonlight out there. Window, come in. Look. It's him. It's Chester. But he's not coming toward the house. Just walking. That's the path runs up by the bluffs. Yes, and if anything happens to him, it's our fault, Salto. Come on, step on it. Run! Chester! Chester! What's the matter with him? He doesn't even listen. Oh, look out, George. Now, these bluffs are pretty steep, aren't they? Chester! I'm going to climb up this way, too. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Huh? You what? just stay behind me with Miss Brooks. Valentine. There's another way this whole thing tonight can work. But I'm going to see that it doesn't. George, look, he's up on one of the edges. Hey. Stand still. Oh. What in... Norton. Get out of here. Leave him alone. Norton, wouldn't you know? Stand still. I'm warning you, I have a gun. Oh, yeah, sure. The one from the watchman's locker? He didn't take it. Chester didn't take hey, it. Hey, what's all this? So you did. Sure, sure. You guys wouldn't just make a deal for somebody to commit suicide. You'd get him to write a confession and then murder him. He killed her. He killed our little one. He confessed. Uh, George, he's up on the edge. Look at him. Leave him alone. He'll jump, I tell you. Look at the way he's acting. I just followed him. To give him the gun he didn't take. James, listen to me. It will all be over. For all of us. Oh, you inhuman old... Let it happen. If you don't, 
it'll be the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, look, we can't stop him from here, and he does look like he wants to jump. Okay, so I've been wrong, so I... Valentine! Get out of the way with that gun! Okay, now you're all right, Martin. Stay there, all of you. Chester! Mr. Chester! I'm all right. Uh, Yes? Mr. Chester, now you listen to me. I can't reach you. But Uh, but get away now. There's something I'm going to do. Yeah, I know, I know. Kill yourself. But you were supposed to do it where she died, weren't you? Wasn't that the agreement, Chester, to make it look good? Can you understand me, Mr. Chester? I'm all right. That's it, that's it. Just keep looking at me. It should have been the living room, though. Or were they always wrong? She was beaten, bruised. I remember they said they never found a weapon. Was it really up here that she died? Was she thrown? It would have looked the same if somebody then carried her body back to her house. I'm going to jump, you know. Get back, get back. No, you're not. You're too curious, Chester. This year, since Dorothy Fullman died, must have been the worst for the one who really killed her. Don't you think so, Mr. Chester? What? What do you mean? But admitting it is worse. Some people can't ever do that. They'd rather die than do that. I'm going to jump. You can't stop me. But you don't even want your death to be a confession, do you? Well, they gave you a chance, the little card drawing. You know the masked deck, the marked one, would be found sooner or later. You deliberately left it behind. No, no, go away. The world would say your confession was a fraud. You were a poor little patsy. Well, any of them could have marked the cards, Norton, Salto, and... The high man marked them. The guilty man, Chester. All I've said is built on that. When there's a drawing, a man can't make another man take a certain card. So if he marks them, he only marks them for himself. Check? Yes, yes, I understand, To pick his own card. But the lowest card picked tonight was a nine. If a man wanted a low card, that's not very safe, is it, with 52 cards in the deck? You know, it baffled me for a while, until I saw that you really did want to die. She was faithless. She was bad. Get out of my way! Oh, no, you don't. Now, just hang on. You're going to live, Buster. You're going to write a real confession. to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. George, it did work out that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, Brooksy, they pieced it together again. That's why Chester went up to the bluffs instead of taking the gun. That's how he had killed Dorothy Fullman a year back. Mm. And if the first confession had gone through, if he'd shot himself, nobody ever would have believed it. Well, the other three would have always thought they railroaded the poor little punchy. Trade their private little hells for new ones. If Mrs. Ames weren't still in love with her husband and called you here. Mm Mm-hmm. George, isn't it uh, remarkable what a woman will do for the man she loves? Remarkable. Forgive... Forget. Protect. I'll remember that. Darling. <laughs> the very next time I'm suspected of murder. Oh! Good night, Brooksy. You have just heard High Card. Another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it.
Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, mystery lover. Time for your dead time story. That's right, dead time. This Let George Do It adventure has so many bodies in it, you'd think the Black Plague hit town. It's called Angel's Grotto, and I think you'll find it a heavenly tale. As usual, it's all about George Valentine and his faithful companion, Brooksy. Companion? Oh, well, I better not tell you any more, as it might spoil the suspense. And that we cannot do. Dear Mr. Valentine, you are fired. I know that's a clumsy way to put it, but I've been a nurse too many years to learn parlor diplomacy. Besides, you've been here at the Grotto Farmhouse for almost a day now, and you haven't found anything. Not a single thing. Not that you should have. Perhaps I was just hysterical this morning when I called you out here. But now even the police seem to agree, don't they? Mr. Moraga's death last evening was an accident. Yes, an accident. And so much as I appreciate your coming to help, why should you stay on? Sincerely, Emily Flood. listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Oh, Miss Flood. Miss Flood. Yes. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Oh, here you are. We've been looking all over. Did you get my note? Yes, back at the house, but we wanted to... I don't like it back there. I came Look, out... Look, Miss to... I, I was a little surprised. After all, I've barely even had a chance to talk to you since we got here. You see, there's very little factual evidence of any kind. Here. Did you check here? There might have been fingerprints on the handrail that no, might no, show... No, 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 we checked all that. Best fingerprint man in the state found nothing to prove anything. Not even on the wheelchair. No sign of a struggle. He hated that wheelchair. Imagine a man only 45 who usually couldn't sit still for a minute... Having to spend six months in that thing. It was from a sailing accident. The bone wouldn't heal. Uh -huh. Most of the nurses were scared to death of him. But he liked me. Because I wasn't good looking and I didn't have an eye on his purse. And he had told me about this grotto. The Angel's Grotto. It's beautiful, isn't it? All that moss and the ferns. Yes, and... I saw it first about this same time yesterday. I just brought him out from the train, and he had to come here first thing, even before supper. Did you try to find the angel like we did? Oh, it's just a legend. Indians who used to work at the mission across the ranch. An angel of stone, they say. Crossed by the waterfall, I guess. Yeah. Only it's like all those things, huh? The face and clouds, the mountain shaped like a man's head. You can never really see it. Angel of death. He used to come out here and just sit when he was a little boy, you know. It was all so different then, he said. A farm, I mean. Just a place in the woods. And an exciting, scary grotto for boys to tell stories about and dare each other to come close to the edge. They were lovely boys, I guess. Herman hadn't met the bottle and the blondes yet. And that whiny stepbrother who still lives here was just like the real brothers. And John hadn't taken up sailing or broken hips or even gone out to the city to build his steel mills to become the richest man in the state. Why? All been murdered. Mr. Valentine. All right, lady, we're sorry. We, we know you're upset. Anyway, there aren't any facts. But last night at supper... Well, those guys aren't boys anymore, are they? He hated his family. He said this was the last time he'd ever come back. You want the rest of it? If you're going to fire me, you want my report why I say murder? Go on. Well, you were there. You and he and the boys last night, remember? 
You're all sitting around the table? No, no, I don't want to talk business tonight. I don't want to talk anything. I'm tired. Emily, have you done my unpacking yet? Well, I thought as soon as supper is over, while you sit outside for a while... Sure, your nurse will take care of things, John. Here, have another glass of wine. It's special. No, 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 I said. Well, the farm isn't business. I only waited till you came, John, to talk about buying a new tractor instead of riding... Oh, for the love of... Leave him alone, Jake. He's tired. Can't you hear what she said? Well, I got a setter coming around tonight. Got to get out there and help her with the pups. I only thought if he could spare a thousand dollars or so... Leave him alone. (laughs) Jake, you... You'll just never understand us businessmen. Well, farm's a farm. You can't operate stop on it. Stop it. Both of you, stop it. I came here for a one-day visit, that's all. That day starts tomorrow. Oh, sure, Johnny, sure, we understand. I don't come out to the old place often myself, but a little reunion is different, huh? No. I wish I'd stayed in Florida. <laughs> don't blame you. All those classy nurses. Please. Mr. Maraca. Well, Johnny, I know the farm isn't very important anymore to you, but all I wanted to say was... Oh, get out to your barn. Go go be a midwife, <laughs> whatever it is. Now, you nurse, <clears throat> see if you can't give the cook out there a hand with the dishes. I notice Mary's not as speedy as she used to be, Jake. Stay where you are, Emily. Herman, for your information, I'm sick and tired of the steel business, too. Huh? You heard me, Mr. Vice President, in charge of gas and wind? Oh, oh yes, yes. Get everybody out. Leave us brothers alone. Have some wine. (laughs) You don't want to talk business, not old Herman. Herman, the diplomatic sponge. Well, I wrote you I'm going to retire, didn't I? In the prime of life, and why not? And that means for my family, too. I'm here to cut all strings at once. Lazy relatives, steel mills, old family homesteads, the works. I'm sick and tired of supporting a worthless bunch. Please, please, don't. You're tired. You'll upset yourself. You said everything could wait till tomorrow. Everything you have to say to him. Yes, yes. All right. All right. I'm sorry, Emily. Uh, you two fellas. Wheelchair doesn't make a guy like me very friendly, but... But I mean it. I'm moving to Florida for good. Only... Well, we'll talk tomorrow, huh? Sure, Johnny, sure. Sure, we... We understand. No, you don't. You're going to work for a living, Herman. Well, what's the matter with you, Jake? Huh? Earn your own tractor. <laughs> me? I'm tougher than all of you, I guess. Well, what's the matter? Want to murder me or something? Well, come on, come on, say something. Want to murder me or something? And then, Miss Flood, you brought John Moraga out in his wheelchair to sit in the evening air. And you went back to do the unpacking and clean up the dishes for Mary the cook who was out helping Jake. Brother Herman, he went to his room, so the testimony says, where he drank that wine all by himself. Jake, he came out and smoked a cigarette for a while with the impatient invalid. Then went to the barn and was busy for some time delivering a litter of puppies. Your testimony's very complete, Mr. Valentine. So what? So, ten o'clock, you came out to bring Mr. Moraga in for the night. And he was missing. Because around nine o'clock, according to police reports, the doctors... His wheelchair parked here overlooking the grotto where you left him got a little bit too close to the edge. Oh, but there wasn't any evidence. You couldn't find anything. No. No, no evidence to show whether the brakes just slipped and the wheelchair rolled over or whether Mr. Moraga was pushed off the edge. 200 feet down to the rocks. All those hatreds and everything, even motives. But everybody's story seemed to check. Yeah, that's it. Nothing so far can be proved. Mr. Valentine, you kicked that rock just now to see how I would react. Mm, Maybe. Well, I think you should understand. There won't ever be any evidence. His death was an accident. I believe that now. So get out. Get out. Please, go Johnny couldn't have been too surprised, Mr. Valentine. Said he saw the angel clear as death. Omen, I guess you'd call it. We smoked a cigarette together down there, you know, half hour before his death. Surprised at what, Jake? Huh? 
Well, the brake slipped on his chair, don't you think? You figure he was unconscious when it happened. We don't even know that. Look, uh, we're leaving. I only asked... His you. own fault in one way. Had a fixation on that place he did. Ought to be the devil's grotto, I always claimed. Or maybe we could blast the marble and make a quarry. Did you see me, Mr. Valentine? Oh, yes, Mr. Moraga. Uh, look, Jake, do you mind? Uh... Yeah, sure, sure, Mr. Valentine, sure. Got to see about my... Mr. Moraga, testimony showed that last night your brother called you vice president in, in charge... In charge of gas and wind. Yeah. Uh, old Johnny was the only one who had any brains here. Any... Are you part owner of the Moraga Steel Mills or just a paid employee? You mean am I just the boss's brother? Yeah. Yes, if you like. Uh huh. And now that he's dead, you're you leaving, Mr. Valentine. Oh, no, no, don't get me wrong, Jake and I. We appreciate what you've done. But also, we're tired of everybody looking cross eyed at the guys who benefit. I should have told that nurse she was being officious to get you up here in the first place. She was badly upset. Well, so am I. Johnny was my brother. Ah. These little nurses get more conscientious the richer the patient is. Oh! Oh, how dare you! Harry, listen to me! What in the name? I will not, and I won't leave here until I'm I... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit you, but you can't talk like that to me. I'll talk any way I please. I've been here 15 years. I'll call you all the names I Stop can. Stop it, I said. Stop it! All right, nursey, now cut it out. Cut oh. it out. What'd she do to you, Mary? <laughs> What'd she do? Don't look at me that Miss way! Flood? Hey, hey, easy, please. <laughs> Miss Flood. Know what she was up to, Mr. Moraga? She was firing me. Yes, she fired me. You... She. You what? Now, look here, Miss Flood. You've been fighting Take it easy, will you? Here, Emily, you're all right. It was the way she looked. The way she... I'm sorry, Mary. I didn't mean... You see, Mr. Moraga, I happened to overhear this young lady and a policeman Please, talking. no. You just Let found me... out the nurse is really a wife, eh, Mary? <gasps> What's that, George? Just guessing... But it would explain why she could try to fire you, Mary. Why you laugh at the word miss. Not to mention some things John Moraga said last night. Or why just a nurse should be so curious and hire me you and try... this mousy little flat Yes, heel? yes. We were married a week ago in Florida. I did tell the police, Mr. Valentine, I wanted to tell you, but I wanted to wait until... Oh, just because I'm his nurse and he was wealthy. Just because... Stop looking at me like that. Nobody's looking any way they shouldn't. I wondered what his big announcement today was going to be. What made that hot-headed sucker want to sell his business, cut us off, go gallivant and off. Get out of here! Every one of you! This is my house now! Get out! You married a week and now he's dead. Yes! He's dead! He's dead! Don't look that way. Can't you understand? I loved him. And he loved me. Don't give me that. Oh, I wish I were dead, too. Leave me alone or I will be. I will be. Yes. A good act. Good act, Mr. Moraga? Are you changing your mind? I thought you were so sure your brother's death was an accident. You're listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now, back to George Valentine, Angel's Grotto place of great beauty, a place where a man fell 200 feet to his death on the rocks below. A man in a wheelchair, sitting alone in the moonlight. But according to the police, that death was an accident. There's no further reason for you to stay around. Still, if your name is George Valentine, well, what can you do except stall for time, pretend you can't start your car? 
Say, uh, look, uh, Jake, is there some rope around here? I may need it when the mechanic comes to give me a tow. Yeah, in the shed over there helps out. Mm. Oh, okay, thanks. Get out of the way. Good idea. So that fool Emily won't hang herself. Ha! There's a good one. <laughs> Come on, Brooksy. Let the rest of them think we've gone. You realize how short our time is? You mean what he just said about Emily? George, I want to go back in and no, talk Brooksy, to her. No, Brooksy, we got to find evidence before somebody else gets murdered. <laughs> the tracks, all right, Brooksy. And here's where the wheelchair stood. George, you and the police went over it inch by well, inch. Jake gave me an idea. He was wondering earlier if John Moraga was conscious when he fell, remember? Yes. Okay, now look, I'm John Moraga. I'm in a wheelchair, see, and I'm sitting here. I'm a strong guy. Strong? George, John had been laid up for six months. Well, that's not long enough to break down a dynamo like him. The point is, when he was sitting here, it would have been pretty hard to take him by surprise. You mean somebody slugged him I first? Don't or... know. There's no sign of a struggle. At least thought he might have fallen asleep. George, suppose he'd been drowned. Huh? I mean, remember that wine last night at Oh, Sunday? yeah, I thought of that. But it's like everything else, nothing left to show. Nothing left but the tracks of the two wheels here and... Hey, Brooksy, look. They just go in practically a dead straight line all the way out to the edge and over. Okay, Brooksy, throw me that rope there. Oh, George. It's all right you... now. It's all right. This tree will hold me. Oh, George. Just take it easy, will you? There we are. This is one thing we didn't check. But, but they combed every rock down below there. They when I kicked that rock loose this afternoon, remember what happened? It bounced. Okay, I'll find out what happened last night, and I won't bounce either. I hope. Brooksy, I can see the angel from down here. Yeah, it really does look like one, you know. A cross by the... George, your rope's twisting. I'm all right. There's some stuff to hang on to here. Angel of death, huh? I can't even see you anymore. Brooksy. What'd you say, George? Hey, not so loud, will you? I was just looking down before. It's a watch. What? No, no, no. Piece of watch chain. Sure, sure, he did hit here before he dropped to the rocks. I thought so, the way the cliff curves out. It's... Don't go any farther. What if he did lose part of his watch chain? It doesn't tell you anything Oh, about... doesn't it? Hooked on a little twig, some scrub trees here growing in a crevice. Well, you know, it doesn't have any bark. Yeah, that's right, two places here, no bark. I'll tell better in the daylight. But, Brooksy, there are kick marks, too. He, he grabbed here as he fell. Must have hung on for some time, several minutes maybe, before his strength gave out. Somebody's coming, George. Made it. Hey, I called you, but I didn't hear you answer. Well, I went to see George. I, listen. Listen to what? Well, it's gone now. Okay, come on. Get this rope out of sight. Here, duck back here. Yeah. In the bushes. That's better. Oh. George, I hate high places. You're crazy. But I learned something, Brooksy. The fact he clung there proves John Moraga was conscious. He couldn't have grabbed on there unless he was perfectly all right when he went over. He wasn't slugged, doped, anything. Just pushed. But those straight line tracks... Well, I can think of a person he might have trusted. Never guess what was going to happen until the last minute. Oh, George. Any of them could have come down here without being seen. His shouts when he was hanging there wouldn't have been heard. Oh, Brooksy, look, stop evading it. You know who I'm talking about. All those tears don't hide her motive. George, I just can't believe that a girl would... Yeah. You see what I see? Little Emily. George, she's crying. That's what I heard before. Yeah. Walking like she didn't know where she was. <laughs> George, she wished she were dead, too. She was hysterical, but she said I'm she... I'm like Jake. I didn't take it seriously. But she's going where we were. George, grab her. No, she's no, going to... stop. Uh, uh, Emily? Oh, you stunned me. Oh? <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to. It's Herman. Beautiful night, isn't it? Mr. Maraga. What are you doing down here, anyway? You know, don't you? Why do you ask? Oh, well, I, I didn't believe her. 
Good-looking girl like you with her head and her shoulders would seriously think of carrying out a threat You like... think I'm ugly. We said so. A stupid, flat-heeled nurse. Uh, oh, well, really, it isn't any... No, stay where you are. I don't think there's room for both of us here, Mr. Moraga. All right. All right. I loved your brother. I loved John. I'm 35. I'm not pretty. I know what I am. But he loved me, too. Oh, no. Please don't touch me. Don't come any closer. Oh, it's all right. I know how you feel. It was an accident. Leave me alone. Oh, well, just an accident. That's all. I told you. Don't touch me. Well. You big fat balls. Miss You walked right into it, didn't you? Look out of my arm. I've handled patients ten times as tough as you are. My arm. Look out the edge. Believe right. what I said, didn't you? I believed I'd come down here and be thinking of jumping when it's you who's going Look to throw right. this. Come on, Bessie. Step on him. He's the one who's liable to be killed. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Get back here, I said, get back! Let go of me! Okay, sister! Hey, 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 what happened? What is it? All right, all right, oh. take it easy, all of you. Good Lord, what's the matter with you? She's all right, George. Let go, leave me alone. She would have killed me. She was trying to I push know, me. I know, I know, we saw we it We thought it was going to be the other way around. Oh? It never occurred to me. She has the same motive for getting rid of you, Mr. Moraga. You're the only real brother. You're in her way, too. Uh, Herman, for the love of Pete, why the crazy little fool? I thought that she was... Shove me! Was she trying right, to will do you please stop it? it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We prevented a murder. Now I can prove it. Murder number two. Hey, did you find out something? Mr. Valentine... Lady, will you stop crying for one minute, please? I didn't say you killed your husband. You didn't kill John Moraga. George. Emily, the tragedy we prevented tonight was you killing for vengeance because you thought the murder would never be solved. Herman did it. I was sure. The police couldn't find any clues for you, but you were like I was. You knew it had to be murder, and so you tricked Herman into following you down here. The only trouble was when you tried to take the law in your own hands, you picked the wrong person. I'm... What? Yeah, that's right. He didn't do it. He's demonstrated that pretty well right now, hasn't he? Only, uh... Hey, you, uh, what's your name, Cook? Uh, Mary? Oh. Did you ever see the angel? Did, did I? What? Come on, come on, the angel on the rocks. You've lived around here 15 years, you said. You've heard the legend. Oh, that. No, no, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no angel in the rocks, Valentine. Let's oh, just Oh, yes, there is. Because I saw it. And John Moraga said he saw it, too. Oh, no. No, he did After didn't. you left He's... him down here, Emily, he supposedly said it while smoking a cigarette. With you, Jake. Yeah, oh, wait a minute. I never said it. Oh, anything. yes, you did. I remember it, George. And that was your mistake. Because, Buster, that angel turns out to be a real angel of death. You can't see that rock formation from any place except halfway down a straight cliff. No wonder the Indians had a legend. So when could John possibly have seen it except when he was climbing down there after he'd been shoved, clinging there, hanging there? Why did John scream out that he saw the angel? Was he pleading with you to help him? And did you just stand there and laugh at him, Jake? No, no, you're crazy. Me, I'm just a farmer. I sure, don't... you're a big, strong guy. And that's why the tracks of the wheelchair were nice and straight, Brooksy. A man strong enough could just tip it back, load and all, and give it a roll. Now, you listen to me. I was up with that setter of mine. I was clean out in the barn. Mary, help me. Mary, do you know what the penalty is for providing a false alibi in a murder case? No, no, I don't even know what you're talking... You better tell me fast, lady, how many of those puppies you delivered. Mr. Valentine... How much of that two hours Jake really spent with you in that barn? Oh! Hey, get her, she's running! No, no, we'll get her all right. I don't believe anything that dumb old thing... That's all, Jake! Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Angels got him. And the angel really did solve it. Well, Brooksy, the weak need accomplice didn't help Jake much. Yeah, but Mary wasn't really mixed up in But any... she started the ball rolling. Nothing else he could do but confess after that. I suppose she wanted to keep the farm as much as he did. And Moraga was going to take it away, sell everything. Mm -hmm. And to think it all started with our being fired. 
Emily tried to do it the right way, George. She hired you to find evidence of what she thought had happened. Yeah, by a woman's intuition. So, just on the basis of that, she tries to play angel of destruction, of vengeance. It was crazy and wrong. But she loved John Moraga. Those tears were all true. Hmm. She told us how much she loved him. First and only love of her life. I could tell. And he loved her just as much. I know, I know. Love, love, love. Hey, how come you're such an authority on the subject, Brooksy? With you around, I'll be darned if I know. You have just heard Angel's Grotto, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. (laughs) 